<laughs> I have always been able to pick up and sense things. It's kind of random. Most things I keep to myself. Because in my experience, it makes people uncomfortable. That's another post though. The first time I saw the hat man, I was 8 years old, about 1970. I lived with my parents and two sisters. I shared a room with my middle sister. It was late. I knew everyone was in bed and sleeping. I feel this memory like it happened yesterday, and I think thinking about him will open up that part of me that's sensitive to that kind of energy. It's scary. The terror and just the sense of having been watched. The energy or vibe of badness, wrongness, and or just a darkness. Hard to convey the shock that I felt when I knew I wasn't dreaming. I woke up and in the doorway, I saw a man with a long black overcoat, kind of like one of the old western duster coats. He had on a fedora hat with a large brim. I couldn't see his face clearly, it was in shadow, but the nightlight from the bathroom lit him from behind. He crooked his right index finger, motioning me to him. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and he was still there. It seemed like he was closer to me then. He was still backlit from the nightlight. I remember looking at him getting closer, closing my eyes, and saying the Our Father prayer. When I opened my eyes again, I didn't see him, but I knew he was still there. The energy or feeling was still there and very strong. I knew I shouldn't have got out of bed or tried to run across the hall or else he would somehow get me, or so I thought at the time. I don't remember how long I sat there in my bed. It seemed like a long time. I finally got up the courage to run to my parents' room. Don't think my feet even touched the floor. I woke my parents. The police came. The house was searched. Neighbors all on alert. No signs of anything or anyone. I remember distinctly seeing my parents, their friends, grandparents, in little groups huddle up talking, looking at me. I don't think anyone believed me, and they thought I might be incapacitated in some way. It was close to five or six years before I would sleep alone in a room, much less by myself in a bed. Now all these years later, I've had a few incidents recently that brought it home again. Thanks for reading. After lurking around the site ever since the same age this happened, I finally decided to write out what happened to me 10 years ago. The following experience is my very first paranormal encounter, though not the only one. When I was in third grade, I lived in the city of Spring, Texas, which is a suburb about 18 miles north of Houston. The subdivision this happened in was Oak Creek Village, Old Oaks. At one corner of the subdivision, near my house, there was a forest and if you continue along the main path for about 10 minutes, you'll reach a clearing in which there is a small river with a large drainage tube with its mouth open perpendicular to the side of water. A neighborhood friend and his dad showed me how to get there, and I often rode my bike to the location to explore around. One holiday weekend, my mother invited a boy in my class named Stephen to our home, as he was my only friend from school. I went to a school outside of our neighborhood because my mom taught there and the nearby school wasn't very good. After playing baseball a bit, I told him about the forest and he agreed to ride there on my scooter with me as I rode my bike. When we got to the clearing, we slid down the grass hill to get to the river and Steven stepped on the rocks atop the water to enter the drainage tube as I watched from the grass nearby. About 20 seconds later, he walked out looking quite bewildered, and said, I just heard a gunshot in there. Being a brave child, and since I had heard a gunshot, I wanted to investigate, so I walked on top of the rocks and peered into the drainage tube as Stephen stood behind me, seven or so feet away, not in vision of the inside of the tube. I had planned on walking inside the tube, but stopped because of what I saw. Inside the tube, about 50 feet away, was a glowing white figure, and though fuzzy-ish, was clearly in the shape of a human, as I could make out a head, shoulders, arms, legs, and torso, though there were no details. It was only an outline of mostly a man. 
unable to comprehend what I was seeing. I could only stare at it in quizzical wonder. I started to look around the figure, but there was only darkness. It didn't appear as though anything, but the figure was inside the tunnel, and no noise whatsoever could be heard. I continued to stare at the figure, and saw that it appeared to be walking around within a small area, occasionally bending down and then standing back up. It seemed to be looking for something on the ground. As I continued to stare, I felt like it was gradually coming closer, at which point I realized, isn't that a ghost? Only having heard the word mentioned a few times before, and in scary stories, I started to worry about the danger of glowing figure behind me, so I stepped back, faced Stephen, and told him what I was seeing. His eyes widened, and he told me we should get out of here, so we ran as fast as we could and raced on my bike and scooter back to my home. Though I remember having a small interest before, this experience is what truly got me into the paranormal and what led me to this very site 10 years ago. Though I've been back to the location several times after, as it is dangerous, I haven't ever stepped on the rocks leading into the tube since then. My own theory is that it was the ghost of a man who had died in the tunnel or nearby and the gunshot was the sound of what had killed him. Though now an uninhabited and empty forest, I later found a mountain of bricks that I felt had been used to build a house in the clearing long ago. I never really believed in the paranormal. I consider myself a skeptic and wholeheartedly believe that it is rational to question experiences without substantial evidence to back it up with. I do not believe in a higher power and consider myself to be an atheist, but after these accounts I had, I now believe that the afterlife does exist. Firstly, I wanted to reassure you all that I am not crazy. I'm not on any medication that causes me to hallucinate. I consider myself to be a competent human being, and during this experience, I was completely awake and alert. I was inexplicably looking out my bathroom window from upstairs. I say inexplicably because I can't even begin to explain why I felt the sudden urge to look outside my window. It was almost as if I felt some intense energy force me to look outside my window, and I couldn't resist it. So I was brushing my teeth, and that's when I noticed it. A cloaked figure, the size of a normal sized man, floating across my courtyard, wearing all black. I wasn't able to get a good look at the apparition's face because I had only noticed it from a side angle, and it was 20 feet away, moving across my line of vision where I was able to get a side on view of the hooded figure. My initial reaction, believe it or not, was met with apathy. I did not think anything of it, and so I went on with my daily routine. I think I may have been in denial about it because I just didn't want to convince myself that spirits exist. And besides, I had an important job interview that I had to get ready for. A few days later, I was sitting in the living room watching YouTube videos on my laptop. I decided it was time for bed, so I closed my laptop since it was getting pretty late. I can't remember exactly what time, and I was home alone, but still alert. I just couldn't sleep. I had completely forgot about the experience I had a few days prior. Now this is where it gets extremely creepy. As I was heading upstairs to go to my room, I swear on my life, I heard a distorted voice saying the words death and now whispered faintly in my ear. I can't even begin to explain the eeriness of it all. It just didn't sound human and it had a certain calmness to it. Seven months later, my 27-year-old brother died in a horrendous accident involving a car hitting him on the M40 after he ran out of fuel and was walking down the hard shoulder to get to the nearest fuel station. Could this have been some sort of warning? I can't seem to find the answer I'm looking for on Google, so I've signed up on here in hope of finding some expert help. Again, I consider myself a logical human being, but after these experiences, it seems there's much more to this universe that I can't truly ever explain. This is one of the scariest experiences I've ever had, so I'm going to tell it to you right now. 
My friend and I were heading home from a friend of ours in a nearby town or village, I should say, because I live in a really remote location. It is at least 15 miles from my house, and there are a lot of alternative roads to use. The best roads are the longest, so we figured we could check the GPS to see if there was a quick route, and we saw an alternative road we decided to use, which to all of our surprise, we never heard of because both of us have a very good knowledge of this part of the county. We started the drive, and the first part, we're on a road we knew well, but as we seen on the GPS earlier, the left turn into the unknown was coming ahead. We took the left turn onto a gravel road with no signs on it, and it was heading right into the forest, and we drove for a few miles. Suddenly, asphalt appears in the middle of a timber truck-like road, and thick smog was building up outside. So I was fighting to see the road, and it was getting really cold in the car. We kept on driving longer into the woods, and then, out of nowhere, a lady all dressed in white was standing by the side of the road. She was holding an old washboard and looked me right into the eyes with what looked like black eyes or very dirty around the area around the eyes. I remember specifically her long white dress and the horror that struck me right away. I wanted to drive 120 miles per hour, but I couldn't drive faster than maybe 20 because of all the fog. So it felt like we drove for hours, which I'm sure wasn't more than 10 minutes. And then suddenly, fog is clearing up and we're at a crossroad near a village close to mine. Because of the panic, I couldn't memorize everything properly. And then I drive to my friend's house safe and dropped him off and got home. Today, we're trying to find this road again to show a couple of friends who didn't believe us, but it is nowhere to be found. We even drove to the same village at the exact same location where we dialed in the GPS, but it did not show that lost road as an alternative. Five years ago when I was 17, still in high school, I went to pick up my friend Elizabeth one day from her job. I went on the bus. I had no car or license at the time. Elizabeth and I were really close. We are still really good friends, but I don't really see her as much as our high school days because she has a daughter now and she is always working. She used to work in this store located on Broadway in Chola Vista, California. I went there many times, but this time when I went to pick her up on the bus, it was super weird and I honestly don't know what that was. It was about 9 or 10 o'clock at night and there was no one else in the store because she was closing. She told me if I wanted to look around the store while she did some things in the office. I told her it was okay and I would wait so I started looking around the store. The store is called Warehouse Shoe Store and it's divided half shoes and half clothing but I think the shoe section is bigger. I was in between. I was in the clothing section looking at some shoes facing the other side when suddenly, on the corner of my eye, I just see a small black silhouette running from the shoe to the clothes section. I turned around but I didn't see anything, so I paid no mind because I thought maybe there was still someone in the store and their child was running around. I continued looking at shoes and I hear the rack right behind me move. So I turned around and I see the clothes moving like someone had just opened it to go inside the clothes rack. I used to do that when I was a little girl, so I thought maybe this little boy or girl is trying to scare me. So I giggled and I peeked down and I didn't see any feet or anything. I opened the clothes to see inside the rack and there was nobody there, so I started walking around the area, and I didn't find anybody. When Elizabeth was done, she told me that we could go now, and so we left. She had a car. I told her what just had happened to me. But the strange thing was, she said she felt something touch her. In the late 1970s, I took some holidays and gave two days to help an organization do a flea market. We had to sort things that were given away and put a price tag on them. 
There were a lot of various things to sort out, mainly clothes. The place chosen to sort those things was a big house which was sitting by a main road not too far from my own house. This house had been abandoned a long time ago. The owners were away. It's been a bit more than 30 years I had been staying in this area, and I saw this house when it was completely a shack and run down. Broken windows, long weeds, dirty with tags on some walls. On three occasions I saw renovations going on, but they would stop for an extended period. I heard from people of the neighborhood that the house was haunted and that it changed owners on three occasions. Each started renovations but stopped because they had financial problems. The current owner took almost 10 years to renovate the house. When it was ready, he tried to run it but did not get a single client for two years. However, one day, as I was going to work early, I saw vehicles by the house and people uploading furniture in the house. I said to myself that the owners were lucky. The next day in the afternoon, while coming back, I saw the same people now removing their stuff from the house. I asked neighbors what had happened, and they said a young couple moved in, but on their first night, they experienced scary events. They apparently heard voices, door slamming. They saw an old woman in a wheelchair cursing them, and their bed shook at night. A few weeks later, I saw another similar scene. In the afternoon, I saw people moving in, and the next morning, they were leaving. Then the house remained empty for three to four years. The organization, knowing that the house could not be rented, asked the owner to use it as a store, and they would take care of the yard and maintenance against a minimal rent. He accepted. I think the owner was resigned. Anyway, here comes my part. I was a bit nervous to work in this house, knowing the history of it. I went in the first day, and I could feel the atmosphere being thick. I was feeling watched. Maybe it was my mind. I worked a good 5-6 to six hours from around 5pm to 11pm. At the beginning, there was a lot of people, but they would leave gradually. About a half an hour before I left, we were about 7 only. I was not feeling well, and some parts of the house were creepy. Things were all over the place. I started to hear a conversation. Others did hear the same, but said it's the neighbors talking. I was not convinced. I also heard footsteps at a stage on the first floor, but others dismissed it to an overreacting mind. I had told them about the house, but all of them were skeptics. The second day I went at the same time, there were less people on that day. It was a Friday if I'm correct. I had the same feeling of uneasiness and being watched as the day before. While working, I heard as if an iron container full of coins fell to the ground. Some of us went to check, but nothing had moved. Then, I was sorting out clothes and piled them up well folded and left to do something else. When I came back, the clothes were on the floor. Some other clothes, which were on a hanger, were also down. I understood that it was not normal, but others still dismissed it. We were now four of us at around 11 p.m., and I could hear conversations going on the first floor. Then a screeching noise, toilets being flushed, footsteps, dragging noises, etc. Some of us went up but saw nothing. People were ignoring these events. Maybe they had received instructions about this. Then the responsible of the team said it was time to leave. As we were just putting in an order, we heard as if something was falling down the stairs. Obviously, we saw nothing. Then we heard furniture being moved. The four of us just packed and go and did not check. As we were about to close the garage door, the responsible was looking for the key. The door then slammed shut. We were outside and we heard like a huge noise as if a pile of iron pots and cookware fell down. The leader opened the garage door and everything was sitting perfectly still and in order. He quickly closed the door and we all left. I did not come back there. 
of people still help there for another two months, but they would make sure that no one would stay alone. Today, the store still exists, and it's still in operation, of course. Thanks for reading. This story happened a few years ago, and I am sad to say that it is a little bit like the Ring One. My house is said to be haunted. Well, at least that is what I say. And we moved here when I was 14. Since then, I always feel like I am not alone. Some nights I can see lights go on and off in my bathroom, or I smell horrible things when I am awake in my house. But this encounter with a ghost was the last straw. It was a cold, rainy day, and I had to let my dogs in the house before they froze to death. My mom was at work and my dad was at work too. They both said that they would be coming home late, so they gave me a list of what to do in order to be safe or just to keep the house in order. But the list was long, and I was not looking forward to doing all of this stuff when I could be having fun playing around with nobody home. When I was watching TV, I started to get the feeling like I wasn't alone after all. I felt a cold chill on my back, and at the corner of my eye, I started seeing shadows. I felt a little better when I saw that my dog was not barking or showing teeth at anything. I went up to get some lemonade out of the fridge, when suddenly, as I walked forwards, it opened on demand. This is where it gets to be like the movie The Ring One. So anyway, I walked around the counter in the middle to see if I could see anything in the fridge. Nothing was there, so I just walked over there and closed it. But then I felt stupid because my lemonade was in there. After I got the lemonade, I sat back down and watched more TV. As I started taking a sip, I could see in the reflection of the glass in my kitchen... I looked at the glass, trying to see the kitchen fully now, and what I saw next made me have nightmares for a long time. Looking at the glass, I suddenly saw this black creature run straight across the kitchen counter. I gasped, and right as I gasped, my dog jumped up and started barking like crazy and showing warning teeth. I jumped up with all feet and arms on the couch watching my dog. This is when it started getting freaky. All of a sudden, my dog starts moving his head like he is watching something dance or run. His head is moving across the ceiling and then back down to the kitchen counter again. Then, my dog moved his head and stared straight at me. I screamed because I knew that this ghost was either right beside me or behind me. I ran to my room upstairs and locked the door. I started crying out of fear and listened to my dog bark like crazy. Then, all of a sudden, the barking stops. My bedroom is big, but my bed is right in the corner near the window in the closet. I was sitting under the covers waiting to hear my dog bark again. It was all quiet. Then, I hear my dog scratching and barking even louder now at my door. There was only one meaning to this. The ghost was in my room. Next thing I know, I was woken up by my mother on the kitchen counter. She asked me what had happened and I told her the whole story. She then asked me why I was found on the counter. I told her that all I remember was passing out in my bed. She looked at me and smiled. Then she said, It's okay now, sweetie. Everything is fine now. Maybe most of us have experienced driving at night, maybe in a foggy night, a cold night, or even some people have been on a bus on their way home. In my case, I was on my motorcycle. It all happened in Mexico. This was exactly two years ago. That night, I had gone to my friend's house. We watched a movie. It started around 9 p.m. and finished at 11 p.m. It was around 12 a.m. when I left his house. There I was, at max speed on the road, just feeling the breeze on my bike. To get to my house, there is only one trail. There is another road to get to my house too, but it takes forever, so I took the one I always go on. 
It was a silent night. I could only hear the owls and the air as I was passing through this trail. At a long distance, I saw a kid. He was just standing there in the middle of nowhere. I got surprised, and at the same time, I felt really scared. As I got closer to him, I slowed down a bit. He asked for a ride, but of course I denied to give him one because it was midnight, and this was not normal. I continued the trail like nothing ever happened. Whenever I'm on my bike, I sometimes close my eyes for a bit just to feel the breeze. Somehow, it feels like I'm flying, so I close them for a couple of seconds. Once I open them, I was not on the same trail anymore. I was on the other road I did not take. I noticed because I know my trail like the tip of my palm. I also knew I was on the other trail because sometimes I would take that trail to visit my uncle. I decided to go back and take the same trail because it was going to take forever. Once I got on the same path again, I noticed the same kid up ahead. This time I felt pretty scared and nervous. I slowed down and decided to give him a ride. He got on my motorcycle. I did not even talk to him. I just kept on going. After a few minutes, there was a curve up ahead. After passing this curve, I turned around and the boy was not on my motorcycle. I felt really scared at this moment and I just had this weird feeling. And so I got home. I told my parents about it next day. And they surprisingly said that there was another person who experienced the same incident that I had. My parents told me not to drive so late. And as a result, I tended to listen to them. As some of you know from reading my previous stories, I've just recently moved to Los Angeles with my fiancé and little brother. And you would also know about the new houses I have lived in. I'm currently living in, and the things that have taken place in those houses. Well, I guess that isn't enough for me, because I have to deal with them at work now. I'm a mechanic at a very popular and very busy motorcycle shop. Every day, myself and six other guys pull through maybe 25 plus bikes in a 10-11 hour day. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but we don't just do repairs. We also do custom paint jobs and other custom jobs, so it's quite time consuming. So in other words, it's ridiculously busy and we don't have time to mess around. However, someone seems to have the time to pull pranks on us. This past Monday was busy as hell. The showroom was having a huge sale and for some reason the owner thought we should have a sale on a few things in the shop, which was retarded because, as I said, it was busy as hell. It was around noon, and I decided to take an hour and go to Jack in the Box. When I got back to my work area, all of the drawers on my toolbox were open, and every single one of my sockets were scattered across the floor. I yelled over at Rod and told him if he needs to borrow something, not to make such a mess. I used a little more colorful words, though, because I wasn't too impressed. He told me he wasn't even near my bench. He was doing airbrush the whole morning. Well, the pranks went on for the rest of the day. Nothing as bad as before, just missing tools, and I would turn around to find that drawers were open when I knew they were closed. Finally, it was time to close up for the night. Since I am the manager of the maintenance department, I have to stay an hour after everyone has left to do invoices and whatnot. I was at my bench pricing out a few things a customer wanted when I heard some coughing. It was coming from the long hallway at the rear of the shop that leads to the dumpsters. A special code is needed to open that door and can only be open from the inside. Plus, it makes a very annoying creak followed by a loud slam when it is opened. So I was a little shaken to find no one there when I went to check it out. I walked down the corridor to go see if the door was propped open at all. No, closed tight. I just turned around to head back to my bench when I heard the coughing sound again, only this time it was coming from the shop. I jogged down the hall and into the shop to see who was there. No one. This is when I just stood there and went, great, now I have to deal with them at work too. 
I went over to my bench, where I had left my invoices, which were very important and needed to be put into my computer right away, and they were missing. I gave up. I had enough. So I grabbed my coat and left. Didn't finish sweeping. Didn't power wash the floors. Nothing. I got home and told my fiancé and brother about what happened. Chris thought this was hilarious because he usually gets all of the annoying ghosts pulling pranks on him, so he got his little cheap shots in, and that was it. The next day, I got to work, and when I turned on the shop lights, I could not believe my eyes. Everyone's tools were spilled all over the floor, and a hose that I had rolled up nice and neat before I left was pulled out. Finally, I had enough, so I started yelling at the spirit. After yelling at it, I began cleaning up the tools and putting them back where they belonged. As I was cleaning, I swear I heard a very mischievous chuckle coming from the corridor. Yeah, I said, hilarious. I'm having the time of my life over here. So funny. Basically sounding like a retard. If someone came down and saw me arguing with nobody, I'm sure that would have looked a little weird. The rest of the day wasn't that bad, until closing time came and I was alone again. I started to smell the faint smell of a cigarette. I followed the smell too, you guessed it, the corridor leading to the dumpsters and, yep, you guessed it again, nothing. I turned back to my area to finish sweeping and I noticed at the corner of my eye, the missing invoices from the previous day were neatly stacked on my workbench. I leaned on my broom and smiled. I guess I finally got through to the spirit, and he felt bad or something. Since that week, nothing out of the ordinary has happened, other than a power outage that happened when two other mechanics got into a yelling match. Was the spirit angry that they were arguing? I don't know. I'm just going to say it was a coincidence. Until next time, God bless. It was the middle of August, and the harsh wind blew hot and humid, kicking up a storm for the evening hours. Off to the north, the black clouds had started to brew and roll. It was about 6.30 p.m., and my date was late. He would not tell me where he planned to take me. It was a surprise. Now, being 30 minutes late, I begun to wonder what could possibly be going on, if I would be going anywhere. I walked out into the open front porch, and could almost smell the rain coming. It began to grow darker. I decided if he arrived, we would just stay at my house until the storm passed. I then started to worry that he may be riding his motorcycle. Motorcycles and thunderstorms do not mix. He knew I despise motorcycles, but, well, hopefully, he would be in his truck. As the dreaded motorcycle came around the corner, the rain began to spit big fat drops. He got off the bike and indicated we needed to hurry up. I told him I was not going. It was raining. I was not getting on the bike, and I wouldn't even if it was not raining. After he became increasingly angry with me and refused to stay at my house until the storm passed, he got on the motorcycle and started off into the downpour. I looked up and all I could see was flashing red and blue lights, such as those coming off an emergency vehicle. I watched for a few minutes, thinking there must have been an accident right in front of my house. I could hear screams of agony, sounding if they were coming from in a few feet in front of me. No one was there. I turned around to grab my iced tea I had brought on the porch with me. As I turned back, the lights were all gone. There was no evidence of an accident either. I shook my head and turned to go into the house. As I turned, I could hear the unmistakable roar of his motorcycle starting and then screeching tires. I whirled around and nothing was there. I turned back around after a few moments and decided I would sit on the porch for a while. Surely the heat had gotten to me causing me to see and hear things. After 20 minutes later, my mom called me at the screen door telling me I had a call. I asked who it was, as my mom was familiar with all of my friends. She stated she didn't recognize the voice. I went in and answered the phone. The voice on the other end of the line clarified my name and asked how I was related to Mark, my would-be date from earlier. 
I told him I was not related, that we had been dating for a few weeks. I was then informed that he had my name and phone number. Mark had been in an accident on his motorcycle. The roads were wet and slick. He skidded out of control and came to a rest on a couple of those sand barrels that are used for street barriers. As the accident was being described to me by phone, I looked up and saw the fishing red and blue lights again. I heard the screech of tires. I closed my eyes tightly and said a silent prey. As I opened my eyes, again the lights and the screeching sounds were gone. I was told to contact his parents and come to the hospital. They would not release his condition to me over the phone. I told my mom. She drove me to his parents' home and I told them of the call. We all went to the hospital together. By the time we arrived at the hospital, Mark's left leg had been put into a cast all the way to his hip. His scrapes and cuts had been cleaned on his arms and face, and he was arguing that he did not need to have the cervical collar on. Mark ended up staying in the hospital overnight for observation, but he eventually recovered completely. We did not continue to date after that night because he stated I jinxed him. About three years later, he had another accident on a motorcycle, which ended up breaking his back and his pelvis, causing him to give up motorcycles for good. A couple of years ago, I ran across an old Ouija board dated 1919. I remember how fascinated I was with an experience when I was about 10 with one, so I thought that this board game would be fun to fool around with again. My son, when he was very young, told me about looking out his bedroom window and seeing three glowing figures coming from the field toward his window one night. He also stated that they even entered his room and stood at the foot of his bed. He covered his head with the blankets, thinking that they would go away, and when he uncovered his head, they would still be there. Then they vanished. I attributed this to a bad dream at the time. There is this old, beautiful house in my property, built in 1926. The builder also signed and dated his name in the rafters in the attic. Cool, I thought, that he took so much pride in his work, like an artist, to do such a thing. Anyway, we were in this old house, working the Ouija thing and so forth. My son asked me to see if what he saw was real or not. We got an answer and a lot more. The two people who were at the board knew nothing about this. In fact, they did not know the name of the road we live on or anything else much about the neck of the woods. I asked if there were any ghosts who wanted to speak, not at all taking any of this seriously. Yes, replied the board. Who are you? I asked. Anna Mills was the reply. As our guests worked a Ouija board, why are you here? I asked. And the Platchet had began to move quickly. I died here on the Munger Shaw Road. Our guests didn't even know the name of this road. How? I inquired. Truck, the board answered. How? I asked. Run over, Anna replied. When? 1936. At this point, I was having fun with this game. I did not take this at all seriously. After all, this thing is just a game. So if this is all true, where's your body so that I can bring you some flowers? I jokingly asked. Her answer sent chills down my spine. You are there, she answered. What do you mean? Scattered. Misspelled by an eight-year-old, she said, My ashes are scattered where your trailer house is, she added. She gave us a lot of information that night. She is with two uncles who are elusive, but protecting her. She was visiting them here when her death occurred. Things have happened after that as well than before. When I first put the trailer house where it is now, now abandoned, for I am now living in the old house, my ex-wife and I heard the distinctive voice of a child crying. That I can say without a doubt. My ex also told me that she saw a small girl one night fleeing out the door one late night. 
blew her off. And so did I one night when I woke up to use the bathroom, you know, through the corner of the eye, which I attributed this to being half asleep. We did the Ouija again with two other people. Again, the same conversation with this Anna Mills. I cannot find any records of her existence of her anywhere, though. Then again, out here in the sticks, especially back in the 30s, records may have not been so critical. Heck, I know a guy that had two people buried in his front yard from back then. That's in the days when they did things like that. I did ask her who her uncles were, and she remained elusive on that info. Okay, I know this all sounds really weird, and I did not believe a thing about this until about a year ago. I went for a walk, as I have quite often. I walked across the field on a winter moonlit night. On my way back, I distinctly saw two people sneaking around the trailer. Thinking that someone was trying to break in, I approached one of them. I yelled out to them, what did they want, ready to confront the intruders. I swear that I was within 15 feet of the guy, wearing a plaid shirt and bib overalls, when he took an abrupt right turn and went right through the wall of the trailer house, right below my son's old bedroom. I could see each and every detail of his face and the texture of his clothes. He looked just like a real person that would appear under a full lit moon. I stopped dead in my tracks, but somehow I was not frightened out of my wits as one would suspect. Rather a comforting feeling came over me. By the way, when I first called out to them, the other ran into the woods. All of this I merely attributed to suggestive thinking, thinking I saw things that I imagined and so forth. Perhaps it was a restless walk, late night and so forth. About a month ago, I was visiting my sister and her family at their house miles away. Her daughter also had an old message board that her father found years ago in an attic of an old school that he once worked at. The palanchet was missing. So for fun, I went to work in his wood shop and made a really nice wood one for them. With her and her boyfriend at the board, I asked, Anna, are you here? Hi, Rick, the board replied. This really freaked them out. Tell us the story that you told me the last time we spoke, I asked. Again, the same info that came up a year before. I did not reveal any of the prior things that Anna said to anyone there, but there it was, again the same. She said that I did see her once, and that she and her uncles did visit my son. I did not ask any of this once the planchet began to move. She went on and on and on. I asked her if she liked what I did with the old house. It still looks as it did in the 30s, except for the addition of electricity and plumbing, and she said that she feels at home. I asked her if she enters the house, and she said, no, bad memories. Again, misspelled by an eight-year-old girl. Lately, at night, through the corner of an eye, my son as well as I have seen someone fleeting past the kitchen window. Even our dog sends an alert that somebody is here, when in fact there isn't. The last time I used the board, being a skeptic, I always have someone else use it. She said that she wanted to meet me along the edge of the field at one o'clock in the morning. Promise? I asked. I promise, she answered. I never bothered. I'm not sure if I believe in such things, but it is fun to think about. Perhaps it is true. Update. Anna is now haunting the people living in their trailer house now, even though I have never shared this story with them. Denise and her friends have seen her as well. She is still alone and longing for whatever she is looking for. They are not afraid, for they find her sweet and comforting, just like the child she was in life. They have actually adopted her, and she at times visits my old house. Crying Woman 
This happened about 11 years ago, when I was around 7 years old. Since I was born, my family moved a lot of times from house to house. My sister and I have seen and heard many strange things during those times when we were constantly on the move. This is one of them. My family and I were living in an old two-story house that was in a state of disrepair with the edges of the roof falling off. The house had a creepy attic and basement that my sister and I never dared to enter any one of them. One time at night, my parents were sleeping in their own bedroom, and I was in my own room, wide awake, trying to sleep. I was very thirsty, and my mouth was dry, which always had bothered me. I didn't want to wake up my parents because they had to get up early in the morning to go to work. Then I decided to go by myself to the kitchen and get a glass of milk. The kitchen was just down the hallway, just a few feet away from my room. When I got there, the first thing I did was turn the lights on. Then I tried to turn on a small TV we had in the kitchen, but it was unplugged and the TV was too high for me to reach the cable to plug it in. Then I started to drink my milk. When I just finished my glass of milk, I heard the terrifying sound of a woman give a low moan, like as if it was crying. It sounded... It sounded like it was coming from the hallway, a few feet away from the kitchen. My whole body got numb of fear, but I didn't care how scared I was and ran to my parents' room and told them that I heard someone crying, but they told me it was probably my sister trying to scare me, even though what I heard was clearly a grown woman. Then they decided to let me sleep with them. A few weeks after that incident, I was alone in the entire house. It was at night, and when I went to the bathroom to take a shower, I heard it again, and like last time, it sounded very close to me, like as if it was in the bathroom with me. I jolted out of there and went to my room and covered myself in my blanket, terrified and stood like that, until my parents came home a few minutes later. After that second time, I never heard it again. Luckily, we moved a few months later. About a year ago, I started to remember this incident and told my parents what I heard. My mother didn't know what to make of it, but my father told me that in that same house, something similar happened to him. He said that when he got up very late at night to go to the bathroom, he saw a woman sitting on the stairs, which was right in front of the bathroom, and the woman was sobbing. She was holding her face crying. My dad thought it was my mom and started to tell her, what's wrong? But the woman gave no response. Then my father told her, fine, have it your way. Then, when he got out of the bathroom, the woman was gone. When he got to his room, he saw my mother sleeping. The next morning, he asked her why she was crying on the stairs. My mother was confused and told him she was sleeping the whole time. Until this day, sometimes I wonder who or what was the woman. If any of you have any ideas, feel free to comment. For as long as I've known, I have always had unexplained experiences along with my mother, grandmother, and siblings. I'm starting to think this is a genetic trend, although I feel I have these occurrences more often than they do. I'm now at the age of 29. Most of these experiences happened when I was younger. I'm going to tell you one of an experience I had in this story when I think I may have visited hell. I remember this night very vividly. My parents were harshly arguing with one another, as usual. It died down after a while, but I still went to bed a little overwhelmed. I remember falling asleep like usual, like any other night, nothing different. From what I can explain, is to me, 
It felt as though my soul has lifted out of my body and drifted into another dimension. It felt like I was flying through the air bodiless and then promptly landed in what I thought to be a dimension of hell. I landed on high altitude light brown rock formation and it seemed to be a very hot summer day. Everything seemed very physical and realistic. The sky looked normal, but as I looked around, there were no living creatures. Nothing was alive. There was no grass, no trees, nothing. But this brown rock material, for as far as I could see. I realized I had been placed in near the front of a line alongside with my mom against other people I had never even seen before, facing a little white chapel-like house that seemed to be the only thing in the entire dimension. The people in line looked like everyday ordinary people, except no one was making noise or moving a muscle. Everyone was very silent and still looking at the chapel-like house. I was very confused on what was happening. I began observing, but I never got out of line. I'm not sure why. It felt out of my control to do so. All of a sudden, I heard a very deep, scary demonic voice that muttered the words, Go inside. I looked up to see where it came from, and there was a huge, transparent, dominant-looking face in the sky. I couldn't really make it out, or its features, or exactly what it was looking at. There was a few people in front of me who began walking slowly into the chapel-like house. They seemed terrified, but had no choice but to go in. A few people had to go in at a time, and the door slammed behind them. We were next in line. I turned to my mom, who was behind me, and whispered frantically, because I didn't want the face to hear me, Don't go in. It's not safe. She nodded in agreement with me, but seemed kind of zombie-like, as she didn't actually reply to me. As I looked at the chapel, there was a huge window in front that I could see in. What I saw was very disturbing and mentally unexplainable. It was very dark inside. The only thing I could see was four autopsy tables with four people on them as though they were dead, but not dead. I could only see from their feet up to their waist. It seemed like they were dead, but were able to move their feet. They looked like they were freshly dead. They didn't look like they had rotted or anything like that. Each of them seemed to have had a little ticket wrapped on each of their big toes, along with a white blanket covering them. I couldn't even see any further than that. It almost seemed like I was being forced to walk into a torture chamber. I was petrified and unable to move, and the door looked as if it was about to open again. All of a sudden, everything disappeared, and everything went to a fog. It seemed as if my soul traveled back to my body, and I could see myself sleeping. That itself was very chilling, and in a flesh, I shot into my body and woke up all at once. I absolutely can't mark this off as just a dream, and I would love to hear any comments, feedback, or similar experiences anyone has had. The Baby Cemetery In this story, I'm going to tell you one of my many real-life experiences. I was about 16 when this event occurred, and I'll never be able to explain how this happened or exactly what it was that I experienced. I remember falling asleep in my blue waterbed the night this occurred. That being said... Let me begin. I woke up, but it wasn't my bed that I was in. It was someone else's. As I sat there confused, I also realized I wasn't in my own house either. The bed's sheets and comforter were white with purple flowers. The room was tan. 
There was a window to my right that was open, and the plain white curtains were blown softly as the daylight came through. The bed was located in the left corner of the room, touching the wall. I just laid there, confused. I was still very tired, so I closed my eyes for a moment or two. When I opened my eyes, I was surrounded by five dead babies that were all facing me. They were very gray and rotted looking. They stared at me with very dark, soulless eyes. They had a cloth diaper and couldn't have been over the age of one. I felt complete terror in that moment. I could not move a single muscle in my body or make any type of emotion. It felt like the dead infants were there for hours. Suddenly, they disappeared, and the day became night in the blink of an eye. I remember finally getting up out of the bed and walking through the house. I could feel the physicality of everything I did, and I was very observant. I remember feeling like the house was very sad and lonely, like I was there to help somehow. I walked outside of the house and looked at the front of it. I couldn't put it together in the dream, but it looked very familiar. Suddenly, I woke up again, but this time in my own bed and in my own house. The dream was still very vivid in my mind, and that's when I remembered why the house looked familiar. A few weeks earlier, I had dropped off my friend's 13-year-old brother's friend at his home, but I never went inside. The house was the exact house I had seen in my dream on the outside. This was something that I had to tell him about. The next day, he was at my friend's house, so I told him I had a dream that I was in his house. When I first told him this, he was laughing and denying it, until I started explaining his entire house in detail to him. I told him about the room I woke up in, everything that was in it, how many stairs he had on his staircase, and everything I had seen in exact detail. He looked completely shocked. He knew I had never been in his house before. He started crying and explained to me that his mom has been experiencing similar things. Apparently, it was his mom's room that I had woke up in. The backyard to their house had a very small yard and then nothing but woods. He told me that he and his mom had walked deep into the woods once and found a children's cemetery from the late 1800s, and the graves were all for babies. Thanks for reading. It's that thing again. Jeez. So one day, my mom had made a bottle for my brother, and she checked it and everything. Then went to get my brother. When she came back to the kitchen, the bottle was gone. We checked everywhere, and we didn't find it. So my mom just gave up and made another one. She fed my brother and bathed him. Then we went to sleep. The next day, everyone woke up and got ready for church. When we got to the living room, the bottle that my mom had made was in the middle of the living room. I, being my dumb self, went to grab it. Just as I grabbed it, the bottle turned really hot and it burned my hand. My mom was scared and my dad was trying to stay stable. When I screamed, I felt a pressure on my chest. And then my brother started babbling, then started crying really hard. And then my dog looked at me, then started barking extremely loud. Then I felt the pressure come off, and at the same time, my brother stopped crying, and my dog stopped barking. When that happened, I just fell to the ground and started crying. My mom was in shock, so my oldest sister ran to me and just held me there for like 10 minutes. Another one is that when my cousin was a baby, she would fall asleep in the living room, and when we would take her to her room, she would cry looking up at the ceiling. 
my uncle told his coworker and his coworker told him to take a picture wherever my cousin was looking. He did. And when he looked at the picture, it was a huge skeleton head. And it didn't stop there. They had so many things happen. But I'll tell those stories later. Thanks for reading. The Wood Street Years This may be a little long and oddly written as I had to write it all down quickly. It's not exactly a single story, but more of a collection of experiences from my old house that I wanted to discuss with you all to see what ideas and theories you all had. My family moved into the house in 1987. It was a 1950s council-owned property that they were renting. The village was an old place that housed a lot of miners that would go to and from the local coal pits and also had mines under the most of the streets. It was an odd but lovely place, but there were always stories of hauntings throughout the village. It was as if the whole place was a hotbed of activity. Ever since the move to this new house, my family experienced odd things. My sister would complain of people sitting on the edge of her bed during the night. My father was followed by a hooded figure, even outside in the streets, and my mother had personal items vanish. Over the years, the activity became more and more intense. In 1995, my father moved out and went to live elsewhere, but we, my mother, sister, and brother stayed in the house. My sister complained of activity in the house when we were out. Banging and scraping from the kitchen, items being shuffled, plates clattered. She got so scared at times that she would run into my mother's bedroom and sleep in there. The stairs and landing area always held some nasty element to it. And on the whole, the entire family hated it without any reason to. It was just something we all felt and never really voiced to each other until many years later. If we had to turn off the light in the hall, we'd run out and run back in. If we had to turn off the landing light at night, we'd do the same. We'd run out of the bedroom and quickly turn it off, only to hurl ourselves back into bed as fast as we could. And heaven forbid, we needed the toilet during the night. My sister eventually moved out and got married, and so did my brother. This left myself and my mother alone in the house. My mother got a job after years of being unemployed, so I'd often be on my own from 5 a.m. to 12 p.m. It was then I began to really notice things. One morning, I had decided that instead of staying awake from 5 a.m., I would get some more rest. I settled back down into bed and closed my eyes. The next thing I knew, I heard a banging sound followed by hurried footsteps coming up the stairs. The thing was, I knew it was our stairs, as they had a unique and distinct squeak to them. The top step would creak, and the next two steps up would make a lighter squeak. Then a thud. It was definitely them. I thought Mom had come back due to forgetting something, like keys or her purse even. But there was silence. We had a break in a couple of years previous, so I was naturally on edge. It was actually my first thought. So I grabbed my phone and called my mother, who was almost at work, so it couldn't have been her. She also had assured me that she had locked the door as normal. I was on the phone when I heard the exact same footsteps again. I have no idea how I did it, but I got back to sleep about a half an hour later. A couple of years passed where nothing much happened. Just the odd thing, like items vanishing and reappearing, noises from the attic and odd smells. Then we started noticing it again. My mother and myself went to the shops one day to pick up a snack from the local deli. When we returned, there was dripping coming from the ceiling just above the back door. 
We could hear whooshing from the pipes, too. We bolted upstairs to find the bathroom taps fully on and the plug in. The bathroom was flooded. To this day, we have no idea what the hell happened there. This happened again about two years after when we returned from an outing with my brother. This time, the plug was not in, thankfully. It was from that point, it began to get more and more frequent. I would see things at night that I couldn't explain. I first put it down to lucid dreaming, but I was not the only one seeing them. I would see strange insect-like creatures crawling up the curtains and on the ceiling. I'd stare at them, and they would vanish after about 15 seconds. There was one time that I was not sleepy, and I was looking out the bedroom window at the street. It was about 1 a.m. at the time, and I saw something very strange on the hedge that surrounded the house. The only way to describe it was a spider, but it had ridiculously long legs, and it was gliding effortlessly across the top of the hedge. My fiancé also saw this for himself back in 2009, and he sat there staring in amazement. And he's a skeptic too. Other things I would see were a man in my room. He would be halfway through the floor of the room. The stairs were directly under my room. Sometimes I would open my eyes and see a face looking back at me in close proximity. Only the fade in a second or two. I admit, that was very unwelcome. The last few years of living in the house had more physical things happen. Objects would be thrown across the room. Things would stop working or randomly activate by themselves. My laptop, which, by the way, does not do it anymore now. I live elsewhere. And we, my mother and myself would have our covers pulled from us when in bed. I remember one night literally having the battle to keep the cover on me. There were also random and vile smells, almost like rotting meat and an invasion of flies. Thankfully, this only happened once and only lasted three weeks or so. We even checked for dead animals. But of course, we found nothing. Now keep reading because... It gets a lot more freakier. My fiancé moved in with me in the house not long before we moved out. He was the type that didn't believe in ghosts. He had been taught from an early age that when you die, that is it. My mother began to date again and was out of the house frequently, leaving myself and my fiancé alone. We decided to clean the house up a little, as we wanted to make my mother feel happier. She had been suffering from severe depression. I don't think it was approved of as things kept going wrong. The vacuum would randomly overheat, even though in this new house, it never has. Things would fall on us. Items would vanish. I even had the unit of our old computer literally fling out from under the desk. It hit me square on my shin even though there was no way it could have. I also had the vacuum cleaner itself chucked at me. We would also hear loud thumps from inside the wardrobe, as if someone was punching it from the inside. We'd joke and say, Ugh, enough of that. Probably not the best of ideas, but we didn't intend to be scared by it, whatever it was. Another thing we noted was that when the door to my brother's old room, which had been used for storage over the previous few years, was left open, the toilet light would turn itself on. We would be out during the day, return at night, and it would be on. Or we'd wake up in the morning, and it would be on. But it didn't happen when the door was shut. One day, I recall the door being left open, and I saw a stack of my drawings get lifted and flipped through right in front of my eyes. This was in the dead of winter, with no doors or windows open. Needless to say, I was not impressed and slept with the covers over my head that night. One night, 
my fiance was upstairs shaving while I was amusing myself playing a Facebook game. It was midnight, so naturally I was hungry. I always get hungry for some reason after midnight. So I went to the kitchen and started making myself a snack. I was addicted to omelette and cheese bagels at the time, so I started making one. After it had finished cooking, I took it into the living room and continued messing about on the game I was playing. I had almost finished it when I heard Lee shout from on the landing. We had no bathroom light at the time, as the bulb had gone, and we couldn't get the light cover off to replace it, so Lee was having to use a mirror on the landing. I went up to see what he wanted, and he said that he had seen a man in the mirror looking back at him. I was naturally confused, but my gut did flip-flops. I asked what kind of man, and he said it was a short, bald man. He even said that he stared at him and could see him out of the corner of his eye, looking over his shoulder, as if it was a real person present. Remember, my fiancé is a skeptic. I admit, I was a touch unnerved. The door to my mother's room which we had taken as our own by that point, was open a little way, and for some reason, I daren't look in. I also felt a little horrible cold feeling that felt as if it was wrapped around my ankles. I didn't want to stay up there at all. I went downstairs and called my mother up to see if there was anyone in the family who had died that fit the description. She said there was no one, so I tried to shrug it off immediately and finish the last bit of my bagel, only for my fiancé to shout again. He came running down the stairs with foam still on his face, saying that he'd seen him again. Only this time? It was as if he was screaming at him, but he couldn't hear any sound. It had really freaked him out, and he was incredibly uncomfortable. I said for him to finish shaving quickly and calm down. Reluctantly, he went back up and tried to shave. But for some reason, the razor was not cutting anymore, no matter how hard he pressed. Also, the cold tap was chugging out scalding hot water, which burned his hand. During this time, I had gotten on to my mother again and told her he had seen this man again in the mirror. While I was on the phone, I could hear odd noises coming from upstairs. My fiancé finished shaving and ran downstairs again, only to pause and stare into the kitchen with an absolutely horrified look on his face. I stopped talking to Mom to ask him what was wrong. He said that he had seen the man again outside the kitchen window, walking past with an unearthly grin on his face, and his was very skinny and looked like he had no arm on one side. I told him to get into the living room, and while I was still talking to my mother, I could hear loud footsteps coming from above me, my mother's old room. My bones were also cold, and the atmosphere was horrific. She suggested I get in touch with my brother so I could stay the night at his, but while she was talking, I felt the atmosphere lift suddenly. It was instantly warmer again, and I felt oddly happy. I actually mentioned it to her, as it was so sudden and drastic. But then, it dropped again. The feeling of dread and the cold returned, and it felt as if something was circling us. I got off the phone with her and called my brother. In a state of panic, I explained what was happening and the fact that we couldn't just stay in the house. We ended up at his place, sleeping in his living room. And now my fiancé is more open-minded about the paranormal. The house was never right from the start. I would love to know just what was going on there, but I guess I will never truly know. The day we moved out was interesting, too. During the move... My mother had experienced a couple of little things while alone, i.e. a piece of paper scooting across the bedroom floor. But 
It was when the house was totally empty and the power had been turned off. Myself and my brother's missus went to check the rooms to be sure we hadn't left anything. All was well and clear. Then we got to my brother's old room. We opened the door and we were hit in the face by the most intense cold breeze. It was bone chilling. It made our eyes water. We turned to each other, nodded, and said that it was fine and we should go. We legged it down the stairs, said goodbye to the house, and left to live in this new house we are in now. Far away from the place I called home, now we are in Texas. The year is 1999, and with my parents being divorced now, my mom was the only person bringing in the money. So, we ended up moving from a beautiful house in a suburban neighborhood and into an old house far in the country. This house was old looking, blue. When you walked inside the long, tall hallway, it went straight back to the kitchen. Going up the hallway were two rooms to the left and the living room by the front door on the right, and further up was my mom's room. The first time I stepped foot in the house, I already had a bad feeling. I was 15 years old and was into the scary stuff. Still remembering all the things that happened from my previous homes, I had my guard up for any funny business. One night, after coming back from a high school football game, I found that I was home alone. My mom and the rest of the family were at my uncle's house that was literally up the dirt road. I was too afraid to walk over there because of how dark it was. My ride was already gone, and I was just there standing on my lightless porch. Yeah, my mom forgot to turn on the front porch light there before she left. So, standing there, I didn't really want to go inside. What to do? Well, at least she left the living room light on, I told myself. I unlocked the door and slowly walked in. The hallway was dark, not one single light on in the entire house. Only in the living room was the light and TV on. For a few seconds while shutting and locking the door, I stared into the dark hallway, hoping not to see anything. The kitchen was dark and had an eerie look to it, with the moonlight just barely shining into the window above the sink. I quickly ran into the living room. I sat on the couch and reached for the phone call to call my mom. But I then realized that the number list was hanging near the phone in the kitchen. There was no way in hell I was going into the kitchen. So I sat there, watching TV for a while. After a few minutes, I heard some music playing. I did not know where this was coming from, but I did know that it was coming from down the hallway near the bedrooms. My heart jumped and then stopped. At least it felt that way. Getting up from the couch, I walked towards the entrance and peeked around the corner. The music was playing louder. All I could see was darkness coming at me from all corners of the house. I decided to walk down the dark hall towards the sounds. I was trying to be the tough guy. The closer I went into the hallway... I could start getting a sense of where it was coming from. It was coming from the bathroom. When I got to the bathroom, I reached in and turned on the light before walking in. The radio was on, and it was on the sink. I thought to myself, maybe it was on the whole time and I just now heard it. I began to turn it off when I looked down and saw the cord unplugged from the wall and at that instant, I ran out of the bathroom and up the hallway towards the front door. As I passed my mom's room, her door opened slowly, but I was running too fast to really notice. It seemed like an eternity unlocking the locks. I felt like I was going to go into shock. I got the last lock undone when I heard a moan coming from the kitchen. I opened the door got out, then shut slammed it behind me. I ran to the road with nowhere to go. I was 15, but still wanted to cry. I was home alone, 
in a haunted house, and my mom was a mile away. I stood there with my hands on my hips, trying to catch my breath. It took me a few minutes to get my thoughts together. I convinced myself that I was overreacting. The radio must have had batteries in it. I walked back up to the porch and sat on the steps. I sat there waiting, and waiting, and waiting. I was laying down on my back after a few minutes. Then I hear this noise coming from inside the house. It sounded like someone was walking with a pair of flip-flops on. The sound was coming closer and closer to the door. I stood up and backed away from the porch. It got closer all the while getting louder and faster. Then it stopped. I couldn't do this anymore, I thought to myself. I turned around and headed back towards the road now with a few tears in my eyes. But to my relief, my mom was coming up the driveway. I ran to the car, and everyone steps out. What's the matter? My mom asked me after seeing my face and how distraught I was. I hate it here, Mom. That's all I could say before my older sister screams out and walks back to the car in shock with her hand covering up one side of her face to not look in the direction of the house. Her eyes were wide open and her crying was held back. What happened? My mom then asked her. I will never forget what she told me she told us she saw. She said that she saw three faces looking out of the bedroom window at us. She described them as melted together and had these angry frowns with the eyes missing. My mom believed her. I then told her what I had experienced, and after that, we ended up staying at my uncle's that night. The next morning, we were very nervous about going home. My older sister never came back. She stayed with family until we moved out. My youngest brother and sister didn't know about anything, and I didn't want to leave them or my mom alone, so I went home to watch over them. We ended up moving out a little after that. We had to move in with family until we could get another place. I believe that it was something that was trying to get me that night. Some evil strong force that forced its way into this world and did everything it could to get closer to me. I believe it used the music to lure me in to where it was hiding in the kitchen. If I would have stayed in that house that night, I might have become possessed or something. My sister is still traumatized from that image of these faces that looked entwined together. I also later found out that my mom had experienced a negative presence in the house and had seen quite a few things, but kept her mouth shut to not worry or scare us. Thanks for reading, and hope to hear from some of you soon. P.S. The radio did have five batteries in it, but it needed six to work with it being unplugged. Old House Ghost This happened just last month. A few days of terror for my family and me. We were house-sitting for my mom while she went downstate for a short vacation. She told us that we could take her master bedroom because it was bigger and we could sleep with our three kids in there with us. We told her okay, but ended up not doing it because of the fact that it was her room and we didn't want the kids breaking anything. So we decided to take another room that was almost as big and already had a king size bed and a baby bed for my youngest child. My mom's house is sorta old and was previously owned by my sister and her abusive husband. So this place has some bad vibes for so many years. My sister always said that she thought he put some bad curses or something in the house because of things she would see and how angry her husband would get out of the blue. Anyway, 
The room that we chose was always scary because my wife and I had experienced something strange in it during one Christmas about five years ago, but it already had everything and was very comfortable. That first night, we went to bed sort of late due to the kids being excited about staying the night at grandma's. So around 11 o'clock, we tucked the kids in, shut the lights off. After they got to sleep, my wife and I sat on the floor near the bed and talked for a while. The room is near the kitchen, so when the light is on, we can see it under the door. Like that night, because of the lights in the room being off, we can easily see the light. After a while, my wife looks over at the door and asks, Doesn't that look like someone is standing at the door? I looked over and saw what she was talking about, so I replied, Yes, but you know it's not. I was thinking maybe it was the uneven carpet that was making it look that way. So, after a while of talking, we ended up getting up and stretching before going to the restroom that was also in the room. We got out quietly to not wake up the kids and began to put on our night clothes, or at least try to because it was too dark to see everything at 100% but we could see a little. A few minutes later, and my wife was dressed and already laying down next to the kids. I was still looking for a shirt to wear, but couldn't find one that I had packed in my bag. So I went to the closet that I had some clothes put away already. Trying not to stumble over toys, I get to my shirts and begin to look for one. Just then, with the little bit of light from the room, I see something on the corner of my eye next to me. I turn my head and try to adjust my eyes. Seconds later, I see a form of a man standing facing me with his head down, so all I could see was the top of his head. It looked like black hair, and it didn't have a shirt on. I could not move. The arms of the thing hung down to its sides, and the legs were partially spread apart. It almost looked like it was in a defense stance like it was going to charge at me, but I did not move. I was in shock. Not too long after I began to realize that the figure looked like me, as if I was looking in a mirror. I came to my senses and turned slowly towards the bed, at the same time looking at the bedroom door and seeing that the shadows that looked like a person standing there were gone. I went to my wife like a scared child and said, There is someone in the room. She jumped up and turned on the light. There was nothing there. The bedroom door was locked from the inside and the kids were still asleep. I was shaking up after I explained to her what I saw. I decided to stay up the rest of the night to watch over my family. The next morning, I was trying to understand what I saw, and make a logical explanation of the events. But being me and believing in the supernatural, I was finding myself backed up into a corner about it. We could have packed our things and gone to another room, but for some stupid reason, we decided to stay. The next night, nothing happened. I was the last one to fall asleep, but only because I dozed off on the chair that was already in here. I slept like a baby. The third night, my wife and I were woken up by something that we heard in the kitchen. It almost sounded like whispering, but we could not make it out until we put our ears to the door. Like I said before, the room was next to the kitchen. We stood there, listening in the dark for a second, before we both agreed that it did sound like someone was talking in a low voice. My wife was freaking out at this point and turned to the bed to grab her phone. I asked what she was doing and she told me she was going to call the police because we thought there was someone in the house. I went after her to calm her down before the whispering stopped. I went to the bathroom to turn on the light so we had enough to see without waking up the kids. Then we put our ears back to the door. We heard nothing. 
being in the room with no type of weapon or anything to go out there with to check out what it was, we ended up calling the police. I was trying to be tough about going out there, but I was also scared as hell. The cops got there a little while later and scoped out the place. The windows were all locked, and all of the doors that led outside were also locked. After the cops had left, I called my mom and told her what we had experienced so far while staying there. She wanted to come back home, but I told her to finish her vacation. I didn't want to be the reason for her vacation to be cut short. That was stupid of me. The fourth night, we did decide to stay in her room this night, to be away from the other one and the kitchen. It felt more relaxing in there because it was so empty, and it was brighter with the moon hitting the windows. We fell asleep once again. At around 3.30, my wife wakes me up and tells me that something was on the other side of the bedroom door. My heart stops right then. Just hearing those words coming out of her mouth made me want to die. When I got brave, I asked her what she heard, and she said, It sounds like the doorknob trying to turn. I woke up the kids this time thinking someone actually broke in. For a few minutes, we sat quietly, waiting to hear what we thought would have been people walking around. If they did get in, the house is so old, so it has a lot of old boards that squeaked when you stepped on them. Nothing happened. We eventually fell back to sleep. I mean, it could have been her imagination playing tricks on her, right? Of course, that's what I definitely would like to think of it as. But I guess it wasn't at all. The next morning was great, because we knew that we could leave the next morning. We left the house all day and went out to eat. We got home late and decided to try to get the kids to bed by 10.30. We fell asleep with no hassle. It was around 1 in the morning when my oldest daughter shook me awake. She was sitting up in bed. When I looked over at her, I asked her what she was doing, and without being afraid or hesitant, and with the motion of her hand and finger, she pointed in a direction and says, Do you see her? I asked what she was talking about. She then says, Look, she's standing right there. She was pointing by the TV that was at the corner of the room. The moon was the only thing giving us light in the room, so I really could not make out what she was looking at. I first thought she was asleep, and to this day, I just think she was talking in her sleep. But I looked at her and said, What are you talking about? Get some sleep. I tried to lay her back down, hoping I didn't have to rock her back to sleep. But as I put my hand on her shoulder, she says, Look, she's walking over here. All the while, pointing with her finger, bringing it closer and closer to the bed. I got the chills when she was doing that. I didn't want to look. Right then, my daughter screams at the top of her lungs in terror. The rest of the family jumps awake. We turn on the light, and my daughter is trying to move closer and closer to us, saying that she went under the bed, saying that over and over. We just got up and got our things together after that. I called my mom and told her that we were just going to leave because of the kids being afraid. I think she knew what was up because we had always had problems with the house. Like I said before, there was a lot of hate in the home from years past with my sister's abusive husband. So with all of the negative energy, I think it just built up to the point of chaos between our world and whatever the other world is that is bringing all of this. We haven't been back to visit since then. It's been a few weeks already, but I know we will try. Thanks for reading. Another creepy thing that just won't escape me.
A ghost, perhaps? A few months ago, my wife and kids and I were staying the night at my mother's house. In a room that was added on later, after building it, my mom was renting this house from this couple. This room was always kind of freaky. On one night, my wife said she saw this cylinder-shaped object floating in the room towards the door. I thought that was strange, but nothing compared to what she saw next. On the night that we last stayed there, my wife, my two little girls, and I were sleeping on a king-sized bed. I was also asleep. So was my oldest daughter. My wife is sitting up in bed, rocking my other little one in her arms. She swears she was still awake, but kind of dozing off, with nothing but the light of the computer modem, not the monitor. Only gave little light in the room, enough to make out the shapes of the objects in the room. Also, everyone else in the house was asleep, so no sound other than the buzzing. The bed was in the corner of the room. She was sleeping near the wall, and I was on the outside of the bed. She said she looked in my area and saw something kind of moving, like the very top of someone's head, more like a child in the crawling position. She told me later that it was moving really slow down the side of the bed. She was so scared. She double-checked to see if it wasn't either of the girls that may have gotten up to play or something. They both aren't scared of the dark. They were both asleep. Slowly, it kept crawling towards the foot of the bed until it got to the corner. When it got there, she told me that it poked its head up just enough to see the black of the eyes. But without hesitating, it ducked back down the turned corner, crawling a little faster towards my wife. She told me that she lied down as fast as she could, thinking it saw her. But again, she swears that she was awake. She shook me and whispered my name over and over until I woke up. He sat up quick and asked what was wrong. She told me, but I didn't want to see anything either. And I admit, I was freaked out too. All of the strange experiences that I have had all my life from a kid to a grown man sort of gotten my nerves all crazy. That is the event that happened that night. My mom no longer lives in that house. The bathroom in that house always scared me. When I would take showers there, my face would get numb all the way down to my arms. Thanks again for reading. I'm an Ohio State Police Patrolman, and on July 23rd, 2009, I was on patrol in Clark County. I was on my way to the Clark County OSP barracks to deliver paperwork on a case that was continued from Union County. While en route, everything flashed on my unit, and my car stalled, but I was able to coast to a farmhouse on this county road I was traveling on. I coasted my unit into the driveway and saw an elderly gentleman walking out by the barn. He looked my way but continued into the barn. I tried to get my unit started, but it was completely dead. After trying to reach dispatch on the radio with no luck, I noticed a high-powered pole transmission line adjacent to the property. I knew my handheld was useless, unless I got far enough away. So I opted to try to use the farmer's phone since I couldn't get a cell phone signal either. I walked out to the barn where the old man had entered and hollered hello. As I was opening what appeared to be the door to the milk parlor, looking in, I again hollered hello, a little louder than before. Not hearing anything, I turned to walk to the house to see if maybe I had missed him. But as I turned around, he was standing behind me, which, I'll admit, startled me a little. The man had no expression on his face. 
when he asked if I was having car trouble, to which I replied, yes, and asked to borrow his phone. He pointed towards the house and told me we could walk there or use the milk parlor if I wasn't going to be long because he was getting ready to milk and asked me if I wanted some water while I waited. I said yes and thanked him and then proceeded to tell him that the parlor would suffice. I followed him into the barn and he walked out through the barn while I used his phone. I told dispatch where I was and to dispatch a wrecker and was told they would have a wrecker out in under 60 minutes. As I hung the phone up, the farmer was coming out, wiping his hands on a grease rag where he said he was working on the pump motor for the milking machine. I told him what dispatch had said, to which he said, let him push my car to the road so they will find it. I told him if it wasn't in the way, they could grab it there, to which he replied, nay, they never look in the driveway, so we best push it to the road. He told me I could set my glass on the picnic table, then to get in and steer and he would push. Since it was on a downhill slope, he pushed it fairly easily. Once on the edge of the road, I sat with my cruiser until the tow truck shows. The driver gets out of the truck and is looking up at the farm, all nervous, and says, We need to hurry and get out of here. I assured him all was okay. When we arrived at the barracks garage, everyone was standing around outside. Everyone acted concerned about my well-being, asked how my adventure went at the farm. I said it went fine. Well, did you talk to the old farmer? Everyone wanted to know. I said he didn't chat very much, and he helped me push my unit to the street. Everyone went and looked at the patrol car, now released from the wrecker. I said, what's the big deal? The... Wrecker driver looked at me and said, You don't know? I said, No. So he told me that in the early 70s, a farmer shot himself in the milk parlor of that old farm, and nobody has lived there since mid-80s due to it being haunted. I said, No way. An officer told me to jump in his patrol car, and we'll drive out there. Long story short, it was a run-down, abandoned farm with dust and cobwebs everywhere and not a living soul anywhere. I had him pull into the driveway, and there sitting on the table was my glass where he had told me to set it. I walked to the barn, and the milk house was covered in dust. But oddly enough, the phone had fresh prints like it had been used, I picked the phone off of the cradle and no dial tone whatsoever, which really startled me and I said, we can go now. But he being a paranormal hunter on the side was full of questions. When we arrived back at the barracks, my car was repaired. It turned out the positive cable came off of the starter and where the old man pushed my car were greasy handprints. I have driven back there, and the house is gone. Apparently, someone torched it, but to this day, it still gives me the heebie-jeebies. My grandpa is 73 years old, and one thing I would know about him is that he would never tell a lie. My grandpa's grandpa owned a farm in South Dakota, where he is from. And just a little ways from his farm was a bar. And you had to walk about a mile on a dirt path to get there. Now, in my grandpa's time, teenagers, my grandpa was, at the time, 15, could go into a small town bar at any time, whenever they wanted, because they needed the business. So, at about 9 p.m., in the middle of the summertime, my grandpa and his brother, Warren, went out to the bar to shoot pool. They did not have a drop of alcohol, and once they were done, it was about 11.30 p.m. 
They were walking slowly. Warren was on crutches. And talking to each other, when Warren noticed something, they noticed a tall, black figure walking and stepping when they stepped. Parallel to my grandpa's feet. My grandpa threw some rocks at it, but nothing happened. As it seemed, the rocks would go right through this figure. My grandpa, scared, ran as fast as he could, but forgot Warren behind him, and the figure disappeared. They hurried to their grandpa's farm, going as fast as they could, and eventually got there around 12.30 a.m. Now, this is where it gets really eerie. When my grandpa got into the house, he locked the door behind him, but as they were trying to imagine what was that thing, something was tugging on the door. Their grandpa, fast as wind, went to the door with a gun in his hand, but as he opened the door, nothing was there. Tomorrow morning, they found small footprints exactly where my grandpa saw this figure, which is abnormal for how tall this thing was. Oddly enough, there wasn't any footprints next or in front of the house. Their house was in the middle of nowhere. There was not anyone at the bar except the manager, who was short and was there when they left, and, of course, themselves. And that was the only thing in circumference to the farm. It was an extremely low chance that a human could have been there that fateful night. I have always been a skeptic when it comes to believing in ghosts, spirits, and the paranormal. Raised in a family of doctors and scientists, such ideas were never encouraged at our home. I am currently living in Mumbai, working for a large corporate firm, and my parents live in Bangalore. Of course, this is all located in India, which I live. A couple of months back, I took a two-week leave to visit my grandmother, who has not been well and lives in a village in a mud house. She just refuses to come to Bangalore to stay with my parents. The urban air stifles her completely. It was June and hot, the typical Indian summer. That particular night, it was a full moon and exceptionally quiet. 7 p.m., and the entire village was already tucked into their homes, with not a soul in the streets. My childhood friend, who lives in the same village, had come over to see me. We were talking about how the grass is always greener on the other side. She's married with a baby and me, a single-career woman who lives alone in the big city. Somehow, we fell into talking about spirits and ghosts. She narrated a legend of the ghost of two lovers having been taken place about 70 years ago. India was in the middle of turmoil, fighting for independence from the British. My grandmother's village, however, was, and still is, largely unaffected by changes happening outside its borders. Although cell phones and computers can be found now, Thank God for that. The village is predominantly inhabited by people of a certain community. Only the fringes housed believers of other faiths. It so happened that around the year of 1942, the rich headman's teenage daughter fell in love, madly and passionately, with a young farmer boy of another faith. The boy, too, reciprocated her feelings, but was too scared to take any step for the sake of the both of them. In India, interreligious marriage was, and frankly still is, taboo. Still, for the sake of their love, they decided to elope to the city and be together. Unlucky as it was, they were intercepted at the train station by the girl's brothers and brought back. 
The girl was locked up and forcibly married off to an old man, while the boy was beaten to death and his body left in the rice fields to rot. Having got the news of her lover's death, the girl hung herself in her bedroom and vowed to return every full moon with her beloved haunt the village. From that year onwards, every full moon night, the spirits of the young lovers are seen holding hands and roaming in the rice fields. Once my friend narrated this story to me, I burst out laughing, pretty sure that if the lovers are still seen, it is the only handiwork of people alive who want to keep the legend going. She seemed offended by my outburst and challenged me to visit the fields that night. It was coincidentally a full moon. Initially refusing, I agreed later. Sharp at midnight, we took off. We had no lights. She insisted that it was for our own safety. As we left the village and walked towards the rice fields, I could feel a heavy air descend on me. I don't know if she too felt it or not, but we didn't talk about it anyway. Before we reach the rice fields, we encounter sugarcane fields. The grown sugar canes were taller than me. Walking through them has the same sounds as someone walking over dried leaves. I could see my friend walking beside me, but I felt there was someone behind us as well. When I signaled the same to her with my fingers, she just asked me to be quiet and move on. Soon after we were in the rice fields, it was 12, 38 a.m., and we waited. Another 15 minutes and still nothing. Bored, I signaled to her that it's time to get back. What happened next, I will never forget. I can vouch what I saw was real and not my imagination. You have to believe it coming from someone who was a non-believer. I felt a chill within my body and two white smoke like silhouettes. One, a girl, the other, a boy, holding hands, appeared in front of my eyes. It was like they were walking on their own way and I happened to be walking in front of them, rather them following us. They walked on and through my body, hence the eerie chill, and moved ahead to the rice fields, very much in love. I was stunned into silence and was mesmerized to see the smoke silhouettes gliding around the fields. I knew what I saw was no human, who was just trying to keep the legend alive. My friend showed me her watch. It was 2.30 a.m. We walked back in silence. I left for the city the next afternoon, having mentioned nothing to my grandmother. But as I left the village, I could swear that I had a nasty feeling, as if I am leaving someone behind. It's been more than a year now, and believe it or not, I want to go back and see them again. Thanks for reading. I've lived in the same town all my life. It's small and in the middle of the countryside, south of England. Around two years ago, me and a friend of mine called Lisa decided to go for a walk to this place we called the cow fields. To get to the cow fields, you have to go down a long, thin road that hasn't been used for years, surrounded by trees either side. The reason we go there is because of how beautiful it is with all the rolling hills and streams. When we got to the fields, it was around 3.30 p.m. in the winter, we had about two hours of light left to explore around there. We sat on a small hill that has a stream to the right, and it curves round in front of you where there is a bridge to some fields to 
get back to the roads. I was looking over to the trees behind the stream in front, talking to Lisa and having a smoke. When I saw a figure, he was holding on to the trees, swaying back and forth in the wind with them, but it was more jaggedy. I didn't say anything to Lisa because I thought it was just my imagination, but it wasn't like I looked over and he disappeared. He was in the trees always, never left my sight. He'd sometimes move from tree to tree, hunched over and limping as he walked. It was quite far away, but I could still make out that he was wearing some kind of cap. It just looked like the shadow of a man. I noticed Lisa was looking over in that direction. I was panicking, but due to my mental health history, I didn't put it past just a lapse in my recovery. Lisa seemed to quiet down and started staring over in that direction. That's when I suggested we left. I wasn't sure what would happen as we had to walk towards the figure to leave the fields. Both me and Lisa were hesitant. As we walked towards the bridge, the figure faded away. I was now 100% sure it was just me, and I had been making myself, thinking Lisa had seen something, when in reality, she was just looking at the trees and daydreaming. We walked through the remainder of the fields and got back to the road. As soon as we stopped on the road, I saw faces. I don't know how to explain it, but they were in the trees next to me. It looked as if someone had taken a picture with a slow exposure time as someone turned their head. But they were all moving, so blurred and gray with their mouths gaping open. That was the last straw for me. I turned to Lisa, who was frantically looking side to side. I could not not say anything. I remember just thinking and talking so fast, like it burst out of me. I said, Are you seeing this? Without saying anything, she started sprinting down the road. I followed. She was in front of me by far. I looked behind me, and I saw the figure from the trees standing around 15 meters away from me. I ran faster. I turned around again a minute later, and there was nothing there. I slowed down because I just couldn't keep that pace up. I saw Lisa frantically looking at me over her shoulder. I looked behind me again, and the figure was there. He was probably around four meters behind me this time, just standing there whilst I ran further away. I didn't want to look back again because I feared how close he would be. I kept running when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Whatever was standing behind me now was now running next to me through the trees. I could see the cap on his head. The strange thing was, I couldn't see him if there was a gap in the trees. Only when it was close to the trees. I finally got to the end of the road, and we were under a lamplight when we had started running. It was only just starting to get dark. Within about three minutes, it was almost pitch black. Before I had a chance to tell Lisa what I had just seen, she was crying hysterically, saying, It was right behind you. He was standing right behind you. She also started talking about the faces and the man in the hat. I don't know what we saw, but I have never gone back to those fields. This is only the second telling of this tale in almost 40 years. In 1973, at the ever-observant age of four, 
I had my first brush with the paranormal. On a hazy autumn morning, my mother unexpectedly interrupted my routine when she dressed me in new going somewhere clothes. She explained to me that we were to attend a wake that day. Even at that young age, I knew that a wake had something to do with death. Furthermore, I could sense her discomfort, so I did not ask her any questions. She did add that it was not for a relative of ours, but of our friend, Geraldine. As our taxi pulled into the funeral home, Geraldine greeted us and accompanied in to meet the family. Unlike my mother, I knew no one there and felt a little intimidated, so I was relieved when Mom asked Geraldine to stay with me as she went into the viewing parlor to pay her respects. Geraldine sat with me in the lobby as family members conversed in small groups. I looked around, hoping to see any children that might be there. There were none. But I couldn't help noticing one person in particular, an older gent, probably in his late 50s, was listening in on a conversation extremely intently. He was a little gaunt and seemed to be very worried. He stood there with his hand on his cheek, shoulder to shoulder with one of the mourners. I watched as he left this group to listen in on another and then another, looking a little more pained each time. No one even so much as looked at him. Interesting. I remember wondering, with my innocent and limited grasp of the concept of mortality, if he was the man we were here to see. With that, the man turned and looked directly at me. He looked at me inquisitively and then offered up a meek smile. My eyes widened and I turned my gaze away. My heart racing, I could not resist looking back once more as I tugged on Geraldine's blouse. I successfully got her attention, but to my dismay, he could no longer be found. It was just then when my mother made her way back to us asking if I was ready to go home. I was more than willing. She thanked me for being a big boy and behaving so well while she was gone. I have always known that the situation could be rationalized as one not of a paranormal nature, but the feeling I experienced were so intense that no rational explanation ever has ever seemed to satisfy. Why would no one acknowledge him, and it seemed that he only saw me after I wondered if he were dead? I scanned the room thoroughly for him as we left to no avail, whereas I easily noticed the strange man before. To this very day, I've never been able to shake the eerie suspicion that I witnessed a ghost at his own wake. What do you think? It started when my boyfriend's father bought the funeral home and wanted my boyfriend and me to move out of state to take care of it because his parents didn't want to move out of state. I quit my job and moved out of state with my boyfriend to help his parents take care of the funeral home. When my boyfriend and I first got to the funeral home, it was big, spacious, and a bit creepy. The outside was beautiful as well as the inside, but the place had many doors, all of which eventually led back to the main room. My boyfriend often sees dark figures mostly on this one side, near the side door that leads to the apartment on top of the funeral home. Of course, no one lives on top of the funeral home. Too scary. I've never seen anything the whole time I've been there, but one time I was going to use the fax and computer to look for a job. Being the weirdo that I am, I went to the funeral home alone. I went to the back door and the back door was unlocked, so I went inside, turned on the lights, and went to the office. I was faxing my resumes and surfing the web for jobs when all of a sudden the computer just shuts off, figure it's time to leave. I didn't feel anything and wasn't scared until I got close to the back door. Somehow, my body was telling me to run. It got cold in the little hallway by the back door, and I felt goosebumps all over my body. I ran towards the door, not looking back, just opened the door and closed it and locked it from the outside. Ever since, I've never gone back to the funeral home alone. My boyfriend's uncle had a similar experience at the funeral home. He came to the funeral home to help my boyfriend cut the grass and rake the leaves. He got there before my boyfriend and thought my boyfriend was inside. So, he went to that same back door that I went to and found it unlocked. 
He thought my boyfriend was in there and walked into the same spot where I felt something. He said he called my boyfriend's name and it was dark inside and no lights. He got super scared when he realized no one was there. He ended up leaving and ever since then, my boyfriend's uncle won't go into the funeral home by himself. If he has to go shovel snow, cut the grass, or rake the leaves, he would bring his own lawnmower or his own shovel. My boyfriend has had many experiences at that funeral home and the scariest experience yet. When the funeral is done and everyone leaves, my boyfriend and I would make sure that the doors are all locked before we leave. There are days when we come in to get the mail and the side door and that back door would be unlocked. We always thought that maybe someone broke in and even went inside to check, but would never find anyone. My boyfriend said one time he opened the funeral for a family to bring things to the funeral and when he locked up all the doors were locked. He said he went to the side door and somehow it was unlocked. He said hello and someone with a male voice answered him back saying hello to him too. He got really freaked out and wouldn't go back inside. When I got off work, he made me go with him to search the place and like always, we would never find anyone. No matter how many times we lock the side and back door, next time we come back, it would be unlocked. Then a couple days after that door incident with my boyfriend, he said while we were sleeping in bed, he swears he saw a tall figure walked around our bed and came to his side and got on top of him. He said he tried to scream for me to wake up, but I couldn't hear him. When he finally broke free, he woke me up and he was drooling all over his pillow. He was so scared that we slept with the bedroom door closed and we both prayed before bed and put crosses up around the house and inside our room. Three weeks later, he drove out of state to see his parents and his mom took him to see a shaman lady. She said that a female ghost from the funeral liked him a lot. It was the female ghost that answered him, disguising her voice as the male voice that answered by him, and she was the one that followed him home. The shaman lady told my boyfriend that she told the spirit to leave, and everything should be fine now. I was home alone in our apartment when my boyfriend went out of state. The night my boyfriend left, I had rolled over to his side, and I could have sworn something was on top of me, because I looked at the alarm clock, and I could swear I was up but somehow still asleep too. I remember hearing myself pray and sing a Christian song in my head. I woke up singing the Christian song out loud and only two minutes had passed. I wasn't scared or anything. I just prayed and then thought it was a dream and went back to bed. The next day, late at night, my boyfriend told me what the shaman lady said, which creeped me out. After that, we haven't had any experiences with the funeral home. We had alarms put in the funeral home because the doors kept unlocking by themselves, and we put a bolt on the side door, so even if it unlocks, no one can get in. I doubt anyone would want to come in. I was so glad when his parents decided to sell the funeral home. I can't see ghosts, but my boyfriend seems to attract them, and he can see them. I will have to write about our apartment that we live in now in my next story. Hopefully, I'll have it up before we move out in September. Although I've had many experiences with the supernatural, I'm going to start with the most recent and go from there. To give you some background, I work in a funeral home as an administrative assistant in Kirtland, New Mexico. I know, I know, a funeral home, but I'm perfectly comfortable there. I've been alone in there on a number of occasions while the directors are off on a service, which is when I notice things more often than not. The main reason for this is I think is because when the building is empty of others, it is usually quiet, except for the music that is a constant during the day. But when there are others there, there's a lot of talking and conversing going on, which tends to block out the sounds of anything spiritual going on. My office sits at the front of the building to the left of the front entryway, with the bathrooms on the other side of my office as well as the door to the prep room. The arrangement room door is catty corner to my office door in the same hallway, with the chapel to the right of the entrance and two more offices in the break room behind that. 
The funeral home used to be a private residence and then was a church before it finally became a funeral home. I'm not exactly sure how long the building has been there, but plan on doing some research on it when I have the time to do so without interruption. My first time alone in the building was probably about three weeks ago. During my first week there, Jess and Brian, I'm not using real names for obvious reasons, had to travel to another city for the services that day, so I was left to the man the fort, so to speak, from 8 a.m. until they returned at around 3 p.m. that afternoon. The first thing to happen was the sound of the front door opening and closing, including the little dinger going off, so I jumped up from the company computer, where I was working on some folders and books for a family, to go greet whoever it was that just came through the front door, only to find no one in the foyer. I shrugged it off as my imagination and went back into the office to continue with my work. As the minutes passed, I had forgotten all about the odd sounds of the front door and the dinger going off, and was deep into my work at that time, concentrating hard. By this time, it was about 10.45 a.m. I had been there for a couple of hours alone already and was doing just fine. Like I said, I don't get an uncomfortable feeling in there when I heard someone walking through the building from behind me. So I, once again, left the computer where I was working to go see if someone came in, and I missed hearing the dinger to the door going off. I started checking the rooms in front of the building, making a complete circle to the back and around to see the front of the building again, to find no one there. All I could think at this point was, it has got to be my imagination. And so, I went back to my office to resume working again. About 10 minutes or so had passed by at the time, so it was probably about 11 a.m. This time, when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to look, and no one was there yet again. So I said out loud, Hello? Can I help you with something? Are you just curious about me because I'm new here? Or are you wondering if I can tell that you're here? I didn't get an answer much, as I would have liked one, just to know for sure that I wasn't losing it. The activity stopped after that, for the rest of the day anyway. Whoever or whatever is there in that building isn't harmful, or I would have felt very uncomfortable there alone, I'm sure. I've talked to Jess about it, which has been there for three years now, and she admits that she has had some experiences there as well, but never anything harmful, just more curious than anything. We do have some remains of an unclaimed person in our garage that we can't do anything with, so his remains stay there, but neither Jess or I know if it is actually him that is there, or if it's previous owners of the building. Whenever I enter the building, if no one's in the front entryway or close by, I always say hello Teddy, just in case it is, in fact, the one who is in our garage. If it's not him, I'm sure that eventually whoever it is will let me know in some way, hey, that's not me, I am so and so, and I will change my new habits. Until then, I like to think it's Teddy and he is just looking for acknowledgement to the fact that he is who he is. I do realize this could be my imagination, or even what could be chalked up to nervousness of being alone in a funeral home. However, I myself do not believe this is the case since I have never felt uncomfortable there since my beginning. Thank you all for the chance to submit my story, and comments are welcome as long as they aren't derogatory. These events happened in 1985. Not sure if it was before or after my other story, Night Demon or Nightmare, but it was in the same year and does relate to it. One night, as my previous girlfriend and I were sleeping in our room, I found myself on the ceiling and out of body experience, looking down at myself and my ex-partner. We were both laying on our back. My arm was extended out under her, and her head was slightly tilted resting on my shoulder, and our heads gently conjunctured at the same point. I'll probably never get around to writing about my dream, but if I had to rate my own psychic ability, my dreams are the strongest aspect of them. The reason I say this is whilst I was on the ceiling, I was wondering if spiritually I could somehow enter my girlfriend's subconscious or dream and communicate to her as other spirits have done with me in my dreams over the years. Just like my other story, Demon or Nightmare, when I grab my wife's foot from a 
OBE state, looking for validation. I was attempting something similar, but with much more complexity. Something, by the way, that can't be done from this plane, but at the same time, I thought I'd give it a go. I'm sure most of you reading this story are probably glad you're not married to me. I understand. But it wasn't premeditated, more of a on the spur of the moment, if that makes any sense. As I started to descend from the ceiling, I was heading in the direction of my ex-partner. Just at that point of landing on her, once again, no idea what I was trying to do. She physically jumped with a moan of discomfort, which woke up me instantly, just in time to physically hear and feel myself. The last part of her discomfort, I know it was wrong, but if I'm to be honest when sharing my experiences, it serves a better purpose to tell you the whole truth about them. If you believe in karma, then this next experience may be just what it was. My ex-partner tragically lost her then-boyfriend in a car accident about 12 months prior to our relationship. I have no doubt he was hanging around her, and from all reports, he was an alright type of guy, although somewhat of the jealous type. This one night, and it was after my out-of-body experience previously explained, I was laying in bed, awake this time. My ex-partner was asleep, both of us in a similar position as mentioned before, when all of a sudden, something jumped straight into my body. I've had quite a few encounters over the years with the paranormal, but this was the most threatening and invasive of them all. An awkward, compressed, chilling feeling. I remember thinking, no you don't. Whatever it was, it was trying to occupy my body. It lasted about 15 to 20 seconds, and when it left, a few curse words flew with whatever or whoever it was. I don't know if he was trying to possess my body or whether it was payback for my previous out-of-body experience. Not sure. I think it was him. Although I can't rule out something else related to my previous story. One other thing. Although I never saw him, my ex-partner did. One night, when I was out of town, she saw him standing at the end of the bed. It gave her a fright from memory. This experience was over 25 years ago, and I'm at a point in my life now where I can look back at it and others to try and rationalize possible causes. Maybe I deserved it, karma, for attempting something I shouldn't have. I should also mention I've never taken any type of drugs, recreational or prescription, that could create this type of illusion. Out of all my experiences, this was an undeniably real event. I would only be too happy to boil it down to my imagination. If that were the case, I'll accept any criticism if you do think it's karma. This is passed on to me by my mother. She never lies, and this story haunts me. Back where she lived, it was a rural one. Greens everywhere, wildlife. I've always had a weird feeling, or always uneasy feeling inside the house I lived in. It was an old rickety house, made by the local people around the area. I've no idea how old the house is, but it's old. Well, back when my mom was a kid, she and her cousin were best friends, lived in the same house. My auntie is the most happiest, most energetic, beautiful woman. She is the type of woman that would befriend anyone. In the middle of the night, my mom woke up to pee. The house is always full of people, but this night, she was alone for the first time. There she went up the stairs, to the washroom, and my auntie was sitting on the toilet. In her hand was a knife, and she was carving the sink in a circular motion. My mom said she was very scared and frightened at the moment. My auntie then said, I'm very tired. She sounded hoarse like a man. My mom then ran out of the house calling everybody. She had to go out and run a couple of blocks of forest to find the nearest house. The story is not told fully. She said she came back to the house and the men of the house went upstairs and took a hold of her. My mom heard thrashing, shouting, and grunting. Fast forward, they went to a spiritual person to help because she apparently was possessed by a traveling lone dwarf and took my auntie as a host because she was always happy, making a lot of friends and very beautiful. The spiritual man then said to bring everyone in the village like it was some sort of ritual dinner or some sort. But the night was prepared, everyone in the village was at the house, and it was nighttime. There was grand food everywhere. I have no idea where my auntie is at the time, but my mom said that they were all grouped together or hugged in front of the house. There, a man spoke, and this is where it gets strange. The lights around them started shutting off and on. Then she heard banging, clashing, growling in the house even. The plates was being destroyed, basically. 
everything in the house as well. After that, my auntie was now fine. Again, my mom never lies about this stuff and would like to get an insight on what possessed auntie. I'm Odessa. I'm 22 from New Hampshire. This experience happened about a month ago, which I label the most scariest encounter of my life. And I don't exactly feel comfortable with sharing this experience with others since there are those out there who are closed-minded to these types of things. This is why I'm using this site as a place to share my experience. I was always open to the belief of spirits, but the ideas of demons and possession always seemed a bit far-fetched to me. That seemed like the kind of thing you could only see in the movies. Well, after this one long night, I look at things from a whole new perspective. Under a year ago, I became friends with Robin and Dan. They're a nice couple, a bit shy and an awkward at times, but whenever I need someone to talk to or a place to go, they're there for me. They had recently took in a new roommate whom they've known for years, Cody. Cody wasn't getting along with his family, so they took him in. When I had slept over, I slept in the same room as him. He sleeps on the floor on a giant mattress, and I sleep on the futon which is almost next to it, but there's a table between us. Robin and Dan sleep in their own room, which is out by the kitchen. The first two nights I slept over, I woke up during the night to hear Cody sleep whispering. It was the eeriest thing. Most of it sounded gibberish and almost like a whole other language. I didn't think much of it other than it was just some strange sounding sleep talk. Although, I had never exactly experienced anyone sound like that before. The second time I experienced it, the next morning, I did mention it to him that he makes a lot of sounds in his sleep, and he just said, oh really, and brushed it off. The third night I spent there was the last night spent with him. This time, a friend of mine was over, Cat. Robin and Dan decided to go to bed early. Cat, Cody, and I stayed up for a little bit, and then all decided to crash on the giant mattress that he usually sleeps on. I sleep on my side, facing away from them. Cat was sleeping in the middle. Throughout the night, I kept hearing the strangest noises. It was occasionally throat-clearing sounds, slight grunts, and slight movement. It took me a second to realize it was Cody's sleep talk that was going on. Again. Before I had realized that, I thought that maybe both Cat and Cody were awake, messing around next to me, which would have been really awkward, by the way. Slightly unsure, I braved myself and rolled over to see Cat sleeping. I poked her and she woke up, and we started discussing the noises coming from Cody next to us. I started giggling in relief when I mentioned that I had thought they were potentially messing around. I realized the more I talked and giggled, the louder the noises were getting from Cody. The sleep whispering started up again. Now, finding the whole aspect of sleep talker is amusing. We came up with the idea of trying to talk to him to see if he would talk back to us in his sleeping state. Biggest mistake ever. This is where it all goes downhill. So, Kat and I were trying to come up with things to say or ask. At first, she started asking him random questions, silly things like, Hey Cody, did you run out of hot dogs? Each time, he twitched a little bit and whispered a little more gibberish sounds. He was reacting to her voice. It started to sound creepy, but still full of innocent laughs of finding it amusing. I said, wow, he sounds like a demon. Cat, you should ask him if he's a demon. The second I ended that sentence, the room went cold instantly. I can't even begin to explain the dark, heavy, cold feeling that filled the room. Cody sat straight up out of his bed. His eyes rolled back into his head, and he started gagging and then snarling. Cat and I, in such a stunned state, ran straight into the bathroom and locked the door. The fear inside me didn't even sink in yet. I wasn't exactly scared yet, just shocked and confused. I kept asking, what just happened? Cody's sleep whispering started to turn into actual sleep talking. The bathroom is across the room, so I couldn't hear everything that was being said or all of the noises coming from him. But the voice I did hear didn't even sound like his, but it was clearly coming from him. It was very deep. It was like there were two different voices talking back and forth in gibberish, another language with occasionally English. I kept hearing him say, they are still in there. Cat was really upset and started to shake and cry. 
I was still in my own personal state of shock and denial. It crossed my mind. Could this be a joke? But there was such a cold, heavy, dark feeling. Unfortunately, I knew it wasn't, but I wanted it to be. Finally, it went quiet. We probably waited in silence for probably a total of 15 minutes while I worked up the courage to open the door and check in on him. Cat whispered that maybe he went back to sleep since I had been quiet for a while. I had an awful feeling in my stomach, but I put my hand on the doorknob and whipped the door open extremely fast. There he was, just sitting straight up on the mattress like he was waiting for me, looking me dead straight in the eyes in the most evil demonic grin. Even though it was dark, it was almost like he had a ghastly glow. He was the only thing that stood out in the room, looking right at me. Instant panic, I slammed the door and locked it again. Now, the fear finally sunk inside of me. I started to get teary-eyed a little bit. I started to pray inside of my head. I was praying for this all to pass over and to be kept safe. He began talking again, started off with those gibberish noises while kind of making a clicking sort of sound, and then the deeper voice came out and said, open the door. Then we heard Cody's normal voice again and it sounded like he's crying and whimpering. He starts to plead for Cat to open the door. Over and over again, he kept saying, Cat, please, open the door. Cat, please. Cat looked at me, and she asked if she would say something back. I told her no. I said, we need to just keep waiting this out. We were in there for such a long time. It must have been about 45 minutes that had passed. Throughout the whole time, I could hear Cody talking that gibberish talk from across the room as usual, but then the bathroom door started to vibrate. This is when I had enough. I knew there were two windows open in the apartment, and Dan and Robin were just a couple rooms away. I decided to scream and bang my fist on the door in hopes to get someone's attention. When I did that, instantly the dark cold feeling went away, and then I heard Cody say, what the fuck? Apparently, when I did that, it somehow snapped him out of his possession. I knew I was safe, but I was still hesitant to come out. We talked back and forth to him a little bit through the door. Then I finally opened the door and went and sat down to talk to him. He said his throat felt dry and that he didn't remember anything that happened. I described detail by detail everything that happened to him, which he then opened up about how he has a spirit named John attached to him. He said John has been with him for about seven years now. He described a couple times where his ex-girlfriend, who he dated for about a year, would be afraid to sleep next to him because she'd hear him having conversations with this John in his sleep. He also explained how his mother is aware of the situation and that his grandfather used to have a spirit attached to him as well. But he assured us that John would never want him to harm anyone. I spoke up in disagreement. I told him what I felt was evil and that I felt like it wanted to either harm or scare us badly. He seemed to start to get annoyed with me, like it offended him that I was hinting that John is actually a demon. But talking it out made everything seem a lot better. I was able to throw out a couple laughs too. I was also just relieved that everything was over. Or so I thought. I started to apologize though, well, it wasn't a direct apology, but I explained that neither of us meant to offend him or John in any sort of way, and that if we had known about this before, then we probably wouldn't have tried to joke around when he was sleeping. The second after I ended my little apology, the room went cold again. Keep in mind, it was a really warm night. Even though there are two tiny windows open, it was a quiet, warm night. I looked down at my legs in shock of the coldness with that awful feeling again, and the second I look up back, I see Cody's eyes roll back again as he falls back onto the bed. Kat and I ran for the door to leave the apartment. I didn't look back, but Kat said she looked back as he watched us leave with that huge demonic grin on his face again. Kat and I were wandering the streets of town, not knowing what to do. It must have been a little after 5 a.m. at the time and we eventually made our way over to Dunkin Donuts to get some coffee. We sat at the table and talked about what we should do. I suggested that since there is a church right up the hill, that we would try to talk to a priest. 
I just wanted some reassurance or advice or even a prayer or anything that would help the situation become better. She looked up a number on her phone and tried to call it. Due to bad service, we couldn't understand what was being said on the other end of the phone. So we decided to walk up to the church. We sat on a bench for a little bit and the priest, who lives right next to the church, came out and invited us inside of his home. We sat on his couch and explained everything we experienced. I felt so relieved though as I explained everything to him because my biggest fear was to explain something and get looked like I'm some kind of nutcase. He listened in belief and explained how a family friend of his had a similar problem but didn't get into too much detail. I told him my fear is that whatever is inside him might try to latch onto us or haunt us and he assured us that it's Cody's own demon and that it's his problem, not ours. He also explained that the situation becomes worse when the person doesn't recognize it as a problem. He said Cody probably views the demon as if it's his friend. I completely agreed with that statement because Cody seemed to get offended when I referred to it as a demon instead of a spirit. The priest also told us that it feeds on fears and that we should just try to keep our faith and strength and we'll be okay. We left his house feeling a little bit better. Kat was a bit more hesitant, but I tried to work up her confidence to head back to the apartment. I told her we were going to carry on a normal conversation right as we walked through the door and as everything is fine, which is exactly what we did. I opened the door to the apartment and Cody was up and awake playing video games. We awkwardly sat down and we were just all quiet. We didn't really know what to say and neither did he. I got on my laptop and Kat got on hers and we were sending messages back and forth quietly. In her message, she told me not to tell Robin and Dan about the situation. When they wake up because if they hear about it, they'll probably kick Cody out and he will be homeless. I debated but agreed not to anyway. She decided to get up and go outside for a smoke. Cody stopped playing his video game and went to his bag and got some clothes and went into the bathroom to take a shower. I was still using my laptop messaging people on Facebook. I could hear Cody making noises while in the shower. It was just slight coughing and that clearing of that throat noise again and I started to get a weird feeling. It wasn't as bad and cold as before but I had a gut feeling that I should just go step outside with Kat. So I did. We were outside for about 15 more minutes and then headed back inside and Cody was out and back to playing video games. Kat goes into the bathroom to use it and she comes out, sits down and messages me from her laptop again. She told me in the message that Cody's pocket knife is just randomly sitting in the sink. That instantly put a sickly awful feeling in my stomach. She turns to Cody and asks if she can step outside and talk to him. He agrees and they head outside. While they were still outside, Robin wakes up and comes out of her room. After the whole pocket knife thing, which I later learned he had no memory of, I completely changed my mind about being quiet about everything. I immediately told Robin about the whole thing, to which she then went and talked to Dan, and then they stepped outside with Kat and Cody. Both Robin and Dan were disturbed by it all, and agreed that they don't want Cody living with them anymore. They suggested for him to sleep at Cassie's house for now until everything gets sorted out. Cassie lives right up the road at an apartment of her own, and she is also an acquaintance of ours. Kat and I decided to spend another night at Robin's and Dan's. Around 11.30pm at night, Cassie starts sending frantic texts about Cody's behavior. Apparently Cody was sitting on her couch, talking to her, and he fell back like he went to sleep, but when he sat back up, his eyes rolled back. But then he snapped out of it and carried on a normal conversation with her. She was really freaked out about it, and we had her come over to talk to us about everything. Out of fear of going back to her own apartment, she decided to sleep over with us. We were all up a good part of the night talking about what to do. We decided that it's best to try to contact Cody's family or mother since she's the one that's supposedly most aware of it all. The next morning, I went home and later heard they did take care of the situation and contacted Cody's mother. Now flash forward, after all of this, I had to cut off all ties and contact with Cody. 
Even though I did value the friendship and memories made with him in the past, I just decided it was best not to talk to him anymore because of everything bad that had happened. I still kept a friendship with everyone else, of course, but sadly, Kat found it hard to do so and continued to keep up a friendship with him up until he broke into her own apartment one night. Unsure what caused him to do so or if he was possessed, she called the police and is currently working on getting a restraining order on him. And this is where my story ends. I'm curious to hear if anyone else has had a similar experience or has heard of a similar experience. Even opinions would be interesting to hear. Another thing I found odd was how no one heard my screams or banging when Kat and I locked ourselves in the bathroom. Like I had mentioned, two windows are open. They live in an apartment building surrounded by other apartments. Dan and Robin were just a couple rooms away and supposedly they are light sleepers. How did no one hear me? I'll get the miscellaneous information out of the way first. My soon-to-be husband and I moved into our current residence approximately one year ago. So as far as I know, there was only one previous family who called this house their home, and nothing sinister has ever taken place on the premise. The house is a newer construct in a quiet residential neighborhood. Though I am not a skeptic, I have never had to deal with anything paranormal. The past couple weeks have definitely been a new experience for me. Two weeks ago, I thought I heard a voice while I was sleeping. Asking my boyfriend if he'd said anything, I got no response. As he was obviously sound asleep, I decided I was dreaming and rolled over towards the closet, which is situated behind my bedroom door, which always remains closed. Though I considered getting up and drinking a glass of water, I stopped moving when I saw a fuzzy white form near the closet door. A sweater that I have hanging there moved as it passed underneath it. Within moments, the shape had disappeared. Confused, but not scared or concerned, I convinced myself I was dreaming and went back to sleep. After that night, I have been consistently waking up between 3am and 4am. Sometimes, it is because of noises. Other times, the room just doesn't feel quite right. Three nights after seeing the fuzzy shape, I woke up to the sound of something falling or someone stumbling. At least that's how it sounded to me. In the same place as the previous sighting, I saw the shape of a tall man. He was shadowy and seemed oddly formed. Slightly frightened at this time, I turned to press my face against my boyfriend's back. He did not wake up at all and urged myself back to sleep. Four nights ago, after continuing the pattern of waking up between 3 and 4 a.m., I was startled awake because the temperature plummeted in my normally hot room. Though it is usually humid enough in the bedroom so that I can't sleep without an industrial fan blowing at full strength, and though it is the middle of summer, the temperature became absolutely frigid. I was shivering and my skin was cold to the touch. Upon opening my eyes, I saw what I assumed was the same man, better form this time, and wearing a grin that set my heart pounding like crazy. Amusing as it is to me now, I jumped up and tried to punch him. He vanished at once. For a long time after, I shivered and my heart raced. I was much more scared this time because even though I actively tried awakening him by poking and speaking to him, my boyfriend did not wake up. Because this is unusual for him, and because it was now the third time he had an awakened to help relieve my fear, the emotion grew until I was ready to cry. I planned to stay awake until the sun rose, but exhaustion eventually wore out over fear and I slept. After that night, I finally talked to a few close friends about the nocturnal happenings. The first person I spoke was with my husband-to-be, who engaged in a long conversation with me about theories, possibilities, and things we could try to do. He was curious about the fact that I said he seemed to be in a deeper sleep than usual when this went on because normally, he will wake up if I leave the bed or say something. I immediately felt better. The conversation loosened a knot of nerves I hadn't been aware of. The next day, 
After having that first talk, I was online at work, talking to a friend on my laptop computer. We were discussing what had been happening, and I told him I was going to start looking up who the man could be, what he wanted, etc. With as little information as I had, however, I wasn't feeling confident I would find anything on him. My friend suggested shadow people, because I implied that the first two times I saw him, he was shadowy and not fully formed. As I was about to reply that third time, he was fully formed and not like a shadow at all. The temperature dropped and my computer keeled over. It was plugged into the wall, no low battery warning came up, and it did not overheat. I keep it propped on a store-bought stand that prevents overheating, and when I touched the bottom, thinking that was the cause, it was cool to the touch. Now I work alone in a small drive through store that is perpetually 5 to 20 degrees warmer than the outside air. Unless I walk into the cooler, it just doesn't get cold in there. I felt like a drop of ice water slid down my spine, and I quickly turned my computer back on. Stand up perfectly, no problems, and locked back on. What disturbed me the most was when I got back into conversation with my friend. The first thing he said was, Sorry for disappearing on you. My computer completely flatlined. Thought it was a power outage at first, but nothing else was affected. It was kind of weird. Yes, and even more weird that the same thing happened to me, thousands of miles away, at the same time. With as unimpressive as these occurrences are, I've been willing to pass them off as dreams, imagination, coincidences. The only things I keep coming back to that convince me, maybe I'm not just imagining things, are the temperature drops in places that are consistently uncomfortably warm, the strangely malfunctioning computers, and the sheer burst of uninhibited terror I felt when he smiled at me. I know that doesn't seem like that should be the biggest thing here, but it is the point I keep coming back to, in my mind and when I speak with any of my friends about it. I almost don't care why he's hanging around, but the intimidating leer of the grinning man haunts my thoughts now, even while I'm awake. This story happened to my mom. It was during the 1960s when she was still sleeping with her brothers and sisters in one house. They have inherited a big house from my grandfather. He was a doctor. So having a couple of her cousins sleeping over is not a problem. Their house was built near a river with a wooden bridge over it. Here's where her story begins. All of them came home late from a party. They were all tired and decided to call it a night and went to their own rooms. My mom was staying with two of her sisters in one room. Her bed was located right besides a big window that's made out of wood and would just open from the middle, then the shutters will just slide from side to side. That night, due to excessive drinking, my mom woke up because she needs to go to the bathroom, so she went and went back to bed. When she was about to doze off, she could feel something or someone was watching her. She opened her eyes and she saw a lady with long black hair outside their window. She was also wearing a black dress, and her eyes were red. The lady was staring at her with a creepy grin on her face. My mom couldn't move. The scary part of it was, my mom's room was located at the second floor. In short, the lady was floating. She tried to call her sisters, but they could not hear her. She felt so scared and just covered herself with her quilt. After a few minutes, she tried to check if the lady was gone, but when she peeped out of her quilt, the lady was still there, staring and grinning at her. We live in a haunted house. It is really not bad once you get used to it. In fact, at times when there's no activity, you can actually get a little lonesome for them. We moved here in 1982. It wasn't long after we settled into our new house that we bumped into the former owner at the local church. She asked us if we had seen the ghost. We didn't know what she was talking about. She said it sometimes appears in the front bedroom, our daughter's room, as a shadowy figure of a woman in a rocking chair. 
Our daughter overheard us talking about it and she said, oh, that must be the lady who sits in the chair at my desk at night. She doesn't bother me, just sits there kind of watching after me. We had noticed some strange things in the house, but put them off to natural causes such as the reoccurring footsteps in the hardwood floors after we went to bed, the strange way the television would turn on and off by itself, other electric appliances doing funny things, and objects disappearing then turning up somewhere else, but we dismissed the idea of it being ghosts until one late night. My wife woke up thirsty in the middle of the night, so she went to the kitchen to get a drink. When she got to the living room, she saw someone in the shadows in the middle of the room. Thinking one of the kids had gotten out of bed, she hollered, get your butt back in bed. The figure streaked off and disappeared. It didn't go around the sofa. It went through the sofa. It didn't walk. It glided. It was the figure of a woman with long black hair. The kids were sound asleep in their beds. My wife came back to bed without her water. My first experience with her was about 10 p.m. one night. I was walking home from next door, and as I approached the driveway, I saw a figure of a woman walking in the drive. She was cutting across the edge of the lawn on the north side of my shop about 20 feet away. The light on the north side of the shop was on, illuminating her faintly. I could make out no details of her, only a dark figure of a slender woman walking briskly towards our house from the west. As I got in range of the motion detector light on the east side of my workshop, it came on. The figure vanished. This phantom female I saw matched the description of the dark woman other family members have seen in our house. But the dark woman is not the only spirit in our home. We have discovered there are others. Some are shy and reclusive. Some are a little mischievous and playful. They like to play with stuff. Just to let you know they are there, I think. They hide things. You put something down and a minute later it is gone. You search all over and then find it right back where you laid it in the first place. They turn things on and off. TVs, radios, just about anything, even water faucets. One morning, my son went into the kitchen to get a drink of water. Uh, Dad, Dad, come here. I went into the kitchen to see what was wrong. What's this all about? My son asked. He was standing back from the sink, pointing to the faucet, which was running full blast. My wife was standing beside him. The knob is turned off, but it's still running, he said. We stood and watched it for a minute. Figuring a faulty valve, I started to walk towards the sink to try to turn it off by myself, and suddenly, it just stopped. Turned off all by itself. I looked it over, turned it on, and then turned it back off again. It worked fine. I checked the valves the next day, and everything was functioning properly and has worked fine since. TVs are a real favorite. I was waking up from a nap one evening when I heard the television on in the living room. I assumed my son was home and was watching a movie. As I rose, I heard the television turn off. When I went into the living room, the lights were off, the television was off, the door was still locked, and my son was not there. My wife and I were the only people in the house, and she was still sleeping. I turned on the television, and the same movie I had heard from the bedroom was playing. Radios are popular with them too. On another occasion with my wife, my daughter and I were watching television in the living room. All of a sudden, the CD player comes on and starts playing a CD at high volume. My wife got up and turned it off. Reaction from all of us was very casual. Go to grandma's if you want to listen to music. We are watching TV, I jokingly said out loud. At the time, my mother was living in a mobile home behind the property. My sister was staying with her. I found out the next day they took my suggestion to heart. My sister called. I went out to go to work, she said. The radio in the van was playing. I thought someone left it on. Oh great, now the battery will be dead, I thought. Then I realized the radio doesn't work unless the key is on. I was holding the key in my hand. That's weird, I thought. I unlocked the door and I reached in to turn off the radio and it was already off. It quit playing when I touched it, so I put the keys in the ignition and turned on the radio and it came on. I turned off the ignition and it went off. Ignition on, radio on. Ignition off, radio off does not work without a key. How is it playing without the key and the ignition and the knob turned off? She asked. We have all gotten used to our ghosts now. Our children have grown up around them and have their own stories. Their friends and ours have all been scared out of their wits a time or two, but are accustomed to it now. New friends take a little time to get acclimated though. My son was in his teenage years and most of his friends knew about our house. His new friend Jason did not though. My wife and I had gone out for the evening and my son was having a party. 
All his friends were over. Everyone was having a good time but Jason. He was tired. Jason was new to Tommy's parties. Jason was also new to our house. If he had known about the things that happened here, he might have not left the main group and gone to the game room where it was quiet. Most of our friends know and have experienced eerie things while here with enough frequency that it really doesn't surprise them. Ah, but Jason was new, ripe picklings from a mischievous ghost. So Jason left the party and went into the game room by himself, where he laid on the floor to get a little rest. My son and his friends were only a little surprised to see Jason run into the living room pale and frightened. The pinball machine, Jason said. Flash Gordon, it came on all by itself and started playing itself. There's nobody in there, and it just came on and started playing. Yeah, so? Responded my son's other friend, who was so accustomed to such things here. Flash was Philip's favorite machine, my son explained casually. Philip was our nephew who died in an accident a short time before. He was probably just enjoying a round of pinball, said my son. He is a nice guy. He won't bother you. Everyone went on about having fun, except for Jason. He stuck close to the group for the rest of the night, but he never came back to our house. There have been times when these spirits have saved the day for us. We once awoke to find a fire had started on our patio by a candle left burning when we went to bed. About 15 square feet of one wall covered in rattan was charred from the flames but somehow, mysteriously, it had gone out by itself. The dry rattan, though very flammable, had just stopped burning. This was not the only time. It had only been a couple of weeks since we buried my wife's brother, Virgil. Tragically, he was killed by a car while walking home. My wife had been cleaning out his mobile home next door. A terrible task, but she faced it with courage and fortitude. Sometimes I think she is operating an automatic pilot. She came home and told me, I saw him, Virgil. He was just standing there in the doorway of his trailer while I was sorting out his things. He said nothing, then he disappeared. A few days after that, my dad came into the shop where I was working. Do you know the door on Virgil's mobile home is open? He asked. No, I replied. I'll check it out. The home was vacant since Virgil died. We were watching his property while probate proceeded. I walked over and saw the front door ajar. I feared the worst, that the vacant home had been broken into. We were careful to lock the door and no one else had a key. I carefully entered the premises. The overwhelming odor was unmistakable. Propane, strong. I had to exit immediately, a gas leak. The house was full of it. I went to the rear of the home and found the main gas valve. I turned it off. Covering my mouth, I entered the home again. Quickly, I began opening windows. I could not stay in there for very long. I can't believe this place didn't blow up, I said to myself. It's a good thing the front door was open. But how did the front door get open anyway? Sometimes they go with us. Sort of a spirit field trip, I suppose. In 1998, my wife and I took on extra jobs. I was managing and bartending at a local hotel bar, and my wife was the cocktail waitress. I guess they got lonesome for us. No one at home to pester and all. Maybe just bored. So they started going to work with us. We were at the lounge. It started out small. TV on, TV off. Glasses doing funny stuff. That sort of thing. We had closed for the night. It was clean up time. I was walking to the kitchen when I heard a noise from the juice box. The pages of cards which show the selections were flipping on their own. Page after page flipped, all in one direction, then it would switch and go back the other direction. This was just the start. They seemed to prefer after hours at the bar. We were cleaning up one night when we decided the small table and chairs would look better if I moved them farther away from the pool table. I moved them over near the dance floor. I proceeded to clean the rest of the bar. When I turned around, the table and chairs we moved are back in their original positions by the pool table. The next night we decided to mess with them. After closing, we rearranged the entire setup in the bar. Tables, chairs, everything. Then we went to my office, got our stuff together to go home, and walked out to find everything back where it was originally. What had taken us a couple of hours to do, they had accomplished in a few minutes. We have lived here in the magic spot about 25 years now. I have notebooks full of activity, notes about ghostly occurrences, sightings, etc. We have never tried photography, but being an artist, I have done paintings of some of the entities we have here. We also experience really odd weather patterns, most often in the winter. Radios and televisions, actually just about any electronic device, is likely to act up when used here, and we have learned more about the history of this area. 
A local Native American medicine man once told me this place gives them the willies. Teenagers refer to this place in the surrounding area as the magic spot and have many stories about it. Over the years, we have actually had a good relationship with our ghosts. Though at times mischievous, for the most part, they just go about their own business and we do the same. We do at times bump into each other, however. Sometimes it is much surprise to them as it is to us. Sometimes it is nice to have them around. Other times, it can be quite frightening. I was actually surprised one late night, and it and I streaked off in opposite directions. I don't know which of us was more surprised. They have become as much a part of our home as our family members. It wouldn't be the same without them. As the youngest of five children, all boys, and the son of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, supernatural followers will know that means a white witch. I've seen many strange things. I and my brothers grew up in what would be described as a haunted house. At a very young age, I loved to play in my parents' bedroom, which overlooked the landing, first two steps, and small landing at the top of the stairs. On an almost daily basis, I saw shadows walking along the landing. They were not ordinary shadows. These were floating. They were not cast on the wall, but were in mid-air, but I could see through them. As I got older, they seemed to happen less frequently. I still see these shadows occasionally, out of the corner of my eye. In the early 80s, my brothers discovered the Ouija board method of entertainment, which heralded some very interesting results. On one such session on the Ouija board, the spirit known to us as Paragon put us in touch with a chap called Ray with a message for my father. I can't remember the surname that we were given, but we passed the message on to my father, who accused us of conspiring with my mother to try to persuade him that Ouija board works. Of course, this was simply not the case. It turned out that his friend Ray had committed suicide while my eldest brother was very young. Therefore, it would be impossible for us to know anything about it unless we were told by someone. We simply had no knowledge prior to the session of events that had taken place so many years before. On another occasion when I was 11 or 12, we had a very strange encounter. My mother and father were out for the evening and my brothers were left to look after me. The session took place in the dining room, which had one exit into the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could exit to the hall towards the front door, or a door latched with one bolt lock to the back garden and side entrance to the property. There was a window looking into the garden that the strange phenomena took place in. It was a strange session that seemed to pick up an angry persona. All of a sudden, there was a bluish glowing light out the back of the house, and the window started to shake violently. As we made a mad dash for the kitchen, the door to the back garden also started to shake violently. We all ran for our lives out the front door and scattered in all directions up and down the road. There was snow on the ground and I was dressed in PJs and no shoes. It was almost half an hour and much deliberation before we returned to the house and went in. There were no signs of any strange happenings. We used playing cards with letters drawn on the back and yes and no written on separate cards and numbers in the middle of the table in a row and some excellent shaped wine glasses that were virtually impossible to push. In an early experiment, the glass zoomed round and round with great speed. All of a sudden, it left the table lifting up to the top corner of the room and smashing it to small pieces. Even the stem and base broke into pieces, the biggest the size of your little fingernail. Anyone who has ever broken a wine glass will know it takes a tremendous force to break the stem and base to that extent. In 1985 at the age of 15, I was walking home to the family home around 10 p.m. from a friend's house. It was a wet and windy night and I walked with a collar up on my coat with my chin tucked into the top of my zip, only looking up every now and then to see where I was going. There is a small village in the outskirts of the city, just down the road from the family home. I was walking towards the village where I would have to turn right to go in the right direction to get home. Approximately a thousand yards before the road I was walking along came to an end. There is a 10 story block of flats and next to that a retirement home. As you get nearer to the end of the road, approximately 500 yards from the end, there is a row of attendant bungalow flats going along the road I was approaching and intending to turn right towards home. To the left was a large grass area between them and the main road. I passed the end bungalow flat heading to the T-junction with the grass area to my left and approximately 100 yards of space all around me to the nearest object, some small bushes. All of a sudden, I saw a pair of brown shoes come into view a couple of steps in front of me. Startled, I looked up to see an elderly gentleman in front of me. 
I took a step sideways and went around him. Something struck me as strange and after a few more steps, I turned around to see nobody behind me. There was absolutely no way that the old man walking slowly with a walking stick could possibly have moved quick enough to get behind something to obscure him from my view in such a short time. In fact, the distance between me and the nearest object was too great for Ben Johnson at his prime to reach before I turned around. It wasn't until I thought about it while walking home that it struck me what it was that was so strange about the gentleman when I first laid eyes on him. Despite being quite persistent, rain and strong wind driving the rain, the man was dry and there were no drops hitting him. He was all dressed in brown, brown shoes, suit, and flat cap. I can't remember the color of his shirt or if he was wearing a tie, but I will never forget his face as he smiled a gentle smile and thanks as he moved out of his way. His features were very clear. I have never seen him since. This village was quite a friendly community where most people knew everyone else, but I did not recognize this gentleman. There were many strange things that happened in the family home. From power cuts that were localized to just our house in the whole street. We had electricity meters that took coins to pay for the electricity supply. If the electricity went out, it should need to be topped up by popping a coin in the slot. Even after putting money in the meter, the electricity would not work. It would be found to have been switched off and in those days, there were no such things as circuit breakers that would trip the switch. When my father knocked out the dining room window to put in a patio door, we found three patio negatives of an old gypsy man. The first of him, out the front of his caravan. Another of him, stood on the caravan steps and the last of him, laid out dead. We intended to have them developed. They were missing from the place we put them. We assumed they fell down behind the kitchen cabinet where they were left. When the kitchen was remodeled, there was no signs of them and other things we assumed had fallen down behind the cabinets. On many occasions, I have told certain people to answer the phone because it was for them and it was. The problem was the phone had not actually rung until after I had told them but within a few seconds. I can't explain it, but it still happened. It was in October of 2004, around 3.30 in the morning. I was slowly waking and was in the state where I could hear the TV, but wasn't quite awake. I remember having this eerie, scared feeling, and in my sleep started singing Jesus Loves Me, the old childhood Sunday school song. Anyways. I remember feeling a presence on my legs, real heavy, and I felt something was watching me. I snapped awake and moved, and the thing made a swooshing noise, and my cat even looked up in the air where this went over my head and out the door. I was on the couch and the front door was behind me. My cat was acting funny even before this, and at times, I would come home and feel a nervous, scared feeling like someone was in the house. That's when I saw it. It was the silhouette of the hat man. I looked petrified, and I couldn't just shake the feeling. It was almost inside my head like it was screaming voices at me. The voices released from the hat man into my head were all mumbled, so I couldn't really understand any of them. A split second later, there is silence, and the hat man slowly fades into the abyss, actually fading into the TV screen once and for all. I don't know if this has anything to do with the paranormal, or if I'm just losing my mind. Was it sleep paralysis? Was the hat man real, or was it just all in my imagination? I have no idea, but I'm kind of hoping and praying to God and Jesus that this doesn't even exist and that I'm all hallucinating this just to make myself feel better. As I previously stated, my cat has even noticed weird things that have occurred in this house, and I'm just not sure what to trust anymore. Are my senses going crazy? Am I just in touch with the paranormal? Am I opening up another portal? To the paranormal dimension in which beings and spirits, including the hat man, come to greet me with demonic images and voices in my head. I don't know, but I'm just hoping that I will never find out the true answer to this mystery. Thank you so much for reading. I know it's short, but thank you. I have an interesting ghost story for you. Three of my friends, my sister and I, are currently going to a school in an old-fashioned building that used to be an Eagles club. During the first two months that I was going to the school, I had an odd dream. I dreamt that our school had this odd catwalk that had never been there before. It was like you were seeing into the attic. There were two little girls that looked like sisters who were playing up there. It was all decked up real nice like, and they had what looked like party dresses on. Every time I left a the building, they would just stare off into the distance with these really looking gloomy eyes. Yet when I was in the building, they would play with their little dollhouse. 
About two months later, the owner of the building took a few of us up to the attic. When I got up there, I immediately noticed what it was. The little girl's room only looked older and less used. When we left a few minutes later, two girls claimed to have seen a little girl that looked about 10 and one girl claimed to have heard voices. I doubt that she did because she had known about my dream beforehand, but one other girl who saw a little girl hadn't known about anything. When we downloaded the pictures we had taken, there was a lot of activity in them. Lots of mist and light in a very dim and dry attic. Not too long ago, we took a tape recorder and taped a small amount of sound. When we played it back, we could faintly hear we're going to kill you in the background. When we taped a second time, we caught a man's voice saying, hey, come here, come here, come back, with the small childlike whispers in the background. No one was talking and there were no men in the room. Plus we taped in an area that is sealed off to the rest of the school. Sorry that this was so long, but I thought it was important to get in the details. Four years ago, I was nine at the time. Me and my family all lived in a house with our grandparents. We always visited my other grandmother, who lived alone. She had a really creepy house. Whenever we visited, me and my brothers or sister would spend the night there to keep her company. We would have extremely scary experiences. Up until I was nine, I hardly had any encounters with ghosts, but then it started to occur more frequently. I would hear really loud stomping over me and the chandelier would start shaking. It was like having an elephant running around upstairs. I remember I would be really annoyed and go upstairs to see what was up. My brother loved to jump around, but he was next to me watching TV and it was common sense that grandmothers didn't start jumping around like that. Of course, I went upstairs and found nothing. Other times, when I was in my grandmother's room, about to go to sleep, she had a king-size bed that we both slept in together, but the traditional dolls she kept in her room would start opening their eyes by themselves or start floating or even, I swear, dancing. I would be so freaked out, I'd try to wake my grandmother, but she didn't believe in ghosts, and as usual, whenever I pointed something strange out to her, she'd just scoff, but I would also hear a girl crying or when we had a dog, Someone played catch with it and threw the ball around. My dad and his friends had always heard the stomping. He said they'd also seen one of my grandmother's treasured antique dolls in the toy box, a girl's clothes or jewelry being taken out of my suitcase as if someone had tried them on. But about three months before I turned 10, my grandmother said that she wanted to move, not because she was scared of the ghost, but because the house was ugly and too small. Everyone in my family agreed but me and my two younger brothers and older sister all were glad that we never had to visit the horrifyingly scary house. The best part was, our grandmother decided that she would find a house for all of us to live in. Me, my parents, my sister, my brothers, my other grandmother and grandfather, and now, my second grandmother, who didn't have to live alone and take care of such an old, huff house. After all, cleaning was difficult, and she wanted company. So now we would be all one big happy family. But that's not the end. As I was saying, three months before I turned 10, we started packing up everything in the house because we had already found and bought a brand new house that had been completed only a year before with a swimming pool and enough room in the yard to get a dog in our own tree house. Me and my siblings were so cheerful, we didn't mind doing most of the moving. We even ignored the ghost girl, forgetting to be scared. But. When my mother said we had to go to the attic next to do work, boy did my blood freeze. The attic was where the ghost girl always disappeared to. The rooftop was where we always saw the little girl sitting on during storms. And the worst part was that the attic had a lot of stuff there, so we would be spending practically a week hauling all the junk out of there. We were really scared, but my mom just snapped at us because she knew we were scared of the ghost and she had lectured herself hoarse about there being no ghost even though we told her about all those weird things going on. But to cheer us up, she did say that in the attic, my aunt had all these cute dresses from the 70s stashed up there, not to mention some darts and a dartboard for my brothers, even a mini basketball hoop. I was excited because I was going to be a hippie that Halloween, so we decided to go for it. When we were up there the first couple of times, nothing happened. We even started making daily trips up there during our break just to explore. But soon, really scary things would happen 
and they were so scary because that ghost girl got mad and would throw fists and chairs at one time, even a dart. Or when I found a little box of cute Barbie dolls and clothes, the ghost girl would snatch it away from me and I hear her screaming in my ear literally, don't touch that, it's mine. I would run away from the attic because I was scared. Things got steadily worse. Things would go missing. The ghost girl would appear at least once a day and scare the peepins out of everybody. She would start stealing things from me too and claim them as hers. She also took those traditional dolls of my grandmother's. Finally, we moved and at last, we all got into the car and started to drive away. When I looked and I saw a cold, white face stare out the attic window, I had heard voices the night before telling me not to leave or give the stuff back, but I will never forget the face in the attic window, mad, pale, and ghostly. I will relate an occurrence that happened 47 years ago. I grew up with my grandparents until my folks could afford to buy a home. My dad found an old Victorian on the east side of Manchester, New Hampshire. It was built in the 1880s and even included the maid's apartment in the attic, complete with the speaking tubes connected to the kitchen. My folks fixed it up, remodeling the kitchen and downstairs extensively. In the summers, our family used to move out to a cabin by the lake every year. As soon as school finished, we'd pack up the gear in two cars and head out to the lake in New Hampshire. The house would be locked up, Curtain blinds and shades drawn. No food left in the fridge. At the camp, my dad and I fished every day. His work was only 30 minutes away, and it was a short commute. By the time I was 16 or 17, I started playing frequently in the local youth golf tournaments, and often was right back in my regular neighborhood playing at one of the local courses. After playing, I used to commute back to the lake most of the times, but one tournament had me starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, after the qualifying round, so I started to stay over. The key to the house was hanging up in the garage, and I opened the house up around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I went to my bedroom upstairs and took a nap. The house was cool, the windows having been sealed, blinds and shades drawn. It felt nice after being in 90 degree heat. About an hour and a half later, I woke up quickly. I don't know what it was that got me alert, but as I listened closely, I could hear a noise coming from directly above me. The sound I heard was like someone shuffling through a box of tools. My first thought was some damn squirrel was trapped in the attic. Getting out of bed, I calmly walked to the doorway that led to the attic stairs. Suddenly, the shuffling noises turned into footsteps, clear, steady, and they were heading towards the stairway leading to the door. I could hear heel and toe, heel and toe, six steps to the landing and a turn. Two steps more, and I was gone before whoever reached the bottom. I took a leap to the landing, and the next 13 steps in one jump, turned at the bottom of the stairs, and hit the back door and slammed it shut. Drove to my buddy's house, and when his mom asked if I wanted to stay over, I said thank you very much. Talk about a reprieve. In the fall, I was off to college, and I can say that I never spent another day or night alone in that house. Years later, my dad passed away. The house was put on the market, and it took almost a year to sell. The two women who bought it had it back on the market in six months. I don't know what the source of the steps was. I can't go back and figure this out. But I never had a bad feeling in this house. But I never had a good feeling either. I never told anyone about this, and I used to wonder about whether my brother or sisters were in danger. Nobody had ever broken into the house. We upgraded all the locks on the doors and windows when we moved in 10 years before. There's no reason that anyone could have been in that attic. Someday, I will ask my brother if anything ever happened there that caught his attention. He'll probably figure it was the 60s that did this to me. Thanks for reading. I have two ghost stories for you, both pertaining to a condo that I used to live in as a child. City, Whitehall, Ohio. When I was three, my mother, sister, and I moved from Juarez, Mexico, up to Whitehall, Ohio. The town is only about 15 minute drive from the state's capital, Columbus, but that's irrelevant to the story. We moved into a condo. Our side was rather small and had two stories, and a basement. When I was five years old, my mother had remarried. Nonetheless, she was also expecting. Since we only had two bedrooms, 
both on the second floor. My mom had my sister and I move up into the attic. The first month was fine, until we brought up our beds in a rocking chair. My sister and I had to share a bunk bed, and as always, she had to have had the top, so I took the bottom. One night, I woke up hearing someone crying. I thought it was my sister, but I could hear her snoring. I looked around the room and saw the rocking chair. It was rocking back and forth and crying? No. I narrowed my eyes and noticed a pale girl who looked a bit like a mix of my doll bubbles in Shirley Temple. I called out, what's wrong? And the crying stopped. I laid back down, but then I felt something grab my feet. Water. It yelled out to me. I didn't understand and I hid under my covers trying to shake off the grip, but it would not let go. Then it started to scream water louder and started telling me how dry it felt. I told it that the bathroom was downstairs. The cold grasp had let go. I heard steps and cries, then the door opened. When I woke up, the chair was on the other side of the room and there was a glass of water on the steps. It would keep going on for about two years. My sister said that she talked to a girl that had lived in our closet. The chair normally sat in front of it. She told me that the girl was always thirsty. When I was seven, still in the same room and house, a new apparition had appeared. She was tall and resembled slightly the features of the little ghost from two years earlier, but she was dark and her dress was somewhat 20s or 30s styled. I can't quite describe it, but she told me that I could never open the window to the room. Since the house was so small, heat was trapped up in my room and my mom would keep the window open for us. We had a mother robin living in our window who was very beautiful. She had laid three eggs, all of which had hatched successfully. But two days after the baby birds had hatched, I heard the window slam shut while playing a game of Twister with my sister. The mother bird had snapped her neck in the window. I remember what the woman had told me and I started to cry. My mom would help me feed the baby birds and I told her about the ghost. She told me it was fine and I was just being silly. But again, two days later, only two birds were in the nest. I was upset and thought it had fell down the two stories onto the driveway. The two other birds had grown up and had left the window. But the next summer, my sister smelled something in her toy chest. It smelled like rotting eggs. We found a Cabbage Patch doll at the bottom of the toy chest. Its chest had been cut and the smell was coming from within it. I gave it to my mom and then went outside to play. About 10 minutes later, I heard a scream. My mom ran out with a dead baby robin that had come out from the doll. I never opened the window up again. Thanks for reading. This story deals with one of the instances in my life where I was the most confounded and fascinated, as well as generally scared out of my wits. The setting is South Portland, Maine, in the summer of 2005. I was enjoying the summer following my sophomore year at college at my uncle's bungalow style home. My uncle generously offered me a place to stay in a semi-finished attic for a very low price per month. Naturally, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to spend a summer five minutes from the beach so I took him up on his offer and moved my things in four days after school ended. Things were going great. I found a job in town and began to enjoy the fruition of my hard work the semester before. Summertime is a wonderful time in any coastal main town, and even more interestingly, so are the wealth of lore and tales surrounding the old ports where I resided for those three months. I've had a curiosity in paranormality and the occult for most of my life, and come from a family that is seemingly quite susceptible to such things. My first reaction to my uncle's house was along the lines of, I wonder who died there, as it appeared to be at least 60 or 70 years old. The interior was equally as old looking, but I don't know whether to attribute it to my uncle's eccentricity or to the previous owner's idea of a neo-Victorian decor. The whole house gives me sort of a never alone feeling, which really got to me some nights. My room, however, was void of color or taste, completely white walls, a large desk with a lamp, a pull-out futon, and a blue and white speckled carpet, the itchy sort. Anyhow, you have an idea for the basic setting and my way of living for the summer. Now on to the unusual. The story here begins in just the last place I described, the attic room. The way the attic was set up was the following, a staircase leading from the ground level, 
a small hallway with a door at the end, the attic room, and a door on the right as you walk through the doorway, which would be classified as a guest room that nobody uses. Both the guest room and attic room are not connected, but the doorways are adjacent to each other. Anywho, one night, my girlfriend was up visiting for a couple of nights, and we were upstairs laying on the pulled out futon. It was past 1am by now, and the only light in the room was the glow of the television I had brought up from my parents' house. The rest of the world was quiet and sleeping, and my uncle and his dog were asleep downstairs in his bedroom. We lay there, eyes fixed to the screen that illuminated our bed and surrounded things. And then, suddenly, a very strange event happened. Out to my right in the dark, I saw some stir which caused me to divert my gaze in that direction. I'd been 100% sure before I looked that it had been my uncle who had came up the stairs to tell me something. I was even ready to acknowledge his presence with a hey, is everything okay? But then I remembered that I hadn't heard the extremely loud stairs creak. The shape that I saw was that of something large. The size of a big man could be more accurate, but there was something odd, something wrong about the shape. I could see it for only a brief moment, even in the pitch blackness of the doorway and hallway that hadn't moved in. It was some kind of shadow, a very dark shadow if I could still see it. It was darker than the dark. After those few seconds of confusion, I turned to my girlfriend who was staring at me right in the face. I asked her if she had just thought my uncle came upstairs, to which she replied that she had looked at the same time as I had. Something moved, something dark and large and soundless had moved and we both saw it. Throughout my stay at the house, and even more so after the apparition appeared, I never feel safe or secure. I constantly feel watched and I turn on a light before I enter my room, if at night time. Maybe it's for fear of being watched in the dark. Maybe it's for fear of confronting something darker than something void of light. But either way, I just can't feel alone. Something is there. This much I can feel. About 40 years back, I became interested in tracing my family's ancestors. This is how I discovered the Tilly Bent Settlement. Situated in the Appalachian Mountains, it really is a beautiful place. The Dakota River flows down from the high mountains, winding its way into the Blue Ridge Lake. Tillybed Settlement is nestled back in these same mountains. One must cross the Dakota River and travel down a one-lane dirt road that takes you deep into the forest. As you drive along, one begins to notice, windows rolled down, how quiet the deep woods become. This was my first impression of this area 40 years ago. This place has been lost in time because it looks like the same now as then with the exception of the renovation of Tilly Bent Church. I've been here many times, many, many times over the last 40 years. I suppose you could say I'm drawn to the mystery of this place. I will only share a small portion of my research. However, you need to understand this. Tilly Bend Church sits right in the middle of this haunting. This church is not part of the haunting. This church is the house of God, and services are held here on a regular basis, and demands the respect as being the house of God. In 1756, the Creek Indians lived in this area and got along quite well with this white folk that came to this area from North Carolina. There are census records showing that the white man intermarried with the Creek women. The Cherokee did not get along with the Creeks and forced them out of the area. The intermarried Creeks did not leave, and neither did their customs. In 1820, the Stanleys had formed a settlement over the mountain in a place known then as Stanley Gap. This being told, I can now share with you what I know is fact. Searching for my great-great-grandmother's grave, I ended up in Tilly Road Cemetery. At this time, the church only had services on decoration once a year. The church building was very old, but still in fair condition for its age. There were no glass windows, only wooded shutters, and that was common in the days before air conditioning. 
and the doors to this church is what I remember most about this old country church. There was in both of the old doors what appeared to be like someone had shot the doors with a rifle of some sort. My first impression was that someone had done this out of pure meanness. I then proceeded to walk around the side of the church and walked up and peered through one of the cracks between the shutters. Of course, with the shutters closed and there being no windows, the inside was dark. I could, however, make out the old homemade church pews and the pulpit. I also noticed a high ceiling with the rafters showing. Yes, I thought this church is old, and the welcome sign out in front of the church stated the church was established in 1858. After I looked the old church over, I then headed up the hill to the cemetery. I noticed there were a lot of field stones marking the graves, which is not unusual for very old graveyards. Right in the center is a very old and large oak tree, the only tree that is in the graveyard. I started looking around at the grave markers for my great-great-grandmother's grave. Well, to my surprise, her grave was also in the center of the graveyard, and her grave was the only one under the oak tree. The name on her marker is Elizabeth, so I'm looking around at this graveyard, thinking it looked as if no one wanted to be buried anywhere near her grave. I then wrote the information for her marker down, and that is when I noticed the head of her grave was facing west, which is very odd, because all the people here bury the dead facing to the east, because the Lord will return in the eastern sky. I finished getting the information, and I caught a glimpse of someone out of the corner of my eye. I did not hear a car come down the dirt road, and there were no houses close by. I turned very quick to see who it was, and there was no one. I laughed at myself thinking, yeah, I'm jumping at my own shadow. You see, I don't believe in ghosts, but I did believe in mean people. As I started back down the hill, I noticed another grave. It was called Mary. The birthday was the same as Elizabeth. They both died on October 26th. Elizabeth died 1905. Mary died 1906. I thought, boy, somebody messed up on the dates. I reached my car at the foot of the hill, and as I got in, I looked back up towards the cemetery, and at the tree, I saw what appeared to be a woman. Her dress was long and black. She had on a hat that I can only describe as a granny bonnet. I thought you have got to be kidding. Then it looked as if she stepped back behind the tree. I was curious, so I went about halfway back up the hill and shouted hello. Of course, no answer. So I walked all the way back to the tree and there was no one there. I hurried back to the car and left. A couple of weeks later, my grandfather asked me if I had went to his great-grandmother's grave. I told him I had, and asked why her grave was facing to the west. My grandfather said, well, she was a witch. I laughed, and I said, really, Grandpa, why is her grave turned around? He went on to tell me this. She was Creek and also a witch doctor for the Creek Indians. The whole settlement was afraid of her. Now she had a daughter to marry, a Tilly, and another daughter to marry, a Stanley. There had been a family feud between the Tillys and the Stanleys, so the two sisters became enemies because of their husband. The feud escalated, and on Sunday morning, the Stanleys went to Tilly Church and started shooting through the doors of the church, killing the preacher, he was a Tilly, and several others in the church, including the one sister who married a Tilly. Now, the Tillys didn't let this go, and one night, they went to Stanley Gap and killed some of the men while they were asleep. Now the sister that married a Stanley, her husband was killed that night. A few months later, she died having a baby. Elizabeth Bradley vowed revenge on both the Tillys and the Stanleys for the death of her two daughters. 
After that, every baby born to the Tillys and Stanleys died at birth. I said, come to think of it, there was a lot of little baby graves, rows of them. My grandpa said, well, after a year of this, the Tillys went to Elizabeth Bradley's house and got her. She was then taken to the center of Tilly graveyard and hung from the old tree. They cut her down and buried her right where she fell. Right before they hung her, she told them she would come back. Now, after a few months, the little baby started dying, all at birth. People in the Tilly settlement started claiming the witch had come back and had taken up residence in a very old and mean woman. Elizabeth Bradley's sister-in-law, Mary, so on the anniversary of Elizabeth Bradley's hanging, the men went and got Mary Tilly Bradley. They hung her from the same tree. They would not bury her facing west because she was, after all, not at fault because the witch came back through her and she was a Tilly. I said, Grandpa, that didn't really happen. He said, you saw the graves and I'm telling you it did happen and the older folks here will tell you that it's true. He said, and I'll tell you something else that's true. I saw one of them witches one time when I was a small boy. My grandpa went on to say that when he was about nine years old, he went to decoration at Tilly and he described the same very woman that I had seen. This happened 40 years ago and my grandpa has been long gone for many years now. I've seen a tin type old picture of Elizabeth Bradley, and I've also seen Elizabeth Bradley at Tillybent. I've kept a record, and I've seen her eight times in the last 40 years. There has been two occasions that I heard a little baby crying as I walk up the hill. Of course, it quits when I get to the tree. Strange how one would think you could only see a ghost at night. I've only seen her in the daytime. Of course, I don't go there at night, and I never will. I've always believed in paranormal things. I've had many encounters with ghosts, and it's never really bothered me. My daughter was born in 2006. Around the time she was one and a half, we moved into a nice older house. The first night in our new house, we were camping out downstairs because our beds hadn't been unloaded from the truck yet. Around 2 a.m., I was woke up because you could hear the sounds of someone walking around in a room above the kitchen. I just blew it off as an older building and such. I walked upstairs when I continued to find her closet doors open and things scattered around her room like someone had been in the boxes. Again, I just blew it off as my kid brother playing a trick before he left. The next morning we were setting up her room, and I noticed her sitting there, acting like she was playing with someone. It sort of gave me chills, because she was actually talking to someone. I just ignored it, but later, she started mentioning the man. Three days into living there is when things started happening. Her room has never been warm. I can turn the heater up to 75 degrees. I've bought a space heater. The landlords have came and checked the windows and insulation. Everything's normal. Her closet doors open at random times by themselves. Now at almost three, she still talks about the man in her room. She's informed me that the man tells her she can do things, be bad, and do things after she's told no. She still sits around and talks to no one. We live 14 months with just little things happening all around 2 a.m. Her bedroom door slams shut and he hears stomping down the stairs. The laundry room doors open and slam shut. The water in the bathtub turns on by itself. But lately, things have become more aggressive and frequent. I decided to decorate her room. I put new curtains up, her new blankets on her bed, 
and hung clothes in the closet. I walked downstairs, leaving all the lights on, but shutting the closet doors. I was downstairs maybe five minutes. As I entered the hallway, I noticed her door closed, nothing new, but I opened it, and there was this rush of cold air. Again, nothing new. The light was off, and you could feel someone in the room. It was an angry sort of feeling, like someone was glaring at me. I ignored it and turned the light on. The curtains I'd just hung had been ripped off the rod and lay in the middle of her room. Her new blankets and sheets were off her bed, and her closet doors again wide open. My daughter refuses to sleep in her room now, saying the man scares her, that he yells at her. I've placed crosses and went as far as to have my house blessed, and nothing. In the last two months, I've been woken up to someone screaming in my ear. The sound of my front door opening and slamming shut, and my bathroom shower turning on, all in the 2 a.m. hour, and on nights my daughter's at grandma's house. There are some stories that my family and friends have passed on, and I think you might find them quite interesting. I'm a great fan of your website. I have some stories that I've heard from family. Here's one that my grandpa encountered. His father had recently died in 1993, and the night of his funeral, he was awoke by something. He didn't know what it was, he was just awoken by whatever it was. He looked over, and his father was standing there, saying, I'm okay, please do not worry. My grandpa got a drink of water, and his father left. He went right through the door. Then, I have one from family friends. This was when friends Steve and Rita had moved into a new house. They had seen several apparitions that they have not really explained, but really just blobs. Then, here comes the scary part. Here are two stories that I've also inquired from the same person. Rita and her husband and two friends were in the family room in the middle of the day, talking, and all four of them saw a shadow jump from the balcony, slide across the family room, and go under the couch. Steps have also creaked, and toilets have flushed for no apparent reason. This was also a new house, with no history of violence on the property. Now for the second story. A couple of nights later, Rita was sleeping, and woke up to feeling like someone was sitting on top of her, trying to choke her. Steve woke up to Rita's screams, and flipped the lights on. She told him there was a man with a plaid shirt in the room, trying to choke her. No one was in the room. She got up out of bed and went to the dresser, looked in the mirror, and he was behind her. A lumberjack-looking man in a plaid shirt, standing right behind her. This also might sound kind of weird, but my mother Bernadette lived in a new neighborhood when she was little. Outside of the development was a field with a very small house, almost a shed. Whenever my mom took a walk with her grandma, a little girl would come running out of the house and shed and talk with them. She was always dressed old fashioned with a dress on. She resembled a little girl like Shirley Temple. She said her name was Judy. My mom saw her several times. Her grandma also did too. Years later when she mentioned Judy to her mother, her mother said that nobody had ever lived in that house. It was used for storage a shed, and said my mother was making it up, and that it was a story. We have never figured out if it was a ghost or not. My great-grandmother remembered her too. As a side note, I've passed this particular field many times, and have seen the shed, but have not had any strange things happen to me when passing the area. Like my grandmother has said, no one has ever lived in that shed. So I don't know.
My name is Rodney, and I would like to share a story with you that happened to me and a friend of mine. First, I'll give you some background. It's the early 70s in Enon, Ohio. My friend Mike and I were very close because both of our parents had gotten divorced around the same time we were in our early teens. We shared similar interest in magic and trickery in the occult. We used to save our money and either buy magic tricks from magazines or make magic tricks from plans that we would buy for our act. We appeared on a local after school show for kids a couple of times and in doing so we got to meet a local famous person named Dr. Creep. He had a Saturday night show where he would host and show scary movies and he also did magic. Dr. Creep was really knowledgeable and had a lot of contacts. He told us of a local magic shop in Dayton and gave us directions. We couldn't drive at the time, but I would beg my older sisters to take us there. Discovering that magic store opened us up to a whole vast world of new tricks and illusions. The shop also sold paraphernalia for smoking and it had a lot of what we now refer to as goth type of clothing and jewelry. Well, as we were getting a bit older, the movie The Exorcist came out, and we thought that what a neat idea it was to put some drama and stage production into the act to make it more of a show. We both attended a vocational school, so there were a lot of talented people there, and we found a couple of girls that liked to dance. We added dancing demon girls to the beginning of the show using black lights, dark jumpsuits to conceal the girls under the sheets. The music was Mike's Oldfield's Hearst Trench. I think that was the title. The stage was very barren when the show started. Only a small table with dimly lit candle and the dancing girls could be seen. The dancing girls dance ended with the meeting in front of the table and Big Flash exploded and as the lights slowly illuminated, they would reveal a transformation in the whole look of the stage. There was now a 10 by 12 painted dragon silk tapestry hanging beyond the table, and two silk banners of Belizebuth artistically lit with airy lighting, and I would be standing where the dancing girls had disappeared in my cape. Most of our tricks and illusions were dark in nature, my friend Mike moved to Houston a year before we graduated high school. He got a job at the Galleria Mall in the fun shop. After I graduated, I moved to Houston and stayed with Mike at his mother's house. I also got a job at the fun shop. Eventually, we pretty much ran the place and again, we found a lot of new outlets for magic and the occult. Eventually, we moved into an apartment together as roommates. Our interest in the cult grew, but only out of curiosity, and it gave us an air of mystery to other people. As we made more friends, and our reputations as being a little different spread, we decided to really mess with people. Mike's bedroom had a huge closet, and being young, he didn't have a lot to put in there. We decided to dress it up, and make it look like a devil worship after with the banners we had and with the skull shaped candles and the magic tricks. Our plans were when our friends would come over, we would show them that and they would freak out. The very night we did this at about 12, I awoke to a pounding on a wall between Mike's room and my room. I sat up and yelled, what are you doing over there? The pounding continued unrelentingly. I got out of bed and went over to the wall and yelled, knock it off, I'm trying to sleep. The knocking got louder and didn't show any signs of stopping. So I went over to Mike's bedroom door and knocked and said, Mike, stop it. The pounding continued. So I opened the door to see Mike sitting up in his bed, looking at the closet. My eyes went across the room towards the closet, and as my vision passed his dresser, I saw the door slowly closing. I asked Mike what he was doing banging on my wall, 
He said it wasn't coming from the wall between our rooms. It was coming from the closet. I continued looking onto the closet. As I saw the door, it was breathing and jostling as if someone was trying to get out. Then it stopped suddenly. We were scared witless. We gathered up enough courage to both walk over and we pulled open the door with ease. The closet was freezing. We looked around and saw no one or anything. The apartment we lived in was brand new. No one lived next door. Our neighbor downstairs was gone for the weekend. We asked the people behind us the next day why they were banging on the walls, and they said that they had it, and that they didn't hear anything the night before. We immediately started ripping all the decorations down. I'm still very much fascinated with the paranormal, but I will not invite it in. I have another story I will share with you later, but as for now, I hope you enjoyed what I gave you. My parents own a lake house in northern Indiana, and we used to have a neighbor named Mr. Campbell. Sadly, Mr. Campbell was quite old and depressed, and one day, he left a note and enough food and water to last his dogs at least a week. He said his body could be found in the lake. I couldn't remember if it was ever found, though. This story has many parts, all leading to the same conclusion. Mr. Campbell's ghost haunts this property, but he seems to be quite calm and docile. The first instance, well, a rich man, Richard, bought his property, tore the home down, and built a $2.5 million house. Richard was extremely nice and was always coming over for dinner. One day, he told us that he thought his house was haunted. He had an entertainment system installed that requires him to climb a ladder to fully turn it on or off. For that reason, he always left it on and left the ladder in the garage. One day he had guests over and was going to put on the Indy 500, but the system was powered down. He said he watched TV the night before and no one had been in the house. At first he just assumed it was a power outage or something. He got the ladder and turned on the system. However, all of the settings were messed up. The volume was turned down very low, and the radio was on and set to a 50s station. The TV was off because of the radio. When he turned on the TV, it was tuned static rather than the Discovery Channel Richard had been watching the night before. He said he played it off as an accident to his guests, that it kind of spooked him. Later, after this happened, again Richard assumed Mr. Campbell wanted to listen to music, but didn't want to disturb anyone, because no one had heard the music. Richard also had a roommate named James. The thought is that they were lovers, but no one really asked. Richard would travel to Chicago a lot, and James would be home alone. One night, my sister and I were watching TV in our room and saw lights shining outside and heard men talking. We looked out our window and saw about three police cars and about six policemen walking all over the house, looking at windows and knocking on the door. We went outside with our dad to see what was going on, and the police asked if we had heard or seen anything suspicious. We said no. Why? They told us someone had called 911 from the house, but only breathed into the phone for a couple minutes and then hung up. We told the police that Richard was gone, and usually when he was gone, James would visit his mother down the street. My dad called James' cell, and he was at his mom's for a dinner and a movie. He said he was planning on leaving soon anyways, and came to talk to the police. James let him in, and they searched the whole house, but no one was there. However, in the kitchen, a burner was left on high. James said he made pasta to bring to his mom's 
and must have forgotten to turn off the burner. After the police left, James said he sometimes got a strange feeling in the house, like he wasn't alone when he knew he was, but that he never got scared. It was more like being watched over than stopped. My sister and her friend were sitting on our screened-in porch one Friday night after we got to the lake house late. They saw a man walk from the pier to Richard's house, and my sister called out, Hi, Richard, or James, whoever it is. But the figure didn't stop or reply. He just walked up to the house and disappeared. The girl said a light never came on, and he never heard a door open. The next day, Richard was doing yard work, and my sister mentioned the night before, and jokingly accused him of ignoring her. He told her he had not been home last night, and that he had just gotten back from Chicago early that morning. He also said that James was in North Carolina for the week for his sister's wedding. My sister and her friends were confused, because they had both seen the man, and they were worried they had seen a robber. Richard asked if the outdoor lights turned on, and they said no. Why? He said he has motion detector lights, so if there was a person by the house, the floodlight should have come on, and his alarm didn't register entry last night. The next incident, Richard had to move to Chicago. It had gotten to be too much for him to constantly be driving back and forth. So he bought a flat in Chicago and put the house up for sale. James left too. The new owners are really quite annoying and full of themselves. So no one ever told him about the possible haunting or the house's past. One day Janet came over and asked us if the house had a story. I asked why. She said she had been in the shower when she saw an old man staring at her. She screamed, and he just disappeared. We told her about Mr. Campbell and everything, and she sort of freaked out. They tried to sell the house, but couldn't. She still says the old man watches her every now and then. The housekeeper says she has never seen the old man while she was showering, but that she thought she saw him one day while she was cleaning. He was in the entertainment room, listening to music. She also said that the five dogs will stare at all the same spot for several minutes on end, tails wagging, as if they were being talked to. We still talk to Richard, and he has told us many stories about the house, rearranged pantries, the entertainment system being changed multiple times, and other various things. We think Mr. Campbell haunts the home because he can't move on. My mom says my experience must have been Mr. Campbell trying to get away from Janet for a while. That incident was before the shower, but Janet was already in the home with her husband. We still hear the beeping every once in a while, and we all just say, Hi, Mr. Campbell. You can visit as long as you like. The dog stopped staring and following him after about the tenth time. They'll look up just after the beeping, and just before we hear him leave. I'm a bit of a baby, so I still get creeped out when I'm alone at night, even though I know he has never done any harm. My parents are the last people I think would believe it, but with so many incidents, we think he is there living out his days watching others. Maybe he regretted saying goodbye prematurely, and because of this, this is what keeps him from going to the other side. I was visiting my mother and some friends in Florida, and stayed with my mother while vacationing to cook costs, of course. She works nights at the local hospital, so I'm there alone from 7 p.m. until 7 a.m. when she works. It was a Friday evening and my mom had just left for work. I was hungry, so I went out to grab a bite to eat. I got back to the house around 8 and called my friend, who was supposed to come over to keep me company, but he was running a little late. So, I decided to keep myself entertained as I waited. I was in my room listening to music 
and stuffing my face when I heard what sounded like church bells. Now, these bells would have had to be kind of loud because I listened to my music on blast. I turned down my radio to hear the sound more clearly, all the while thinking to myself, there are no churches in the area that I know of, which made this all the more strange. As I listened, I heard the sound fade off into the distance, as if traveling away. I sat for a couple of minutes and turned my music back up and continued eating. About 15 minutes later, I heard something like someone trying to get in through the back door. My mom's house is a little older, I'd say about 40 to 50 years old. For someone to pry open the back door would not be a difficult task. So naturally, I ran to the back door to see what was going on. Once there, I saw that no one was there, but the glass in the door near the knob was fogged up like cold water would do in a glass cup. Thinking that was a little strange, I grabbed the handle to open the door, and I looked to scream bloody murder. The handle on the door was sub-zero cold, and it really caught me by surprise, just from how incredibly cold it was. I stepped out into the porch, turned on the light, looked around a bit for anything suspicious, and when I saw nothing, I reluctantly went back inside. Uncerned, I kept my music to a minimum, just in case anything else happened, as it surely it did. About an hour later, I got a call from my friend. Now this is strange. He lives about five minutes from my house driving and about 20 minutes walking. Apparently, he came over to the house and rang the doorbell, heard my music playing, and figured that when I didn't answer, I was in the bathroom or something. He called my phone, but it kept getting cut off after the first ring. So he decided to go back home and come back since it's not far at all. He claims that as he was backing out of my driveway, he saw the front door open. He rolled down the window to see if it was me. He said as soon as he got the window all the way down, the front door violently slammed shut so hard that my friend thought for sure that the front window should have shattered. I heard none of this. Around the time that he came over was coincidentally the same time I heard the strange bells. So, I was a little spooked and told him to come over, so he said give him about 15 minutes and he would be over. Well, a lot can happen in 15 minutes. I got off the phone with him and went to the bathroom to freshen up a bit. I washed my hands and face and dried them. I was heading back to my room when I heard a faint sound in the living room. I was a little apprehensive to see what was making the sound and started thinking that perhaps I wasn't alone in my mother's house. From my bathroom to the living room, there is a long hallway. As I walked the hallway, I sensed a presence, and it felt like a large presence, however that feels. Upon entering the living room, I looked up and saw what looked like a clergyman. I could see him clear as anything. My reaction wasn't what one would expect. Looking back on the incident, it seems unusual to me as well. I began to cry almost uncontrollably, and I still have no reason as to why. That's when I heard a knock at my door. My friend had arrived, and as I stood there, I saw the apparition seem to fade to nothing as he continued to knock and rang the doorbell. I opened the door to my friend, who seemed a little shaken himself. He asked me why I'd been crying and unsure on what to tell him. I simply said that I saw something sad on TV. He asked if anyone else was in the house because he saw someone leave out the back door. I told him it was my neighbor. I've had many things happen to me 
and dreams and visions have been a part of my life for as far back as I can remember, and none of them compare to this incident. Weird, huh? I was only about three years old when I first started seeing things in my old house. It started with the noises in the attic. I would hear a rocking chair rocking in the attic directly above my bed. However, that portion of the attic had nothing in it at all. The floor wouldn't even have supported the weight. My old house was a 1950s home. The basement still had an old coal room. However, the coal chute was sealed shut to prevent breaking in. The coal room was directly below my bedroom and it was the only part of the house no one ever went into. I can only ever recall even seeing the door open once. It was an empty, depressing kind of room. In addition to the noises above, I would sometimes hear footsteps in that old room below me, or footsteps on the basement stairs. The first time I ever saw anything was, as I said, when I was around three years old. I woke up from my sleep in the middle of the night to see a young girl standing by my bed. She had brown hair and green eyes and wore a 19th century style green nightgown. She looked to be about eight years old. She frightened me at first, but I didn't get malicious feelings from her. And gradually, I accepted her. She appeared to me often throughout my childhood. And even now, I see her occasionally. The other ghost I saw was much scarier. I wasn't the first one to see him. My younger brother was. He was a tall man who held a knife in one hand and wore black. My brother began seeing him when he was about five years old. The man would appear in his closet and began to walk towards him. And then my brother and his fear would scream, and the man would disappear when my parents came running. I have never told anyone about my experiences with ghosts, for I was afraid I would be called crazy. But my brother told us all about what he saw. He saw the man a total of four times, once in each of our bedrooms, and twice in mine. I saw the man twice, but I didn't begin seeing him until I was much older, around nine years old. I always got a fairly bad feeling from the man, and Victoria, the name I gave the little girl, would always disappear before he appeared. I got the sense that she was scared of him for some reason. In addition to this, when my great-grandma passed away, I inherited her jewelry box. The first night I had it, I'd have left it sitting open on my bedroom floor. When I went to bed, I was around six years old. I was lying awake in bed when suddenly the movie in my VCR fell out of the VCR and onto the floor. A few minutes later, my TV turned on. There was no one else in the room at the time. As I got up to turn it off, it turned itself off. A few nights later, I'd once again been playing with the jewelry in the jewelry box. I awoke to find my basketball bouncing itself repeatedly against my dresser, sideways. There was no one else in my room at the time, and I kept it up for over a minute. After that, I became frightened and stowed the box away in the back of my closet. To this day, I will not open it. Even though I'm now 16, the scariest thing of all happened when I was 11. I awoke in the middle of the night, unable to move the lower half of my legs. Terrified, I sat up to see a strange black shadow sitting on my feet. It was blurry. That may have been partly because my glasses were sitting on my bedside table. At first I thought it was my black cat but quickly realized that it was much too big. It was transparent. It was about half the size of a small child, 
But the thing itself isn't what scared me. It's the feeling that I got from it. I felt terrified, like I've never felt before in my life, as if the strange shadow was pure evil. I struggled to move my legs, and then ran into my parents' room and woke them up. It's the only time I've ever told them of my paranormal happenings. My dad came into my room and turned my light on, but of course, the thing was gone. He insisted I was dreaming and tried to get me to go back to sleep, but I slept on their floor for a week straight after that. I've since moved into a new house. My grandma died here, and we moved in afterwards. Because she left it and everything else of hers to us, I don't have as many experiences here. But there is one that really stands out in my mind. I awoke in the middle of the night, and I could feel someone laying against my back. Their knees curled under mine, and their arm around me. I freaked out and literally jumped onto my floorboard and flicked my light on, but nothing was there. My mom was woke up from the commotion, and I told her about it. She told me it was my grandma, who was keeping me safe as I slept. And then a few days later, we drove to the cemetery, where my grandma is buried. We took my grandma's dog with us. Once we got to my grandma's grave, the dog went crazy. She began to bark and whine, and paw the windows frantically. We thought it must have been a squirrel or something, but there were no animals in sight, not even a bird. My mom thinks that the dog saw something we couldn't, and I have to say I agree. I've had many experiences, and these are just ones I was reminded of by reading other stories on your website. I wrote a lot. I tried to narrow it down a bit. I've tried seances and things with my very good friend, who has similar experiences to mine, and we've been successful at this. It really shocks me sometimes, because we'll both get an image in our head, or see something, and we can finish each other's sentences. That's how precisely we see things. I definitely believe in the paranormal, and I hope to show other people the truth. I lived in this area for over 30 years. Robinson Woods is the home of the Chief Chichi Pinque, as it is spelled on the sign, in the site of his burial marker. He was the last chief of the Potawatomi Indians, and he was related to the Robinson family. He died in 1953. There have been numerous ghost hunting expeditions conducted here, with reports of drums and shadowy forms of an Indian in pictures in the woods surrounding the memorial marker. These woods are connected to Catherine Woods, west of East River Road, south of the Kennedy Expressway. There's a trail that leads from behind the Chief's memorial marker, going to a small branch of the Dace Plains River. It is along this river that John Wayne Gacy buried several of his victims. Additionally, there have been numerous bodies found here over the years. In the late 1950s, two brothers went missing and were killed, and their bodies were discovered here. The area of these woods, more towards the Catherine Woods side, just south of the expressway, is where the American Airlines flight went down, killing all on board. On the east side of the East River Road, there used to be a horseback riding stable called Happy Day Stables, which was the site of many illicit doings. John Wayne Gacy was known to be friends with one of the stable hands that worked there in the 50s and 60s, and he was a frequent visitor there. This stable hand is the one who was responsible for killing the two brothers in the late 1950s, and it's local legend that Gacy participated in the murders. Of course, both Gacy and the other man died without ever revealing the truth of this. These woods have been the site of more phenomena than can be counted. 
generations of kids have gone there to dare each other to face their fears. I personally experienced the drums in the woods, the face of an Indian behind the marker, felt overwhelming fear, anger and sadness and evil along the river behind the trail and horrifying fear around the airplane crash site. That's my story and many others in the rumors surrounding this area. When I was around seven or eight years old, I lived in Norwalk, California with my mom and my soon to be stepfather in a two bedroom apartment. There are two things I remember most about living in that apartment. One was the beautiful princess Kenobi bed I slept in and the other was the floating woman's head I would see coming into my bedroom from the hallway. I have and will never forget that image. It looked like an older woman with long, coarse gray messed up hair with some kind of hat. The first thing I think of when I remember her face was she looked like a witch, pointy nose, moles on her face. From the moment I started seeing her float in, she just stared directly at me, went around the poles of my bed and coming right at me. I would always put the covers over my head knowing she was right on top of me and shut my eyes hard and pull my fingers in my ears until I felt ready to look again. I've always believed and been interested in paranormal and ghost stories. After my grandmother died, I felt her hand on my shoulder in my then boyfriend's house. I turned around Nobody was there, but for some reason, I knew it was her, and I didn't feel scared. I felt she was letting me know she's okay and with me. Lately, my sister and I have been looking at paranormal sites and researching videos and pictures of ghosts, paranormal stories. Your site is my favorite right now. A few years back, I was at the White Horse Bar in Maloa and was doing a gig. When I was done, I left the back room and walked through the kitchen area, passed by a guy in a white outfit who was preparing food, or so I thought. I put my stuff out of my vehicle, came back in, and was going to get a bite to eat. I asked for a menu, and a barmaid gave me one. I ordered food and the barmaid headed back to make me my food. After a while, she came back with my food. Her and I talked, and we started dating shortly after that. Well, a week or so later, I met the whole crew, three girls, and the owner. I asked where the chef was, and the owner told me they're right here. I laughed and said, what about the guy? They all gave me a funny look, and said there is no guy. I had explained the guy I had seen a week back that appeared to be a cook dressed in white clothing that's similar to a chef and was facing the kitchen stove that I walked by. They all gave me a weird look and from there, the owner talked about seeing shadows going across the back room area late at night and no one was there. He told me the owner prior said a ghostly head was said to appear down from above the bar one time in the past. There was a time that I had to change the light bulb and it had to be replaced. The old one was loose and burned out. I tightened the new one in place and tightened down the fixture. And we were sitting down my girl at the time. And the owner and another of the bar ladies and I joked. The ghost will probably be here to flicker the lights, and the light will burn out. The crazy thing is, a couple seconds after that, the light flickered and went out. The owner got another light bulb, and I took the fixture and closure off to find the bulb loose, but still good. One of the bard's maids researched the property and told us the place a long time ago, back in the past, 
was a feed store and that a guy in his teens got crushed to death from fallen feed sacks. I was born in Singapore in 1951 to British and Australian parents. We lived in various cities in Malaysia during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. In 1957, we arrived in Kuala Lumpur, where we stayed until mid-1975. We moved into a company-owned house at Freeman Road, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The history of the house is as follows. It and the house next door, number 17, were built just before World War II by the late Dato Gunlay Taik, a then well-known architect who became an early Malaysian high commissioner to either Australia or Canada. He built them for his daughters. During World War II, the two houses, along with the large semi-detached house immediately behind, on what was then known as Gulf View Road, were taken over by the Japanese Army secret police and known as the Kenta Pai, equivalent of the Nazi Gestapo. The two houses behind were used as Kampai Thai offices, and the three in jail in Freeman became senior military officers' brothels. The women in the brothels were both Asian and European, the latter being drawn from a pool of captured civilians and military nurses. Comfort women was the term used by the Japanese. Male military POWs were used as gardeners and cooks, etc. These staff, if they fell from favor, were executed, and some were obviously buried in the ground surrounding the houses. As some years later, we did find scattered human remains when excavating the gardens for our new orchid beds. On the advice of our doctor, who identified them as human in origin, we quietly reburied the remains. He said that if word got out as to what we had found, we would never get any Malay or Chinese domestic staff to work for us. After the war, the houses were returned to their owners who, knowing what the Japanese had used them for, promptly put them up for sale. They were all bought by large companies at bargain prices who used them to house senior expatriate staff. Gunlight Take was no different, and in 1947, sold his two houses to the company my father worked for. The two company houses were three-bedroom houses of two stories, double brick construction. There was also a long, narrow room, forming a roof over the carport at the front door. This room was to play a significant role and what we were to experience over the following 10 years. In our house, this room was turned into a large walk-in linen press and storage area. To enter it, one would take one step down. When we moved into the house in early 1957, the first thing my mother noticed was that this room was extremely cold, as if it was air-conditioned. In tropical Malaysia, a non-air-conditioned room this cold is not even practical. Our dogs would never go into this room, and when passing the entrance to that room, always hurried past with tails between their legs. Nobody would really stay in that room for very long. It had a very uncomfortable atmosphere. However, sometimes after running around and playing and getting very hot, I would go and sit on the step at the entrance to the room to cool off. I was five years old and knew nothing about ghosts at this time. The main bedroom on the extreme right hand side of the upstairs part of the house, as one faced out towards the main road, had its own full bathroom and the other two, also upstairs, shared a bathroom via separate doors leading from the bedrooms to the bathroom. These latter two were adjoining each other. One was on the extreme left-hand side of the house, and the other at the back with the windows looking out over the back lawn. This eventually became my room. All the doors were heavy solid, with solid brass latches. Windows were hinged teak framed and had a bamboo awning type blind that rolled down over the window 
to give shade from the sun. Downstairs was a separate formal dining room, lounge room, kitchen, toilet, and downstairs storage room, as well as a storage area under the staircase. The lounge room opened up onto a rear veranda area. Remember, the temperature was over 85 degrees Fahrenheit plus all year round. As per usual, European expatriate practices of the times in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong expats had domestic servants to look after the household chores. All expat houses built prior to the early 1960s had separate servants' quarters on the property. This house had a three-owned building with shared kitchen and bathroom, and it had a car garage building sited at the rear of the property about 20 meters from the main house. About three months after we moved in, funny things started to happen. The first incident was the appearance of a white cat. Interestingly enough, it always followed the last person who went into my parents' bedroom at night, the bedroom at the right-hand side of the house. This cat made no sound, but appeared from nowhere and scuttled into the room as the door was opened. This bedroom was air conditioned. A thorough search of the room failed to find the cat, but next night, there it was, entering again. At the time, we had no cats. This cat was seen every night until my parents moved to the middle bedroom, which was nearer to the room that my younger sister and I shared. Their old bedroom was then turned into a guest room. Over the years, Visiting guests who stayed overnight with us also saw this cat. One evening, about dusk, my mother, looking through the lounge window, witnessed a woman with long red hair, wearing a sort of white nightgown, standing near the front gate. She thought that this was unusual and walked out the front door to go talk to the woman. As she walked across the lawn, the woman walked away and went behind the hedge, which formed our front fence. When my mother got to the gate, she looked in the direction that the woman had walked and saw nothing. Three nights later, my father saw the same woman walk into the entrance of the servants' quarters. He followed her, but found no sign of her when he entered the building. She was never actually seen in our house, only on the front and back lawn and in the servants' quarters but she was regularly seen in the house next door, number 13, and also in one of the houses behind. The occupants of both these latter houses often saw her sitting on the edge of the bed brushing her hair, but there was never a reflection in the mirror. When spoken to, she would turn her head, smile, and slowly fade from view. We also saw an emaciated man in a military uniform, he was seen in our house, both upstairs and downstairs, as well as outside. One evening, my mother saw what appeared to be a body lying under a shroud in the front garden. About eight years later, I also saw this figure, for lack of a better word, on the back lawn at first light one morning, and again at about 3 a.m. on another morning. From time to time, we would also see an old Chinese woman in the lounge room. She was wearing a white starched linen top with black pajama pants, cut in a traditional Chinese style. This used to be the standard Chinese domestic staff uniform in the immediate pre- and post-World War II era. We referred to them as black and whites. By the 1960s, the next generation of Chinese female domestic staff had abandoned this tradition for more colorful pajama suit type clothing. One would look up from reading a paper or a book and see this old woman standing in front of you smiling. She would then fade quickly from view. She was only seen in the lounge, in broad daylight, but never when there were a lot of people around. One evening when in my mid-teens, I arrived home from visiting a friend. As I walked down the drive, I noticed that the lounge room was lit up and a man was shiny neatly combed black hair and wearing a khaki uniform was sitting in a chair with his back to the window and reading what appeared to be a newspaper. 
I got the impression that he was Asian and thought he was a friend of my father come to visit. Later, I recollected that the furniture in the room was different to what we had in there. When I entered, I found the whole house, including the lounge, to be in darkness, the rest of the family having gone out and the servants retired for the night. Thinking back, I think this man was probably a Japanese military officer. I only experienced this once, and my parents never did. Occasionally we would also hear a woman's voice calling out in terror. We couldn't figure out what she was saying, because she was saying it in Japanese. It was then that my parents realized that what we had seen and experienced were most likely the spirits of those who suffered there. After finding this out, we began to suspect that the cold room I described earlier in this narrative may have been used as a place for the ill treatment and execution of prisoners. My father learned that after the war, health authorities advised that the original septic tank was too close to the house and a new one had to be installed. While digging the new pit, workers had dug up human remains. We left the house in 1967 to move to a new house nearby. The next occupant, also working for the same company, also experienced funny things, but didn't actually see anything strange. This family's dog on several occasions also dug up human bones from the gardens. In the interest of preserving the local peace, they also quietly reburied the remains and said nothing. I didn't find out about what they experienced until many years after they had left Malaysia and returned to England. The company sold the houses in the mid-1970s after my family had left Malaysia. The houses at 15 and 17 were torn down, and a large mansion was built across the boundaries of both properties. However, this was demolished after a few years, and since then, the two blocks have remained vacant. In 2008, they are still vacant. This is a prime land in an inner suburban area, but the land is still vacant. The house at number 13 is still standing, but is abandoned and half the roof is collapsed. We wonder just what was found when the site was excavated for the new building. Also. The reason why the new mansion was also demolished and the blocks left vacant, maybe the souls of those poor victims still occupy the site and are not at rest and reappeared in the new building. I was shocked to see that in Lovejoy, Georgia, there were apparitions. I too had an experience, but didn't think much about it especially after everybody looked at us. My mother-in-law also saw it, as if we were crazy. We used to live in a new apartment complex. One day, I was sitting on the counter eating lunch, and my mother-in-law was in the living room. As she came towards me to get to the kitchen, we both saw a man going towards the room at the end of the hall. Our first instinct was that one had broken into the apartment. We did get a chill, but at the same time, we didn't seem it was a big deal. We just figured it was the fact that we had gotten scared. I grabbed the phone, and we walked towards the hallway. When we looked, we saw nobody. We thought they had gone into the bathroom or the laundry room. When we saw nobody, we looked in the closet of the room, but again, didn't see anybody. After we came to our senses, we realized that nobody could have entered because we would have heard the door and the alarm would have went off anyway. Two guys that slept in that room told us afterwards that they would have trouble sleeping for a long time. On occasion, they would hear the water running, but they thought it was the other one. After sharing these experiences, we have come to the conclusion that this was in fact paranormal. We called the leasing office and asked them if anything had happened in that apartment, or if they knew of anything of this nature in that area. They obviously thought we were crazy, and replied that they didn't know anything. 
Now that I have found this, I feel relieved that now thanks to this, my family believes us. I'm of course referring to your signs. Thank you for letting me share my story. There's a lot of things in my life I've seen over the years, but nothing has disturbed me quite like this. It was the weekend of break for myself and my mom, and we decided to go up to Oklahoma City to see my cousins. Everything was great. I got to see some relatives, and nothing seemed quite out of the normal. That is as far as normal went that night. While taking the four-hour drive back, I noticed that the moon was very huge and blood red. Of course, I didn't know about the eclipse that day, so it was cool to watch as we drove to Ferris, which is a tiny town between Lane and Antlers. I remember that my mother pulled into the Veterans Bridge in Aloka when a couple miles down the road, I happened to look up and an elderly couple was standing on the side of the road staring across as if watching something. It reminded me of the Grant Wood painting of the farmer. I remember looking at a clock a moment before and saw it was midnight. The moon was still out and still red. What makes it even worse for myself is that my mother also caught a glimpse of them. I turned around shocked and I felt like if I turned around they would be flying behind us screaming. I've passed by several times since then, and every time, I get a shiver up my spine, remembering what happened that night. I still get teased a bit about it, even to this day, even though my mom was pretty spooked out herself. My dog and I have been traveling the mountains of upstate New York and Pennsylvania for 17 years. So when he left me last February 2007, I brought him to his favorite spot. There was still snow on the ground, and tracking through the woods at this time was very difficult. I tried to pick ground with the pick that I carried, but the ground would not permit me. I found a nice spot and laid him under some brush beneath some trees. I told Dylan I would be back. Three weeks passed before I was able to get back to him. When I was driving up the dirt road, all I could think about was how I was going to find him. Being where I'd laid him down, I thought I'd find him in pieces. Was getting sick to my stomach. He was my boy, and this had to be done. When I reached him, it was just like I'd laid him down. Thought this was weird. He wasn't even stiff. It was like he was waiting for me to come back. It was nice being with him, even though he had passed. The rest of the afternoon off and on, I dug his grave, going very deep so the wild animals couldn't dig him up. I took off my coat and wrapped it around him and laid him in the grave. Dusk was setting in, and all of a sudden, I heard children moving all around me, laughing and giggling. I knew this wasn't natural for children to be where we were, for the closest house was at least 10 miles away. I still dismissed this in my mind, as the circle we were using around me kept getting smaller. I would stop every now and then and listen, but I would hear no breaking branches, which should have been happening. Thank God I already had a cross I made, for night was now upon me. When I was tracking up the mountain towards my car, the spirits were in a horseshoe behind me. Every now and then, I would turn around to keep them behind me, but this still didn't stop the giggling. Never heard this type of laughter before. When I made the clearing where my car was, the noise finally stopped. I popped the trunk open to put the pick and the shovel in. Then, I leaned over the hood of my car. There stood five solid white entities at the edge of the woods. They were not children. For the past 11 months, I've been visiting his graves to make sure his resting place is kept up and comfortable. Once, 
I saw a dark figure that drifted across the opening. Another time, this figure was floating seven yards from me. I even heard bullfrogs croaking. I'm an educated man. I'm not crazy. Can't talk to anyone about this without people thinking I'm weird or mentally disturbed. Either way, this was a tale that I thought you'd enjoy. It's a hundred percent real. I swear my life on it. I know I may only have my word, but it's the best I can do. I've worked at St. Francis Hospital in Peoria, Illinois for over 20 years. I've seen some of the nun ghosts on the seventh floor where the laboratory was when I worked there. The morgue was also on that floor. I was working third shift one night. At times, we took the back elevator, the service elevator, to the floors to draw labs when needed. As I was walking down the hall to the elevator, I saw a nun getting onto the elevator. I yelled out to her, please hold the elevator, sister. The door started closing. Thinking she did not hear me, I hit the down button as it closed. The door opened, but there was no one on the elevator. There was nowhere else she could have gone, for it was a dead-end hallway. To take the stairs, she would have had to walk past me. This was a strange night, and it took place many years ago. Another moment, it was fairly late, and I was again on my way to the elevator. This time, I made it inside alone, and as the elevator was closing, I saw a man in a white lab coat standing all the way at the end of the hallway. At the time, the hallway was pretty dark, but there was just enough light that you could see down it. I knew for a fact that there was absolutely no one else on the floor at the time. The image of the man in the lab coat, and also the nun, will always be engraved in my mind. This hospital has always had a reputation for having had ghostly visitations from previous employees who used to work there. Some of my co-workers have experienced this as well. When I was describing what I had seen to a current co-worker, she was a bit startled from the revelation. That's because one night, she had taken the elevator to the morgue, and when she got down to it, she could have sworn that she saw a figure or dark shadow in a praying position, kneeled over. She said the figure was an outline of a person, no distinct features, almost cloud-like, but could definitely tell it was made to be some sort of person. My theory is that the nun appeared once again to help with the newly deceased transition to the other side. I'd also like to think that the man in the lab coat was a former employee of this hospital. Either way, there's quite a bit of haunted history here and I'm not sure how to deal with it at times. Since I'm fairly used to creepy happenings, it no longer frightens me like it used to, but there's always a bit of excitement in telling these tales to those who haven't heard them before. I believe there is a portal to the other side that humans have access to, and eventually, we'll transport ourselves to this world. As for now, we're just getting a glimpse of the afterlife. This is an authentic story, and it happened to me. I've already posted this on allaboutghosts.com, but I've not heard anything about this place other than my story. Maybe someone out there has had a similar experience, or even paranormal things happen at this place. What made me want to add my story here is when I read the story about Tacoma, Point Defiance Park, Five Mile Drive. This story grabbed me and was almost disturbing to me because it is so closely related to mine about a little girl. However, this was no ordinary looking girl. She was looking real, of course, except she had no eyes and was smiling 
and then all of a sudden she disappeared. I was searching here to see if there was anything from my spot at Eagle Falls. When I went to this favorite swimming hole of mine on Sakoa River, this is a very beautiful swimming hole, almost lagoon-like, where the river flows with falls into a pool of deep colorful water and under the water, on the side of the walls, there are huge giant flat rocks that drop off down where you cannot see the bottom. The rocks above have been carved into the star-like settings that have become flat and then go down into where the river wall is. Across the river, which is only about 50 feet or so, there are rocks where people can climb to. There is a rope swing tied to a tree on the side also. It's a popular spot for people to swim in the summer. I really like this place for swimming and floating on my raft with flippers, so I can move faster to swim up the currents of the falls better and ride the river down. This brings me to my story. I was headed towards the place where I was going to do just that, and noticed there were two people to the right of me, a man and a woman, one sitting next to the rope swing, and the other climbing up the rocks. And to the left of me, there was this little girl, about six or seven years old, and standing about three feet away from me, on the edge of the rock by the water with her head turned slightly, and just smiling at me. I am swimming still almost to passing her, and notice she's still smiling, so I smiled. I waved to her and said hi. She still smiles at me, but says nothing back. I looked at her again, this time into her eyes. We locked eyes for a second, and that is when I noticed her eyes were very dark, to the point where I couldn't see her eye color. They only looked like black holes, almost hollow-like. Everything about this girl seemed normal, except for her eyes. She had a cute little swimsuit that was lime green, with little white flowers on it, and a little ruffle around the waist. She was tan, and had golden blonde shiny hair that came down past her shoulders, and also had bare feet. She was alone. There was nobody above her or next to her. I was thinking that maybe she was standing there watching her mother swing from the rope swing or something, but as I swam a little bit past her, I suddenly turned to look back because I feared her being too close to the edge and wanted to let her to know to step back. But as I turned to do this, she was gone. Now, I was wondering how she could climb the rocks that quickly and how she could be completely out of sight when I only turned for a second, then looked back. Surely I would have noticed her walking away, at least if she did climb the rocks, or even if she had fallen in, I would have heard the sound of water splashing. I was only a few feet away from where she was standing, and I quickly went to the area where I saw her, and nothing. I looked above and further back where some people were sitting by some trees and looked down along the banks where other people were sitting and with kids and no one looked like her or had blonde golden hair or the same bathing suit on. At this point of feeling very confused, I felt a cold chill come over me and my hairs and my arms were standing up. I felt a sadness and chilling feeling and had a vision of the same girl falling into the water and drowning. I even felt some pain and a little bit of anger type emotions right there where she stood while I was still trying to see if I could find her. I thought, where are her parents? Why is she all alone? So I swam back up to my spot by the river and told a friend I was with what happened and I pointed to the rock she was on. He said it sounded and even looked like I saw a ghost from the way I was acting. I asked him if he would go back with me to look for her, and he said no way, that is way too creepy, I don't want to go over there with you. I'm thinking about how this situation is so crazy, and the fact that it's daylight even. 
I'm going back to see if I can see her, I said. Determined to find her, I swam back to the spot where it happened and looked all over the area where people were sitting, and still, no little girl in a green bathing suit. I started looking in the water to see if I could see anything from down there. Nothing. And the girl across the river that I thought was her mother was not. She was with the guy on the rock still. Then again, I get the chill and I'm feeling sad and start becoming afraid of the spot and even swam away from it again, thinking this doesn't make any sense. Then wondering if I'm the only one who saw her. Did the people across the river even see her? This is a wide visible area where you can see everyone around you. Am I losing it? Then I remember those eyes she had were actually hollow. The smile she made and just kept smiling at me. How she didn't even move from the time I swam towards her. Stopped, made eye contact, and said hi. Then kept swimming, only a few feet further then turned around to say she was close to the edge, or, where is your mother? Somebody should be with you. I truly believe what I saw was an entity of some sort, and perhaps this little girl might have fell into the river and drowned, right where she was standing. I've heard some stories from here of people dying at the spot by swinging from the rope swings and jumping from the high cliffs, which happened right across from where she was. I also believe I wouldn't be so disturbed by this if it all seemed normal, but it didn't, and for some reason, she didn't seem to fit in. I wrote to ease my mind, and maybe to just get it out somehow. If anything at all, I will probably never know why she picked me to see her, but I will never forget what she looked like, or how she stared at me and smiled for so long. Maybe she was looking out for some people swimming in the river. Who knows? Well, this is the end of my story. Up until I was around 10, my mom, sister, and dad and I lived in a house called Filder's Green, which was in Lanark, Cornwall. The house must have been around 50 years old and was originally two cottages joined together, meaning it was fairly big. To begin, the only things that would happen would be the odd cold spot, and often, I felt like I was being watched. Another time, my mom went to use the downstairs bathroom, leaving my dad in the kitchen, when she heard a man cough loudly outside the door. Think he was my dad using the study, she shouted something, only to hear no reply. She left the bathroom. There was no one outside, or even in the study. When she went back to the kitchen, my dad was at the same place. She asked him if he had followed her to the bathroom, which incidentally wasn't near the kitchen, and he said he hadn't moved. There was no one else at the house at the time, apart from me and my sister and we were in bed. Another thing that happened was when my mom, my dad, and my dad's friend were sat in the kitchen late one night, when they suddenly heard an almighty crash from my bedroom upstairs. My mom said it sounded like a full-grown adult being thrown to the floor, thinking maybe my wardrobe had toppled over or had fallen out of bed. They ran upstairs and found me fast asleep, with nothing out of place. Later on, they even got someone to check the chimney in my room to see if a stone had fallen down it, but they found nothing. To this day, we don't know what the crash was, or indeed, who made it. The most unexplained incident, however, was the sound of a singing lady. My mom and dad were asleep in bed, and they were woken by a tuneless humming outside their bedroom door. There was no way it would have been me or my sister, as we were only young, and it was quite clearly the sound of a woman. 
the sound came along the corridor from my room and gradually disappeared downstairs. Another time, my mom, sister and I were inside my mom and dad's bedroom, helping my mom fold up some laundry. My dad was outside mowing the lawn, and we could see him from the room. After we had finished, we went to open the bedroom door, which was shut. We couldn't get out. The door had no lock on it and wasn't jammed. There was no draft in the room as it was an airless summer's day. It felt like someone was standing outside, holding onto the handle to prevent us from leaving. My mom, who was obviously stronger than me and my sister, tried the door too, but there was no lock. In the end, we had to shout outside to my dad to come and let us out. He opened the door easily, and there was no sign of it ever being stuck. We left that house when my parents separated, and I found out from someone that knew the current inhabitants that they too were experiencing strange things, such as their child's toys being turned and turned off during that night. My friends and I went to Cypress Valley Cemetery in Villanoa, Arkansas. We come to your site and have tried out some of the places and have gotten good responses. We parked our car out front and went into the gates around 3 in the morning. There were four of us, there were two guys, and then my best friends and I who are girls. The guys went in first and we followed them soon after. Immediately entering, we all had a very strange feeling come over us. My best friend and I decided to go back to the car and let the guys walk around and explore some more. We were alone in the car for nearly 20 minutes with the windows rolled down because we were smoking when we started hearing screams from the distance. They sounded like they were coming from a woman. We saw no one else there. Then a few minutes later, my best friend saw the outline of two men walking on one end of the cemetery. She assumed it was our guys, so she called their cells, which when they answered, the lights from the phone showed us that they were on the complete opposite end. There is no way that they could have made it over there that quick. When we finally decided to leave, they got in the car and we sat for a minute. We had the windows rolled down but it was about 68 degrees outside, so it wasn't cold at all. We all felt as if the air conditioning was blasting on us, but there was no source of air. It was very strange. Strange things kept happening to us later the next day. We go ghost hunting almost every weekend, and have been to many places, and this one was by far the scariest place. It just felt very uneasy, very dark. Just thought I'd let you know. Here is one of my stories of paranormal activity. From being very young, my brother and I had always experienced things we knew were not normal. But of course, our grandparents, whom we had lived with since we can remember, brushed it off as childish imagination. As we were growing up, we saw less and less unusual happenings. It all began when I was 15 years old. My brother at the time was 17, and our grandfather passed away. My entire family reported seeing him the night after he passed away. Now, my family has its skeptics and its believers, and every one of them reported seeing him laughing and looking much younger and healthier than they'd ever remembered. He smiled at them all and said goodbye. Now, my brother and I had not seen this apparition, so we brushed it off as their subconscious, projecting an image they all wanted to see. Of course we were believers, but we thought if anyone would have seen him, it would have been us, 
for we had been there for him when nobody else had ever been. Well, our thoughts came to reality one night, around five months after his passing, and this supposed collective haunting. My brother and I were up in his room playing on the PC. My grandmother was out, and my little sister in bed. Now my grandfather, or daddy, as was his nickname, always enjoyed his music and always had it on extremely loud. We were laughing at something on the internet when John Lennon, imagine, began playing very loudly downstairs. Well, at first, we thought it was a cruel joke by our neighbors. This particular song had been his first choice for his cremation, and so I, being the braver of us, stormed downstairs to find it was indeed coming from the office room that was my grandfather's. I walked into his old room to find it was freezing, and there were no windows or doors open, and the CD player was not on, and the music was still going. Then, there was a knock on the back door. Usually our neighbors used our back door, and the music stopped. My brother was now downstairs with me, and we thought it must have been our neighbors there to complain, and the noise so, he unblocked and opened the door. Opposite the door was an outside toilet, and as my brother opened the door he froze. His face paled, and I could tell there was something wrong. I looked outside to see nothing, but incredibly shaken by the music, I slammed and locked the door, turned every light on in the house, bar my sisters, as she was seemingly sound asleep, and sat downstairs waiting for my grandmother. To this day, my brother will not tell me what he saw outside, but I doubt it was the friendly spirit of my grandfather coming to say goodbye. The reason I believe this is because the morning after, my little sister said, Do you believe in ghosts? I didn't react and merely asked why. She then replied that the night before daddy had been in her room when she was crying about his passing telling her the shush that everything was okay and he was happy. Also, my neighbors, who were really quick to complain, never mentioned any loud music coming from our house, so I really want to know why only us heard this music, and more importantly, who had been outside when my brother had opened the door. There is a two-story house right in the center of town that I lived in, in 1958 or 1959. It is known as the Old Van Delzim House. Both my cousin and I experienced odd things in that house. There were many times that we would hear footsteps, such as a man wearing boots, walking from the upstairs front bedroom towards the back bedroom to the left of the stairs. My cousin also said that she saw an old apparition in the backyard. I went to see the psychic Carol Pete this week and showed her a picture of the house. She said she felt it was a soldier from the Civil War era. Also, she said that many horrible things happened on the property. No one ever died in the house, so it is connected with the land it sits on. We stayed there only about two or three months and moved to another location in the same town. I also found out that I am a psychic medium, have had many unexplained things happen through the years. This soldier is not threatening, he does not know he is dead, wish the house was mine so I could try to help him. All this has been burned in my memory for nearly 50 years. Hi, my name is David, I'm a French student, and I wanted to share some eerie things that happened to me and to some of my friends with you readers. My grandfather died last year. He was a total atheist, and believed that supernatural is just some bullcrap, and that people who got interested in it were pitiful fools. What's more, he was a convinced internationalist communist 
and often led some speeches against God and the church. I was the contrary of my grandfather, a conservative Christian loving God in fatherland, so the situation often led to arguments between my grandfather and me, as we were obviously on a different wavelength, but it didn't matter. He was my grandfather, I was his grandson, he loved me, and I loved him as well, and we would often laugh together. Well, as a Christian believer, I believe and still believe in hell, and I feared that my grandfather would go there after his death because of his resolute anti-God feelings, so I said a lot of rosaries so that God would put him on the right way. One day, as I went back from the university, I got a phone call from my mother. She told me that my grandfather had been sent to the hospital in order to cure a little pain in the knee. But when the doctors started to inspect his general state of health, they found out that my grandfather had a generalized cancer and that is why he felt so tired. I got so upset hearing that, that I rushed to the church and put a candle to the Holy Virgin so that she would get the forgiveness to my godless, communist grandfather. I went to visit my grandfather in the hospital where he was sadly ending his life and I could notice no changes in his mind and moral and his calvary in the hospital bed lasted for months. Here is the moment when my story becomes interesting. In my prayers, I would always ask the Holy Virgin to save him and let me know by a sign that she had taken him to the right place, near the God and far from hell. It was an ordinary night. I was reading in my bed with my bed light and listening to the outside noises as usual, and I closed my eyes to sleep afterwards. Oh God, I can never forget what I lived this night. It was about 5 a.m. because it happened just a moment before I woke up. I had a very powerful dream and it looked so real that it is still sculpted in my memory. I dreamt about a giant curtain of red velvet with a portrait of my grandfather hanging on it. I looked at this picture and my eyes looked leftwards and saw that the curtains were open like on a theater. Behind these velvet curtains, I could see the sky filled with orange clouds lit like on a wonderful sunset or dawn, I don't know. And suddenly, I saw a boy kneeling in the darkness in front of the scene and I recognized myself. I can't figure out why, but I know that the boy in this dream kneeling was me in person. A short moment after, a young woman went out from behind the curtain from the lit side. She had a blue dress and a blue veil. Both were blue, one dark, the other clear. She looked like Raphael's holy virgin in the painting. I remember her peaceful face that made me feel peaceful and tranquil. The lady sat in front of the kneeling boy, me, and started talking to him. I would see the lady's lips moving, but no sounds coming from her mouth. But I distinctly remember her beautiful eyebrows. After talking, she showed me something behind her. It was a ladder, a beautiful multicolor ladder the one in the orange clouds. The ladder went through a hole in the clouds and this hole had incredibly powerful light coming right from it and it thrilled rays of light. It was noisy like a storm, though not frightening at all, not at the contrary. My dream stopped with this vision of delight. I had forgotten the dream on the following morning and went downstairs for the coffee. My mother was standing in the kitchen and her eyes were painful. As I held my cup, she told me that my sister called from the hospital and that my grandfather passed away. I was waiting for this event with pain, but I got psychologically ready. Anyway, tears began to go out from my eyes and I began to cry and go in the garden to think. And as I was walking through the trees in my garden, 
I suddenly remember that strange dream of the night. And I was thinking that it was the sign I was waiting for, and that I beseeched the Blessed Virgin to send me. I was so grateful. I went to the church and told the Holy Virgin thank you. But I wasn't expecting such an intervention, but another prayer of mine had been made. However, if you're thinking that this story is going to be about light and positivity, you thought wrong. Because one day, a few days before the funeral, I was visited by a spirit with horns. That's right. I was lying in my bed asleep when the door slightly opened a little bit, and I was greeted by this creature, this horn figure. It was definitely a black mass, but it was just standing there as I was trying to regain consciousness in the middle of the night. It stared at me with its red glowing eyes. That's all I remember, the dark outline of this dark mass and the horns protruding out of its head. It was there for about 40 seconds, and I'll never forget the sight, and it just slowly disappeared. I have no idea what connection this is to my grandfather, or even if it means something, but it definitely rattled me to my core. I started to get a lot less sleep, and on days that I would get sleep, I would have these terrible nightmares of the same horned figure. In one of those dreams, the horn figure would be seen off into the distance with again those glowing red eyes, and there would be candles scattered about with the only source of light coming from the candles. They were all lined up row by row and in a line that eventually led to this horn figure. I remember waking up instantly after that dream and crying profusely. I yelled out to my grandfather. I said, please save me from these nightmares. I'm sick of these nightmares. Fast forward a few days after the funeral and the most spectacular thing happened, though it was a little unsettling, not even going to lie. And I feel like this was truly confirmation that God was answering my prayers. We have this massive full body mirror that rests in the living room. This is where I saw my grandfather in the mirror, standing right behind me. It happened so fast, and it disappeared so quickly, that I had to regain my composure and not freak myself out too much, because I knew deep down inside that my grandfather was here to tell me it was okay, and that I shouldn't fear evil. Was it a possibility that I was so distraught over losing my grandfather, that I thought I was losing my mind in the process, and I was just imagining everything that I was seeing? I don't know. I can see why people would think that after this story, but what I do know is that I contacted my grandfather and maybe some unruly spirits, maybe deep below the surface that we can't always reach. And it's really terrifying, but also comforting to know that my grandfather has my back, even in the afterlife. One early morning I had been sitting in my family room, reading the newspaper. It was a very quiet morning, and I was all alone. The sun was coming through a bedroom window off the family room, and shining down the hallway. It was one of those extremely bright sunrises the kind where you can see dust particles floating through the air. I glanced up as I was turning the newspaper page. I then saw in the sun rays the outline of what looked like a man. It had a light black to gray color. It had no details, just the outline of its body. It was about three feet off the floor and had no legs from around the knees down. I could see the arms, it had no hands either. I just remember telling myself, wow it's a ghost, and I took it all in. I told myself not to turn my head or blink. 
The ghost appeared to be looking into the bedroom. It turned its head slightly to the right. At that point, I had to blink. My eyes were drying out. When I did that, it was gone. I then got up and put my hands through the spot where it was. I guess I wanted to see if it would be cool or something, but it was the same temp. I just stood there in amazement of how cool that was. I also needed to add, it was no one's shadow, and it's hard to describe, but it was not a shadow. I could see the dust particles going through the figure, and the figure was in the middle of the hallway. It was three-dimensional. It actually looked like a hologram. I really love those rare ghost encounters. My parents bought a house in Newborn, North Carolina in 1970. It was a brand new home in a new neighborhood. I lived in this house with my parents and younger sister until I went to college in 1994. The house was a three bedroom, two full bath ranch with a carport. Before I was born, my father enclosed the carport and turned it into a large den. The original steps, carport door frame, and window frame remained and led up into our kitchen. It was an interesting layout because you could look through the open window frame from the kitchen and see into the sunken den or vice versa. The bedrooms were on a long hallway at the back of the house. The hallway could be reached by two doorways, the kitchen and living room, actually one big circle. The first bedroom in the hall faced the street. The bathroom was next, another bedroom, and then my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. The room next to my parents' room was mine until my little sister was born. I was five years old. I was moved down to the first bedroom. This room gave me the creeps. The closet door would slide open a bit on its own, which my parents said was probably a draft from the heat or air conditioning. However, after someone broke into my bedroom window while I slept and stole a few things from my room, I never stayed in there again, usually sneaking into my little sister's room and sleeping with her or sleeping on my parents' bedroom floor. I constantly slept with the bathroom light on and a bright nightlight or a lamp. I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear odd noises that made me feel paralyzed and cold all over. One would think these irrational fears would subside with age, but they seemed to intensify over the years. One reoccurring incident that still bugs me occurred in the kitchen, den area. Whenever I would be sitting on the couch watching TV, I would see the silhouette of a person walk by the window frame from the old carport. I would assume it was my mom or dad because the shape was tall. What would scare me to death was the fact that no one would appear at the door leading to the steps after I would see the shape walk by. Many times I would call out to my parents, thinking it was one of them, but no one would answer. And then, I would walk up the steps and look into the kitchen. There was never anyone there. Most times, this would happen when I was home alone. On numerous occasions, my parents would come home to find me sitting on the front porch steps or sitting in my car with the doors locked. This went on for years, and I was very excited when I moved out to go to college. Years later, I went to visit my little sister and stayed with her in her college dorm room. We were telling ghost stories with some of her friends when I told her my accounts of the shadow. I was in mid-sentence when my sister finished my thought and described the incident in perfect detail. I had never told my sister about this because she was much younger and I didn't want to scare her. Needless to say, we were both shocked and had goosebumps. We compared stories 
and it seems we had very similar experiences in that house. My parents eventually built a new house about 10 miles away and sold that house. I wonder to this day if the new owners have ever experienced any of the oddities that my sister and I did. I'm 28 years old now. The paranormal has always interested me, but only recently have I started to research it. I've come to believe now that some things I've experienced as a child were probably more than nightmares. I believe my encounters were that of the paranormal, edited with a touch of child's imagination. Contrary to what you might believe, I think my touch of a child's imagination is what scared me the most. I decided to share with you those experiences that could be considered nightmares for your entertainment, but also those that I truly believe are paranormal. At the age of five to seven, I can't recall for sure. One night, I was lying in my bed, asleep. I felt something moving at the bottom of my bed, and the next thing you know, I felt like I was being dragged out of my bed. My covers had tightly wrapped themselves around my legs, so tight that I couldn't move them. I yelled, my bed is eating me, help, mommy, daddy, help. By the time it stopped and parents got into the room, half of my body was hanging off the side of my bed while the other half was hanging on for dear life. You know what my parents' response was? That's what happens when you don't fix your bed every day. Your bed eats you. No, really. I still never fix my bed after that. I disproved that theory fast. It never happened again. I look back now and realize that whatever it was in that house had a weird and somewhat morbid sense of humor. Check it out. Several other times, I would wake up from a rather deep sleep, turn over, and open my eyes as if something told me, wake up Steph. Sure enough, I would open my eyes and one of two things would be sleeping next to me. A. Bo Duke. He was like a hero to me at the time. Or B. An orange mummified witch with a cone-shaped hat and empty eye sockets. Now. You would think waking up next to Bo Duke saying hi, Steph, would be cool as all heck, but no. I would freak out, jump so high I would fall off my bed, and thump, and run to my mom's room screaming, Bo Duke is in my bed, help. It was way more dramatic when I saw the witch. Now, here's what really makes me think it was actually a spirit playing games with me. As I got older, about 10 years old I would say, the occurrences were not so graphical. I would still hear a voice say wake up stuff. I would open my eyes and see a pitch black silhouette of a man standing in the far corner of my room, about 6 feet tall. I would blink my eyes a few times, he was still there. I would pull the cover over my head and then peep out. He was still there. Of course, I then freaked out and ran to mommy's room screaming, the boogeyman is here to get me. Help mommy, the boogeyman is here. This would happen several times a month, for a good year or so it seemed. The last occurrence was years later, when what believed to be the same silhouette mentioned above ran across my room. First, I saw a blur run down the hall to my left and stop at the middle of the wall near the footboard of my bed. It took a moment for it to take shape, but it was definitely the silhouette of a human. I started to dart, and the moment I moved, it darted towards the other wall and vanished. I freaked out and flew to my dad and told him that there was someone in my room. Years later, when I was old enough to understand, my dad told me of the ghost of an old lady that dwelled in the house. 
She was a nice, but sometimes grumpy old gal. However, that doesn't explain the man that was in my room. I still can't figure out if the Beau Duke, which thing was truly a nightmare, or a spirit messing with my head, using the touch of a child's imagination. I've been to Gibbs Bridge twice, and we have seen something every time. The first time the signs kept changing, there will be a lot of writing on the signs, or not every time we came around. I looked back and thought that someone was messing around with us, and I saw a figure standing alongside of the road, ran by the guardrail, and disappeared. Then. I kept seeing something black out of the corner of my eye. My cousin was with me, and she started to scream, and me and her both heard moaning over her screaming. Then, it was me and my sister and her friend. The signs again kept changing, but only a few, not at all like last time. We took pictures, and got orbs. Then, we saw a figure again by the sign, and disappeared. We went all the way down the street, and turned around, and saw a big bright light. I told my sister it was probably a car, so flash your lights to let them know that you are coming. She did that, and the light was gone. It kind of looked like a motorcycle light with handlebars. I know the whole story about it. Then, we turned around again, and saw it again. It was not the street light at all, because we turned around going back to the bridge about 10 to 15 times, and only showed up about 3 times. The weirdest part of that night was we left, and my sister's phone was in the center council. Nobody was touching it. Somebody that we know called us, and wondered why we called. Nobody did it. It was in the center council the whole time. My sister looked down and saw her phone hanging up, and they said we left a message. It was all three of us talking, and it was muffled. Tell me what you think, and go out there some time again. Thanks for reading my story. Back in the early 90s, a wealthy family who lived in Corona owned two homes. One large home they owned was on the south side of Corona, overlooking the 15 freeway. The other home, used later as an office, was the old in-town district on Corona's famous Grand Avenue. As the story goes, before the husband and wife met and got married, the husband lived in the large house on Grand Avenue. The house once been a funeral parlor, and almost nightly, the husband would hear talking and other noise coming from the room next to him. He would check the room, only to find it silent and nothing out of place. After he met his wife, they purchased the large house on the south side and turned the Grand Avenue mansion into an office. One of the children of the family went to my school, and he claimed that their family had experienced all kinds of strange phenomena in the old mansion. One instance, a soda can was completely knocked off of a nightstand, right next to a bed that he was sleeping on, and constantly, they would hear footsteps upstairs. And the mother once said she was in the bathroom, and the door suddenly flew open. All of the windows were closed, eliminating any chance of a drift. Another night, the family drove past a mansion, as they often would, to make sure it was secure. Remember, nobody lived there at this time. It was only used as an office. As they drove past the house, they noticed every single light in the house was turned on. They went in, turned out the lights, and left. They checked with everyone who had a key to the house, and everyone assured them they had not turned on the lights. It is claimed that the atmospheric pressure in the backyard is different from the rest of the area. These stories were all interesting to me, 
but I still had some skepticism. Until one year, the family was going to go on vacation to visit relatives in Texas, and they asked my mother and me if we would watch the mansion for them while they were gone. Keep in mind, neither my mother nor I knew anything about the house, including the strange phenomena. So Monday morning, we got to the house and settled in. My mother, a school teacher at the time, was grading some homework assignments, and I, only about five at the time, was fast asleep on the couch. My mother got thirsty, so she stacked the homework assignments in a pile, went to the kitchen for some water, came back, only to find the paper strewn all over the table and on the floor. I was still fast asleep, and there were no open windows. Later on that day, she was in the kitchen again, and she heard me crying in the other room. She ran in to see what was wrong, but again, I was fast asleep. I did not appear to be restless, as if crying in my sleep. Later on that week, we both occasionally would hear footsteps walking around upstairs. It is a very old house, as you can see from the attached photo, so naturally, the floors are very creaky. These were definitely solid footsteps. We constantly went upstairs after hearing the steps, only to find the place empty. After the family returned from their vacation, my mother had mentioned to them the phenomena we experienced. They laughed and explained to us that it happens all of the time. They described the entity as a friendly ghost who likes to play pranks on people, hence the bathroom door flying open. The family eventually moved to Texas and sold the mansion to somebody else. I never return to ask the new owners if they have experienced anything. Perhaps somebody around this area might want to. My name is Prenta. I lived in Hamtramck, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, in a two-story flat on Crailing Street. The apartment itself has a long and bloodied history of violence and death. Not only did I experience multiple ghostly apparitions, such as a man in a long beard that resembled Abraham Lincoln, but demonic possession, as well as poltergeist activity. The demonic possession was incredibly startling. It wasn't something that occurred inexplicably. I had a boyfriend who was connected to negative energies, and an evil spirit named Harold latched onto him. My boyfriend had never been once an aggressive or temperamental person. However, after staying together in that apartment for a lengthy period of time, our relationship began to sour. He would often talk in his sleep, which was something he had never done in the seven years previous, and we had lived together for a long time. One night, he was sleeping right next to me. For some reason, I remember I had a difficult time trying to rest, so I was tossing and turning in bed. My boyfriend was dead asleep. Not a second later, he starts whispering. He keeps repeating, Harold's here. Harold wants to play. Although it scared me half to death, what he said after that truly shook me to my core. He uttered some unnerving words, Something about how he was going to take care of my suffering soul. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore, and I woke my boyfriend up. He was in a pure state of delirium. I told him he was talking in his sleep, and when I told him what he said, he looked at me as if he were terrified. That's because he said he had a dream about a man named Harold. My boyfriend told me that in his dream, he was in the Mafia, and Harold was his mob boss. He wore a pure white suit and looked like a traditional mobster from the 1920s. Well, a couple days later, I was cleaning my apartment when I discovered a secret room that I never noticed before. 
It was basically a walk-in closet. The room was empty, except for a small cabinet with a drawer. I opened the drawer, and in it was an old newspaper from the 1930s. I kid you not, in this newspaper was an obituary about a man named Harold. The obituary didn't say he was part of the Mafia, but he was a World War I veteran. I believe that Harold used to live in this apartment. My boyfriend told me that Harold appeared once while he was in the shower, and I was away at work. I often worked the night shift at a hospital, so I'm often away at night. He heard a crash coming from the kitchen that startled him. When he went to investigate, the dishes that were on the countertop somehow fell to the floor. He then returned to the bathroom to brush his teeth. When he saw the face of a young man staring back at him in the mirror for a second, right behind him, it was so quick, but long enough to notice. He then had an idea to photograph the bathroom, a picture directly facing the mirror, and then the bathroom itself while standing from the door frame. What he saw was incredible. It was an orb, clear as day, appearing right in the mirror. Either way, I was convinced that later on, my boyfriend was possessed by Harold. He became a shell of his former, laid-back and friendly self. He transformed into a vicious, aggressive, and easily agitated person. We eventually had to have a priest come over to bless the apartment, and to perform a prayer on my boyfriend to release the spirit who could be inside of him. After we moved out of the house, the feeling of intense rage and negative energy seemed to subside almost entirely. He stopped talking in his sleep, he was more easygoing, and he started to become the man I fell in love with years ago. Still, there was one experience that I had while in that apartment that I'll never forget as long as I'll live. It was the evening and I was starting to settle down on my first night off from the hospital in days. I walked to my bedroom to change. In the bedroom, there is this huge mirror that I often use. As I was walking through the bedroom, I was looking at myself in the mirror. That's when I saw a woman dressed all in black with a scarf. It must have been some kind of babushka woman. I instantly closed my eyes out of pure fright. And as I opened them back up again, I returned to look back at the mirror, only to see that this woman had disappeared. I only saw myself. All of these events are 100% true. I know sometimes when people tell these types of stories, they are often met with a high degree of skepticism. I should mention though, that I have high integrity, and I think it is foolish to tell pointless lies just for attention, or to have a good story. The possession, Harold, the poltergeist activity, and the babushka woman were all signs that something awful wouldn't leave that apartment. At this point, I'm just thankful that I don't have to experience that ever again, and that my boyfriend isn't being used as a vehicle for paranormal entities. I would say this is a story of a haunted house, but it isn't. Until about 10 years ago, it was just a haunted house in my book. I met my husband over 30 years ago. He told me about a house that he used to live in that had some very strange things happening in it. It was local, but he never wanted to go anywhere near it. He said that it was very old and had been built by a young person had some of the wood and granite that made the fireplace sent from Ireland. Anyway, the story is that when he married his wife, she came with her mother, a real shrew. She harped at him and distressed his wife to the point where he went mad and killed them both, then ran screaming that the demons of the house had made him do it. My husband's family moved into the house in the early 60s. 
bodies. During the years they lived there, they heard doors closing and footsteps on the stairs, as well as the smell of coffee and frying bacon in the middle of the night. His mother was quite a gardener, but could never get flowers to grow in the yard. He said the whole family was quite uncomfortable in the home and eventually moved. We had been together for a few years when we heard that the property had been sold for a mini storage lot. We were talking about it with my sister and some friends when my husband told the story. The friends asked to see the house. I'd never seen it to this point and I'll admit was more than a little bit curious. We finally talked him into going and away we went. When we turned onto the street, we got a really creepy feeling, but when we pulled up to the house, I was absolutely terrified. There was not a living blade of grass or anything else on that lot. We live in Washington State, and this was March. The house was dark and very ominous. I refused to get out of the car, so did my sister. The guys, three of them including my husband, took a flashlight and headed around to the back of the house to see what they could see. After a few minutes, we saw a flash of light on the second floor. A few minutes later, we saw the front door open, but nobody came out. After a few minutes more, they returned to the car. We commented on the fact that we had seen the light, and they told us that they had never turned it on. Then we asked them why they didn't come out the front door. They told us it was locked and that they tried it before going around back. I was always skeptical about the stories connected with the house. But after they tore the house down, the mini storage was plagued by problems and eventually went out of business. The property sits abandoned and barren. Still nothing lives there and it's still as creepy as it was years ago. I've got a story to add to your website. I've gone back and forth about someone having come check it out, just not sure I'm ready for it. But here goes my story. My husband and I moved into a new house built on a minor Civil War battlefield. We know there was another house in the vicinity. There was also a tree that was referred to as the hanging tree, not far from our backyard on which about Union soldiers were hung. Soon after moving in, we noticed odd shadows and white lights that seemed to move across rooms with no apparent source. We tried to account for them by cars passing on the road, but never could pinpoint anything. One evening, we were watching TV when a shape ran past a door to what eventually would be our deck. The door was a good four feet off the ground, but the person running past ran level with the door itself. My husband and I ran for the door, flung it open, and my husband jumped down and ran in the same direction. At that time, we were the only house on the end of the street, and being a very small town, it's very quiet at night, and sounds carry for quite a distance. We didn't hear anyone running, nor did we see anyone. We were spooked, but figured it was a kid, and our eyes played tricks on us. Not long after that, my husband jumped off the couch and ran for the door again, because he said someone was standing there looking in. Again, level with the door, and no deck. There was no one we could see when we went outside. Some months later, I was up around midnight, cleaning the kitchen. My husband had gone to bed and shut the bedroom door. The bedroom was at the top of the steps and the door in plain sight. I was watching TV across the great room when I saw out of the corner of my eye a man leaning around the corner of the hallway wall and smiling at me. As I turned my head, I was ready to yell at my husband for sneaking up on me, 
when I realized the man's hair was long and blondish, and my husband's is dark brown. In short, I also realized the man was wearing a white t-shirt with full sleeves, nothing my husband owned. I couldn't see anything from the waist down. While I stood there staring, he simply vanished. I immediately ran to the hall and noticed that the bedroom door was still shut, and if anyone had gone out the front door, I would have heard it. There was nothing, no sign of anyone. When my husband got up for work, I told him what happened. He said it was my imagination. I didn't think so, but we left it at that. However, I started turning on the lights when he left the house for work, since he left at 3 a.m. A few weeks later, though, my husband was in the front room at the computer. To the left is a table with an antique mirror hanging over it. My husband saw movement in the mirror, in turn thinking it was one of our cats on the table. Instead, he saw a man's shoulder and arm, wearing a white shirt, walk past in the mirror. My husband simply got up and walked outside until I got home. During this time, my son, who knows no fear, would never stay downstairs at night by himself. He said he was creeped out, like someone was watching him from outside the door. My daughter, a typical teenager at the time who kept to her room, would often come downstairs to hug me and sit close to me. When I'd ask her if something was wrong, she told me that sometimes she felt someone was sitting on her bed and that she saw things move out of the corner of her eye. The strange thing is that my husband and I never told the kids what we saw until they were 18 and 19. There was a time when activity seemed to stop after my husband, getting the idea from my friends, stood in the center of the house and asked whoever was there to not show themselves to him. He was left alone after that. However, recently, we've been experiencing marital problems and my husband moved into another bedroom. I'm now hearing footsteps in my room and I'm constantly woken up by what feels like someone sitting on my bed. I'll roll over, but there won't be anyone there. One night was unusually bad, and I had to get up earlier than normal the next day for a class. Around 10 p.m., I said out loud that I needed to sleep, and he wasn't letting me. If he wanted to bother someone, to please go harass my husband. Strangely enough, it got quiet and I fell asleep, only to be woken at 11 p.m. by my husband, who was in the bathroom, frantically looking for someone to stop an area on his leg from hurting. He has psoriasis, but this particular time, he said it felt like someone was poking him with needles. The area was deep red and gave off heat, a very odd coincidence to say the least. We've also had things go missing, a tablecloth, a 15th century style costume, and various little things that turn up in different areas. We have yet to track down the tablecloth or the costume. I did tell the ghost not to hurt my husband. My uncle and aunt now live in a house near the bank in Auburn town. When I was a little girl, my best friend Stephen and his family lived there. They bought the house and were told that the previous owner, an elderly lady, still haunted the house. They put little faith in the story and never let it bother them. I remember playing in Stephen's room and smelling an old lady smell, like medicine and Lilliac perfume. We never felt threatened by a presence at all. The smell would usually fade away just as quickly as we smelled it. However, one night, after the family had gone to bed, Stephen's mother was awakened by the sound of toys making noise in Stephen's room. 
Stephen had one problem. He was highly susceptible to nosebleeds. The slightest bump would set off a massive flow of blood. Stephen's mother thought it was strange that he was awake and playing with so many noisy toys at once in the middle of the night. Also, the rocking chair in his room where she would often read him bedtime stories was rocking so hard that it was banging against the wall. She ran down the hall to his room, and when she opened the door, the toys went silent. The rocking chair slowed down. She looked at Stephen in his bed and saw that his nose was bleeding very badly, and it was going down his throat. He might have drowned in his own blood if the very sweet lady's ghost had not raised such a racket that night. My grandmother Emily was a hard-working wife and mother, and during the Great Depression, she held her family together, even when her husband, Grandma William, died suddenly. He left her widowed with several children to raise. She was a down-to-earth person and a practicing Catholic, so was not given to superstitions, but nevertheless had some encounters with the otherworldly. One time, for example, she was on her way to visit one of her brothers, an elevator repairman. On the way there, getting off the train, she had a sudden premonition of his death. She got a hold of herself and rushed to where she was supposed to meet him. It didn't take long for her to arrive at his workplace, an elevator station, where he had to do a repair job. She saw a noisy crowd assembled there, and she inquired what was happening. She was told that a repairman had been killed in an accident. It was her brother, the very one whom she had gone to meet, and about whom she recently had a deathly premonition about. I explain this as a prelude to our ghost story. Among her other siblings, she had a brother who was a decent man and a barber by profession. Unfortunately, they had a disagreement, which escalated into a parting of ways. He uncharitably held a grudge against her all the while. Time passed, and one night, while she was asleep, and her husband were asleep in bed, she was suddenly awakened out of a sound sleep and noticed a person kneeling near the side of the bed. It was her estranged brother, garbed in his brother's smock and weeping bitterly. He was apparently suffering. She was startled and confused and didn't know how he got in her house and bedroom in the middle of the night and why he suddenly showed up after choosing to cut himself off because of a silly grudge against her. She began to speak to him and ask him what was wrong, but he interrupted his sobs to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And with that, he completely vanished. She was amazed and woke up her husband, relaying to him what had just occurred. As they lay there discussing it, the telephone rang. Her husband answered, and it was for her. When she got on the phone, she was informed that sadly, there had been a death in the family that very night. It was her estranged brother, the barber. They understood this ethereal visit from beyond the grave to be the soul of the departed brother, and that he was given the grace to appear from his purgatory to his sister in order to make up for his uncharitable bearing of a grudge. A requiem, mass was offered for him, and they prayed for his soul. He never appeared again. I come from a long line of psychics, and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, and mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom into a room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, 
and lots of her family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before and was distraught by the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, the spirit visits the family on the third fifth, and seventh day after their death. This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was Daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye standing in the doorway wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in, but had just fallen asleep on the bed, fully clothed and knit wearing brown trousers and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye, and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery, where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom, until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. I awoke to pitch black, and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor. I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back. So I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go, with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk 
and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor and in the bunk bed with me? The strange pink light. Around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops, we were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason, to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. He checked out where the possible light source could be coming from. The curtains. No, we were on third floor, so it could have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom, all lights were off, and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, the sphere appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was, or where it came from. Running Ghost When he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate, and it flashed again, with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it, until the pictures were developed, and on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast, so fast, it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural, and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14, when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. Just before I started university in the UK, I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we are heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, Something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it, imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This, of course, being the famous... Princess Diana of Wales, who died tragically in a car accident, but I predicted it the day before, at least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Udalexer Cemetery Experience So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was Student Diggs on Ulexer New Road. 
I was heavily into my goth influence back then. Not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly, and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed, so we were locked in, and had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter, looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall, when the sun just disappeared and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones, so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones and holes in graves and that danged mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, frantically trying to get out, with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me, and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar, and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby, that I found out that the very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences, but looking at the dream section, I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A. done this before, or B. seen places or people before, or C. really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind, and was very careful of not wandering off my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom, and even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest, so we walked in, and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house though, and I refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away, until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it and threw the door open and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up, 
and realized that I still needed to go. So I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings, and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time, and so it was. Finally, before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog, Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems, and she couldn't walk very well because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. So one evening, when her parents were out, my sister and I were playing with her in the garden, and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seemed to be able to predict death, unfortunately, amongst other things. I turned to my sister. When I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie that looked like a cross, it was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me, but sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back and our parents were in pieces, and that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down, as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught, as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her, and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary. I'll do that this year, as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch and my husband and I said goodnight and went to bed in my mother's bedroom because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep. So I was just laying there, 
looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly, I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass, right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had, because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband, but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color as opposed to the regular darkness. It was pitch black and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, Hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head and scared me half to death. I stuck my hand in it and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up and I said I saw it as well and was frightened by it. They both said, wow, I wonder what it was. I had read somewhere that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. I'm a nurse and run our family's assisted living, and recently we had some strange things happen in our care home. I understand with caring for the elderly that sometimes strange things occur in doing this for almost a decade. Recently. I had a resident that started to decline at the age of 93. One night, after helping her get into bed, she asked me if Bernie, her husband, who died 10 years before, knew where she was. I reassured her that he did. It caught me off guard since her mind was intact and she was not forgetful. A week went by and again, I assisted the woman into bed. She says to me, I hear Bernie in the hallway. Can you tell him that I'm in here? I told her to call for him and he would come in. She refused and asked me to. So I went out to the empty hallway and said, Bernie, he is in here if you would like to visit with her. As a nurse, sometimes you do things out of the better judgment for yourself as long as it helps your patient. Later that night, I heard the elderly lady talking to no one quietly. I've had some odd things happen in my personal life through the years since childhood, but that is another story. I was once told by an elder Japanese woman not to talk to the dead or invite them into my home. Another week goes by and my resident took a drastic turn for the worst by refusing to eat or drinking fluids. After a week's stay in the hospital, she returned on comfort cares in hospice. The end was near and we knew it. However, while she was in the hospital, I received a frantic call from one of our nursing assistants asking if I would please come back to work because she was really scared. When I got to work, all the lights in the house were on and she was sitting on the couch with her back up against the wall. When I asked what was wrong, she told me wide-eyed and pale that she had seen a mist down at the end of the hallway and was hearing weird popping noises coming from the residence room that was in the hospital. After checking the entire house and silently saying the Lord's Prayer, the house felt calm. He spent her last days being pampered and showed care and compassion 
from staff and family. Many of the staff came in on our days off to sit with her, including myself. The last couple days of her life, she was sedated for pain and hallucinations. When no one was in her room and she didn't know we were checking in on her, she was reaching up towards the ceiling and mumbling. The day before she died, we had XM music playing on our TV. A couple of the nursing assistants were performing for their evening cares. When the TV changed to CNN for 30 seconds, and turn back to the music by itself. The TV remote was on top of the TV. Since our favorite lady passed away, things have stopped for the most part. My mother passed away June 5th, 2007. Me and my husband were in New Jersey at the time, waiting to get unloaded. We drove an 18 wheeler for a living. My sister had called me the day before and told me that my mom was in a coma and the home health care people said she only had about 24 hours to live and that I needed to come home. So I called our dispatcher and said we needed to be routed back to the Chattanooga terminal so that I could see my mom before she passed. He said no problem. After you and your husband have put tires on, go pick up that load and head for Chattanooga. Well, while they were putting tires on our trailer, we decided to get some sleep. The cell phone rang, and it was my sister. She told me that mom had come out of it. It was sitting up and laughing and talking to everybody, and that she was okay. So I called my dispatcher and said we don't have to go home. We can do one more load out here. So it was late that night when they finally got the tires on the trailer and we decided to just stay there in the parking lot till morning so we could get some much needed sleep. We get up that morning and pull out. As we're heading down the highway, my cell rings and it's my sister. She's crying. She tells me that mom passed away that morning early. So to make it a little shorter, our dispatcher gets us home 36 hours later. Now at this time, we are at my mother's house and she has already been picked up by the funeral home before we got there. Later that day, my husband's cell phone rings while we are nowhere near it to answer it. So when we do pick it up to see if our dispatcher is called, it shows we have one voicemail and no number. So my husband listens to the voicemail, and it's my mother, the day after she died. The message said, Connie, this is your mother. Call me. We decide to check if it was a delayed message, but it wasn't. I even took it to the cell phone company, and they said it was June 6th at 1.25 in the afternoon. My mom died June 5th, 2007, at the times between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. It has really bothered me that we missed the call, even though she was already dead. She might have been trying to say goodbye to us. A few nights ago, a friend and I took a drive up Angeles Crest Highway. It was a clear night and it wasn't too cold. As we entered the parking lot, we noticed there were no other cars there. As I made a U-turn in the lot to face the small building, there we saw a man walking. What got my attention was the fact that my headlights shined bright on the building, yet we only saw the person from the waist down. The rest of his body was a shadow. The man was walking around as if he were looking for something. It appeared he had a flashlight in his hand, the way he was moving, but there was no light coming from it. The closer we got to him, the smaller the image got. When I shined my brights on him, it looked like he went down a small hallway. Even then, we could not see his upper body. 
We went back the next day to see if we could find anything. One thing we did notice was the hall we saw the figure walk through was now a wall. Not a wall that was just put up, but one that looked like it was part of the structure since it was built. Three separate spirits are said to walk the halls of the soon-to-be-abandoned Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, as a new more modern hospital is being built right across the city. In the older section of the third floor, one room is said to be haunted by the ghost of a mental patient who jumped out of a window in the 1960s in the psychiatric ward. Thirty years later, in that section, Administrative offices were constructed, and employees reported sharing running down the hall of someone with bare feet in a light outside the room where the man was said to have jumped, turns on and off periodically on some nights. The switch that turns that light on can be found only inside the room, which was not even in use at the time. When the lights were checked by maintenance, they seemed fine. Later, some orderlies enjoying lunch on that same floor reported seeing an IV stem being rolled up the same hallway. They left their food there and didn't return. In what was the pediatric area, the ghost of a red-haired girl in her early teens in a white hospital gown has been spotted at one point by a nurse who also had long dark red hair when the room was used for pharmaceutical storage. She claimed to see the spectral image of the girl staring at her through the glass observation window of the room. The nurse was also a redhead. Finally, the third spirit has been chronicled by the hospital's own sad history and has been spotted in a newer section. A young nurse, who had just started, was leaving for the night to go out with friends. As she hurried down the stairwell, she dropped her purse over the guardrail a lunch too far and fell down the center of the stairwell, landing on her head. She died three days later due to massive brain drama. Ironically, one of the hospital's employees who had the task of cleaning up the bloodstains was the son of the woman who had seen the red-haired girl's ghost as her family worked in the hospital. It is sad that sometimes you can see the girl repeat her fatal fall. I have many stories to share with you, but I'm going to start at the beginning. I grew up in Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. From the time I was a very young child, I knew that something was not right in our house. Our house was the last house in a dead-end street that faced the marsh. In the winter, you could see Highway 35. The surrounding woods were equally as disturbing. I was the only girl in our neighborhood. All my friends were guys. They were like brothers to me. I was a tough kid, and I did not scare easily. However, being alone in our house and going to sleep at night frightened me to death. My father died when I was a baby and it was just my mother, brother, and myself. There was quite a difference in age between my brother and I. For years, I kept my experiences to myself because I thought it was my imagination, and I also thought that if I told my mother and brother that they would think I was crazy too. It took me a long time to realize that I wasn't crazy. It was not my imagination. And the hard part was that I was a gifted child whose family could not relate to me on that particular level. These are my experiences while I live there. My mother and father bought the house in 1962, and I was born in 1963. We owned the house right up until 2005. To this day, the events are burned into my memory. From the time I was about five years old, there hardly was a time that the house was at peace. I would lay awake in bed at night and watch orbs dance across the walls and ceiling. Then, I could feel someone sit on the corner of my bed. 
It was not a faint feeling either. In retrospect, as an adult, you could actually see the corner of the bed being pressed down. My heart would pound in my chest so loudly that I couldn't hear anyone else, and I could feel every hair stand up on my entire body. I would pull the covers and pillows over me in such a way that only my eyes and nose would stick out, even in the summer with no air conditioning. Shadows were commonplace everywhere in the house. You could smell flowers in the middle of the winter as well. Then, just as I would start to fall asleep, I would be jolted awake because something pulled the covers of me so violently that they were on the floor at the foot of the bed. That would send me screaming out of my room to my mother. There wasn't a time that you didn't feel as though you were being watched or that you didn't feel that something was following you from room to room. If you came home and put your car keys down, turn your back for two seconds, they were gone, and then after searching the entire house, they would suddenly reappear where you originally put them in the first place, and you were the only one home the entire time. When I was in high school, I would come home and shower because I played sports. I always locked the bathroom door. Every time I would pull the curtain back when I was finished, the door would be wide open. Once again, no one was home, and our interior doors had no keys. Until now, I've been very vague with you about my experiences, but now I will tell you in detail my most frightening experience. I was engaged to Mitch. We were just both out of high school. My mom was out, and so was my brother. Mitch and I decided to go to my house watch TV and eat some pizza. From the time we entered the house, I could feel that something was really wrong, really out of sync. The air seemed electrically charged. It was as though us being there had interrupted some unseen gathering. I ignored it, even though I was goose flesh from head to toe. Even with all the lights on, my mother's house always seemed dark. Mitch was sitting in the room watching television, and I went into the kitchen to heat some frozen pizza. We were having a conversation as I did so. My back was to the living room as we were talking, and I was placing the pizza on the baking sheet. I heard what I thought was Mitch leave the living room and walk into the kitchen. I became aware that he was standing directly behind me as I was still talking. I turned around to ask him something, but to my shock, it was not Mitch standing there. I felt all the blood drain from my face. My knees went to jello, and I gasped and screamed at the same time. Standing face to face with me was a huge black solid apparition. I could make out a head and shoulders, but the rest became more see-through as it went towards the knees and feet area. It felt like slow motion. I think that when I turned around and screamed, I scared it as much as it scared me. As I stood there screaming, the black figure literally whooshed through the kitchen wall. Mitch ran into the kitchen. I was shaking and white as a ghost. It took me a while to collect myself. I shut the oven off and we left and went to the local pizza place where I told them what happened. We didn't spend much time at my mother's house after that. This is just one story out of countless stories that I'll be glad to share with you. I'm now 46 years old. My entire life has been one foot in this world and the other in the spirit world. Years ago, I'd contacted Sylvia Brown, who told me that my mother's house had many spirits in it, but two stood out. There's the ghost of a baby and its mother. She also said that I was a medium and a psychic and she was right. This is what I now do. I'm no longer afraid. 
It gives me pleasure to be able to connect with grieving spirits, with the departed loved ones. I consider this wonderful gift that I will not trade for anything. Thank you for listening. All of my life I had reoccurring experiences of the paranormal, starting at age 7, as far as I can remember, when my father died. I used to believe the experiences were dreams or imagination until recently. I was telling my fiancé of my experiences, voices, mists, noises, marks my body, being touched, shirt tugged on, hair pulled, etc. His suggestion was that maybe I am a sensitive, so I started thinking about this possibility and decided to explore it further. My fiancé and I previously tried going to paranormal meetings, which would go on ghost hunts. There was one in particular that appealed to me, and we signed up. The building the group was going to was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, at an old building that was previously the Elka Club, built in 1914. This information was given to us by the leader of the hunt. When we arrived, we went into a room to get the speech about which rooms to be careful of. They would be marked by the yellow tape. Nothing else was told to us about the history of this building. But as I stood there, a name entered my mind and it kept repeating itself, Sarah, 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 over and over again. Well, as the group entered the basement, we divided into small groups of two or three. My fiancé and I were in a small room, in the back, and I felt nothing, so we decided to head out into the main part of the basement. And just as we stepped out of the room, a man that was on tour with us, who has been there before, said, Sarah, if you are here with us, give us a sign. I was flabbergasted. I looked at my fiancé and explained the other shock on my face, and we continued in to other parts of the area. I had entered a room just of the entrance of the basement and instantly was bombarded with intense sadness so much so that I got tears in my eyes. I informed the group leader and they took pictures around me, but by this time, I already knew that what they were searching for in the building wasn't correct. I knew that what I was feeling was the past and the child Sarah intended on proving just that to me. She in what I would call it, attached herself to me. She started flashing images in my mind about what the building was before the Elks had been built there. It was her home. It was a beautiful Victorian with a large porch, parlors, a library, you name it, she showed me. She told me that she was sad because of the remodeling that was about to happen in the building. She got her point across by telling me certain rooms did not belong. I also picked up a persistent man in a room on the first floor. I was flashed an image of a podium and people sitting and listening intently to this man. In the ballroom, I was given images of people dancing, only black shadows of such. And at last, the third floor, I approached the end of the main hall and was shoved by something not seen. I took a moment and continued on into a grand circular room with benches attached to the circular walls and had the feeling of being watched. And I kept saying, this feels like judge and jury. It was like you were being persecuted, watched, and the spirits were getting angry. So I wanted to step out of the room for a moment, and I took a step forward towards the door and received a sharp blow to my middle back on the left-hand side. I went out of the room and was telling the crew about the incident 
and decided to give it another try. And as I entered, I again got another blow to the right side of my back. At that point, I wanted out of there for good, so the group agreed to leave the third floor. And as I entered the hallway again, I got pushed in the same spot as the first time, which happened to be in front of a very large window. The interesting part was, I said before, I knew nothing of the place, but when we were leaving, I told the owner all the stuff Sarah had told me. I told her of the man in the room that in my mind, I'd seen the podium. I told of getting pushed and hit in the back. Well, she surprised me. Not only, but many in the group as well. Come to find out that this is where Sarah's home was. The rooms I was seeing were the rooms in her home. The man at the podium would have been the black preacher that occupied that room after the elk club closed down. That night, I came home exhausted. I fell asleep and dreamt of Sarah. In the dream, she told me her last name, so I searched for her on the internet. I then found something more shocking. Not only did I find her, the year she was born, but I also found the names of her parents. Well, I'd spoken with someone that has been to the club and knows things about it, but they never knew her parents' names which happened to be the same names I came across. And as far as the room on the third floor, the owner informed me that this room was the judging room for the elk members and where they would hold their remembrances to the dead brothers. The interesting thing was, the women were not allowed in this room. And there was also an EVP that picked up stating, you are being judged. So needless to say, I'm no longer doubting my ability, and I'm more open to my experiences, which have been many since that night. Growing up in rural Michigan, I had several what the heck was that experiences. Most were minor, a moving shadow or an uneasy feeling, but one stands out. I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid 80s and my family had just returned from a vacation. When we got out of the car, my dad headed to the mailbox, my mom to her garden and I lugged my suitcase inside the house. All of the windows were shut and I pulled the garage door closed behind me. Walking through the house, I passed the bay window from which I could see my dad still on the road and my mom picking some vegetables. The house was silent, except for my footsteps on the carpet. I walked into my room and put my suitcase down in the corner. I heard a male voice laughing behind me, maybe in the doorway eight feet away. It was a hearty laugh, loud and clear. I spun around, and there wasn't anyone in the doorway. I ran back to the garage, through the door, and outside. My father was just grabbing his suitcase from the car, and my mother was pulling weeds. I wasn't scared when I heard the voice, but not having a tangible body to put it with did unnerve me a bit. Following the event, I was able to forget and had no issues in the rest of the house. It was only after I got older and interested in the paranormal did I realize that I must have had a run-in with something. About two years ago, I bought a 126-year-old, 8,000-square-foot mansion in Missouri just outside of Kansas City where I grew up. My mother had owned and lived in the house for the previous 15 years, slowly maintaining it. She had done a great job maintaining its mid-1800s character, slowly bringing the woodwork back to life, 
adding insulation, and replacing all the plumbing and wiring. I mention this because I've heard that a disturbance in the environment can cause spectral activity to begin. I'd seen the house only once, as I live over 2,000 miles away, but I fell in love with it immediately. The first night I stayed over, I woke in the middle of the night to huge blobs, about a dozen, from golf ball to basketball size, floating around the room I was sleeping in. This is the one and only time I've ever experienced anything like that. I closed my eyes, said a prayer, and fell back to sleep in time. I said nothing to my mother the next day until she asked me, Well, did you see the blobs? One of the workers stayed down there the other night and said he wouldn't stay in the house after dark because of the blobs floating around him. She had not seen them and still hasn't. However, the previous owner told my mother a few years later that he loved what she had done to the front room, but he could never stay in there while the house was his because of the blobs. During the summer of 2007, I went back to see my family. I stayed downstairs again and had several things happen. It is important to note that I've never felt in danger, only uncomfortable. My mom and her boyfriend went upstairs to go to bed. I stayed downstairs in the first floor master suite. For the next 45 minutes, the heavy footsteps above my head were attributed to the two of them settling in for the night. Finally, I decided I would go up and find out what was going on. The entire upstairs was dark and still. They were both long in bed. I returned to my bedroom to hear the continued walking above me. So, I went out on the living room to sleep on the couch. The walking continued above me, although there is only one attic above that living room. I could also hear a distant, quiet talk between a man and a woman but I couldn't make out what they were saying, and it seemed to always be somewhere else from where I was. The next morning, I decided maybe I would have a chat with myself out loud, and if anyone else heard it, then maybe it would be for the better. I sat on the end of the bed. It was now daylight, so I felt comfortable to be in the bedroom again, and said that I was the new owner, and the son of the woman they probably knew very well by now. I really liked the house, and hoped to continue my mother's good work, but for now, I lived elsewhere. I also mentioned something that I don't suggest, but in this situation, I felt comfortable in doing so. I told them that they seemed to have been there a long time, and so long as they agreed to stay out of the bathroom while I was in there, we could get along just fine together. The following night was as quiet as it could be. I think their interest in me was satisfied. This past summer, 2008, was my third visit back. Absolutely nothing happened. I was ready, and nothing. Hey, that's fine with me. But one side note, my mother sat down to look at an album she had kept for all these years she had been doing the refurbishing. She was showing me the huge change in the house, from walls being ripped out and then rebuilt and so on, and well over half of the pictures, there were huge light anomalies. There were smears, blobs, and strange twists of the image. I mentioned this to my mother, who looked right at me and said, You know, I haven't taken a decent picture since I've lived in this house. I've owned one crappy camera after another. All the pictures look like this. I have to throw most of them away because they are no good. I just smiled. Right, Mom. 
every digital and disposable camera she has ever had in the past 50 years has had the same problem. I grew up with a mom who is wicked, and she is very psychic. She has told me accurately if a lover and I will break up, when, if I'll meet someone new, and accurate descriptions of people I'll meet. My mother told my roommate that the child she was having would be a girl, and she was correct. My mom, to my amazement, is the real deal. On Halloween, our house is the most popular because the altar my mother sets up outside is very real. It's very fun, and I grew up with the easygoing view of the paranormal. I do tend to be very logical, and I believe in a paranormal experience if it does not seem like someone is BSing me. I keep my mind open. My mother does have headaches if she is around haunted houses. She has migraines that will make her sick for days after being in one. She's had this happen to her several times in her life, including once when I was a kid. A few years ago, when I was 23, I started having heart palpitations and tachycardia. At one point, my heart rate went up to 181. I spent night after night in the emergency room, and I was recommended to a cardiologist. I went through that for several months, before finally, someone realized it was a sedative that I took that helped me sleep. The doctors took me off the sleep medication, and I soon found out that I had become dependent on sleep aids. At the same time, I had to get on a Greyhound bus for a two-day trip to move back with my parents because of the health problems. If you've ever traveled on a Greyhound, you know it's really hard to sleep on it. I was sleep deprived. I was told that I was sleeping, but I didn't realize it. I wasn't sleeping through the night. I was exhausted. I was depressed and I developed a phobia of the sound of a beating heart, heart medication commercials, etc. In short, my mental health was suffering. I had to make the choice to go into a psychiatric ward because it took a month to get an appointment with a psychiatrist. I didn't want to wait that long. The ward was in a regular city hospital. All the patients were quiet and were there to heal. Nobody was dangerous. There were patients with bipolar and other types of mental illness, and nobody was dangerous. There are different levels of hospitals. This was a ward for anybody going through emotional difficulties. I started to sleep the first two days I was there. I was not dangerous. But they did have to give me something to sleep. I was having dreams in which in my bathroom, patients had bathrooms in their rooms. I could hear a woman crying and throwing up all night. It was horrible and nightmarish. I could never see her because in the dream, I was laying in bed. How can I describe this? Even though I was asleep and dreaming, it felt like I was aware of everything going on. It never sounded quiet. It sounded like patients were throwing fits, and that someone would go by my room and rap on the wall with a walker, and that poor woman threw up and cried. She sounded miserable. The ward was actually always quiet, and nobody threw fits at night. My mom had taught me how to interpret dreams. I figured mine showed my anxieties. I'd been through hell. I wanted to sleep, and I never gave one thought to the idea that the place was haunted or had residual hauntings. I had greater concerns at the time. However, 
my mom came to pick me up, and she refused to enter the ward. I didn't think anything of that either. We were driving home, and she asked me how I had slept, and if I did at all. I told her about the nightmares, and how I was completely loud, and I was still very exhausted. My mother was shocked, and it showed on her face. She said, Sarah, those were not just dreams. This psychiatric ward used to be a cancer ward. I was getting a migraine because there are patients who have not moved on. Wow, that shocked me. I never heard doctors mention that it had been a cancer ward. The idea was never put into my head. Like I said, I wanted to sleep again and to feel happy. I was concerned for my health. I believe my mom. She's usually incredibly accurate about these kinds of things. I honestly have gotten tired of finding out if me and a potential lover are not going to work out. She's that accurate. However, I could not tell you if that ward was the former cancer ward. I simply don't know because none of the doctors ever mentioned it. I was sleep deprived and going through hell at the time. My emotional state could have been reflected in my dreams. However, if I've learned anything about the paranormal is that it can be a very small world. The hospital in question is in Iowa. It is a regular city hospital with an emergency room, surgery room, etc. It is not a psychiatric hospital only. If a former nurse ever writes you, or even a former patient, I am here to tell you that there may have been something to their experience. The ward in question is still open. This was a few years ago that I was there. This is just a quirky experience that I wanted to share. My story has been going on for a couple of years now. When I was nine, we moved into our house. It's a nice little place, back by a large ditch. Behind the ditch is a large forest that I used to play in. The house itself is unremarkable. It's three bedrooms. The master bedroom is the first room you come to when you open the front door straight in. Right, there's a door to the garage, and to the left is the room we use as our living room. To the right of that is the dining room, with the entry into the kitchen. From the left of the living room is the hallway, with the bedrooms and the bathroom. From the time when I first moved in, I've never liked the bedroom at the end of the hall. It has a window that looks out into the front yard. The room I shared with my sister has a window that looks out into the backyard. I'm not sure what it is about the room, but it's a creepy feeling. I was around 11 when my older sister moved out. By that time, it had been a while since I'd gotten any creepy feelings in the second bedroom. I was pleased with the idea of having my own room. I moved my bed in there, got everything set up, and prepared for the grown-up life that I wanted. The first couple days were okay. I had strange nightmares about something coming in from the ditch, something I couldn't explain. Finally, after about a month after I had been sleeping in the room, I woke up suddenly from one of those dreams. I laid there for a while, not really sure of what woke me up. Then, I realized that the music box my grandma had given me a year ago, it was on. The music box was shaped like a carousel horse, and had a switch on the bottom of it that turned the music on. I sat up, 
and took it down from the shelf above my head and turned the switch off. I figured that maybe my cat went up on the shelf and brushed against it. I laid back down to go to sleep. It was lying there that I first saw him. I don't know what made me look up into the doorway of my bedroom. At the time, I slept with the door open, but I did, and standing there was a man, clear as day. For a moment, I was sure that someone must have broken into the house. The light coming off the nightlight near the door, I saw that his mouth was moving quickly, and no sound was coming out. It was almost like he was screaming at me. He took a step forward and vanished. I slept in the living room that night. I finally got the nerve to sleep in my room again. After about a week of sleeping on the sofa, in that night, I had the same creepy nightmares and woke up to find a child sheep sitting on the end of my bed, staring at me. It vanished when I turned the light on. I ended up spending the next year sleeping on the floor in my sister's room because my mom wouldn't let me move my stuff in with her. I also couldn't change my room without getting the feeling of being watched. I would glance at the mirror, it's the type that sits on the dresser, and see a face staring at me, one that wasn't my own. My older sister finally moved back home, and I ended up back in the other bedroom with my sister. I thought that would make it go away, but I would sometimes see the man standing in the doorway late at night. He'd stand there staring at me, mouth moving, forming words I didn't understand. Three years ago, some major changes happened. My oldest sister broke up with her husband, lost her house, and had to move in with my mom and dad, along with her two kids. My youngest oldest sister had her boyfriend living in the house with her. The living arrangements were this. My two oldest sisters slept in one room, along with my youngest nephew, belonging to the first sister I talked about. My oldest sister's kids slept in the second bedroom with me, and my sister and her boyfriend had the living room. It was weird at first, but we all got used to it. The weird things had calmed down since I moved to the other bedroom, but it picked up again when my sister moved in. I was trying to get some sleep. It was around one in the morning, and I saw the child shape again, but this time, it was sitting at the end of my niece's bed. I sat up, but before I could say anything, my niece woke up screaming. She said it was a nightmare, and I had a feeling it was probably the same one I had when I was younger. They moved out last year, and things calmed down for the most part until my youngest oldest sister moved away. I now had a bedroom all to myself. I was trying once again to get some sleep. I've always had trouble sleeping in this house, and I looked at my doorway, and the man was standing there, but this time I could hear him whispering. It was gibberish. I turned over and pulled the pillow over my head. But the room got so cold, I ended up turning my TV on and closing my bedroom door. Another time, I was messing around with a couple of the other teenagers in the area. We were crossing the ditch and going over to the woods behind the houses. The way we cross is there's an area with two large pipes that stick out in the water. Surrounding the pipes are these rocky things that you can slide down, but also grip with your hands. They're kind of smooth and hard to hold when wet. We were coming back. The others had crossed just fine. I was the last one over. The first thing that happened 
that was really odd was my hand slipped and I started sliding down. I felt as if someone had grabbed my arm and stopped me before I reached the water. I was about to step down into the water to get across when I heard someone yell my name and say very loudly in my ear to stop. I looked down and there was a snake in the water right where I was about to put my foot. My friend came back across and got rid of the snake. I got home okay. When I went to take a shower later that night, I looked at my arm and I had a hard handprint bruise on my arm. I don't know if it was one of the ghosts from the house, but something stopped me from falling and from getting bitten by the snake. So, I guess even if the ghosts scare me, they're looking out for me too. Bonito City, a rather grand name for the cluster of log buildings that housed a saloon, post office, schoolhouse, church, general store, a hotel called the Mayberry House, and a number of comfortable residences. Set amid lofty peaks 12 miles northwest of Rizzuto, apple orchards and livestock of the Benito settlers flourished in the 7,000 foot meadows at the edge of the forests. Trout fishing was excellent in the Benito River. God was in his heaven and all was right with the world, or so it seemed, when two events took place that would cause the serene and pleasant community to literally disappear. The centerpiece of Bonito City was the two-story log hotel called the Mayberry House, operated by Mr. and Mrs. John Mayberry. They had three children, John, Eddie, and Nellie. On the night of May 5th, 1885, the Mayberry House leaped into the record books with one of New Mexico's most bizarre crimes. Earlier that evening, a number of miners ate supper there and left. Only two guests had rooms, Dr. R. E. Flynn from Ohio and a youth named Martin Nelson seemed to be pleasant in inoffensive rumors. All were in bed by 10 o'clock. About one o'clock in the morning, Nelson arose and knocked on the bedroom door of the two Mayberry boys. John awakened and opened the door, at which point Nelson fired two rifle shots, killing him instantly. He then turned on the seven-year-old boy Eddie, who was screaming in bed. Nelson killed him with a single blast. Dr. Flynn, hearing the shooting, rushed from his room and was shot through the head. John Mayberry, after hearing the screams, was making his way up the dark stairs from the first floor when a shot through the heart dropped him on the landing. Blood was everywhere. Mayberry's daughter, Nellie, appeared and was shot through the side and left for dead. She later recovered. Miss Mayberry ran upstairs where Nelson shot her in the chest, but failed to kill her. She stumbled downstairs with blood streaming all the way to her feet, leaving bloody footprints visible on the stairs, even years later. She fled to the nearest cabin for help, but Nelson followed, executed her, and threw her body into her irrigation ditch. Nelson the saloon keeper no relation to Martin Nelson, appeared on the scene, grappled with the youth who was no match for the murderer. Mark Nelson shot him to death and left his body bleeding in the sandy street. The next victim was a storekeeper, Herman Beck, who came out to learn the cause of the gunshots. Nelson killed him with one bullet. Bonito's terrified citizens locked themselves in their homes until morning, while Nelson roamed at large, finally climbing up a nearby mountain. 
next morning is Charlie Berry, Rudolf Schultz, and Don Campbell were standing in the street discussing the murders. They sighted Nelson returning down the mountain. He saw the man, brought up his rifle to fire, but was an instant too late. Barry failed him with a bullet through the heart. Nelson's last shot went harmlessly into the air as he fell. Total fatalities were eight killed, including the murderer and one wounded. It was years before the people of Bonito City recovered from the shock, and for 15 years, nobody set foot in the log hotel. Folks said it was haunted, told stories of shrieks and groans in the dead of night, of seeing lights flicker from room to room, or hearing muffled shots. Those who peeped through the dusty windows could see the bloody footprints left by Miss Mayberry's feet. The murderer was buried at Bonito, with his head pointed down. Folklore say that this custom was to prevent the buried persons from walking as a ghost. The victims were also buried in Bonito, side by side of each other, in a reasonable distance away from the murderer Martin Nelson. Gradually, Bonito City died. The final blow came when the railroad arrived in the desert below and took a business-like approach to acquiring water rights in the Bonito Valley and later on buying out the land in which the remaining residents of Bonito City lived. In 1930, Bonito Dam was built by the Southern Pacific Railroad. The remains of the victims were moved to Angus Cemetery. A large stone marks their resting place, and as for Benito City, it is presently resting under 75 feet of water that is now known as Bonito Lake. Since then, Bonito City has become an old memory and a murder mystery of the past. Some people have claimed that during a well moonlit night, they can see the top of the church steeple shining below the stream resting water of the night. Is it really the church steeple being seen 75 feet below the water's surface? Or is it a haunting image reminding us of the presence of the city below? You decide. In early November 2006, I went over to visit my grandparents' house and my grandpa wasn't feeling well. He eventually went to visit the hospital. I thought he would just get out in a day or so because he survived a heart attack before. For the first few days I wasn't worried at all. But after a week in the hospital, I was getting a little worried. About two weeks later, he passed away. I was absolutely devastated. Before his funeral, his brother and sister came down to visit. While they were sleeping in my grandparents' house, this is two days after he had died. My uncle was leaving. He looked back to see if things were all right, and he saw a rather tall figure, wearing a hat, walking in a room. At first he thought it was my grandpa's brother Robert, but he was fast asleep in a different story of the house. He went looking in the room, and the ghostly figure was gone. We all think the figure was our grandpa. He was about 6'1", and always wore a hat. Every time my grandma went to go get food, or to pick up my little cousins, we would get a feeling someone was watching me, but in a good way. In early December, I was decorating the Christmas tree, and I saw a face peek out at the top of the stairs at me. It looked exactly like my grandpa a few years before he died. It kind of feels like a little bit of him falls every one of us. All of these accounts have happened in Lake Hefazio, Arizona, 
each in a different house. My mother and I were driving around town, looking for a house to rent, when we found a large house in Bayou Drive. This house was an old bluish color, with vines creeping up the outer walls and into the fireplace, with a large overhang on the front porch. As soon as we started walking up the driveway, a very strong feeling of dread started to creep through my body. I really liked the house, so I ignored the feeling and continued into the backyard. As I entered the backyard, I remembered a dream many months before. The exact backyard was in my dream, and the images of death and demons filled my mind. My mother had the same feeling, so we left without another word, deciding that a door had opened and a demon was dwelling inside the house. We moved into a different house, where everything felt normal at first. We lived there for seven years. I soon felt eyes watching me in the shower, which then led gusts of freezing angry wind rushing past my face and arms. Later I learned my mother was going through the same events, only she experienced only one of the gusts of wind. When we started talking about moving out of the house, things got worse. My mom once felt a figure sit down on the bed beside her and saw the indentation of the person on the bed. There were no dogs in the room and the entire house was asleep. I saw blinds move with nothing in the room and a shadowy figure walk across the kitchen. I was cleaning out a house, just about to move into it, when I repeatedly saw a figure of a little girl out of the corner of my eye. I could sometimes hear her talking softly to no one in particular. Later investigation proved that a little girl had drowned in the pool years before. I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life, from seeing eyes in the corner of my room to being slapped by something I couldn't see, so I'm very open to anything and everything that someone would think was weird or crazy. My mom, however, is not, so for her to tell me about what happened to her, I know it's true. I'm 28 now and this happened a few years before I was born. My mom was an FHA teacher for 15 years, so she went to FHA meetings a lot. One night she was at a get together for school, and it was getting light, and as she was getting ready to go, one of her friend's cars wouldn't start, so my mom said she would take her home. As they were driving, her friend and her were talking, not even thinking about how far out in the middle of nowhere they were. Finally, they got to her house, and my mom dropped her off and started home. It was a very calm night, and very dark, almost eerily calm. As she was driving down the road, she started to feel uneasy, so she tried to blow it off, until she turned down back road to the highway. I can't think of the name of the road right now, but I do know there was quite a few fatal accidents on that road because of how windy it is. So, as she was driving, she looked over and saw this thing running right beside her. It was as big as a cow and its eyes glowed green. She got so scared, she stepped on the gas and was going 85 miles per hour and the thing then disappeared. It was almost as if it was there like a flash, and it was gone. She never found out what it was, nor did she ever go down that road again. But she figured it might have been a banshee or something after a long look at things. She has only had two things ever happen to her in her life that she definitely couldn't explain and that was certainly one of them. 
The other was when she went to bed one night, when she was a teen. She just got into bed and looked over at her closet, and there was something that looked like a man floating with a glow around it coming at her. She ran and told her mom, and her mom told her it was nothing. So she went back to bed, and she saw it again, and ran out, and slept on the couch for the rest of the night. I'm a clairvoyant, and I'm used to not being alone. The last house I lived in had a number of distinctive entities, and will only share a couple of my experiences with you now. There was a young girl probably around four or five, who was very prevalent around the time my son was three. One night, I had a contact dream. Usually my dreams are surreal and nonsense, but when I contact someone, they're usually set in whatever house I am in, and are more out of body experiences. I walked to the end of my hall, and looked through the dining room into the kitchen, and there was a small girl with waist-length dark brown, not black, wavy hair. She had a flowered white nightgown on, and she was pushing buttons on the microwave. When I asked her why she was here, she quickly, and I mean quickly, like Japanese whore across the room in a blink quickly, came up to me. I crouched down, but I couldn't see her face. And somehow, I knew she had been badly injured. Think gunshot wounds to the eyes and cheek. So I didn't want to see her face. I explained to her that she needed to move on and go into the light where her family was waiting. And then I walked back to my room with her following behind me. I woke up, then went back to sleep. And a while later, my son, woke me up, half ways anyway, enough to answer him and kind of remember. And he asked me to tell the girl that she was not his sister and to leave him alone. I told him to lay down in my bed and explain to her she was about three feet away, that I'm not her mother, and that she needed to move on, that it wasn't her house anymore. I thought that part was a dream when I woke up, until I realized my son was asleep beside me. The other very noticeable energy in my house was that of a woman who was very straight-laced and controlling. She would often sit on a window seat in my bedroom at night. My husband, who was a very skeptical man, would sit up in his sleep staring with closed eyes towards her and ask over and over, who is that? Who the heck is that? Until I would tell him it's okay. Then he would lay back down. Well, this house was in Oklahoma, and every time there was a tornado weather outside, she would panic and really become agitated and very distracting to those who could sense her. So I'd have to calm her down and watch the storm. When my alarm clock didn't go off, she would bang loudly on the window in time for you to get to work, the only nice thing she would do. But when we were moving out, she really flipped, stirring up whatever else was there, so in the middle of the night, I would hear floor shakings and bangs from completely empty rooms. Tape would be peeled off boxes and placed across the room would be removed from boxes overnight and put in different rooms, like books stacked in the middle of the kitchen after they were packed, and sounds of the TV coming on after it had been unplugged and wrapped in protective sheeting. All in all, it was not a very fun move, especially when I was alone the last four weeks of packing, and she kept opening the valve on my air mattress at 2 a.m. My new house is nice, but I keep hearing a little boy talk to me from a corner of my bedroom. Oh well, I guess. I'm 
25 now, and I've had strange experiences which, though I'm very analytical and skeptical, can't seem to find out how, or why, or what these things were. I will tell each encounter as simply and as accurately as I can. I used to live in Stockton, and my house was built around 1910 to 1912. I was an only child, and my parents were very busy doing their own things. I may have had an overactive imagination, but I don't believe so, because what I saw was too clear and not vague and reinterpreted by my brain. The sliding redwood doors that separated our living room from the dining room began to shake before my eyes as if it was locked and someone wanted in. I got up and walked around to the other side, thinking it was my cat, but I didn't see her paw, and she never shook the doors, just nudged them apart. I walked around to the other side of the doors to the kitchen. All the lights were off, and I saw no one. I felt very scared suddenly, and went to bed, closing my door. Another time I was laying in bed, and my mother was on her hands and knees sniffing the floor. A bathroom connected our rooms, and I assumed she had begun sniffing in the bathroom. I asked her what she was doing, and she replied, your father and I smelled rotten blood. I can't remember what happened first, but I saw a clear apparition in my living room as I tied my shoes. A man dressed in black with a top hat and coattails, had a cane with a black long beard, walked briskly through the living room, and disappeared. I had a dream that I pulled the back out of the apartments in my parents' bedroom and saw bloodstains. I don't know if she was moving them. She denies it still to this day. But I know I wasn't moving them because I was determined to find the truth. The board told this story. A married couple named Mark and Melissa Twain live in the house with a woman's sister. One day, in jealous outrage, she killed them both in the room with a shotgun. I thought it was very fishy the wife had my name, and the husband's name was Mark Twain. But like I said, my cousin says she didn't make the Ouija tell the story. I was under the house one day, bored and playing around, when I found a small handful of large blast bullet casings. Not as large as a shotgun gasing bullet, I don't think. Other things have happened. I heard a knock on my door late at night. One huge knock, but I was too scared to open it. I told my father in the morning and he got very angry and shouted at me that I was too stupid. I don't know why that angered him. I surmised the knock was from my dog changing lying positions on the porch. Once a baby bottle just sitting on the counter just seemed to be thrown in the floor. My father said it was because I stomped into the kitchen, perhaps. But the powerful way it fell, I doubted it. I was never able to tear my parents' carpet or find any information on the house that could point me in any direction, though I did get all the paperwork on who owned the house, and no name Twain ever owned the house. My aunt, who claims to be a psychic, came over to the house and said that several ghosts live here. But that was something I didn't hear myself. Another family member told me that. The house, which was always a bit odd, had a stained glass window on the front, not very large. It was of a cross. Later in life, I was in high school, living with a friend. I was trying to go to sleep and heard someone say my name very clearly right next to my ear. I got up and asked my friend what he wanted. He was in my grandmother's room, which they shared. I didn't call you, he said. The voice didn't sound like his voice. It had a lisp, as was very girlish sounding. 
we went to the house in the Delta, abandoned and run down, as well as vandalized. I walked ahead of everyone, always ready to take on whatever. As I walked past a bush, these birds just exploded from it. Before, I heard no burn song, and they surprised. The house was elevated with the basement that had openings for water to flow through. Everything was pretty much ruined. A door opened nowhere, as the staircase had been brought down. It felt like a cemetery, not in a morbid sense, and just so quiet and hollow. We went to the basement, where trash was everywhere. On the door which had been removed then, placed back up, was a crude black painting of a devil or satyr. Being mischievous, I took a wooden bed frame topper. It was painted brown with a carved flower on each side, and it was painted red as well. After I took it home, that's when I heard the voice. My room was cold, and I saw something in the garage, and I had a really weird nightmare. The kitchen was being renovated, so we had to wash and get dishes in the garage. I went out to get a cup and felt very nervous in there. As I was walking to leave, I heard a loud boom in the wall to my right. I looked, not too long, but long enough, and this will be a very hard to explain situation and sound crazy. But this energy waved and glistened in the shape of something human turned its head and looked at me. I ran out, scared for my life. I'd never been so scared. I took the bed knob back, and nothing happened like that again. The site has long since been destroyed. I'm not sure what any of this means, but I do know one thing for sure. I experienced it. Both of these accounts took place within the same week of each other, happening to my brother and I when we were on vacation in London. The Hyde Park Ghost. I was on vacation with my family in London for Thanksgiving, 2001. About 10 in the morning on Thanksgiving Day, we decided to go for a walk around London, starting with Hyde Park, which was about three blocks from the hotel. The park was beautiful against the autumn sky, and both my brother and I found it strange how time seemed to skip, as the park just lay kitty corner from a highly modernized tourist strip. As we waited on the corner for our parents to catch up, I turned to see a great black carriage standing behind us, pulled by a glamorous looking brown and white Clydesdale. I talked on my older brother's jacket and pointed, and we watched it for a while, thinking it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. Others in the park didn't take much notice of them at all, walking by in a hurry to get wherever they were going, or that's what we figured. My brother, having his camera with him, took a picture of the carriage and the driver. A slightly portly man with a contented smile and a formal air. He looked at us as my brother snapped a picture, and I felt an unexplainable tingling. Shrugging it off as the autumn weather, I continued to watch the driver. Our parents called our names, and we turned back to look at them agreeing that we should all go for a ride in the carriage. My mom asked what we were looking at, and I turned back and pointed. What happened next is the strangest thing I've ever experienced. There was no carriage standing on the corner with us. My brother just looked as puzzled, and we continued the search about the corner, thinking it must have driven off after we turned to look at my parents. The carriage, driver, and horse were nowhere in sight. I found it odd also that we had not heard them drive off. 
as one would think a horse walking on stone could not be terribly quiet. A week or so later, we got the film developed. My brother and I searched through the pictures at least three times, trying desperately to find the one he had taken off the carriage. But though all the exposures from his camera were present, we could not find the one of the gleaming black carriage, Mary Driver and the magic Claydisdale. We did, however, find a startling shot of the corner it had been on, with the little glowing orb just right center. My brother and I prickled. The real start, however, did not come until about two days after that, when I was reading a book about the ghost of London I would picked up at the Tower of London for some light reading. I felt the same familiar prickle as I read about a popular ghost in Hyde Park, that of a man driving a gleaming black carriage pulled by a huge brown in white Clydesdale, the shadow in the chapel. A few days after walking in Hyde Park, my brother and I were wandering quietly through Westminster Abbey, enjoying the sights. We walked into the chapel that was open and sat for a moment, waiting for our parents to catch up. While we were there, he said he smelled something burning. I sniffed the air, recognizing the strong smell of incense. We looked around, not seeing anyone else in the chapel. My brother poked his head out the door and he looked around, informing me that no one was there and no one was burning anything nearby. Thinking this was strange, but not terribly creepy, we hung around in the chapel a while longer, chatting quietly. Our conversation was broken, however, when we heard someone chanting from the front of the chapel. We jumped, thinking we were alone. I looked up towards the front, certain we had been alone. The chanting continued in a foreign language I didn't understand. My brother, a Latin student, said later the chanting was a prayer or something. We stood there, watching the front of the chapel, looking around for anyone who might be chanting. I nearly fell over when I saw someone flicker to my left, a figure wearing a dark robe and moving slowly walked in front of us at the head of the chapel. I remember taking a sharp step backward and falling into my brother when after a moment's reflection, the being looked up and straight ahead. We couldn't see its face as its profile was towards us, covered by the robe's hood. That didn't matter, however, as in an instant, the being was gone. There was no more chanting, no smell of incest, nothing about me being supported by my pale and terrified looking brother. We didn't know what to think, neither of us thinking too much of ghosts before, but neither of us could really explain it. One minute, someone standing right in front of us, and the next minute, it was gone, completely and utterly gone. Not a trace of it. First story. I was 11 when this happened. I was spending the night at my best friend's house. It was a pretty Victorian house. It still had the original barn. It was in the back. But anyway, one night we were staying up well past our bedtime, down in the living room watching TV and talking. Well, our room, which we were supposed to be in, was directly over the living room. Well, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like something being dragged the length of our bedroom. It was something heavy. We were so scared, so we stopped talking and muted the TV to listen. It sounded almost like a dead body. All you could hear was thump, thump, slide, thump. 
It was freaky. We checked on everyone, and everyone was asleep. In my second story, this is my fiance's story. He's in Germany right now. He would probably be mad at me for telling this, but I have to, because it scared me. Anyway, he's not the type of guy to get scared very easily. He doesn't believe in ghosts. We live in a town called Tacoma. It's south of Seattle. Anyway, a poor town of Tacoma is Lakewood. In this town is an old insane asylum that was torn down about, guessing, 30 years ago, and then rebuilt across the street. Go figure. It's called Western State. My fiance and a couple of his friends went to the hospital for the fun of it. The ruins are still there. They were down in the basement, which also happens to be the boiler room. They were walking down there and came around a corner and saw a bunch of bugs and such. They figured a bum was staying down there as they turned to leave. Dave is a pretty small guy, so he got pushed to the back. As he was about to leave himself out of the window, he felt someone tap him on his shoulder and heard someone whisper something to him. He figured it was the bum, so he turned around, but there was nothing there. He freaked out because it was a split second that he'd heard something and felt the tap. So he started screaming for his friends to come and get him. His friends had to pull him out of the window because he was freaking out the whole time. A third story. I was sleeping one time in my bedroom, and it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I suddenly woke up because I had the feeling that someone was in the room with me. I had my own room at the time, and it was pitch black in my room, but I looked in the corner where my door was, and I could just barely make out the outline of a man. He was just standing there and watching me. I couldn't breathe or think. I just stayed there for about two minutes, trying to figure out what to do. I finally got the balls to reach over and yank on the lamp. When I did, nothing was there. Fourth story. Me and my sister were at my grandma's visiting. And recently, my uncle had passed away in the house. He had gone missing for about two weeks. My grandma didn't think anything of it, because he did that sometimes. She went in his room looking for something, and there he was, lying on his bed, half decomposed. She said it took forever to get the smell out. On my grandma's TV was a plastic face, with a flake flower in it. The TV was off, and my grandma was at work. So me and my two sisters were sitting around and talking. I believe we were talking about my uncle, when all of a sudden, the vase went flying off the TV. When I say flew, I mean flew. It flew like five feet. We all stopped and decided to go to bed. Fifth story, I was spending the night at my best friend's house. I was like 15 or something. My godmother had just told us to go to bed. We were just getting ready for bed when I hear my godmother yelling at me to get my butt in bed. I came out of my best friend's room and said we were. She then proceeded to tell me that she had seen me in the reflection in the window walked by from the stairs to the kitchen, but the room we were in was right next to where she was. Freaky. The sixth and final story. I was babysitting my nephew one night. I was sitting on, listening to music and relaxing, when I heard my sister laugh, thinking that was weird, because I hadn't heard them come home. I got up to check. There was no one there. I know my sister's laugh. About 30 minutes later, I heard my sister cough. Again, I got up to check, 
nothing. I don't know much about this house. I've only been here about eight months. It's my brother-in-law's house. This house is kind of weird, though. When all sounds have died down, you can hear clicking, and sometimes, even what kind of sounds like walking sounds. I sleep with my door open, so I'd hear if my sister had opened her door. But, they're like soft walking sounds. Odd. Anyway, I have tons more stories. I'm a very strong believer in ghosts, so if you want to hear more stories, just email me and let me know. I was reading your site around Halloween and noticed Green Man and instantly knew what the reference was. I had heard this story dozens of times by my dad who visited Raymond. Then I realized the legend was not correct. The legend states that late at night, you could witness a ghost wandering around the tunnels and bridges around town. There have been numerous reports over the years of a man with a green face walking after hours. He is known as the Green Man. This is because when people have seen this figure, the apparition has a terrifying green face as he floats by the local tunnels and bridges of the area. The real version is extremely depressing, but the real version in the least. The horrible accident occurred in Evans City. Raymond, unsure of the last name, and his older brother were flying a kite near some electric wires next to a tree. The kite got stuck, and Raymond followed his brother up the tree to retrieve it. When Raymond's brother grabbed the kite, both brothers got electrocuted. Raymond's brother was killed, and Raymond was severely burned. He was extremely disfigured, and it was extremely hard for him to walk because of the accident. The residents of Evans City collected nearly 30000 for the boy for his care. His older sister and her boyfriend ran off with the money, leaving Raymond without the money he needed to get well. From then on, the townspeople took him under their wing and took care of him the best they could, but without the funds to do it. My dad's grandmother, who lived in Suiki, told my dad and his brothers and sisters the story of the green man when they went to visit her. Raymond, now an adult, walks down the road to and from the tunnel every night. The sun would hurt his eyes since it only had a thin sheath of skin to cover them, so he did not go out in the daylight. He could barely walk, but did so every night regardless. People from all over came to bring him money, gum, and cigarettes, even while he was on his nightly walks to the tunnel and back home. The green man came from the color his skin looked when the headlights would hit him. He had been charred so badly, he was gray, so the headlights actually made him look a greenish gray color. Unfortunately, my dad couldn't confirm this because he is colorblind. Raymond had a hole for a mouth, no nose except for a hole, and holes for ears. My great grandpa, my uncle Carl, then a teen, got out and handed Raymond a pack of lucky strikes and a pack of gum. Raymond talked to them for a bit, though you could barely understand what Raymond was saying. Behind my great grandma's car were many more cars, waiting to see Raymond, as there were more every night. At this point, Raymond was a bit of a celebrity. Raymond was watched by the town and the police, and he never had any trouble with the visitors. My family left and the next car pulled up to visit. My dad recalls hearing of Raymond's passing some years later. It must have been about 1985. The interesting aspect of the story is that years after Raymond's demise, I've had friends who have passed by the tunnels and have noticed gray mists, orbs, and other strange phenomena. 
aware that they witnessed phenomena near the very same tunnels that Raymond used to frequent. One of my friends is a non-believer and a true skeptic of the paranormal, and he had experience where he saw the green man years after his death. Just like the story, he shined his headlights as he was driving through the tunnel and nearly wrecked his car. He thought that he had saw a man wandering around who appeared to have a green face. He appeared so quickly that my friend had little time to react. His car came to a complete halt, but there was nobody in sight. Whether Raymond haunts the road and tunnel, I don't know. However, I'd like to believe that the legend is now true. After the experiences that my friends have had, a little ironic, but fascinating, nevertheless. These experiences all occurred at my grandmother's house, which is called Gwimmick Manor. Although the house isn't very big, it's around 200 years old. All my dad's family have lived there, and my grandmother now lives there alone. There have been many different events, Things such as footsteps, dogs barking at something unseen, and the shower being turned on and off, or just a few minor things. One time, my uncle fell asleep in the kitchen at night, and the door he was sleeping next to was flung open, waking him up, even though there was no draft, and it was an airless night. The same uncle also had experiences as a young child, when he was younger, he would hear footsteps from outside his window late at night, as though someone was walking hurriedly over gravel. At the same time, he would see two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Another time my grandma was walking upstairs with some laundry, when she dropped something and bent down to pick it up. As she was retrieving it, she saw a pair of shoes on the steps in front of her, as real as a human's. She looked up, and saw a long skirt, and the start of a shirt, and then the figure disappeared. My grandma swears to this day that the story is true, and says although she didn't feel threatened, she certainly wonders who this woman is. There was no one else in the house at the time, and the stairs are curved, so if someone had walked down them, you would have seen. Most recently, my sister and I were in the corridor opposite the dining room, which is locked when it's not in use. There is a key on the outside of the door. We were standing there talking when the key started to move, as if someone was trying to get out from inside. We thought maybe someone was in there at first, but then we remembered that the key had been moving from our side of the door. Most recently, we were sitting on the lawn whilst my dad and uncle played badminton on the court behind us. The garden is raised almost on a hilltop with steps leading up to it, so the grass we were sitting on was in line with the upstairs bedroom window, if that makes sense. We were facing the window, talking, and looking in at my grandmother's two dogs, who could have been sitting on her bed. My grandma had gone out shopping, and had left her dogs shut in her bedroom. First, we saw one of the dogs start barking urgently at something in the far corner, which was out of sight from us. This continued, and the dog then jumped onto the bed again and started barking directly at us. We thought this was strange, but what happened next couldn't be explained. A white mist, almost in the form of a hand, passed over the dog's head as though it were stroking her. She then stopped barking. We both looked at each other in horror, knowing that we both had seen the same thing. There was no sunlight that could have reflected through the windows, and I honestly can't think of another explanation for the hand we had seen. 
I still feel scared when I go into the house. January 1999. I'd been working for an American company in Evesham in the UK. The company was based in a small industrial state called Briar Close and East. On the edge of this estate is a small pub called the Oddfellow Arms. We all used to go to this pub now and then for a quick pint of a lunchtime. I personally used to have a pint, perhaps once or twice a week there. Anyway, as you go in on a fairly regular basis, you tend to get to know some of the locals. There was one couple in particular that the story is about. They were an old couple. He was an ex-counselor and had to use a frame to walk with. He was always with his wife. She used to drive him everywhere. Obviously, he couldn't get anywhere without her assistance. It was just after the Christmas break, first week back at work in January. I decided to go for a sandwich and a drink at the pub. Funny thing was, I noticed that this chap was on his own sat in the corner. He tipped his glass to me as usual, to acknowledge me. I thought no more about it. Later that day, I spoke to my warehouse manager. He frequented the pub on a more frequent basis and knew all the regulars by name. So, I mentioned to him how odd it was that the old guy was on his own. Astonished, he replied that's impossible. The old guy had died over Christmas. I have never forgotten this. And some people, including my wife, have told me I must be mistaken. But I know what I saw. And I know when I saw him. For all those people who know the Oddfell's Arms Evesham, perhaps some of you may remember this chap and his wife that frequented the pub. Or maybe someone else had seen him too. I'm recently going to a neighboring school by this house, and have visited it frequently. I never get a safe feeling while in there, and recently, we found a mutilated animal. Not like it was feasted on, but just torn apart, and left in front of the house, maybe for some sort of omen, or a warning. The body was ripped to shreds, and its skin on the hands were ripped off to showing its appendages. Later, we found the skull of the animal adjacent to it, and we noticed the jaw was removed, but the skull itself was in a very clean fashion. No blood, or guts, or any kind of fluids, not even dirt marks. The skull almost looked like it had been washed. That not being the strangest thing, I have a friend of mine, who is a female, who is as well as extremely interested in the paranormal, and she has recently gone to the house, and the first encounter dealt with her, and her best friend, going into the house, and just walking around. The problem was that they did not even get to enter into the house. Right before stepping on the yard, the house is surrounded by large bushes, they heard a sound coming from one. Other times that I've been with her, we swore we heard footsteps beside us in the bushes, as if being watched. Her best friend saw a shadow, and became very frightened, and began to flee. My friend was not as scared and refused, and her being the determined person that she is, continued to go forth. The sound was continuing this whole time, her friend left sprinting, and so just to be a good friend, she decided to go catch up. She was not running so fast, and in her light jog, she turned around and noticed a woman with bright blonde hair, this being the only thing sticking out, chasing after them, and even got off the yard and continued in the pursuit. When seeing this, my friend began to run even faster and eventually ran to the church where they parked their car. 
told me while this was happening, I guess to help us believe. And also, she knew I was very interested, and I could hear the fear in her voice. When she returned, she told us the story, and one of the girls who was a local asked about what she had saw, and when she said the thing chasing them had long blonde hair, the local freaked and admitted that the woman who was murdered did in fact have long blonde hair. This scared and excited all of us because my friend who was chased had no idea how the woman looked or anything of that sort. Not being enough for us, we decided to go back with another group of kids who swear they know much about demons. We weren't allowed to go on because the demon group refused to get on because they swore they could just feel the evil. Well, they went back and we ended up going another day with other friends. We just heard small sounds and footsteps. Other friends' stories deal with the chair in the living room that has two missing legs would be dragged across the living room. But one day, my friend, being the brave girl that she is, went into the house by herself one night. And she was walking around and really did not notice anything. She made a comment expressing how upset she was that nothing was happening. And a few minutes later, she heard a high-pitched shriek, and right then she was pushed, what she guessed to be about four feet, and pinned to the wall. She stumbled out of the house, and when she got home, her best friend noticed the scratches on her forehead. She still has them right now. This incident is very recent. That same night, her friend later called me saying that she had fallen asleep and was not responding, and that she was breathing normally, but her body was extremely cold. We haven't gone back yet, but we notice that activity is much higher when fewer numbers are around. I look forward to giving you updates. Also, I'm from McAllen, Texas, and there's a building in that area that is rumored to be haunted. There's this building and it is extremely haunted on the third floor. I'll go ahead and check that out as well, and I'll give you an update as soon as possible. My name is Andrew Pierce, and I'm a local ghost hunter here in Warwick, Rhode Island. Having experience in paranormal investigation helps every time I tell my story, because living with ghosts and experiencing ghosts are two different things for me. I moved into my home 15 years ago, at the age of 6. The first night in my new house, I slept in what is now my mother's room, and before waking that night, I had nightmares of bloody murder, massacres, and deadly beatings. At the time I was just scared, but now, after researching, I've come to the conclusion this was a ghostly encounter. Between the ages of 7 and 10, I suffered four experiences in my dreams where strange people would walk around in my house. The only problem is that they weren't living, and in each of these dreams, they were foreshadowings of what are now actual hauntings. The area with the most activity is my basement, which has been finished and where several phenomena have occurred. The first came when I was 12. I was headed upstairs from my computer room when I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. When I turned around, it was a little girl huddled in the corner and looking at me. She was dressed in 18th century garb and looked like she had just left church or some sort of social gathering. She has never been seen again, but she has been felt throughout the house, and even experienced once by someone who had never been in my house before. This occurred when a friend of mine was sleeping downstairs, waiting for us to get back from her on to CVS. She was asleep on the couch when a ghostly arm or hand touched her arm, and then proceeded to knock over a couple of items on the table. When she had informed me of this, I knew it was the girl. 
another haunting would be in my mother's room, where, if you are alone upstairs and my dog is not around, a growling sound comes from our room. It is entirely inexplicable, but I have a feeling an angry ghost lives in there, but cannot gather enough energy to support anything other than making sounds and haunting dreams. Shortly after my neighbor died, he built the house for his children and loved my family very much. Most of the hauntings disappeared, and a sense of comfortability ran through the house. Everything was at normal temperature, and there was no more dreaded sense of being followed or even watched. This has comforted me greatly, but it only lasted for a short time. Since that time, several newer and less aggressive ghosts have entered the house, and they are seemingly very friendly with my dog. Where he used to bark at them, he is now okay with them, and can even be seen playing with them. This was witnessed when I saw him playing with his ball alone, but then noticed that the ball was rolling to him on its own. He would bring it back, and it would only roll once more. Also, this same ghost apparently hates breakfast, because it disturbed us one time by knocking over a bunch of papers on the counter and spinning the trash can lid violently. No explainable cause was determined, as it was the middle of winter, and no windows were open, and we don't have a fan in our kitchen area. Another ghost prefers to walk around the foyer and up and down the stairs, but never seems to go past the hallways. That's really all that happens, but I wanted to report these, since they are the only real, vivid ghost experiences I could ever recall. Thank you. We bought a house in Yucca Valley in 1988, built during World War II, from what we were told, two bomb shelters. House added on to the years to come. Interesting old place, but nothing special other than the fact we thought we could turn it into our dream house. Two-story, white picket fence, etc. A couple weeks after moving in, my husband and I were in the kitchen, talking, when I thought I saw something, a fog, an image of a lady going through the dining room, not saying a word, thinking my husband would think I was nuts. He said to me, did you see that? My husband and I choose to sleep in the downstairs bedroom, and the girls upstairs at that point. We were in a king-sized waterbed, framed firmly on the floor so it's not logically possible for something to be placed underneath it. After we began renovating the upstairs, we moved our bed up there, and the girls had the downstairs to sleep. Full-size beds, sitting on regular bed frames. There was nothing on the floor when we moved our bed out. A few weeks later, one of my daughters informed us that something was under her bed. My husband investigated and found a black and white photo as well as some silk scarves. We called the former owner to ask if he knew who or what it might be. He came to look, said the photo was of his dead wife and the scarves had belonged to her. A few months later, my husband found a painted portrait of a young man in his workshop. Again, called the former owner. He said it was of his dead son. A year or so later, one of my daughters saw the same image, the fog, image of a lady. He or she never caused us any harm, except for the fact that money we hid in one place or another had disappeared. After living there a while, we met the neighbors. They informed us former owner's wife had died from cancer in the bedroom photo and scarves were found his son porter found had offed himself at the yucca valley inn ashes had been spread on the property according to them the neighbors but these facts were not disclosed to us at the time that we bought the house after living there some 19 to 20 years 
we decided to move. Not because of spirits. Just now that the kids have grown up and moved out on their own and wanted to downsize. I used to live the house of a thousand stairs in Redlands, California. I lived there for about 10 years off and on with my godparents. They lived there full time. I came on the weekends and during the summer. This place is very active at night. My god sister and I would see the spirits of ghostly nuns walking down the stairs. They would stop to ring the bells in the bell towers and then evaporate into a mist. After a while, we removed the bell that connected to the stairs. There were other spirits as well. Some were pleasant, while other spirits we believed were demons. I think the scariest experience we had was one night, when I was sleeping in one of the rooms. I woke up to seeing multiple green lights floating aimlessly around me, before disappearing. They had to have been orbs. I remember there was a closet which was slightly open. When I looked at the closet, I noticed the head of a figure peeking out with red eyes. If you've seen the famous Amityville horror picture, that's how it looked to me, except with red eyes of course. There are tunnels that run under the property, and rooms as well, all made out of dirt. Some of the rooms doors have been covered over with dirt and rocks so that you cannot get in. If you stay down there at night, you will see nuns going in and out of these rooms that have been covered over. I'm not sure what the nuns did in this house, but there are many restless spirits here. I also believe this place draws mentally unstable people to it. While we lived there, on multiple occasions, we had to call the police because people would break into the property, knocking at our door, telling us the spirits told them to come here. There are so many stories I could tell you, but it's a very unusual place after a while. My god sister and I would sleep in the game room next to our parents room because we were too scared to stay in our room. That's about all I'm willing to share for now, but I hope you enjoyed these stories. I know that most high schools claim to be haunted, but my old alma mater has everything from restless Indian spirits, students that died on campus, as well as the spirits of some priests that passed away at the campus. Its name is Bishop Almy High School. It's located immediately next to the San Fernando Mission, San Fernando Mission Cemetery, and is directly across the street from Eden Memorial Park, a cemetery for Jewish believers. To make this easier, I will list the different stories I've heard in my own limited encounters. One. Our school's built on what used to be an old orange grove. It was also used as a burial ground for Native Americans who built the mission. Several different faculty members have heard the sounds of an old woman crying right inside our alumni hall, and one claiming to have seen her pacing back and forth. I myself went there late with three friends one night in an attempt to see if we could prove anything for ourselves. We heard the same crying noises, and saw a brief glimpse of a black silhouette through the all glass walls of the building. Other faculty members have claimed to see an Indian chief in full ceremonial garb near the school's chapel and the hallways behind it. 3. Members of the water pole, swimming team, and marching band have heard a young boy crying from the old archives located underneath the buildings on the west side of campus. The water polo and swimming teams used to use the old showers that were built for the priests when the school was a seminary and the band used to store its equipment in spare rooms down there. 
One story of an eyewitness who saw the spirit is one of the creepiest our school has. A few of the girls on the swim team went down to the showers after practice and found all the shower heads on and a little boy standing in the middle of the room. The boy didn't respond to any attempts at conversation. The girls left to get a coach to try and get the boy to talk. When they got back, all of the shower heads were off and the boy was nowhere to be found. This part of the school is directly next to the graveyard. Only a chain link fence separates the two properties. Our pool is technically rented space from the graveyard. In the new school archives, located on the second floor of the building over the old archives, there have been reported sightings of a priest in his uniform, reading or filing books. This same hallway, nicknamed the Forbidden Hallway by students, because it has all the permanent records in school's computer's mainframes and is off limits to any student without permission, was once the dorm rooms for the young priests in training when the site still served at the cemetery. A lot of men and God passed on at this location. Five. The hallway behind the school's chapel has had several sightings. The Indian chief, the little boy, and shadowy silhouette have all been seen here. The boy's bathroom is a hot spot for strange happenings late at night. I would be there late for extracurriculars or what have you. And one night when I was there, the door to this bathroom closed and opened twice. No one else was there to do this, trying to test the spirit. I said, is someone here? And the stall door I was in flung open. It didn't feel like a bad spirit, but it was definitely wanting to make itself known. There are plenty of other stories at the school from all different sources. Those are just the ones I've heard the most in my own little two encounters. I really hope this haunting hotspot gets a slot on this website, because I don't think spirits are going anywhere. Yes, great website. When I was a little girl about four or five years old, I remember this clearly as if it happened yesterday. I did something bad to be sent to my room as a punishment. I was laying in bed, not sleeping mind you, just laying there, looking up the ceiling. As you may have guessed, I was bored out of my skull. Anyway, a few moments later, I looked at the head of my bed and saw two white heads, round shaped with red eyes, no teeth or any body for that matter. They just kept staring at me. I screamed as loud as I could, and my mother came running into the room. As soon as she did, the image or ghostly figure, or whatever it was, had vanished. This house that this happened in was known to be haunted. I'm not sure by what. I asked my mother years afterwards if she had any odd experience in that house. After I told her what happened, she said yeah. When she was down in the basement doing laundry, she heard someone call her name. No one was in the house at the time. I'm not sure where I was or my brother were at the time, but I know we didn't call her. We call her mommy, not by her first name, as this thing did. She answered it. Now as I recall, if something unknown calls out your name and you answer it, isn't that an invite? This house is located in Vermont on West Road in Burlington. I forget the number of the house. My mother said I was a gifted child, gifted, meaning able to sense things, as well as sometimes able to predict the future, which I've had in the past. It's not something that happens to me all of the time. Just once in a blue moon, I'd get visions in my dreams that had come as warning signs for 
example. My brother was going on spring break during the days of his high school years, driving his jeep over to coastal beaches in Florida. I recall having a dream of him doing this, and his jeep caught fire while he was driving down the road. Odd how this dream came about. I told my brother not to go. He thought I was crazy, of course, and he didn't believe in that sort of thing, nor does my husband. Anyway, my brother called me up one day and said that his Jeep caught fire. He had a flat tire and parked on the side of the road. He wasn't going to spring break. He was just heading over to a friend's house when this happened. Come to find out, some punks started the fire to his Jeep. In 1977, my friend and I were driving on Old Pleasanton Road during the night. We were heading south when we came upon a woman wearing a black wedding dress. All she was doing was standing there, not moving an inch. We decided to pull over to see if she needed assistance, but didn't go too close, in case it could have been an ambush. No response from the woman. We didn't see that she had a vehicle anywhere around. It was beyond sketch. So we ended up not helping the woman out and continued to drive down the road. As we were driving down the road, we could have sworn we saw the lady through my rear view mirror. She was following us. The only difference was she was not walking. She was floating towards us. This was after we had driven a mile from where we originally saw her, and there was no way she could have caught up with us in time. Within seconds, the lady disappeared, and she was nowhere in sight. We had to stop the car on the side of the road to gather ourselves, because it almost felt like something out of a movie. When I got home, I told my grandma what happened to us, and she was stunned just like I was. A week after this incident, around the same time period, I received a phone call that my friend was found murdered with a knife through his heart at the same location where we spotted the lady a week ago. My grandma told me that it could have been death coming for him. I still tremble at the thought of reliving all that happened that dark night in 1977. Great Aunt Amy, she lived in a small two-room shack in the middle of a very remote wooded area in northern Michigan, next to her brother and his wife. I remember her writing to me in the mid-60s, and telling me they had a road name and a sign now. My younger sister and I loved going there to visit. We would walk in the woods, and explore an old cabin and trailer in the woods north of them. They lived very primitively, an outhouse with magazines for toilet paper, and slaughtered their own pigs and cows. There was a great green apple tree down the road, and we always stopped to get our pickings before heading home. One time, we heard a weird noise, and my mother told us to hurry up and get in the car. We had to get going. It was a bear calling for a cub, and we were downwind. Mom feared we may have been between the mother bear and her cub. Whenever we went to visit, we went to see the uncle and his wife first, then great aunt Amy. Although we would see her peering over the tiered kitchen curtain when we arrived, great aunt Amy was very short and stout and you could just see the top of her head from the eyes up, over the lower curtain, and I'm sure she was on her tiptoes at that, but she was always so surprised to see us, and just happened to have cookies or rolls just out of the oven. The day of her funeral, the late 1970s, my sister Kathy and I got out of the back seat of the car on opposite sides. 
I looked at Great Aunt Amy's cabin and then looked over the top of the car at my sister. I knew she saw her too. Great Aunt Amy's little head, eyes peering up over the curtain, as she always did when we came to visit. I could almost smell those rolls baking that she just happened to be making. Recently, my sister and I took a random trip to the area and went by to see the little old cabin again. But this time, it was gone. A new home stood just to the east of its location. I was very disappointed. My sister turned to me and said, that's all right. She's still there. Can you feel her? I could. My father remarried three years ago, and when we moved into his wife's house, I began experiencing paranormal things. I've experienced things ever since I was a child. My mom and siblings were always sensitive to the paranormal. My siblings were pretty used to it, but I'd never seen anything significant until we moved into our new home. It started slowly. I couldn't sleep well at night and had been hearing bangs. I dismissed it all at first as being in new surroundings, but it continued. My sister moved in and we began sharing stories about things we had heard in the house. They were matching up pretty well. One night I was laying in bed and I heard hand slams against my window and slide down it. I freaked out because my window had a screen on it. So I went into my sister's room to sleep with her and kept hearing banging from my room. There was no one in there. I slept in my sister's room a couple of times before I could sleep in my room again. I began seeing black masses for brief moments after a while and my sister had one in her room that was about eight feet tall and human shaped. We began doing all that we knew, which was praying. After a few years of this, I got a little used to it, but couldn't wander the halls at night without being terrified. One night, I was playing on the computer and heard a very loud bang like a door slamming, so I went to my room. I shut my door and leaned against it and heard running up and down the hallway. Things like this began happening on a regular basis. And at the time, I felt like my sister was the only one I could talk to. Then one day, something on a different level happened. I was in bed at night, and I had a bunch of glass carousels on my dresser. I'm a firm believer in 3am being the witching hour, and at that time, all my carousels went off playing music, and a couple fell off the dresser. Once again, I played and slept with the lights on. I had one final major experience before I moved out. My dad's room stayed locked during the day, so when we heard scratching on the walls, it sounded like something was scratching the walls and the ceiling. I ran to the bedroom door and it stopped, but could see a shadow moving around under the door. The scratching then continued, so I went outside. I moved and don't experience things like that anymore, but sometimes hear noises in my apartment. I just ignore it because I know my family and I are skeptical to these kinds of things. Just keep my faith and know that I know it's human in my apartment, my dad's house. I'm not so sure. This happened to my mother's uncle in the 50s. Her aunt and uncle were coming back to San Antonio, Texas on Highway 87 when their car broke down during the night. Uncle Steve went walking during the midnight hour to get help before he told my aunt to lock all the doors. She did just that. 
About three, uh, three men in a car stopped to help her. They told her that they would help her. But she told them that her husband had gone to get help. And he might be coming back. So, the men told her that they will leave. And they were going to leave her some food in a brown paper bag. Which they left on the hood of her car. Hours after she thought about the food in the bag. But she was too scared to get out of the car. Soon, a highway trooper arrived. She told them that her car broke, and her husband had gone, and never returned. The trooper asked her if she had seen a few gentlemen in a 57 Chevy. She told them about the three men that stopped, and before he left, he asked her about the bag on the hood of the car. She told him that the men left her some food, in case she would get hungry. The officer grabbed the bag, and peeked in it, and out of the bag, her husband's head came out. She has not been the same ever since then. I live in a small town in Kansas. I've lived in several houses in this town, and in just about each house, have had strange experiences. The first I can recall was in a small farmhouse in the country. My sister and I shared a room and had bunk beds. The head of the bed was the opposite of how most people would set a room up. The head of the bed was by the window, and the foot of the bed was flush to the wall. I was in the bottom bunk and my sister in the top bunk. I recall waking up one night and looking out the window to the shed that was across from me. In the top window, the second floor, I noticed a black human figure, no discernible facial features. It had a pale yellow light glowing around it, just purely out of fear and not wanting to experience this alone. I asked my sister, who was supposedly asleep on the top bunk, if she was seeing what I was seeing, not expecting to hear it to really answer me. And she said yes. We still joke about our psychic connection. When I was in high school and living in a small town as I do, my friends and I would drive around the countryside, mostly because we heard that there was some scary haunted place outside of town, and we always liked to investigate. But one night, I was sitting in the front seat of my friend's car and noticed that there was a small boy running in the road ahead of us. It was rather late at night, at least sometime after midnight, a very strange hour for young boys to be running out in the country. I noticed that he had on a red and green striped shirt and brown pants. What was really creepy though was the way he just kept looking back at us, almost begging to be hit. I could only see this boy at the middle point of the curve in the road. Just as we were rounding the last corner, he would disappear. It would only last several seconds. I questioned whether or not I was losing my mind, or if I really saw it, because no one else did. Another story I have was when I bought the house I live in now, still the same town. I'd fallen asleep on the floor in my living room. My dog was sleeping next to me. I'm not even sure what exactly woke me up, but when I looked towards my bedroom, I could see a small girl in a white nightgown. She had blonde hair, and next to her was a white cat. I could see through them. They had a mist around them, and again, just as it registered what I was seeing, they vanished. A few months later, I was in my room standing on the edge of my bed, which is right next to the bedroom door. I was reaching for the light fixture to change a light bulb, with my arms extended. I noticed a man, dark short hair, and in his thirties, he had dark rimmed glasses, and he walked past me through the living room, into my room. 
As soon as he got past my arm, so he would be standing right in front of me, he disappeared. I've also noticed small dark figures, a possible dog, like roaming around me when I was walking in my house at night. I always tried to jump over them, thinking that it was my dog, but she was in another room when this happened. In 1978, my parents purchased a relatively new house in Niceville, Florida. The land the house had been built on had previously been a swamp that was drained to make way for the housing subdivision. Nothing bad had ever happened in the house, yet, after living in the house for a short time, we all began to notice odd things. It started the night I broke up with my fiancé. My parents had got out for the evening, and I was in my bedroom crying. Suddenly, I realized I was not alone. I looked up, and I saw a woman dressed in the turn of the century clothing. She had a look of extreme empathy on her face. I did a double take. Never take your eyes off of them. I've learned, and my visitor was gone. My brother brought her engagement ring into my room so that I could take it to work the next day and have it sized. When I woke up from my nap, I got the ring off the dresser and noticed that it wasn't quite right. I got on my lupe and discovered that the ring had been squashed. I took the ring to my parents and showed it to them. Dad examined the ring. As a scientist, he was a little more observant than I was. He pointed out that the ring appeared to have been squashed from the right beside the head that held the diamond, as if it had been sitting on the rear shank of the ring, and an incredible force put on it that literally broke the head from the shank without leaving a single scratch or gouge mark. That kind of spooked me since I had been sleeping with the ring on the nightstand next to my head and it had been fine prior to being placed by my bed. However, events would soon unfold that made us all realize that the house was indeed haunted by the lady, but she was a friendly ghost provided you were nice to her family. After having moved to the house, my mom was in a terrible car accident, which almost killed her. She was in the hospital for over six weeks, and even after she got out, she was in and out of the hospital repeatedly. By this time I was married and out of the house, but my middle sister's kids would stay over while my sister worked nights. My niece slept in my old room, which seemed to soon become the epicenter for activity, perhaps because of the pre-adolescent age. It started with her being awakened by the feeling that someone was sitting on the bed. She turned on the light and saw depression in the bed, as if someone were sitting there. As she watched, the depression slowly lifted out as if the person sitting there had stood up. She was too frightened to sleep in the room. After that, so her brother slept there for her. He was awakened every night by the sound of a dresser drawer being pulled out and rattled. At first he thought it was Granny, but then he turned the light on and there was no one there. The final straw for my sister's kids came when they were sleeping over one night. Mom had just been released from the hospital yet again and was sitting up in the den. Dad had gone to bed. Suddenly, Dad was awakened by the sound of the smoke alarms going off. He ran into the den and found Mom passed out. She had been in incredible pain since her accident and had begun stashing pills for a grand escape. That night, 
she had gotten so depressed that she ended up taking all the pills that she had been hoarding. There was no evidence of smoke in the house, not even mom's usual cigarette smoke. By this time, the smoke alarms had stopped blaring their alarms, but dad stood there, surveying the scene and thinking about how much pain mom was in and how horrible her life had been since the accident and even going as far as to whether it was even right for him to decide that mom was not entitled to escape the horror her life had become. Then the smoke alarms went off again. Dad figured somebody was trying to tell him something, and he called 911. The next day after we had all been to the hospital to make sure that mom was going to be okay, we all gathered at my parents' house. I asked Ed why he had called the paramedics. I felt like the doctors who had saved my mom's life after the accident had not taken into consideration the lack of quality of life she would have, and I felt like mom was entitled to a reprieve from the constant torment she was in. Dad looked at me kind of funny and explained about the smoke detectors. Then he said that when he had gotten home later that night, he had torn each of the smoke detectors apart, and there was nothing wrong with any of them, nor was there any reason they should have gone off in the first place. Once Dad told us this, we all sat there with odd looks on our faces and started talking about the lady. By this time, I had seen her twice. My older sister had seen her once, and my skeptical scientist dad even admitted to having seen her. We began comparing notes and found us finishing each other's stories and descriptions. We had all seen the same lady dressed in the same clothing, and none of us had mentioned it to the others for fear of being ridiculed. As time went by, the lady continued to watch over her family. After my dad's death in 1998, my then husband and I were in the den of the house after we had cleaned out the possessions and cleaned the house up. I'd left a book on the counter and X went back to get it. Our marriage was on the rocks and he was becoming increasingly abusive to me, something that the lady didn't seem to care for. He had always laughed at our family ghost stories, up till the day. But when he went back in the house to get my book, he came out of the house shaking and white. He had felt a cold hand brush across his face. Then, when he didn't leave fast enough, he felt the same cold hand pushing him in the back, propelling him to the door. The lady was trying to tell him that. She did not appreciate the way she was treating one of her kids, nor was he welcome in her home. After that, the lady began dropping by my house. I always knew she was around because the stove timer would go off for no reason and the dresser drawers would rattle. After I left the abusive hobby and moved to the Midwest, the lady would come by and visit me there from time to time, always setting off the timer on the stove, rattling drawers, playing tricks with the blinds, anything she could do to let me know she was keeping an eye out for me. I realized that this is unusual for ghosts to leave their primary residence and to actually follow people from home to home, but I talked to some friends who all felt like the lady was probably a female ancestor who had died in childbirth, so she felt responsible for looking out for her family. After going through the family archives, we found a photo of my great-grandmother. She had died of appendicitis when she was pregnant. The baby also died. The woman in the photo looked like the lady. My sister is now living in the house. When she first moved in, she put some pots in the cabinet, then went to the bathroom for a minute. 
when she came back out, the pots were sitting on the floor. Earrings and rings that had been lost for years, some in different houses that we lived in, suddenly appeared on the cabinets or in my sister's jewelry box. Unseen hands frequently pull back the curtains to look outside, and my sister's dog loves to romp and play with the unseen visitor. I could go on and on about all the poltergeist activity, some that seemed to be coming from the lady, others that seemed to be coming from my deceased dad. From fax machines that go off when they aren't plugged in, my deceased dad's voice calling me to wake me up when the gas fireplace developed a leak, even luggage being set on its end. Weird stuff just follows my sister and I around. Just two nights ago, while laying in bed, I was awakened by the bed shaking. I sat up and looked around and found my husband sound asleep and the door securely closed against kitty visitors. I laid back down and snuggled up to my hobby, thinking that he just had a chronic jerk that shook the bed when it suddenly hit again. The whole bed kind of went whop as if a 20 pound weight had been dropped on it. This time, I knew that there were no cats in the room and since I had been snuggled up to my hobby, I knew he had not jerked in his sleep. It's nice having your own guardian spirit to watch over you, but it can really interfere with your sleeping. I know that some people think that we're all nuts, or engaging in what shrinks call magical thinking, but every time I start to question my own sanity, I get another visit. It should be interesting when we move to my dad's hometown this spring. I imagine the visits will become a regular thing. Growing up in rural northern Wisconsin, there were few opportunities for earning cash, aside from service positions and agricultural work. Coming from a farm family myself, as a youth, I would hire myself out to farmers to help with the work on their respective farms, mostly crops and dairy cattle. If you never have this experience, it may come as a surprise that these farms are usually isolated and could be quite unfriendly, creepy, and sometimes dangerous. Physical injuries like losing an eye or a limb or even a life are not uncommon. This is the setting for my story. One January, I was a hired boy at a dairy farm owned by an elderly couple with whom I was acquainted with through a parish church. The farmer's house was heated by a wood furnace in the basement where I was lodged and among my other jobs. I had to bring in the wood and tend the fire. One day, while carrying wood down the steps, I felt pushed, which caused me to slip and fall down the stairs, landing on the concrete floor, which knocked me out temporarily. I must have been out only a minute or two, as I awoke in pain and found the wood scattered all over. The farmer was very stern, and I feared how you would react to a mess and me not being busy with the work to which I had been assigned. When he did see me, he asked where I had been and what I had been doing, and so I explained it to him. As I suspected, he was cross with me. Later that night, over supper, he told me a story which made me rethink my staying there. He related that some time ago, his wife, Although a Catholic like me had been dabbling in the occult, things like divination, astrology, cards, etc. Odd things began happening around the farm, and it was no longer prospering. He told me that the last trial had been when he awoke to find her levitating above their bed 
in the middle of the night. They decide to call the parish priest. The priest whom I will call Father X in the story was a mature, spiritual, and virtuous man whom I knew and respected. His brother was likewise a priest and an exorcist. The couple explained what was happening on their farm and house. Father X had to get rid of the occult books and the paraphernalia, and after hearing their confession and absolving them, offered to bless and cleanse the house with a kind of minor exorcism. Before getting out his handbook of rituals and his stolen holy water, he had them close and lock the doors and windows for some reason. He went through the residence, leading the couple in prayers and reciting the house blessing and minor prayers of exorcism, all the while sprinkling each room with holy water. When they reached the last room, which was the kitchen, Father X was finishing the prayers, and after everyone said Amen, the kitchen door, which led outside, unlocked by itself, opened and then slammed shut. Father X then explained that this is why he had locked the doors previously, to make sure that by the door opening and closing by invisible force, he could tell by that sign that the spirit had really left. The farmer went on to explain that he liked the instruction that Father X had left him with, namely, that the devil is like a dog on a leash. The demons are all restrained by the power of God, he said, chained, as it were, and they cannot really hurt you directly unless you come within their reach. Occult practices, blasphemies, and even grave sins can put people in places within the perimeter of the influence of evil spirits, and so if you want to avoid being harmed by them, don't come near them any more than you would approach a vicious dog that has been chained. I asked the farmer if the basin where I was lodging was also blessed. The farmer thought for a moment and said he did not recall that it was. The door to the basin was right outside of the kitchen door. After the experience with my fall that day, in the story that the farmer told me about what had transpired, I determined that I would not stay there another week. I left and didn't return. I didn't explain why, except to say that I wanted to be closer to the parish church and I wanted to go to daily mass. I did not have my own transportation at that time, except my bicycle. The farmer was unhappy that I left as I was hardworking and well behaved, but for me, there were plenty of other farms where I could work that did not have such problems. Throughout my life I had seen and experienced a few things that I can only describe as supernatural. Everything I'm about to tell you about actually happened and I will describe each experience as I remember them. The first thing I can remember happened whenever I was only a young boy, growing up outside a village in Northern Ireland called Besbrook. It was during the winter because we had a heavy snowfall the previous night and I was outside playing with my two brothers. After a while, I went inside to warm up because my hands were frozen. My mother told me to take off my boots so that I wouldn't tramp snow all over the house. I sat down at the table with a bowl of soup in front of me, and it was then that I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in the hall leading from the kitchen to the living room. I turned to see what it was, and what I saw absolutely terrified me. I saw the figure of a woman walking down the hall towards the kitchen. I just got up and ran out the door without putting on my boots and jacket into the snow and refused to come back inside, 
even though my mother insisted that there was no woman in the house. Over the next number of years, nothing happened except what sounded like somebody walking around the house. Even when the rest of the household was in bed or away, everyone heard the noises but chose to ignore them. Then one Saturday morning while I was still in bed, I was shooken awake and told to get up and come down to breakfast. Whenever I opened my eyes, there was no one in the room, so I assumed that they had already gone downstairs. While I was getting dressed, a voice was calling from downstairs for me to hurry up. When I did get down to the kitchen, there was no one around. Everyone else was still in bed. A few days after, my youngest brother claims to have saw a young boy standing in my parents' bedroom who just stood there looking at him. Shortly after this, someone unknown tacked my brother in his bed, leaving him with a black eye. The next few years were quiet except for the noises. Nothing else that I know of has happened in that house except for the noises, but I did tell you that. I lived outside a village. The best way to get to the village is through a wooded area, and this place is a very strange place. I could distinctly remember a moment when I had to walk through these woods to get to the village, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I saw a circle of people in white robes just standing in a circle and holding hands. I was so scared about what was happening that I ran the other direction and no longer wanted to run through those woods ever again. I actually had a friend of mine who was walking through the woods and he swears to this day that he saw a woman just flying from the distance from one side to the other looked like a witch, but she was floating, had really dark black hair, and it just looked like she faded out. These are the only things I've seen in my life, and with that last story, my friend has seen, but I've heard other stories by people I know. The shop at the bottom of the road is said to be haunted by the ghosts of the seven British people killed there in the 80s whenever the original patrol station was blown up. I mentioned earlier, I'm from Northern Ireland. There is a high viaduct in the area, which is used as a railway line. 18 people died constructing it, one for each arch, and numerous others have off themselves off of it. The stories are that at times, you can see these people and they all look sad. There is also the blood on one wall in a friend's house, and no matter how many times it is painted over, the blood still comes through. All this is true, and has happened within a square mile of where I live. My friend from Arizona and I made our first trip to the Queen Mary together. We happened to run into a paranormal researcher when we were on a tour and decided to stay the night. We rented a room with two beds so the researcher could stay with us and show us around the old boat in the middle of the night when the most activity had been reported. We attempted to fall asleep around 11 p.m. I managed to sleep quite easily and wasn't scared about sleeping in one of the reported haunted rooms. About five minutes after I fell asleep, my friend wakes me up. The first thing I remember was hearing a staticky voice and thought it was a radio. It wasn't until she asked me if I heard the voice. That was when I realized there was no radio anywhere in my room. My instant reaction was to turn on the light and look around the room. I reached up and tried turning on the light and nothing happened. We were really freaking out now. The light had just been on. My friend finally turned her light on and we laid there in bed 
for a few more minutes, and I decided to try the light again. And this time, it turned on no problem. We tried to fall asleep again, because we wanted to wander around the ship at 3 a.m. to avoid security guards. As soon as we turned off the lights and laid down, I saw my blanket pushed down and felt something on my arm. My friend also reported feeling things brush against her arm. As tired as we were, we just decided to ignore it all and go to sleep. Three o'clock rolled around and we went to the pool room, reported to be the most paranormally active area on board. We took several pictures and the researcher and my friend called out to the known ghosts. I didn't want to because I really felt like I was intruding. I felt sad and angry feelings throughout the whole area. I was looking around when we all heard a man moaning. My friend and I booked it back up the stairs and stood against the wall. After a few minutes, we joined the researcher again and he continued to call out to a little girl named Jackie. I wasn't paying attention at the time, but I heard my friend gasp and I looked over, and she asked me if I heard that. I missed it. The researcher heard it too. It was the voice of the little girl. She was singing for them. I will never forget my experiences at the Queen Mary, and actually plan on going back soon. I came aboard not believing, and left a member of a paranormal research group. My girlfriend Liz and I haven't been together for very long, but we share a passion for ghosts and hauntings. On our second date, we went to a couple sites in our county that are supposed to be haunted. The scariest one has to be the Jericho Covered Bridge, located in either Falston or Jarrettsville, depending on who you ask. As Liz and I drove up to the bridge, a heavy fog rolled in, almost like the ones you see in the old movies, set in places like London. This was weird, because Liz and I have been driving around the county for the last two hours, and we had only encountered fog in this one place. Maryland was a neutral state during the Civil War, but racism ran deep here. The Jericho Covered Bridge is a grim reminder of that. It is a well-known local legend that runaway slaves were hung from the rafters of the bridge and sometimes left there for days. As we drove over the bridge, we both felt a chill and a sense of terror in the air, like the bridge had been in fact the scene of unspeakable horror. Neither one of us really wanted to leave the safety of the vehicle to take the pictures we were so willing to take just a few minutes prior. Eventually though, we did take the pictures, and when we got them developed, we found only two pictures had turned out. In the first one, you can see some kind of disturbance in the air towards the rafters, and in the second one, we can definitely see an orb in the area where just a minute before the unidentified disturbance had manifested itself. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with similar history as the Hanging Bridge. It was a super old Victorian style home, very big, wide and spacious, multiple rooms. A few things happened that I thought was very spooky. The first incident happened when I was sleeping with my girlfriend in bed. In one of the rooms upstairs, we had an old music box that was in the dining room. It came with the house. I was awoken by the sounds of the music box playing by itself and could see that the door was slightly opened. Needing answers, I hopped out of bed to investigate, not understanding how the music box could play by itself. Needless to say, I made a gigantic mistake. As I opened the door and faced the stairs, I saw a dark shadow move directly up the stairs and then disappear. 
I froze for a second, almost chickened out, but decided to go downstairs anyway. To my surprise, there was nothing there, and all was silent. The music box had stopped playing. Another time, I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, and we were the only two people in the house at this time. We decided to use a spirit box and play with the Ouija board to conduct a session. I was fairly convinced that there was a spirit that needed guidance and was lost. We asked the spirit box multiple questions, but at first, no response was given to us. After nearly an hour, being frustrated, we nearly gave up. That was until we asked the spirit to give us a sign that they were still there. My back started to hurt, like some kind of pressure was being applied to it. I said to the ghost, is that you on my back? Now get this, the spirit box sounded like it said death on the bridge. This immediately startled us, knowing that down the road was the hanging bridge. We tried asking it follow-up questions after that. The spirit didn't say anything, and just like that, the pressure on my back disappeared. I was starting to think that the ghost was trying to tell us that they were one of the ghosts that tragically passed on the bridge. The last incident happened in the kitchen. The kitchen door was slightly opened, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a girl's whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady, I think, who walked past the door. At first I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans. So I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. To this day, I've always thought these incidents were all related to the hanging bridge. The Job Corps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a student there in 1973. Since then, there has been a lot of renovation on the buildings, but when I was attending the Job Corps, it was pretty much the same as it was when it was an orphanage. One night actually at 2am in the morning, when I came back to the dorms after babysitting, I had to walk across the campus to get to my room at the far end of the campus. While walking down to my room, all was very quiet in the dorms. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounded like children laughter in the distance. It was very faint, but I could definitely hear something. Yet, through the faintness of the sound, you could still hear shouts of glee and anger as little children would do on a playground, if that makes sense. This happened behind the little chapel that was there, but the sounds came right there from behind the old chapel. And while I looked and squinted, I didn't see anybody there. I thought to myself at the time, why would parents allow their children to play so late outside? It was cold and it was dark. Meanwhile, my hair was standing on end and I tested the wind to see if the noise was carried from another place. Noises can carry long distances. There was no wind at all. At the time, I didn't know that the job court used to be an orphanage until the next morning when I was talking to my friend about hearing those children. This service worker told me that she used to work there as a service worker for the orphanage. She told me the voices I heard were probably the little children that died of broken hearts while she had worked there. Her face went pale as she told me that the children she thought were treated cruelly. There are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder 
that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved, and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. The man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiancé told me about a occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears to this very day. He was standing in front of the church doors, and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking, that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank. But keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night, and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove, and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we'd better wait until daylight to look for it, so we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery, and that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby, and I was checking out your website and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about 4 o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong, and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared, but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things, and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website, and decided to check if something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch, and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic, and it was all dark. I felt the wall right behind me and found a light switch. I flipped the switch, and a dim light turned on. There was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth, the one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it, 
and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed. I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her. When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said, hey, Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and missed them when things seemed to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house, and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house, or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope, and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all, so I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere, but again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously, with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day, and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home, because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, and a few more creepy paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split, each of us in a different car, to different places away from each other and away from the house. I will never go back to see it, nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello, 
I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences, voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who were fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined, just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body or bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on. Well, we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So, my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property, just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran from the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old, I often stayed in town and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs with the wood stove. Everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move, and someone crawl right beside me, not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth-moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then, I felt it. The feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket, and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story. My grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story, my grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us. 
hoping we didn't acknowledge it, and then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset. It just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. Ghost stories are the most popular types of stories to talk about in the curious world that we live in. Some of us are skeptics, while others truly believe that the supernatural world is real. I truly believe that entities are real, and this is a true story involving my cousin. He didn't see a ghost, but he felt their presence, and is now fully convinced that we are visited by spirits, even though this event happened years ago, and at the time, he was truly skeptical. My cousin is a doctor and he lives in the USA. A few years ago, he went out of the United States to Vietnam on business. He ended up visiting Hanoi, Vietnam, which is Vietnam's capital city, and stayed in a hotel with his wife at the time. Immediately after entering the hotel, they were both surprised to see a woman sprinting out of her hotel room and screaming bloody murder. It was such a shock to us at the time, it immediately gave them bad vibes about the property. Nobody knew what happened to her, and for a while, she refused to speak to any of the staff about why she felt so horrified, or what happened. She looked sickly and pale, as if she had just seen something grisly. She was breathing heavily and hyperventilating. My cousin, out of curiosity, came up to the front desk and asked what happened. The staff said they weren't sure exactly what had happened, but my cousin mentioned that he was a doctor and if they needed assistance, he would be happy to help. After a few minutes had passed, she collected herself. My cousin approached her and had a little chat. She swears that she wasn't just having a wild episode of hallucinations and insisted what she witnessed was real. It was early morning and the sun was barely starting to shine through the windows. The room was still dim and the light was off. The woman had just woken up from her sleep again still dark, but light enough to see the room. The hotel room she was staying in was massive, and she was in the kitchen making tea. From the kitchen, you can see into the living room. That's when she saw a man standing right next to the bed. It was the ghost of former president, Nuko Dim Dam. He was president of South Vietnam in the early 1960s, who passed away in a very terrible way. She also said that the night before, she saw a former Vietnam soldier staring at her from the window during the evening. My cousin, being a practical person, kind of dismissed it and advised her to just go home, take some medicine and relaxed the rest of the night. Even after she had just calmed down a little, it was obvious she was still visibly shaken by this whole ordeal. My cousin and wife didn't take the room, but there was another couple that checked into the same room. When my cousin woke, he went down to the hotel lobby and noticed just outside the main entrance was an ambulance and a stretcher pulling two bodies into it. He asked the front desk attendant what happened. They said that the couple that checked in mysteriously passed away in their sleep and nobody knew the cause. They suspected it was a heart attack. At this point, my cousin was starting to act a little apprehensive about staying the rest of the week there, but 
he continued to sleep at this hotel. His mind never let him believe that it was related to the last incident with the previous lady or tied to the paranormal. Until a couple nights later, all was silent. My cousin was a few doors down from the cursed room at the hotel. This is where it gets freaky. It was late at night, and my cousin was reading a Vietnamese book when the power started to go off and on. He looked out into the hallway to see if there was anything going on, and all seemed okay. He thought that maybe there was a problem with the electricity, so he called the front desk from his room. What he heard over the phone started to finally freak him out. He said that when he picked up the phone, all he could hear was heavy breathing and someone hung up. Concerned, my cousin rushed to the desk. A woman was standing right there. He asked her why she didn't say anything over the phone after he had called. The woman said that he didn't make a call. My cousin insisted that he did, that he heard heavy breathing, and that someone else was on the other line, but the woman refused to accept his story. He also said that the lights flickered, and the woman began to grow pale. She urged him to bless his room, because there is something evil, and it's disturbing the room. My cousin refused saying that it was just a coincidence. Finally, a few minutes later, his wife screams. My cousin rushes to the room and asks her what happened. She tells him that she was walking out of her room when she heard voices talking as if the chatter were coming from inside the hotel room where the couple had passed away. The doctor then demanded the staff open the room, but to their surprise, nobody was there. The staff even claimed that when they went into the room, the bathroom door was open and a dark shadow moved out of the bathroom and then disappeared. My cousin still dismissed everything. He said that things were just chaotic because of the first lady that stayed in the room and everyone was on edge because of the death of the couple in the same room. He admitted it still creeped him out, but chalked it up to merely a very scary coincidence. However, if it were a coincidence, then how can anyone explain what happened in that room? It seemed to be the only room having issues, aside from the one my cousin was staying in, where he heard the voice over the phone. Either way, this was a pretty insane experience, and I don't know how I would have reacted if I was the one who was there instead of my cousin. I don't remember the year that this happened, nor the age that I was. I still remember it though, as if it were yesterday. So. My aunt just got a new computer. She was never a technology ace or anything, so she had no idea how to get it started. When all else fails, call my mother. My mom was a whiz at computers, so my aunt asked her to come over and hook up the darn thing. My mother, being the lovely lady that she is, agreed to do it within the week. It was actually that weekend that she decided to do it. So, mom decides she wants to go over my aunt's house, kind of late for some reason. I was very young and couldn't stay by myself, so she took me along since calling a babysitter at the last minute would be very rude. We finally got there. I look up at the house, admiring its large size. I did think it looked pretty scary though. We struggled getting inside because my mom couldn't see the keys. As soon as we did get inside, I was frightened. All of the lights were off 
and nobody was there. Or so I thought. My mom wanted to get started with her work, since it was maybe 9 o'clock already. She told me to stay upstairs and watch TV while she was in the basement, hooking up the computer. After a while of whining and staying upstairs all alone in the large house, I totally agreed. My mother stayed with me for about 5 minutes, showing me how to work the TV. I begged and pleaded for her not to go, but it was her duty as a sister to fix the computer. She finally went downstairs, and I was left alone in the huge living room. I decided to turn on the cartoons, thinking it would cheer me up a little. I finally started to calm down, and even laughed at the silliness of the cartoons. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the loud noises in the kitchen. Apparently, my mom didn't hear it, and to me, she was God, so anything she said went. After she said nothing, I proceeded to ignore the noise, but then it happened again. I ignored it. It happened again. I ignored it again. It happened once more. By that time, I was so annoyed at the noise because it was disturbing my cartoons. I was so mad, I forgot my rule about my mom, and I jumped up from the couch, turned around, and almost yelled, shut up. When I saw this mist in the kitchen, it seemed like it was in the shape of an elderly woman with a long white dress and long white hair. I was so shocked, I couldn't scream. So I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me, downstairs into the basement and into my precious mother's arms. I didn't tell her what happened, as I was still in shock, awe, ah, and amazement at the creature that had stood before me. I only explained about the noises. She said she was hearing little noises, not loud noises, around where she was. I stayed down there with her because she said I could, especially when she saw my little white face. As I was sitting on the couch, playing with numerous toys that were scattered about, I heard a soft bark. Then I heard a whimper, and then another soft bark. I knew it was coming from the room that held the water tank and such. I thought about the dog, Oreo. It must have been him, but then I remembered he died about a couple months before. My aunt and uncle at the time owned no animals, not even a bird, and it was way too late for someone to let their dog out. Besides, I don't think I would have hurt a dog, as I don't believe anyone in the community even owned one. What frightened me the most was that poor little Oreo a dog that had been banished to live outside for no reason and was never fed, died on the ground right above where I had heard the noise. I told my mom about this. She said that she heard nothing. I told her to hurry up with the computer, which she did because she was hearing things too. We both ran up the steps and out the door. After we looked, we ran to the car and got in. I was scared because the car was not starting up. Then all of a sudden, it did. I was so happy to be out of there. My cousin had heard noises such as the one I had heard in the kitchen, except they were outside of the room. Also, my other cousin claims that he heard a noise in the oven like something was in it. He opened the oven and nothing was there. But he swears to this day, he did hear something. Now, I mentioned in the title of this story that this was a traveling ghost. I say this because most, if not all, of that family's houses have had some sort of scariness to them. My cousin's current residence is just as haunted. Doors will open and close by themselves. One time, we were watching a movie. It was over, and I wanted to turn the lights on. 
when I turned them on, I heard a strange buzzing sound in the laundry room. It sounded like when the dryer is done trying clothes, only it was a steady, non-pausing sound. I walked over to the doors and started to put my ear up to make sure the sound was coming from that room. As I did so, all of the lights went off and the DVD player suddenly turned on much louder than we had it on. But the thing was, the DVD player had been turned off the whole time. When everything came on, I jumped five feet into the air onto my poor cousin, where I proceeded to scratch her neck, holding on for dear life. I don't remember ever watching a movie down there ever again. Later, we asked his mom if she was doing laundry. She asked why, and we told her about the sound. She said she didn't even think about doing a load of laundry. To this day, I'm still scared to stay over my cousin's house. When my sister and I were young, we lived in a newer duplex in California. It was a small place with only two bedrooms, so my sister and I had to share a room. We had our beds on opposite walls, but they both faced the hall. On one side to the hall was my parents' bedroom, on the other was the bathroom, and in the middle of the ceiling was a big square fluorescent light. I think that's where it lived. I can't exactly remember when it started. All I remember is waking up in the middle of the night and seeing what I remember as the electricity man. It seemed to come out of the light, which my parents left on to help us sleep. It looked like a person, but seemed to be made from the light. This happened several times over the next few years we lived in the duplex. I never told anyone about what happened until about 15 years later. My sister and I had come to visit my parents. We were all sitting in the living room talking about our childhood. When my sister had asked if I would remembered anything strange about the duplex, I asked what she meant by strange. She asked if I had ever seen anyone in the wall. I then told her about my experience with the electric man. Turns out, she saw the same thing. This is an old story, pushed out of my mind for years and years. It was 1964-65. I was four or five years old. Our family, because of my mother's recurrent mental illness, bounced around from apartment to apartment, from shelter to shelter, with or without one or both of our parents in tow. There were four of us, but I do not recall if any of my siblings were with me when this happened. It might have been at a foster parent's house. I just don't know. I remember sitting on the side of a small cot in the waning light of a Chicago winter. There was an odd, really dark shadow on the wall to the left of me. It was the size of a small man, and I stared, and I stared in disbelief because it had a hat on and was in profile. The outline of the lips, the nose, the forehead was perfect. I was a pro at discerning what was real and what was not real even at that age because of my mother's problem. And I tell you, I knew that what I was seeing was real, that I was not asleep, and that no shadow could have occurred that so accidentally duplicated the perfection of the human figure that I saw before my eyes. We stared at each other for a very long time, the figure never moving. I never told a soul, as I didn't want to be thrown in a loony bin, too. This is the first of many encounters of the years. My mother had the gift. My sister really has it, much more than I. A 
About 18 years ago, I was in the Jacksonville Cemetery with my husband and three-year-old son. We were reading headstones. I believe it was in June or July. The sun was out and there was not a cloud in the sky. As we were walking through the headstones, we saw a woman walk through the trees. Both my husband and I saw her. We thought there was something odd about her, but couldn't figure out what exactly, though. We were walking towards her, and she was probably about 80 yards away. She was walking away from us and stepped behind a tree. Then, we didn't see her again. I said to my husband, where did that woman go? He said, she stepped behind the tree. We continued to walk towards the spot where we saw her. All of a sudden, rain poured down on our heads. We both looked up into the blue sky and water continued to drench us. We ran back towards the car, and it was like the rain just disappeared. We got back to our car, and we were all soaking wet. The sky was still blue. We left right away. Hello, my name is Wanda. I've experienced a few things in my lifetime, this one recently. Not scary or anything, but just strange. I lost a pet two years ago when he was still a puppy. Bernie got hit by a car and died all alone in the road while at my mother's care. I came home from work and we buried him. My brother and I loved him so much, I painted a stone on his grave that I'd done one year. Well, like I said, that was two years ago, and twice recently, I've experienced the oddest sensations. Both times I was laying in my bed trying to fall asleep, when I felt something, like little feet walking on my leg, and settling in down around my knee area, like a cat curling up, or a small dog. It felt so real, but I tried to explain it away, thinking maybe my circulation was doing something weird in my leg. Then a couple weeks later, it happened again. It walked up my leg and curled up on my knee area. This time, I had no delusions. I was sure it was Bernie, came back to lay down and be with me. Since then, I shared my experience with a girlfriend, and she claims that when she spent the night here, on my couch, she felt the same thing. We even got a ghost picture. My sister's dog was here, and my friend Yuri took a picture with her disc camera of the dog, and there is a big white circular mass over the dog, with what looks to be a foot appearing, or taking shape rather. I've no doubt it's Bernie, and he's been playing with that dog even as spirit. Sign me up as a believer. Yours truly. I was a staff assistant in my sophomore year at St. Michael's. What this meant was basically, I watched the doors coming into one of the dorms to make sure that the only people coming in were the residents. I sat at a desk from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. a couple of nights a week. One night, I was making the rounds from floor to floor to make sure all was relatively quiet. I got to the top floor of the building, and that is, of course, when the proverbial strange things started to happen. I began walking down the hall, and I heard the wind howling through the recycling room on the floor. It had been a quiet night weather-wise, so this was a little odd. I passed it off as some random New England weather patterns, and continued to walk on. When I stepped in front of the first residence door, it started to rattle like someone was going to come out. I stopped and waited, but the door just kept rattling, so I moved on. Then, the next door on the other side of the hall started to rattle 
as I passed in front of it, and then another door started to rattle also. Now there were three doors all rattling away, and it only started when I walked in front of them. I hadn't done this earlier in the evening, and I was wide awake, so it wasn't my imagination. What really startled me was all of a sudden, in the midst of all this door action, I had a feeling that someone was right behind me. I turned around me, and from the distance, I could have sworn I saw the fading image of a priest in all black slowly fade. But the doors kept on shaking, and the wind was screaming. So I ran the rest of the way down the hall and back downstairs to my desk. A check of the outside revealed that the weather was perfectly calm. I believe this is the oldest dorm on campus, so who knows what otherworldly beings reside there. The other thing that happened to me while I was there was sort of a strange religious experience, and I'm probably one of the last people something like this would happen to. I was driving home from my then boyfriend's, now husband's house, and heading back to my dorm at St. Mike's. I was at a stoplight alone in the car, when I heard this deep, low, and gravelly male voice tell me that the second coming was going to happen soon. The voice filled me with dread and danger. It sounded like a lot like a voice that had been altered to sound lower, like when documentaries try to disguise voices of the people they interview. The light turned green, and I drove off. I then looked into the mirror without thinking, and I could have sworn I saw the same priest from the hall, sitting in the back seat of the car. I stopped the car immediately, looked back, and nobody was there. I felt like I was going crazy, because I knew I saw someone in the back seat of my car. About two minutes later, I started to think about what just happened, and got very scared. I talked to one of the priests at school the next day and he felt this was a normal experience within the realm of St. Michael's. Partially because it was getting near Christmas time, and partially because he felt the campus was a center for both good and evil, the good being the chapel on campus, and the bad being the portal that was never shot in the boys' dormitory. He confirmed the story about the pentagram in my location discretion without me bringing it up. I've heard this godly voice once or twice since the original incident, but not to the degree that I heard that night. I once heard of an experience my boyfriend had in that same chapel. He told me that on one occasion he was alone. He walked into the chapel, and under the huge statue, he saw two figures in cloaks praying silently under the statue. He's a complete skeptic when it comes to hauntings, and he insisted that there was nobody there at the time. When I was seven years old, my parents, my sister and I, lived in a home that was one-story house that sat way back from the street. My aunt used to babysit us when my parents were away at work, Anytime I got into trouble, my aunt would make me go into a little bedroom in the back of our house, and she would make me stay in there for hours at a time. I never knew why, but I was definitely afraid of that room, and the whole time I was in there, I would hide under the blankets too afraid to move until she came to let me out. One day, while I was playing in the yard, I found out why I was so afraid of that room. While I was outside playing with my toys, I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around me, but I didn't see anybody. I went back to playing, but I just couldn't shake that watched feeling. I turned to look at the house to see if maybe my aunt or sister was around, and I saw a woman in the bathroom window watching me. I know it wasn't my aunt or sister, because they both have very dark hair, and the woman in the window had very light-colored hair. I don't know what to do. I was afraid to move. I stayed outside for the rest of the afternoon, 
because I didn't want to go into the house. When my mom came home that day, I finally went inside. I didn't say anything to my mom or anyone about what I had seen. I was worried that they wouldn't believe me, so I kept quiet. My sister and I shared a bedroom, and that night, I woke up to the sounds of cupboards opening and closing, like someone was looking for something, and I heard glasses being moved around and the water being turned off and on. Well, being a little kid, I figured I was just imagining it, and as I lay there listening to this, I looked over at my sister, who was sleeping through this whole thing. The next morning, I asked my mom if she was up last night getting a drink, and she said no, but she looked at me kind of funny. That night, my mom had some friends over, and she sent my sister and I to bed early. My sister fell right to sleep, but I just kept thinking about what I saw in the window and what I had heard the night before. My mom and her friends started talking about a lady who had hung herself in the back bedroom of our house. I could not believe what I was hearing. My mom then went on to tell her friends that she hears noises in the kitchen at night. The next day, as I was playing in the yard, I saw the woman in the bathroom window again. I started to cry and my aunt got mad at me so she tried to lock me in the back room again. I was kicking and screaming that I did not want to go back in there, but she wouldn't listen to me. As I sat on the bed, under the covers, I heard the door swing open. I thought it was my aunt to come let me out, so I uncovered my head, but nobody was there. I then started to hear a squeaking noise, kind of like something heavy hanging from a window bar. It sounded like it was coming from the closet. The closet was a really big walk-in one. There was no way I was going to look in there. I just sat on the bed, listening to this noise, until my aunt came to get me. I later found out that the lady hung herself in the closet of that back room. I'm just wondering if anyone knows why she did this, and when it took place. Well... That's my story, and believe me, it is all completely true. I'm an identical twin, and often because of this, most people ask us if we share experiences. You know, they say, like on television. My answer is always the same. Sometimes. It's true that twins, on occasion, may share certain emotions, even though they may be miles apart. This is what my brother and I have known for years. But everything changed when my brother and his wife and two children moved into my late grandfather's home in Norristown, Pennsylvania. The history of the house is nothing spectacular. The only event of any importance occurred when my grandfather, who had been diagnosed with colon cancer in 1987, decided to spend his final days at home before the cancer took him. He died in a hospital bed, which had been set up in the living room of his house later that year, and from that point forward, various members have lived in the house without any strange occurrences or bump in the night, until my brother Peter and his family moved in. The first week in their new home, my brother was excited as ever about living in such a large home compared to the meager apartment he and his family had been sharing for the past two years. Given the history of the house, i.e. my grandfather dying there, it didn't bother him one bit since he was the last person who believed in such tales. Then, about two months after moving in, he decided to clean out the basement to make room for his music equipment. He is a part-time musician, and a new washer and dryer my father had bought them as a Christmas present. While digging through the accumulated junk of a half a century, he happened upon a small Bible. Inside the front cover 
was an inscription denoting the Bible as a gift to my grandfather, from my great-grandmother, in 1906. He took it upstairs and laid it out on one of the coffee tables so that other family members visiting could see it when they visited. Remember that I had yet to hear of this find, since it only had occurred that day, but that night, I had one of the most terrifying nightmares I could ever remember. I dreamt I was standing on the landing, overlooking the living room of my brother's house in Norristown, Pennsylvania, but something was wrong. Having visited the house many times in the past, I vividly remember the layout of how it used to look when I was a child, but in my dream, I remember seeing an end table which was never there before, on which a book was placed. I was drawn to it for some reason. I slowly descended the stairs, even now, recalling how hollow my footsteps sounded on the hardwood floor as I made my way towards the table. As I got there, I looked down and saw that it was, surprise, a small Bible. Upon opening it, I saw there was an inscription made out to my brother from our father. This is where things got really spooky. I remember hearing my brother's voice behind me say, This is mine, which dad gave me. Please give it back. I was too terrified to look around, because even though it sounded like my brother, there was something otherworldly about the whole thing. I finally succumbed to curiosity and turned around. This was, of course, when I woke up screaming something. I don't remember what. I startled my wife, who was then yelling at me to keep it down. The neighbors will think we're fighting or something. Later that morning, I spoke to Peter to tell him the strange dream I had, and that's when he told me about what he had found and who it really belonged to. I was startled beyond words. I told him I would be down in an hour. I live in Parksy, Pennsylvania, approximately an hour north of Norristown, to see the book. Too late, he said. Why? I asked. It's gone, he replied. The conversation went on from there, about how he had placed it on the end table. An end table that he just picked up at a yard sale that day, but when he woke up, it was gone. I asked if his wife had taken it, but he said that it was impossible. They had flown back to Texas two days earlier to visit her folks and took the kids with her for the short vacation. After going around and around about what could have happened to it, as well as the strange dream I had, and what the voice had said to me. In the end, we just didn't know what to say. I guess it was one of those things that will never really be explained. Two weeks later, his wife and two children arrived back home and were in the process of unpacking when she went down to the basement to see how the cleanup had gone. That's when she asked him about the small Bible. What Bible? He asked his wife. Oh, the one in the basement near the keyboard you put there. Looking confused, I'm sure, my brother ran down to the basement, and sure enough, there it was on the door, right where he had originally found it. Picking it up, he read the inside cover again, only this time, there was no inscription at all. Did he imagine the writing to begin with? Did my weird dream that night have anything to do with it disappearing again? I don't know. Neither does Peter. But there's definitely activity in that basement. Because what I saw next, in the basement, a few days later, almost explained some things, although it was incredibly scary. I had another bizarre dream. I ended up going back to the basement to retrieve the Bible. Only this time, there was a red humanoid looking creature sitting on a chair reading a book. He had horns protruding from his head, and he looked like an ape 
paused with Bigfoot, his face very human looking, at the same time. Frozen in shock, I approached him. He pointed to the book, and there was an image of a car on fire. I woke up in a cold sweat and screamed. A few days later, I got a call from a guy who sounded like my grandfather. I kid you not, it sounded identical to him. All this man said to me on the phone was, check on your father, something's wrong with him. I later found out that my dad had been in a car wreck. The car caught on fire. He managed to escape alive. The most shocking thing, my twin brother had the exact same dream on the same night. Same exact creature. I guess they say twins are inseparable. When I was younger, I had a terrifying experience with a ghost. I was fast asleep. And then I suddenly woke up. Something told me to wake up, and I just did. I looked at the clock, and it said somewhere around 3.28 a.m. I turned my head slightly to the left, and I saw this girl. I would say that she was in her early teens. She looked very blurry, but she had a blue hue, and it clear at the same time. She was moving in slow motion. It seemed like she was underwater or something. She had a long nightgown and it was blowing very slowly. She was holding a short candlestick and her hair was long reddish brown color. She looked at me and then I looked back at her. I was surprisingly calm. I got up to tell my mom what I had seen. The next morning, I woke up and I asked my mom if she saw the lady and she said, what lady? Could this have all been a dream? I'm not entirely sure. I've been deeply confused about this ever since. My house has always had extra company. It's been 13 years since we moved in here and for a while, there were some really odd things happening. I was 10 years old when we moved in and fell in love with the huge, empty attic upstairs. I would bring my toys and little sister up there to play with. She was around 8 at the time, so we had a lot of fun together. We brought our dollhouse up there and would spend hours making up stories and having fun. I would go up there and read by myself a lot because it was quieter than the rest of the house. Nothing out of the ordinary ever happened while my sister and I played up there, and I felt very comfortable. In the far end of the room were little racks, where clothing must have hung before. One day, I was up there alone playing, when I discovered this old-fashioned looking gold purse with a painting of a deer and a meadow on it, and being a lover of old things, I was psyched. I brought it to my mother, and she said it looked like a pocketbook from the 1920s that her grandmother used to have, sort of a flapper type style. We hung the pocketbook in the back of the closet to keep it out of harm's way. About a year later, my father and a friend of his transformed my attic playroom into a bedroom for both me and my sister. My father had left a quarter of the room where the pocketbook had been found alone and put up a wall and a door separating the rest of the bedroom from that area. My sister did not like her bed being up against the wall of the back room. Then, what I felt next was unexpected and unbelievable. I was laying there with my eyes open, frozen with fear. I felt as if someone was watching me but I was afraid to move. I'd never felt like this before. It was never afraid of the dark as a child. My sister said, can I please come over and sleep with you? Now, I usually said no to this and stopped being a baby. 
But I wanted her to come over, pretending to be reluctant. I said, all right, but don't hug me, even though I really wanted to be. She ran over and squeezed me, and I squeezed back, and she said, I'm scared. And I said, me too. And then boom, boom, boom. Four loud knocks right on the wall, which our heads were practically up against. I could actually feel the vibrations from the wall. Then my sister crying said, what was that? I made it up. I said, me. I said, don't worry. I was trying to tell myself that it was me. When it happened again, boom, boom, boom. We both jumped up and ran downstairs at this point into my parents' bedroom. And my father went up to see if there was anyone hiding up there. No one was. However, my sister refused to go back up there and slept with my parents. I, however, went back up there scared. I'm mad that my favorite place was trying to kick me out. I felt almost betrayed and hurt. So I stayed up there for the whole night, refusing to leave, but hoping it would not try to scare me. It didn't. My sister would make attempts to sleep up there later, but would always run downstairs at some point. I couldn't blame her, since most of the time, I really wanted to join her, but never would. Over the next several years, I often heard whispering and the door not being wiggled as if someone was trying to get in. At first, then it became a game. The doorknob would wiggle really fast and I would say, I'm trying to sleep and it would stop. And then I got used to the weird noises. It's 13 years later. And in that time, I've had many friends tell me that they heard whispering or tapping on the wall or someone breathing in their ear. To which I say, I told you there was a ghost in my house, but it sparked my interest in the paranormal in which I'm an avid believer because of my ghost buddy. I don't know if the purse actually belonged to the ghost, but the house was built in 1940 after the flapper times. But my mother did tell me that the old man who used to occupy the house had two wives who both passed on. Whether or not or either of them died in this house, I don't know. The purse may have belonged to one of them. Hello, my name is Kirk. I'm about to turn 18 and I live in New York State. I apologize in advance for the length of my story but I never get to talk to anyone about these things that happen. I'm looking for answers as to whether or not the house I live in is haunted. I don't talk to my friends about them because I always get the weirdest reactions when I mention them. You know, the kind of look someone makes when they think you're insane. Since I was a little kid, I'd always found the paranormal music. My mom believes in ghosts based on her own experiences, which I might say, are quite frightening. I have two older sisters and both have related their own personal experiences to me. So in a way, I suppose that was influenced into finding the supernatural interesting. I live in a two family house that my family owns. We used to rent the bottom apartment out to people back in the late 80s to early 90s. The tenants have said that the downstairs apartment is haunted and a psychic my mom brought over one time said that the apartment was indeed haunted. In one of the rooms downstairs, my great-grandfather passed away. The house has been in our family for a while. Also, my mom's nephew who came over from Ecuador was living with us when I was about seven or eight. Hard to remember. He died while living here in a car accident in Lake George. Is it possible he has unfinished business because his wife and daughter live in another country? Also, my mom's boyfriend of a long time ago, this is back in Ecuador, which was probably in the 60s, died on a hiking trip. 
My mom loved him and always insists that he watches over her. That's just some background information because they could all be possible haunts. The experiences I'm remembering are all recent ones. We moved from our old house in the early 90s and moved to Salem, Massachusetts. After three years, we moved back to our house in New York. And after that time, it's the only experiences I remember. My older sister slept in our redone attic when they were teenagers. I was envious because they were on a whole different floor of the house. I used to think the attic was cool. Both my sisters have had stories about the attic. My sisters moved out long ago, which gave me the advantage of choosing a room up in the attic, being older and all. I chose the room which was my oldest sister's because of its size and location in the house. It was the last room and had stairs in the room going down and leading into the second floor apartment. The first night I slept up there, a good friend of 10 years stayed the night with me. He's the only one I talked to about my experiences with. It was about 2 a.m. and we were lying awake, starting to doze off. He had his disc man with him whilst playing a CD with the headphones off of his head so we could both hear the music. I was lying there when all of a sudden I heard the distinct and startling noise of a marble rolling down the stairs that was in my room. It finally hit the bottom of the stairs and I asked my friend if it was him that did that. I remember thinking great the first dang night I'm in here and something weird has to happen. I definitely would have seen if my friend had thrown the marble down the stairs, but he didn't. By the way, this actually happened one more time before, not happening since. That story can probably be explained easily, but there are other weird ones. In the same room I was sleeping one night, I'm 95% sure I would have closed my closet all the way before I went to bed because a thing like that would bother the hell out of me, and I wouldn't be able to sleep. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a very strange noise. It was a quick and harsh boom mixed with a whoosh sound. I looked around my room to find the source, and my eyes focused on my closet door. The door was open. I sort of stood up and chuckled because it was three in the morning. I closed the door and went back to sleep. I later analyzed the sound because I remembered when I woke up. What it sounded like was the closet door being pushed hard from the inside and rubbing on the carpet as it opened, which would account for the whoosh. I was never scared, just sort of curious as to whether or not it was insane. The next experience was definitely an odd one. It was the morning. Morning is like 12 noon to me, especially in the summer. And I'd woken up and was getting ready to take a shower. I made my way downstairs and was heading to my mom's room to get a towel. No one else was in the house at this time. My mom was working and so was her boyfriend. As I was passing through our dining room, I felt something cold hit my right earlobe. Within a couple seconds, my fingers were up to my ear to pinch whatever was on my ear because I thought it was a bug. I took my fingers away and realized that what hit my ear was a drop of some liquid. It didn't feel like water. It almost felt like oil. It had a strange smell to it, almost like a perfume oil smell. Very confused, I rubbed it in my fingers and looked around the ceiling for the source. But if you think about it, an earlobe is an awkward place for something like that to land on. If it was coming from above, it would have hit the top of my ear, right? But that's not the end. I shrugged it off, got my towel, and went into the bathroom. I took my shirt off and splopped. I felt a drop hit my chest. Now this was weird because I was totally in a different part of my house. And again, the chest is an odd place if the drop is falling from above. 
Before touching the spot, I looked at it. It definitely splattered with some force because it was spread out a little. I touched it and smelled it, and it was the same dang substance. Why is this relevant? One night, I awoke to hear a very disturbing noise coming from the bathroom. Nobody was up at the time, and I heard a very distinct gurgling noise. I walked towards the bathroom to see what it was. When the lights turned on by themselves, and the shower curtain was moving. Remember, nobody was up, the lights were off, and they somehow managed to turn themselves on. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to inch closer to the shower curtain. I had to know if something was behind it. I moved the curtain, and to my relief, there was nobody there. But then the lights turned off once again. I start to get really freaked out and rush to turn on the light. I look across the hallway and I see what looks like an elderly man in a wheelchair with an oxygen mask on his face. He looked about as real as any living person would. Now, it wasn't like I saw this figure for a long time. I wasn't on meds and I'm a sober person. I wouldn't even say I was tired. The encounter lasted about 10 to 15 seconds. It was fast, but it was long enough that I could see this man. I honestly felt like the liquid that I felt came from this gurgly elderly man. I found that very interesting. And later, I told my mom about it. She thought I was joking and laughed it off. Then grew very concerned after I insisted that this was something I saw. She thought I was having hallucinations and wanted to take me to the doctor, but I urged her that I was of sound mind. Although she did later tell me that something similar happened to her, where she could have sworn she felt the presence of an elderly man, but she never saw anything. Lastly, there was an unexplained experience that happened in my room. One of my cats was sleeping on my bed, and I was sitting in this love seat I have, watching TV. My lights were off, so I couldn't see anything clearly other than the TV. Something startled me when I heard something hit my wall, as if being thrown, like a hammer hitting a wall. I then started to notice that my cat uncharacteristically started hissing at the window and moaning. She's usually a very quiet cat, but something really seemed to bother her, and she wouldn't keep quiet. She kept meowing for what seemed like five minutes. I didn't see anything in the window, and the cat for the next week persisted to meow in terror before she just gave up. She never did that ever again, and it was quite bizarre. It really started to scare me. On a separate day, I've heard cabinets opening and shutting. These things terrify me because I still have no explanation for them. Is my house haunted by a timid spirit who wants to know that it's there? Any comments or advice would be appreciated. Hope you found my story interesting. During the summer of 1976, my mom, older brother and I decide to accompany my aunt and her family to West Virginia and North Carolina to work in the tobacco fields. I was about 11 years old at the time. After a two day trip from Texas to West Virginia, we were assigned a house to stay in while we were settled into work. There were several of us, 10 in all, and we were tired from the trip. So everyone just basically picked a spot in a place and readied ourselves for bed for that first night. It was not a restful night. At about 3 a.m., we were awakened by the sounds of a woman crying and wailing in the room with us. Looking around the room, we could see that everyone was accounted for and no one was crying. The sounds increased in intensity and lasted for about 10 minutes. When I say wailing, I mean just that, a horrible, low sound. 
very similar to some of the sound effects heard in the old Scooby-Doo cartoons. I realize that sounds somewhat funny, but I swear it's true. I'm not sure if my eyes were just playing tricks on me, but in the darkness of the room, it really looked like there was a figure kneeling down. You could see it well enough in the dark to know that it was a gray outline of some figure. Interestingly enough, after the 10 minutes of sobbing, I noticed that this gray cloud ended up disappearing as well. Thankfully, we weren't to stay in that house for very long. Another house, with more room for 10 people, was assigned to us. That was not an improvement. The next house was a two-story one, located somewhere between Hendersonville, North Carolina, in a small town known as Soul City. It was situated about 200 yards off a road, with a long driveway and a set of railroad tracks that ran along the other side of the road. There was a large white house off to the north of our house, about another 300 yards away. The house had a large open field in front, and was surrounded by woods on the other three sides, and a shed, and an old open water well in back. Spooky enough setting during the day. At night, things would happen, such as lights turning on by themselves, footsteps heard upstairs, when everyone was in plain sight downstairs, the sounds of something heavy being all dragged through the house late at night, after everyone had gone to bed, knocking on the walls, and my brother swears, he seen what appeared to be a black hooded figure at the foot of his bed. I remember I had my window open once while asleep at night, and I could have sworn I heard the sounds of a horse running across the field outside. Nobody in our area owns any horses at all, and you could hear the sounds of neighs. I ended up looking outside and saw absolutely nothing, but there was definitely a horse that I heard. I swear to anyone reading this, these events really happened. I know people often make claims like that, which make it seem like it's fabricated, but I really want to put an emphasis on the validity of these stories. All I have is my word, but I'm telling you, these events are so real. I'm 36 now, an army veteran, college educated, and I have an interest in ghosts and the supernatural. If anyone has any clues about the house, one near Soul City, North Carolina, its owners, or perhaps even its history, please email me. When I was in eighth grade, my mother, younger brother, and I moved into a rental home on Grace Drive in Wilson, North Carolina. I'd always been interested in ghosts, but never had any experience. This house would change that fact. As soon as we moved into the home, I had a very uneasy feeling, only in my room. I always felt like someone was watching me from my closet. Also, feeling uneasy, I could not sleep with my door closed and forbid my mother to close her door while we were sleeping. I also started sleeping with my pillow on top of my head in order to feel safe and secure in this room. On several occasions, I felt someone pushing the pillow down hard on my head as I was trying to go to sleep. It was not sleep paralysis, because I had just laid down. At first I thought it was my brother playing with me, to the point where I yelled out his name for him to stop, because the pushing hurt. However, when the pushing stopped, no one was in the room and I was all alone. One evening around dusk, my mother and I were sitting on the front steps that were located between the bedroom, end of the home, and the living room, where my brother was alone watching TV. My bedroom was located on the front of the house, with only one window. I had a lamp sitting on my bedstand, in front of the window, and beside the bed. I stood up in order to illustrate a point to my mother, now facing the house with my bedroom window in sight. 
all of a sudden, I saw movement in my window. It was a shadow and act of sitting on my bed. Once it sat down, the shadow seemed to fade into the shadows of my bedroom. I stood there looking at my window and said to my mother that my brother was in my room and that he needs to get out. I immediately went into the house to find my brother still watching TV. I asked him what he was doing in my room and he just stared at me like I was crazy, saying that he had not left the living room. Of course, I went to my room to find no one there. We lived in the house for about two years, and only when we moved into our new house was I able to sleep with my door closed, with my mother's door closed. However, this new house was where my mother saw her first ghost. This happened about two months after we moved into the house. She said that she was laying in bed one night, unable to sleep because the street lights in the city were so bright. She said that she looked over to her window and saw an old man standing in a room in front of the window. The old man walked over to the bed and looked down at her and then backed away, only to disappear. She smartly did not tell me the story until I'd been away at college for three years. We are assuming that the old man was Mr. Barnes, who we think may have died in the house and was just checking in on the new occupants. That was the first and last incident that occurred in that home. I'm 16 years old and live in a small town in Texas. It's about 28 miles south of San Antonio. When I was in third grade, my family decided to move down here from Corpus. We began living with my grandfather and soon decided to buy property of our own. My mom and dad bought the property located right next to my grandfather's, which just happened to be the entrance to a coal mine that was very active about the 1900s. We built our house right next to the entrance to the coal mine. Our back door opened right on top of the entrance. By the time the house was built, I was about 13 and finally had my own room. One night, I was struggling to sleep and heard footsteps. Of course I was frightened, but somehow I went to sleep. I kept telling myself it was nothing. While I was sleeping, and this part of the story doesn't make sense at all, I had a dream that I was part of a well-known Jewish family in Europe in the Great World Conflict. I saw soldiers take my husband and I to a ditch in the middle of nowhere where they got rid of my husband. In my dream, I understood German. Next they got rid of me also. As I died in my dream, I woke up in real life. As I awoke, I heard more footsteps marching. They sounded like soldiers, Germans I assumed. They marched through my kitchen and some by my bedroom door, kind of like they were watching me. This is the first thing that happened to me. It didn't make sense because I thought they would be dead miners or something. About two years ago, I became very depressed as many young people do, and I tried to off myself. My mother came home from work and found me passed out and throwing up in the kitchen sink. They rushed me to the nearest hospital where they thought I was going to pass away. I saw my mom crying next to me and became relaxed. I was in total peace. I felt completely happy. Suddenly, I felt two men walking around me talking. I tried to turn my head to see them, but couldn't. I heard them speaking to each other and one sounded older than the other. They said, look, it's so sad, she's so young. And the other one said, look at her mother. At this point, they quit talking and continued to walk around us staring. Then, the feeling of peace was gone, and I heard two other voices. I kept saying, who is that? 
you know, scaring my mom to death. Right after that, I passed out. And when I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I didn't tell anyone exactly what it was I heard. I did tell my boyfriend at the time. I'm not sure he believed me. After that, I would hear voices at my house. People talking to me, but there was no one there. I heard them almost everywhere I went, but I didn't tell anyone. After a while, I tried talking back, but never got a response. The voices were never really clear. There were many at one time. It just sounded mumbled. I tried not to tell people about my voices because I was afraid they would not talk to me anymore. I felt I had a gift. They have stopped talking now. I haven't heard them for about a year now. I know it all sounds weird, but it's true. I also live next to a graveyard, which is weird, I know. It's where most of the dead miners are buried. I think they try to talk to me sometimes. There is also one last account I had more recently. I was trying to go to sleep one night in the house all by myself. I looked out into the living room and saw a solid black figure running around. He looked as if he were hiding. He ran behind furniture and walls and really just scared the heck out of me. It was the only time I saw him though. It was the last of all my encounters. Hi there. I believe that I had a true experience with a haunting. I used to live in apartment 205 in Kingswood Apartment in Fresno, California. A lot of weird stuff used to happen there while my family and I lived there. I am a homolog. My religion is not Christianity, although I do not doubt that there is a God. I do believe in Jesus Christ, but I was simply not raised that way. My family on both my father and my mother's sides are shaman. Many do not believe our customs and ways to be valid, but you'd be surprised by how much sense it makes to us. I grew up around shaman all my life, listening to chants and stuff. It's awesome. Well, enough talk. Here's my story. When I was a little girl growing up in California and being in Homog family, I grew up with spirits and ghosts and hauntings all around me. I accept it, for it is real to me, although I've never experienced an actual haunting myself. Being around my family of shaman focused me to acknowledge the supernatural. But when I was nine, I did have an experiment on my own. Our apartment has always been rumored to be haunted. As a child, I never really paid too much attention to it. Weird things happen at night. Things go bump in the night. Dishes rattle and doors slam. I woke up every night from a nightmare I couldn't remember and crawled into bed with my parents. My sisters complain about seeing dark shadows moving across your walls. In our culture, hauntings happen because it is caused by some or something that is associated with the family or someone in the family. In our case, it was my mother. I remember one time, my mother was cleaning the tub and I was standing out in the hallway watching her. All of a sudden, the door slammed and the lights went out. I heard the lock in the door click in place and my mother screamed. I stood frozen in my spot unable to comprehend what I just saw. I banged against the door, and then it opened. The lights were back on, and my mom was still in the tub. Naturally, she accused me of doing it. To this day, I still don't know what had happened. There was a time that something happened to me, not long afterwards, that scared me so bad, I forgot about it until a couple of years ago. I remember it being around noon, and I was off on summer vacation. I just finished the third grade. I was laying on my mother's bed reading a book given me by a former teacher. I started to have this funny feeling all over my body, more like an awareness that something was watching me or something was near me. All of a sudden, the bed started to shake. I felt something, hands maybe, holding me down on the bed 
and I was unable to move or even say anything, not even a scream. The bed literally shook for a few seconds. It was over in a matter of minutes, but it scared me terribly. I jumped off the bed and ran into the living room. To this day, I've never told my family or hardly anyone. Those that I've told thought I was joking. Was I? Yet the memory is so vivid, and I remember that feeling of helplessness and fright. It was weird. I sort of forced myself to forget about it, until a couple years later, when my class was asked to write about an actual haunting that we know about. I don't know, but things are weird. My shaman grandfathers, both maternal and paternal, came to our house to bless our room. They performed their ritual in our room, on my mother's bed. I remember something about someone dying or committing suicide in our closet, but it was so long ago, I can't remember much about it. My mom has been having dreams about a little girl carrying a knife, chasing her through a rice field in Thailand. My grandfathers did this chant thing, and all this stuff, too much to explain, to capture this thing. They've locked her up in two bowls that have sealed and chained together. Part of the chain that was used to seal it was made into an anklet brace that my mother wears around her ankle at all times. The trap used to capture it was something that my grandfathers did. To this day, my mother is doing better. No more chucky like girls chasing her. The bowls were taken to my mom's father's altar and locked up. When he passed on, it was given to my mother to keep safe. So now, it's in our bathroom closet on the top shelf. Every time we open the door, there it is. Scary. I get the creepiest feelings when I look at it. So, you wonder, what exactly is going on? It what happened? I couldn't tell you, but something did happen, and I've never been able to forget it. Could it be some evil spirit or poltergeist? Who knows? Maybe one day I'll find out eventually. Being a Catholic, I believe there is an afterlife, heaven, etc. And spirits occasionally visit people here on earth. One winter, my family and I, mom, dad, and two younger sisters, went to visit and help out my grandparents, who had recently cleared some land they owned on the Tennessee River, move into their new home. The land they bought had many legends accompanying it, including stories of gold and ghosts. My sisters and I were very interested in exploring the 25 acres of wooded land that had an old Civil War home place on it. An old country store was located about a mile away, and this was the only neighbors my grandparents had. When we arrived, there was a 15 foot long, 15 foot high pile of cut down trees that had been piled up to make room for the new house. This was a great jungle gym for my sisters and I to play and hide on, being as it was a long way from the house. One day, my mom took my youngest sister on a walk around the woods, while my other sister and I stayed on the wood pile looking into the woods. I saw this black, four foot high figure scrambling from tree to tree. At first I thought it was my youngest sister running around, so I called her name. She answered from the opposite direction of the figure that I saw. By that time, I was really frantic, in tears, and running home because I could still see the figure moving extremely fast. It was so fast, I would only see it for about two seconds at a time before it went behind another tree. When everyone was in the house, I told them, but my grandpa brushed it off as a bear, even though there aren't any bears in the area. So I felt better. About a week later, after my family and I left, more people were beginning to have experiences, I guess you could say. My grandpa had taken his dog out one night when he had heard a woman's voice faintly yell, help me. The dog began to bark, 
So my grandpa got in his truck and began to circle his property, looking in the ditches for an injured woman. He found no one and went home. About three months later, a lady was changing a sign outside the country store around closing time. Extremely scared and shook up, she quit her job because she had seen a quick, black, shadowy figure coming from my grandparents' woods. We still don't know what is living in my grandparents' woods, but other people have seen it, so I know it's not a figure of my imagination. Thanks for reading. One night, about 13 years ago, my brother and I were Christmas caroling with friends around our block. We were about 10 or 11 at the time. After ending the night, my brother and I said goodbye to the last of our friends, who had turned in for the night. We were riding doubles on a bike that night, my brother pedaling. We approached the edge of the driveway when he suddenly stopped. We both looked across the street. I said, do you see what I see? He replied, yeah. Happening very quickly across the street was a dark shadowy figure, void of prominent features, approximately seven feet tall. When it began to approach us, we threw the bikes down and we were able to slide under the electric garage door, still in process of closing. We were able to summon our friend's dad to investigate, but nothing. That night, we rode our fannies home, about eight houses down. Amazingly, we never mentioned it to our parents, who were waiting in the driveway to take us to the town's candy cane lane. We have since told them about everything, and to this day, when I visit home and happen to walk that corner of the block at night, I am constantly looking over my shoulder and feel as though I'm being watched. Akinessie East Pine Lock Road now houses Riley's Whitby Bull Restaurant. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was built in the late 1800s, estimated from the style, and was remodeled in 1914 when indoor plumbing was installed and this date appears on the tax records, which would be correct. They use the latest remodeling date for effective date. Archaeologists from SC State Highway Department visited the site in the winter of 1994 when the road in front was being surveyed for widening. I took them under the house and they showed me where the curve marks and the big supporting beams evidenced that the original part of the house was either built before the war between the states or wood from that era which was recycled into the house. In any event, the home is an old, large, rambling affair of an old southern home that, like I said, is now a restaurant. It's unusual in that it is the second empire style with a mansard roof and a large wraparound porch with Doric columns. On to the story. We frequently heard footsteps when no one was there and had strange feelings that we were not alone. I could be in the front room, which I used as an office, and hear someone come down the stairs and stand at the large open pocket doors. When I turned from my computer, no one would be there. I got used to it. One day, I was relaxing in the upstairs bathroom in the old six long iron bathtub. It was in the middle of the day. I had some time to relax. My wife was away. The kids were in school. I had no pressing work, so I took a midday soaking bath. I was lying quietly in the hot sudsy water with water up to my neck, stretched out with a washcloth across my face. I heard someone coming down the hall. I slid the washcloth away, 
opened my eyes and listened carefully because I knew I was alone. The footsteps came slowly down the hall towards the bathroom door, which was at the end of the hall. The footfall stopped at the door and the old porcelain doorknob moved slightly like someone had it in their grip, then started to turn slowly in its big square lock housing. It was right near me because the head of the tub was by the door. I watched over my left shoulder and then spoke. Mary Ann? The turning stopped. I jumped up in a torrent of steamy water and snatched the door open. And there was no one there. No one down the hall. No sounds of anyone running or jumping down the stairs. Just the sounds of dripping bath water. I grabbed a towel and ran down the hall down the big hallway stairs and jumped to the landing. The front door was closed and locked. I could see down the hall to the old Victorian carved door leading out to the back porch. Nothing. I sprinted to the kitchen. Nothing. I looked out into the side drive in the circular drive out front. No car. Nothing. Doors were locked. There was no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I searched from room to room and found nothing. I never said anything that might spook the family, but nobody likes to be in the house alone anyway. Funny thing is, now that we live in a modern house, built in 1973, across the cotton field from 801 East Pine Lock, we still hear noises and footfalls when no one else is in the house. I've sensed a presence more than once and a teenage friend of a family told us that he saw a kind-looking old man one night, dressed in white, standing in our foyer. It was late at night, and Tyler was in the library, and from where he was sitting, he could see out into the foyer. The man in white looked at him, smiled and nodded, and turning, went down the hall. He said it was really interesting, but not too scary. My grandparents died when I was four, and we moved into their house. They were the only people who ever lived in it. I ended up getting their room. When I was in fifth grade, I started experiencing things in my room. My TV would go on and off whenever I would think that I need to turn it on or off. I had to sleep with the hall light on. One night, I thought I saw my mom in my room standing by my closet. When I turned my light on, she wasn't there. Then I thought I saw my dad standing in the same spot, but that time I kept looking at him as I went into the hallway to see if he was still sleeping on the couch, and he was. I was looking at him in the living room, in my room, and when I turned my light on, he wasn't there, but still on the couch. It always felt like someone was watching me. Then. My last experience of seeing something was in the same spot, but just the head looking at me. He looked like he was from the 1700s. When I tried to tell my mom, she wouldn't believe me. I'd wake up at night not being able to breathe, and my sister would run in. Then my mom started to believe me when she'd hear heavy breathing in her room when it was just her in there. I'd be walking, and it would feel like someone was trying to trip me. So I told my mom's mom, and she gave me a cross to hang in my room. When I put it up, I didn't see anything after that, but it always felt like I wasn't alone in my room. Now, years later, I found out that the guy staring at me from the 1700s looked just like a picture in our living room. He was an old relative. When I still go by the house, it still feels like something evil there, but at our new house, it feels like a household. Now that I'm 21, I think that it was my parents' dad still in the room that I had. That's the only reason. A long time ago, about 20 years or so, there was a car crash in front of my driveway. At the time, I did not live there. At that matter, nobody did. In the car, there were six young boys ranging from 6 to 20. They crashed because there were a couple of drunk drivers who hit them head on. 
all the young men died in the car. About 10 years later, me and my family moved in a double wide on the lot in front of where the men died. About one year later, there was an awful car crash at the exact same spot of where the young men died. The woman was not killed, but she was seriously injured. After a couple of years, I went down to get the mail when I heard a strange noise, like a young boy crying. I was the only one at home at the time. I looked around and seen nobody. The crying became fainter and fainter until I could hear no more. The next day, I went back down to check the mail and I heard talking, two men, about 18 years of age. I looked around and saw nobody once again. I listened to the conversation and I couldn't make out anything they were saying, but I could hear the voices as clear as day. Soon after, the voices began to fade away. I talked to my grandmother, who lives just up the road. She told me that the accident happened about 20 years ago, and everyone in the car were killed. I asked her what time it was that they wrecked. She said it was about 5 to 10 p.m. Around 7 p.m., is when the young woman wrecked her car. A few years after the woman wrecked her car, another woman broke down on the bridge, several feet away from where the young man crashed. Another time, a couple were driving with a full tank of gas, when all of a sudden, their gas tank just went empty, right where everything was happening. There were several more breakdowns and accidents that happened over the years where the young man crashed, and more of my family members, have heard strange talking and crying below our driveway. After time, we have moved, and still, there have been breakdowns and accidents at the same location. We think that the bridge in the area around it is haunted by the ghost of the six young men. I want to post something that happened to my mother, Marie, my uncle, her brother David, and my aunt, her sister Gail. A little background first, please. Maria was living in Arkansas, David was living in Florida, and Gail was living in South Carolina. Many miles apart, these three siblings shared the same dream on the same night and called their mother within 24 hours of the dream to tell her of it. This dream occurred in 1989. The dream starts with the three siblings visiting an old farmhouse they lived in as children 30 years ago, with their other siblings and parents. The house was empty. Marie, David, and Gail all got out of the car and walked completely around the house, recalling climbing an old oak tree that held a tire swing, recalling the farm area and what used to stand there, etc., when the three returned to the front of the house, there on their steps sat their dear old dad. They had passed away in April of 1974. Shocked to see their father on the steps, they called out to him. Dad stood and stood at the three with a malevolent grin. He motioned for his kids to follow him into the house. They followed through the living room, past the kitchen, down the hall, until they reached their parents' old room. He turned and looked each one in the eye and put his fingers to his lips, as if to say, shh. He then motioned with his hands for them to follow. He opened the bedroom door, and they followed him inside. He walked to the closet and walked through the closet door. Now in each person's dream, they were the ones about to open the door. As each reached for the doorknob and slowly started turning the knob, their mother appeared from nowhere, screaming at them to not open that door. They instantly woke up from the dream. I was a teenager at the time this occurred, and I did not see the big deal about following their dad into the closet until we visited my grandmother. My grandmother was telling my mother of how David and Gail both called her after Marie did saying they had the same exact dream as she had. My mother looked scared, and my grandmother told her they all needed to get into church because Satan himself was using their father's image 
to lure them into something evil. I asked dear old granny how she got that from a dream and grandpa going into a closet. She told me because her husband, their father, my granddad, was scared of closets. I thought she meant he was claustrophobic. She assured me he was terrified of closets. The whole time they were man and wife, she would have to get his clothing out of the closets and lay them out for him. She would have to put things into closets. She refused to open them or go into them. My grandmother believes that Satan used granddad's image to lure the three siblings down a path of evil. I know this isn't much, but I love to hear the story. Within my years, I've had many, many ghostly experiences, but the most recent experience seemed to scare me the most. Almost every night sitting in the downstairs of my home, I feel a strong presence each time at a different location within the dining room and the living room. First, you may want to know how my dining room and living room are set in my house. When you first walk into my home, you enter a little narrow hallway where you then have to go through another door to get into my living room. Then, to get to my dining room, we have a huge opening and there's my dining room and my steps to go to the second story in my home. The other night, I was sitting on my couch closest to the two living room windows, but something just kept telling me to look over at the window in the dining room. Sure enough, I saw black mist that looked as if a face was watching me, but then it disappeared. I passed it off if it were nothing, and that I was seeing things, because it was around 11.30pm, and I was quite tired. For some odd reason, my shades were semi-open for five blades, and then the rest were closed, so no one could see. I then moved my brother to the other couch, and we sat together and I just could not keep my eyes off the window in the hallway entrance. Within an hour, I was getting finally comfortable. My brother was sleeping. My mother and stepfather were sleeping, and my older brother was home upstairs, with his car parked outside. I gazed at the window, and the black mist was back, but this time, it was more clear and bigger. It seemed more like a body and a face, but turned to gaze out of my window. Then it sounded like someone was trying to open my front door. It's a big steel door, and when it's locked and somebody tries to open it, it sounds as if someone is pushing against it. It happened at least six times before it stopped. I held my little brother close to me. Within the next 15 minutes, it sounded like someone was walking in the hallway and jiggling keys. Well, that was enough for me. I woke my brother up and sent him into my room because I had my air conditioner on in my room. But the jingling sound seemed to follow us to right outside my bedroom door, then stop for the night. My mother recently saw the mist and told it to go back to wherever it came from. It then seemed to glide to my basement door and disappear. My home is about 150 years old, and back then, people couldn't afford to have a proper funeral, so they buried people in the walls in the basement or in the floor. We recently had a dirt basement floor and a cobblestone wall, but we had the floor cemented over. My grandfather, whom I can safely say is a ghost expert, senses something in the walls in my basement. Around my house, but mainly in my room. I know for a fact there is a ghost in my room, but she's a sweet woman, and she just seems to watch me until I fall asleep. There are several ghosts in my home, but recently, I feel as if more are residing here. Just the other night I was drifting to sleep in my room, and I heard the sound as if someone was breathing. I held my breath, and the sound was still there, so I turned the TV on. It seemed to just go away. I was scared and looked towards the mirror and saw a flash 
and then nothing happened. But I saw the woman and felt comfort. I feel as if she scared the other spirit away. In my grandmother's house, there is an attic, but it's hidden in the ceiling, and you have to pull the straps down. During the war at her home, soldiers were hidden in the attic, and rumor has it, one night, the other people found them and killed everyone in the room. But the one young nurse was beaten and then murdered. I had a dream once about a place where there's a dangling light, and you have to walk on beams and then open a door, and there's a little room with blood stains. I told my grandmother, and she said I described her attic exactly, even though I'd never been in the attic. The woman who was murdered was a beautiful woman, and she is often spotted around my grandmother's house, scrubbing floors and walking. My grandmother's house was remodeled after the war, and the woman comes down the steps and walks, straight turns, and goes out a door, which is now a window. But before there was a wall separating the rooms and a separate door. Recently, my grandma has seen a little boy petting her dogs, saying, come on, doggy, come with me. She thought it was my little brother because he had spent the night, but he was downstairs sleeping and no one else in the house was awake. She knows he's a ghost and she is comfortable with him. Although I am severely frightened of her basement, which in 1947, a man was found hanging with a grin on his face and a woman shot in the head underneath him. There were people found suffocated in their beds, random strangers. My grandma says the boy was one of the children found, and the man is evil. She feels that he may harm me. She doesn't like anyone except for her in her basement. I have many more stories to tell you, but I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I'll contact you later with many more stories. Thank you. Feel free to email me, or if you just want to exchange experiences, thank you. Although this is a true tale, it's not one of your spine tinglers. Just something odd that cannot be explained. It was told to me several years ago by a colleague, and happened to her mom Jean and some friends. Although Jean lived in Romford, Essex, she regularly went to a keep fit class in a small school hall in Upminster. The class had finished and her and her friends had piled into her car and drove around the corner, parking near the chip shop and they all ordered fish and chips, like you do when you've just had a good workout. They were all sitting in the car quietly eating when one person noticed something odd and nudged the person next to them. Eventually, they were all mesmerized, mouths agape, Chips forgotten as her attention was focused on the activities in the churchyard over the road. Quite clearly, they could see a silent nighttime funeral procession of a coffin being carried on the shoulders by six pallbearers, all decked out in long black tailed coats. They silently watched the procession walk from one side of the church and disappear around the other side. St. Mary's Lane, for anyone who lives nearby. Of course, they all asked the other. Did you see what I saw? Knowing full well they did. The next day Jean decided to visit the church as she just had to know what happened. Maybe someone was buried late last night. However, she got to the church and found the vicar. She worded the question carefully so as not to look like a complete idiot and was obviously stunned when the vicar told her that no funeral took place last night. She said that from the look on his face it was fairly obvious that he knew why she was asking. But being a vicar, he simply smiled and walked away. Spooky. I've been past the churchyard as my grandparents used to live just down the road, and it is quite a creepy looking place. All the stones are really old and crumbly and covered in moss. None of the names or dates are readable. It's one of those graveyards where you can look at it for a little while, and then you kind of shudder and have to look away. I used to think it was my childish imagination, but even these days, the place still gives me the creeps, even in the middle of summer. My story has to do with things that happened to me as a child. 
When I was six years old, my parents bought a very old house, probably around 100 years old, and that was back in 1976. It was a very large house and some of the original wallpaper was still in it. I have always been kind of in tune with the supernatural, and I also have a psychic sense. I'm not saying I am psychic, but I just know things and I can't explain it. Well, anyway, I know that my sister was very afraid of this house. She is three years younger than me. She would either sleep with my parents or with me, and she would never cross the long hall that ran through the center of the house by herself. I know that one day I was sitting in the living room and I got this really weird feeling, like I wasn't the only one in the room. I felt like someone was staring at me. Now keep in mind that my mother and sister had gone to the store, so I was in the house alone. At this time, I was about nine years old. I was sitting on the floor and I just happened to look up. If you are familiar with old houses, you know that some have these glass windows at the top of each door that I guess people used for ventilation before air conditioning was invented. Well, the upstairs of this house had been added years after the original one story had been built, and the steps that led upstairs went even with the glass window above the door in the room I was in. There was also a small triangle of wood that was missing from the step, and that is where my eyes shifted to. There was something looking at me through that space. I was so scared that I grabbed my dog and ran to the front porch, just hoping my mother would drive up. I don't know what it was, but there was something there. People in the neighborhood were always asking if the house was haunted, and one time an old woman I had never seen before asked me if I knew of the girl that had been locked in her room, in my house, and she had died there. There is also another story that happened in this same house. My uncle was living with us. He was 70 years old, and I was about 10 at the time. One night I heard him calling my father. He was shouting, and that is what woke me up. My father went running into his room, and this was my uncle's reply. I know you're not going to believe this, and... I know I shouldn't be seeing this, but I do. There's a black woman standing in front of the fireplace holding a little girl's hand, and she's wearing a red coat and hat. Then my father said that my uncle's eyes followed something around the room, and then my uncle began to scream again, No! Go away! Don't come near me! Then they disappeared. My father said that he had never been so scared in his life, because his uncle was being rational about it. Like he knew he shouldn't be seeing something like that, but he did. I knew there was something in that house. Although we moved out when I was 14, I still drive by it to look, and I still get a creepy feeling about it, just from driving by. I feel it in my bones. What do you think? I would really appreciate your opinion. Thank you so much. In the summer of 1999, I bought a house in a small town in Washington State. I'm a California native, so as you can imagine, I had a difficult time adjusting to the calmer settings. It was almost too quiet for my liking. About three weeks after I moved into my new home, an old colonial-styled house, I decided and began looking for a roommate. Soon after I placed the ad, I got a phone call from a very willing young lady who said it sounded like the perfect location for her. I took her name down, and she said she would call me the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I waited all day for her phone call, but it never came. I figured she must have found some other place to stay, but I kept the spot vacant in case she called back. A few weeks later she did call again, and as before she told me she would call back the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I faithfully awaited her return call, but same as the first time, it never came. I began to get suspicious as to whether it was a prank caller or a real person of interest. I thought it was odd how she'd given me a name without a number. My attempts to find her in the phone book failed, so without any other place to turn, I gave up on the search. About three months later, I was up in the attic storing some Christmas decorations I wouldn't be needing for some time when my eyes fell upon an old stack of newspapers in the corner. I was somehow intrigued by a particular paper lying on the top of the stack. As I thumbed through it, I was quite shocked to read an article printed about a young woman who died in her house, the house I was currently living in, at the age of 22. Even more shocking was the name of the woman. 
It was an identical match to the woman who called about sharing my home. I couldn't catch my breath. I went down to the local historical library and discovered that this woman did indeed live in the very house I now owned in the late 1800s. My visit to the library occurred close to six months ago. Since then, late at night, I've heard crying downstairs in my living room. My aunt and uncle used to live in an old log cabin. We think it was by an Indian burial ground, but it was definitely haunted, and the spirit there was not good at all. One night, my aunt and uncle woke up to find they couldn't move. They were being held down by something, but that's not my story. My three cousins all shared the same room. It was the only room on the second level. I hated going up there by myself. I never had to before, but this time I did. I was about six or seven. My sisters and I had been playing board games with our cousins up in their room. When we went downstairs to watch movies, I left my shoes up there. When the time came to go, I couldn't find my shoes. I looked everywhere. Then my sister reminded me I left them in my cousin's bedroom. I went upstairs and planned to run into the room, get my shoes, then run out and down the stairs as fast as I could. I ran into the room and picked up the shoes. But as I was turning around, I felt something behind me. I was so afraid to turn around, but at the same time, I wanted to run down the stairs, right out of the house and into the car. So I slowly turned around. There I saw a small little Indian girl, maybe about my age. She was surrounded by a blue and white light. I just stood there until she vanished. I ran out to the car where my parents were waiting. And until now, I have never told anyone my story except for my aunt, who also sees things. Later, I found out that my aunt and uncle would pray to the Indians to watch over them, to protect them from whatever was in that house. Maybe the little Indian girl was just watching over my cousins. My wife and I had moved to the naval station at Mare Island of Vallejo, California. I was attached to the personal support office. About four months after reporting, I was sent to the combat systems tech school's command to process new students. I hadn't heard about the school's past until my encounter. One day in the fall of 1993, I was typing up a report about 0730 before the other three civilians and one other sailor got there. The typewriter was next to the door to my office, so I didn't miss anyone coming or going. There also was just that one main entryway into the office cluster. No other exits except for a fire door with the alarm connected. Anyway, someone walked by my door and I thought it was my shipmate, so I asked how he was doing. I got no reply, so I thought he hadn't heard me and I decided to go bug him after I finished my report. I went to his office and found it locked. Then I noticed the light on down the hall. The light was moving ever so slowly and getting closer to me. It was then that I realized that it was actually a translucent figure of a sailor. It terrified me so much that I ended up passing out from a panic attack. One of the civilian computer programmers walked into the hallway at work, noticed I passed out and shook me awake. I told her I saw something in this hallway and she said that I probably was just overworking myself from stress. I also told her that I thought Brian had walked by. She looked at me and said that nobody had moved from their computers since she got there at about 15 minutes to 0700. She did tell me something fascinating though. She said that at times she could have sworn she heard a whistling and a crying sound coming from the hallway. It sounded a lot like a little girl. It was then that I learned that the school was a fleet hospital for the San Francisco Bay Area built back approximately 100 years ago. The night watch detail would find locked doors open and hear footsteps at night. There were stories told about people hearing sounds of a little ghost girl playing ball near the main staircase. I never had the chance to witness her, and the base is now closed, but it was very interesting. As for the sailor, I have absolutely no clue as to what the story behind this guy was. To spare myself the anxiety, I just revert to thinking it was only my imagination, although it felt as real as anything I could ever see. One other experience was shared by my wife, myself, and my mother-in-law at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii in 1995. My wife had been flown to Tripler Army Hospital due to complications with her first child. 
My mother-in-law arrived a day before I got there from my ship. Anyway, we were put up in the guest house at Hickam for a couple of nights before being moved temporarily to an officer's quarter in the corner of the base. It was a well-furnished room and had a pleasant air about it. That was until the night arrived. My wife was awoken that first night where she heard multiple whispers. She then went to get herself a cup of milk in the kitchen of the house when she saw the presence of two figures crouched down as if they were praying. They both wore brown robes like they were monks. This whole ordeal must have lasted 30 seconds and they faded away quickly. In the morning we both got up and discussed what we had felt that night. That's when she told me about what she witnessed. The crazy thing was, while she was experiencing that, I told her that I could have sworn I saw the face of an elderly man just staring back at me in the mirror when I used the bathroom. He had scars on his face and was balding. I'll never forget the sight of it. It was an extremely uncomfortable feeling. This is a story that will always live with me for the rest of my life. My mother and father used to always take lengthy trips over the weekends to visit my grandparents in Ohio when we had lived in Michigan. We would drive about four hours and we usually would get there by the evenings. My grandparents lived in a huge Victorian estate on top of a hill surrounded by woods all around. The house had six bedrooms and was extremely spacious, so whenever we slept over, I got a room to myself on the second floor. At the time, my dad suffered from terrible sleepwalking episodes, and they only seemed to trigger at this house. I can remember one night, I was sleeping in the room and had my window open. That was when I was awoken by soft sounds coming from outside of the window. It sounded like hymns and chanting, as if it was a lullaby. At first, I checked to see if the television from downstairs was accidentally left on, but it wasn't. I was starting to get really freaked out when I went back in my room, because I noticed my dad was walking towards the trail path into the woods. The house lights were shining bright enough so that I could see the woods well enough from the window. In a panic, I ran downstairs and outside as fast as I could and grabbed a flashlight, then chased after my dad into the woods. He had managed to walk so far into the path of the woods that we got to be a mile away, and the further I went into the woods, the darker it got. We just kept getting further and further away from the house, and it was really starting to get cold and scary. I started to call out for my dad shining the flashlight straight ahead in the now pitch black woods when I had lost him. For a split moment, I felt someone whisper my name in my ear and the rustling sounds of leaves behind me as if someone was walking right behind me. For some reason, I thought maybe my dad was behind me instead. So I turned and pointed my flashlight and there was nothing there. I kept going and continued to look for my dad. That was when I once again heard a voice, but this time in a low and guttural voice. I could have sworn I heard the voice say let's play. At this point, I actually thought my dad was playing a practical joke. So then I yelled out to my dad and told him this isn't funny and to show himself. Even though the voice sounded nothing like him, I just kind of assumed maybe to ease my mind in my panic state. Literally a split second later, I see a cloudy mist and what looked like an orb hovering from the distance of the woods and slowing going in my direction from afar. It then disappeared. I heard my dad's far off distance scream and I started running faster into the woods to try to locate him. When I finally found him, he had fallen into this well that none of the family had any idea had existed. I quickly helped my dad out of the well, and he had asked me what happened. I brought him back into the house and told him that he was sleepwalking and managed to wander into the woods. The creepiest part of this whole experience was this. He said that while he was sleepwalking, he had dreamt that a woman in pioneer clothing 
urged him to find her missing son in the woods. She told him to run to the well, and he will find him. When my dad told me this, I told him about hearing some soft singing before I rushed into the woods to get him, and that I heard voices and whispering into the woods. A couple days later, fascinated by the well that existed in the woods, we went to go see it in daylight. To my utter shock, we had made a gruesome discovery. We found what looked like human bones at the bottom of the well. We immediately called the police. They examined these bones, and we were able to confirm weeks later that they weren't animal remains, but human remains. We had the bones examined by a professional, and they believed that the bones belonged to a young boy who may have perished hundreds of years ago. My guess is in the early 1800s. I would like to state wholeheartedly that these events are in fact true, from my father sleepwalking to the dream he had and the bones uncovered. It may sound a bit far-fetched, but I guess you'll have to take my word for it. This event happened in the 1970s, and I'm 70 years old now. This all happened when I was 17. I have a rather bizarre ghost story, or maybe it just appears that way to me since I've never experienced ghosts before. It was many years ago, when I was 14 years old, and spending a few weeks at her lake home. One night my friend and I decided to spend the night in the den, rather than our bedroom. The den has a lonely view of the lake, and has a wall of windows. It is a very large room. As we were in our sleeping bags, I noticed what looked like a man sitting in the armchair. The apparition was black. You could not distinguish any features, but you could see a bowler hat or a similar hat on his head. He just sat there and didn't move, his arms resting on the chair. I was paralyzed with fear. I eventually mentioned this to my friend, or maybe she mentioned it to me first. I just remember that after a long time, we started talking about our late night visitor. We compared notes on what we were seeing, and it became apparent that we were both seeing the same thing. A shadow? I think not, and if you read on, you will know why I'm so sure. My friend and I became so scared that we buried ourselves in our sleeping bags and held on to each other for dear life. We knew we had to get out of there, but we were too scared to move. Eventually we got up our nerve and made a mad dash to the bathroom. Keep in mind, our lake house is quite large and the bathroom was not nearby. We huddled in the bathroom for some time and got up our nerve to make it to our bedroom. This time, for some reason, we didn't run. As we were making our way to the bedroom, we saw another apparition on the living room sofa. This was definitely no shadow. There were no windows in this room, therefore no light except the bathroom light. This apparition was easier to see. It was a woman from the turn of the century. She was dressed in a white dress, possibly a Victorian wedding gown, and lying in the pose of a deceased person. As you could imagine, we hightailed it to our bedroom. When in the bedroom, we sat up with the light on. I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually, we heard what appeared to be a marching band playing. We looked at the clock and saw that it was after 3 a.m., and therefore, highly unlikely that a marching band would be performing in this rather sleepy like community. Had it not been for this, we would have considered it as teenage imaginations going wild. You can see things, but hearing them is an entirely different story. In the morning we checked out the house, to see if there was any way music could be played by itself in the house. We found an old radio down in the basement, but it wasn't plugged in. We then plugged in the radio, and it did not even work. 
we asked my grandparents if they had heard anything, and they said they had it. When we told them our stories, they just laughed, and almost everybody else we had told this to laughs also. If they don't laugh, they listen and nod their heads, but we can tell they are just being considerate and patronizing us. We are now both 30 years old, born a day apart, and live over a thousand miles apart. When we are together, we still talk about this and stand by our story and memory. We still agree about what we saw and heard. I have no explanation about this, but I will not sleep alone in this house. I don't even visit often, but when I do, I'm still scared to death. Seabrook, Toddville Road, the former Toddville Mansion, which has recently been torn down. The property turned into apartments or condos. Reports of a strange creature roaming the grounds, noises, feelings of being watched, shadowy figures. Actually, this mansion was the List Mansion. The story of this place was well known to the people of Seabrook, who lived there at the time. I lived near the List Mansion for many years. Several acres of land were bought by a Houston business owner in the late 70s to early 80s, right on Galveston Bay, near the intersection of Toddsville Road and East Meyer Road. Bill List was his name, and for the most part at first, no one knew who he was, only that there was a major construction project going up near the bay. Bill List owned a trailer manufacturing business, and with the success of his business came great wealth. The mansion was a massive undertaking, built up on several feet of soil. The three-story brick structure dwarfed the modest home surrounding the property. The brick foundry, where Bill was buying the bricks for his mansion, was unable to keep up production of bricks for the mansion and bricks for other products. So Bill just bought the brick foundry so all the bricks made could go into his construction for project. Month by month, the mansion began to take shape. The stark brick structure was three stories tall, four if you count the massive garage on the ground level. All the windows on every floor featured wrought iron bars. It was divided into two separate sections, with a large glass and garden and pool. Catwalks on the second floor crossed from the front of the house to the back part. The rooms were arranged into two separate apartments, with kitchens, bathrooms, and living areas. The entire property was surrounded by a brick wall from Toddville Road. The List Mansion, as it was called, resembled a prison, which was not far from true. When construction was completed, me and some friends were in the Kroger parking lot in Seabrook when two guys a little older than us invited us to a big party to celebrate the opening of the List Mansion. We talked to them for a few minutes, and then they left. We did not go to the party. For years after that, you rarely saw anyone coming or going from the mansion, even though several families could live there at the same time and never see each other. The guys we saw at Kroger that day never showed up anywhere in town. Then one day, Bill List was dead, murdered, and the whole story came out in the Daily Citizen, the Bay Area newspaper. The List mansion was built like a prison, not to keep people out, but to keep people in. As it turns out, Bill List had a preference for younger men and would cruise the alleyways in parts of Houston where runaways would frequent. He would offer them a place to stay and drugs in return for his indulgence for the young men. Bill would keep them drugged and locked in the mansion, providing everything for them but freedom. Some would stay and others would eventually be let go, but it was the final group of guys figured it all out. They decided that Bill List must die. So one day, they got a hold of a shotgun and waited for Bill to come home from work. Bill never made it up the stairs from the garage before he was shot and killed. The guys who killed him ransacked the mansion, stole Bill's credit cards, and left. Some were picked up on their way to Canada, 
others were caught in the Houston area. For years after the death of Bill List, the mansion was up for sale, and yet no one would buy it. Caretakers were brought in to maintain the property, and eventually, a bunch of people at a rock and roll band rented it for a while. I moved from Seabrook in the early 90s. Eventually, the List Mansion was bought by a real estate land developer, and he tore down the List Mansion. In its place was built Suko condos with clay tile roofs. There is nothing left of the List Mansion except the sordid stories of the long residents of Seabrook. These are my memories of the List Mansion. I grew up in a small town, and for about a year, we lived in a haunted house when I was just two years old. In other words, I don't remember specific things, just feelings. It all started when my mother and father moved from South Carolina to Kentucky. They rented an old house with a huge basement. This was told to me by my mother. I don't remember much about the house. So this is all second-hand information. They had lived there only about a month when my mother and older sister started to notice things. They told me that I was the focus of the spirit as it would do things to me or around me. Here's a few of the things that happened to me when I was little. One time, my mother and sister was sitting in the living room watching TV. I had a little wooden rocking chair that I loved to sit in. My father was at work working a night shift in the coal mines. Mom said, all of a sudden, things got very cold and my little rocking chair started rocking very fast and the rocking tossed me out onto the floor. Then, the chair fell backwards against the wall with no one in it by the way and my mother and sister both heard a very dull laughing. My mother said, that the thing in the house would push me, and a few times when she was watching me play in the front porch, would pick me up and drop me down hard on the ground. My mother says that she was terrified to leave me alone. Then another time, my big sister and her best friend were playing with me in the front yard, and my mother said she heard them screaming for her. When she went out in the yard, my sister and her friend was holding on to me and crying. I was trying to go down the little hill, into a little field below our house, begging to go play with it. My sister to this day swears that she and her friend saw a big black figure hiding behind a tree and motioning for me to come to it. And what was scary was, was that I was going. My sister's friend refused to come visit her at her house after that episode. My mother told me that I told her its name. I won't repeat it here, for it makes me have anxiety attacks, and that I lived in a deep dark hole in the ground, down in the field below our house. My mother went looking for a hole in the ground, and she found an old well that had been boarded up, and the weeds grown over it pretty bad, so it was very difficult to see. She didn't tell me if she experienced anything there or not, but she wouldn't talk about it with me. She kept begging my father to move. My mother said it would laugh at her, and she was constantly scared. Finally, one night when my dad was home, something happened that made my dad rethink and take my mother seriously. My parents were in bed, and it was pretty late. My father looked up and noticed the shadow of someone staring at him in the darkness. My dad at first thought it was my sister, so he raised up and asked her what was wrong. The thing laughed, and my mother screamed that it wasn't my sister, because the shadow was too big to be my sister. When she screamed, my dad jumped up to turn on the lights, and it laughed again, and disappeared. From then on, my dad took what my mother said seriously. After a while, my dad was able to buy a piece of land, and we moved, and according to my mother, not a minute too soon. To this day, my mother refuses to talk about it. I didn't find out about this until years later, when I was watching TV about 15 years old or so. 
I saw a commercial for cat food with the same name of the thing that had haunted us for years before. I had no idea about this because my mother didn't tell me about it until afterwards. As soon as I heard the commercial and some of the cat food, I had an anxiety attack. When I told my mother what happened, she turned very pale and told me some of the story. Some history of the house after we moved out. There was a man and his daughter who moved into the house. He was a single father, so he had his mother move into the house with him to help him take care of his daughter while he worked. Within two years of them living there, the man went crazy and one night killed himself with a gun. The daughter and her grandmother moved out of the night of his suicide and moved away to another state. No one ever lived in the house again. It stood empty for years and the house started falling apart. The owner had since died a long time ago and everyone just sort of ignored the old house. My mother never told anyone of our experiences. Finally, about six or seven years ago, they tore down the house in the basement and they built a community fire department on the property. That building isn't exactly where the house was. It stands about 30 or so feet from where the original house stood. Anyway, that is my story. I've had other experiences as an adult, but I will save those for another day. Thanks for listening. I live in a two-story town. It was the middle of July and it was very hot in Kansas City. I was sleeping on the couch downstairs as the upstairs is hot in the summer months. I was sleeping and I remember a low heavy dark voice saying I must help Laura, my cousin, understand. I woke up startled by the deepness of the voice. You could even say a little bit scared. My dog, which hardly ever barks, was looking into the kitchen and growling, and then slowly he started to bark. He was watching something, and when I looked in the direction he was looking, of course I couldn't see anything. The light from the outside street lamp was beaming through the window, so it was somewhat light. He started to back away and followed the presence into the den and then to the wall that was straight across from me. He was watching something, but of course, I still couldn't see anything, but from the way I woke up, in a startled state, I was somewhat scared to move. Like an idiot, I just stayed still and watched my dog follow this presence that only he could sense. He then started to go to the door, located on the wall across from me, and which opens to my garage, growling at the door. He would back up and then move closer, and then he started to smell under the door. Still, I was too afraid to move. I just stayed there and watched. Within five to ten minutes of this, the presence seemed to have left. My dog stopped growling and was going from the kitchen to the wall, into the door again. And again, as if to look for something, finally he gave up and just curled up at my feet, which have not moved an inch this whole time, and fell asleep. Feeling now that the presence had left the room, I went to the door, which led to my garage, and pushed on it to make sure the door was closed, once again stating what an idiot I am. I did not dare to open the door. However, I didn't really have a choice because that was when the door cracked open just enough that I could see the face and a body of a bloodied lady in a black robe. It appeared for 40 seconds and I saw her long enough to make out that she had to be a nun. I just remember her face looking so badly bruised and beaten as if she was hit with a bat or something damaging enough to give her a black eye. I turned away in fright, then opened the door completely to see that nobody was there anymore. It was like it appeared in a flash of lightning, then was gone. 
just to give you some background on my house. The door that goes to my garage does not have a lock in it. Yes, this is dangerous. For if my garage door is open, anybody could just walk in right into my house. Maybe this nun I saw was really a homeless person. Maybe it was someone who was trying to rob the house. But since they saw me, they fled. Nothing was stolen. Everything was in one piece. Feeling somewhat safe that the presence had left, I joined my dog and soon fell asleep. In the morning I awoke, went upstairs to take a shower, and dressed for work. When I came downstairs, I gathered up all my things and opened the door which leads to my garage and stood there in total amazement. My garage door was wide open. I left the door open all night and morning. I truly feel my spirit guy was trying to warn me and I was too stupid and too afraid to listen to him. As I drove to work, I thanked him for trying to warn me and I promised to try and listen more carefully next time. The reality sank in that I could have been robbed or beaten. Yes, today I'm buying a chain lock for that door and installing it right away. In hindsight, I wish I would have been more accepting of the events that were happening to me. If this has taught me anything, it's to stop, slow down, and listen to the ones who are trying to help me. As a youngster, I was playing with my toys in the lounge, and suddenly, I had this great feeling of feeling fright around me. So I went running into my mother, who was washing the dishes. She told me not to be frightened, as there was nothing to be frightened of. So she assured me, and took me back into the lounge, to carry on playing. But as she walked back to carry on washing, she saw a figure standing still in the hallway. It looked as though it appeared to be a monk in a brown habit, with his face covered by his hood. All you could see was his feet, which had sandals on. My mother walked towards it, and it disappeared into my mother's bedroom. But my mother always said how I must have sensed the presence of this ghost. Another time in the same house, it was nighttime and I couldn't sleep, so I was just looking into space when three squares appeared on the wall. I thought that it must have been some kind of light shining in from the window, knowing full well that no light normally shines through as we had blinds and curtains up at the window. I kept on staring at the squares on the wall. They didn't move or anything, but I felt really frightened like in the other story. I must have fell asleep, thinking about the lights on the wall. In the morning, when I awoke, the first thing I did was get out of my bed and go straight to the wall, hoping in the back of my mind that there wouldn't be any kind of marks on the wall where the square was. But I was wrong. Where the squares were, there were deep-lined marks, like holes that were pressed into the wall around where the shapes were. They looked almost like claw marks and definitely weren't there before. There is no logical explanation for this story, not that I can explain anyway. It was not possible for any light to come through the curtains, and there were no other kind of lights or anything on in the room or in the house. I've tried to come up with some sort of explanation, and I don't have one. And that happened about 23 years ago. I've had some strange and incredible experiences over the years. Just posted one in the last match. Some of them I haven't sorted out how to share yet, but the following experiences are pretty strange. My roommate and I we're living in a Seattle neighborhood called Capitol Hill. Our apartment building, the Ben Lamont, was built in 1910, and my apartment overlooked a little park area 
with a long retaining wall in the back. One night, I must have fallen into a deep sleep as soon as I went to bed. When I woke up the next day, I immediately told my roommate about a disturbing dream that a menacing, sinister black figure had climbed out of a hole in the ground, right against the retaining wall. He seemed full of rage and anger, and was coming closer and closer to our window, and meant real harm. It was a very real, fearful thing. After hearing my dream, my roommate said she tried to wake me up soon after I went to sleep, but I was out cold. She said she heard something like a gunshot outside in the park and walked through a darkened apartment to the living room's bay window to see if she could see anything. She said she saw a man who was built like a tank, but fitting the physical description of the man in my room to a T. He appeared to be staring up at her. For whatever reason, I don't understand why she did this, considering she thought she heard a gunshot but she shined a flashlight on him. When she did, she could no longer see him. Although she saw everything else, the trees, the ground, bushes, everything where she was standing was illuminated, but he had vanished. When she covered the light, there he was again. I guess she did this a few times until he really vanished. Very, very strange. Another time I was staying in an artist's loft in San Francisco that was in a really creepy area on Market Street and 6th. I was in bed, just starting to get the semi-lucid feeling when I woke with a frightened gasp. The only way to describe it is a flash vision. I thought for sure my throat had been slashed with a deep long knife from left to right and all this blood was pouring. I remember sitting up gasping, knowing it was fatal. Then on the news the next day, chills went up my spine when the anchor person said that someone's throat had been slashed at a hotel on 6th Street, right around the corner from where I was staying. Somehow, I must have picked up on the victim's fear, anxiety, and shock. Not really a ghost story, but still weird. Another time, a friend and I had an interconnecting dream. I dreamt one part, and she dreamt the other. They matched perfectly, and since we both dreamt this right before we were waking up, we assumed we had these dreams at the same time. I think I was about seven when I first started seeing things in my house and around my neighborhood. The first time I saw something was when my sister and I were sharing a room. I knew that I always felt something in the room, but I never saw anything, so I really paid no mind. Then one day, while I was sitting in my room, I looked up and saw an image by my door. I don't know exactly what it was, but I know that I was scared. Over the next couple of days, I would hear things in my room. Like people walking, the doorknob would jiggle, and things would just tip over. When I talked to my mom about these things, she told me not to be scared of them, just tell them to go away. The next night, I was sitting on my bed, and I heard somebody walking around. I did what my mom told me, and told it to go away. It didn't work. The sound became closer and an image began to appear. At first I was kind of scared, but when I saw what the image was, I wasn't so scared anymore. It was a little girl, about five years old, who was lost. She was just staring at me for a while, and then she just sat down on the bed next to me. She was sitting next to me for about two minutes, and then she was just gone. For a few years, I wouldn't see anything, just hear things. When my older sister moved out, my sister and I finally had our own rooms. I stayed in our original room, and my sister moved to my other sister's old room. For a couple of months, things were cool, 
And then my sister woke up in the middle of the night and asked if she could sleep with me. The next morning, when I asked her why she slept with me, she told me it was because she was hearing people talking from the closet. Me and her had to switch rooms because she wouldn't sleep in her room. The first night, nothing happened, but the second night was completely different. I was hearing whispering and footsteps. At first, I thought I was scaring myself, but when I heard someone ask why my sister and I switched rooms, I knew I wasn't imagining it. At first, everyone thought I was making it up, but when I told my grandma about it, she looked at me as if she were surprised. She told me that I wasn't the only one in the family to be able to hear and see things. It was something that actually ran in my family. After that, things started happening more. People would talk to me. I would feel them touch my arm, face, or even feet when I was sleeping. And sometimes, I could feel someone sitting at the end of my bed. I think when I really got scared was when I decided to sleep with my light on so nothing would bother me. But when someone said turn the light off, that was it. I ran to my mom's room and fell asleep on the edge of her bed. That was the last time anything happened to me for about a year. I thought it was just something I went through, but when I turned 14, it got bad. Not only was I seeing things at home, but I was seeing them outside occasionally. I learned not to say anything, because when I would, people would just laugh at me. My family and I became aware of a particular area of a supposed haunting in the Jamestown, North Carolina area. We were intrigued by the article and wanted to investigate, even though we are people of faith. The article, which made us aware of the haunting, was in a local magazine and caught my two sons' attention after my wife read the article in a restaurant. The article described the following. In the 1920s, there was an accident in Jamestown near a certain bridge underpass involving two high school students returning from the local prom. From time to time, locals have reported driving by the area where the accident occurred and spotting a young woman dressed nicely standing by the roadside, needing a lift. The stories tell of a young woman named Linda entering the car and describing where she needed to be dropped. Upon nearing the destination, she vanishes. Of course, my wife and I are skeptical, to say the least. So, unaware of any peril, or should I say for a lack of knowledge or fear, we thought we would investigate with our two young sons of five and eight years. We arrived at the location, which is off the main road into the woods, about a hundred yards. There is an old stone blocked railroad underpass located next to the now regularly used underpass. Both of the underpasses have been covered with graffiti in tribute to the stories of Lydia. The old underpass, however, has been overgrown with ivy and weeds and is relatively secluded to say the least. Nevertheless, we were determined to investigate despite the spooky nature of the claims. As we entered the underpass, the air became distinctly colder, which we all noticed. We all felt frightened and left after only a few moments. We got in our car and drove home. We thought nothing of the event until that evening. Strange things began to occur at about 2 a.m. Of all things, an old woody doll with a pole string began to speak in a toy box and would not stop. The electric van door opened and closed several times without any provocation. My boys thought someone was in their room. We thought we were frightened from our prior experiences and let our logical minds control. The house still seemed strange to me and I had difficulty sleeping, even though my male ego would not let me admit my fear. Time went by, 
And although the supposed haunting events were less traumatic, they nevertheless continued for about a month. It came time for the van to have a regular tune-up, and we took it to the dealership. When my wife returned with the van, the trouble ceased. I don't know what we experienced exactly over that period in 2001, but it seemed real. My wife and I still questioned the validity of her haunting, but our youngest son, still maintains that Megan, as he refers to her, often talked to him and was very nice. Anyway, it's a nice little story we often tell family members who don't think we're lost on cozy evenings. Hope you will enjoy. I used to work at this daycare center that only stayed in business for two years. The building that we worked in had many owners and many businesses, but never stayed in business for longer than two years. Usually, bankruptcy would follow. Anyway, I had worked there for about a year and had always been scared of the back of the building. There was a long dark corridor that always gave me the chills and I always felt like I was being watched. I had the early morning shift so I had to be there at 6.30 and get ready for the kids to arrive. One morning, I had an infant who was only four months old and was asleep at the time of the incident. We were in our room and I was write out papers for the rest of the day when I saw a toy out of the corner of my eye being thrown across the room. I didn't think anything of it and played it off as my imagination until a week later, when another coworker told me what happened to her. She was in the sleep room changing a child's diaper when she looked right and saw a little girl standing there staring at her. She looked back at the child she was changing and back and the little girl had vanished. There were no children besides the one she was changing in the room with her. It freaked her out and when she told me freaked me out because then I realized that the toy that I saw thrown across the room wasn't my imagination. Neither one of us had another experience, but those two were enough for us. The first time I had a supernatural experience, I was asleep in my room at my parents' house. Now, I knew this house was haunted because in the middle of the night, I would hear something banging on my walls or my doors, and our dog, who slept inside, would bark on and off during one night, and the next night be completely quiet. But on this particular night, I saw an angel. I later found out that there is an old refrigerator under our house. Ask me why, and I couldn't tell you. Anyway. About a month after we moved in, we bought a six-year-old Shih Tzu puppy. About two days after we bought her, my fiancé and I were sleeping when he woke me up and told me the dog was on the bed. This of course was impossible since she was only six weeks old, had short legs, and her bed was tall with nothing around it for her to jump on. He told me that he felt something tugging at the covers around his neck and growling, and when he rolled over it, ran and jumped off the bed. I just passed it off as him dreaming. But about a week later, while he was at work, he works night shift. I was asleep, and I woke up because it felt like something was running from one end of the bed to the other and back and forth. When I rolled over, it stopped. That kind of freaked me out. Then about three months later, I woke up and saw a hand coming out of our closet door with what seemed to be a letter or a piece of paper in its fingers. The hand was small and white. When I gasped, it disappeared. Then, about a week after that, the bed would periodically shake while I was asleep. I later asked my fiancé if he ever felt the bed shake, and he told me he did, and when he described how it felt, 
I knew we were both feeling the same thing. It's a subtle shaking as if we're an earthquake. Except we live in Virginia, where we don't have earthquakes. At least, not the kind you can feel. It was almost as if there was a big dog on the bed, scratching furiously at a flea. And he also described it the way I would have, which is when you wake up. Your first thought is, man, my heart beating that hard? And then you realize that it isn't your heart at all. And just last week, I saw a young woman with brown curly hair and brown eyes peering at me from a crack in the closet door. And last night, the downstairs bathroom door slammed by itself and the bed shook with both of us on it. Usually, it only shakes with one of us on it. Anywho, that's my story. If you have any insight, please give it to me and you can put the stories on your site. I've had the special gift of seeing those who passed on to the afterlife, often seeing those who have long departed Earth. It happens periodically, but when it happens, I have some pretty vivid and memorable experiences. This has been happening since I was eight years old. One of the scariest ghost encounters I had was when I was 23. I was a teacher at that time. And when I first started teaching, it had gotten very late, and I was in school grading papers. I remember it started to violently storm for a few minutes, before it stopped after some time. At this point, it was so quiet. I was the only one in the school at the time. I had left the classroom door open, when I heard a loud banging on the school lockers right outside the door. It startled me so much, I flinched so hard. I wanted to make sure it wasn't a break-in, so I went outside in the hall to investigate. That's when I was floored. Standing all the way down the hall near the lockers was a man in blue overalls with a long beard. He was holding an umbrella in his hands and looked so deranged. He honestly looked like a homeless squatter to me. I told him not to move at all, and that I'd be calling the cops, that I was armed with weapons, so if he tried anything, I'd attack, which wasn't true at all. I was bluffing, but I needed to scare him anyway. The next thing I know, the man starts charging at me full speed. I run back into the classroom I was just in, slam the door, and hide under the desk. I remember hearing the most intense scream for a second coming from the hallway. The lights go out, and it's pitch black for a moment's time. I started to hear a couple footsteps. Then, silence. It wasn't until about two minutes later, the lights went back on. I screamed out loud, I'm armed, you need to leave, you are trespassing, you don't belong here, etc. I waited a minute or so under the desk and eventually got out. Still quiet, quiet enough to hear mice, I opened the door and head out into the hallway. There was no sign of life, nobody was there, no deranged, homeless man, just nothing. The school is pretty small, it's one floor and about ten classrooms. There are, of course, two entryways to get into the school, the front and back. I went to check the doors, and to my utter surprise, they had been both locked the entire time. I thought to myself, how could anyone break in? The doors are locked, no windows are open, and all of them are locked as well. Was I hallucinating? No, not at all because the man looked as real as any person I could see. So, I made sure to check all the classrooms, even opened the lockers, to make sure this man wasn't hiding in there. But there was no sight of this guy. I did end up calling the police. They checked out the school as well, and saw absolutely nothing. By morning, everyone was aware of what happened. 
And I think they actually canceled school for the kids that day because they were worried that a maniac was on the loose. I think they made the right decision. To this day, I have no idea what it was exactly. Of course, since I'm gifted, I lean towards the idea that this was a ghost. If it wasn't, then I'm really lucky I was unharmed. It could have been a lot worse, and I'm honestly thankful that it was just me that evening. I should mention that the school does have a history of oddities and ghostly phenomena. Supposedly there was a rumor that years ago, in the indoor pool at the school, a teacher went mad and drowned a student right in front of everybody. Legend has it that you could hear the moans and cries of a young person in the pool from time to time. One of the school janitors once swore that they saw a blue figure hovering right above the pool. Unfortunately, nobody took him seriously. He actually lost his job and was put into a mental asylum because he had a mental breakdown after seeing that. Anywho, that's my story and the surrounding rumors of this haunted school. I hope this was thoroughly entertaining. I don't work there anymore. I moved to a different state and work as a teacher currently. After what happened to me, I honestly couldn't stay. Thanks for reading. I'm from Dublin, Ireland, and when I was a boy, I forget how old I was, maybe about 14 or 15. I was staying with my parents with my old aunt and my family's ancestral home. There's a very old church just up the road from the house. It's so close that you can take a shortcut across just one field and you're there. It used to be part of an old Francescan monastery. Anyway, I was in that church on my own one summer's afternoon. It was a hot day and though the church was naturally cooler, it was only a degree or so cooler. I remember feeling a little uneasy. All of a sudden, the hackles on my neck rose. I thought my little sister had followed me in, but then the temperature literally nosedived from somewhere in the high 90s to the mid 40s in a matter of seconds. I sensed that someone or something was watching me from the choir balcony above and behind me. Something told me that as sure as hell was inhuman. I don't know how, but I knew. I slowly turned and looked up. Three seconds later, I was tearing down the road as fast as my legs could carry me. What I saw was the semi-transparent, cowled figure of a Franciscan monk regarding me from the balcony. He was barely there, yet details, the folds of his robe, the heavy cross about his neck, and the shaded outline of a face was visible, yet weirdly see-through. I'm now 20, and still refuse to enter that church alone. I've since asked the parish priest about it. He explained that he had seen an apparition a couple of times when he was alone in the church, but refused to comment or speculate further. I still feel funny talking about this because the only people that seem to believe me are the children around here. You described some of the things that have happened in your number two list of types of ghosts, so maybe I'm not crazy. We moved to this 120 year old farmhouse about four years ago. When we first moved here, my youngest son was three. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen which at the end was the basement door. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen, which at the end was the basement door. I was doing the dishes when he turned to me and asked me to stop laughing at him. I told him I didn't say anything, so he proceeded to go to the living room and back again. When he reached the basement door, he turned to me and said, can you hear them, Mommy? They're laughing at me. I left it alone, but I never forgot it. As time went on, little things would happen that really got my attention, like the smell of perspiration when nobody was around. 
It would only last a minute or two, and it would only be in one spot of the room. I would go to other parts of the room, but could smell nothing until I went back to the original spot, and it would still be there. I would also smell it as if it were just passing by, in front of me, and then be gone. This continued for the next year, and then one day, I laid down with my son for a nap. It was about one in the afternoon. I would wait until he fell asleep, and then I would get up, but before I could move, our bed started shaking for no reason. It only lasted a couple minutes. After that, things happened a lot. My eight-year-old started to get smacked in the leg when he was asleep. He would always come downstairs afraid after it would happen. I started getting nudged on my leg at night, like someone was trying to wake me up. I am a very light sleeper, so I'd wake up immediately and look all around my bed in my room, but nobody was there. One night, when I was sleeping, I felt something lay across my legs. I tried to move, but it was so heavy, so I started to kick real hard and crazy, and it went away. Again, nothing was there. My son was five when he asked me if I could see the man's work boots standing in my dining room. He would see black things floating by and asked if I saw them. He would describe them like shadows. But the clincher was, when we were all sleeping at four in the morning and my dresser started shaking so hard, I thought it was going to fall over. I spoke to my pastor's wife about it and she said they say a prayer every night that ask the Lord to protect them from any harm or evil. My children and I started including that in our prayers, but we added spirits also. We have never had another problem since, except I do still smell them from time to time. I do still hear footsteps across the ceiling when nobody is upstairs, but that's no problem I don't mind. My mother, brother, sister, and I moved into an old house in Cambridge, New York in 1995. They had the intentions of refinishing parts of the house to make it more modern. To give you an idea of the house, it was built in 1884, had four floors, which consisted of a basement, first floor, second floor, and a full attic. Above the attic, there was a window's peak. And access was through the attic by a flight of stairs. Strange things started happening that everyone just brushed off the first week. Every night at 7 p.m. on the dot, the house would fill with the smell of cigar smoke. Nobody in the house smoked cigars. We could hear voices of adults upstairs and people running around. When we went up, no one was there. We heard knocking on the walls all hours of the day. People were heard whispering. It would get so intensely cold in the kitchen, and appliances would randomly turn on and off. My sister was coming down the stairs when she looked to be pushed from behind, and luckily my mother was at the bottom and saw the whole thing. My mother was never bothered at all. It seemed to target only the children, which were my sister, 11, my brother, 13, and me who was 15. She did hear things, and she also felt things, but never scared out of her mind. One day, my mother came to me and said she had to show me something. She took me to the basement door and said, watch. She opened the door and turned the light switch off. Then she shut the door, waited for a few seconds, then opened the door, and the light was back on, and the switch was up. We then proceeded to do this over and over again, and the same thing occurred, so we duct taped the switch off. We left that night to visit family friends, and when we returned, every light in the house was on, even the basement, where it looked like someone tore the duct tape from the wall. We left the light on from then on. Everyone in the house had seen shadows and felt presences, my brother was the one who saw and felt the most. One day, 
He was home alone and said he saw three men in the backyard digging by the garden. He watched him for a few moments when one of them looked up at him and all three of them disappeared. He said the men looked as real as he did. He woke up one morning with three scratch marks down the front of his chest and he said he didn't feel it nor did he wake up during the night. My closet doors in my bedroom one night rattled uncontrollably while I was trying to sleep. This creeped me out so bad, I refused to sleep or even go into the room. The room became a used office, and me and my sisters opted to share a room. My sister said she felt something watch her whenever she was in the bathroom, and on one occasion, she said the shower curtain whipped open. I do believe her because she ran out of the shower screaming and straight onto the front porch. We found out that the house was part of the Underground Railroad. When research was done on the house, it was found that it was also an underground bar during Prohibition. Many, many people lived in that house and also passed away in the house. A woman by the name of Ann Douglas hung herself in what was my bedroom. And we also know that there was also a shooting outside of the house, around where my brother saw the three men. There were so many incidences, but too long to tell all of them. We lived in the house for five months before selling it and moving out. We have heard that people have lived there a stayed a short time before moving out. The house is currently vacant. I wonder why. I had many paranormal experiences when I was young. As I grew older, I dismissed them as fantasy of the young mind. As I grew older, they became less, but two, as an adult, stand out in my mind. One happened when I was in Germany, and the other didn't happen to me. The first time was when I was in Mittenfing, Germany. I was about 23 years old. I was new to the country, military, and looking for a place to rent. We, my ex, an atheist and I, found one. Our apartment was on the second floor. The landlord lived on the first, and there was an attic. The first night we stayed there, I had a dream about a person named Caleb. I could not see his face. All I could see was a shadow behind curtains. He was asking my ex to come with him, and I kept saying no. I had the dream several nights, but I never told my ex my dream. About one month after we moved in, I started experiencing phenomena. We had a bathroom with a skylight. I had this unnerving feeling that someone was looking at me while I bathed. Keep in mind, that this was an old German house, and showers are hard to come by. I also had the feeling of being watched when I went into the kitchen. Several months passed by, and winter came. We had a lot of snow, and it was piling up. One day, I was in the living room, when I heard this sound in the attic, like someone was dragging something across the attic. I dismissed it as snow piling up on the roof and falling. The only problem was, the snow really was falling north to south, roof pitch, and the sound I was hearing was from east to west. I ignored it for about two weeks, and the sound got so loud that I had to leave. My ex found me sitting on the landing one day and asked me what the problem was. I told him what I was hearing, and he laughed and told me it was the snow falling off the roof. I told myself, giggling, you're losing it. Several days went by, and I kept hearing the sound. I did ignore it, but one day, I tried to lay down on the couch. When I heard this sign next to me, I left the apartment again, but one night, we had a party my ex told people that I was hearing things. They laughed, and I was embarrassed, but I told them open the attic door. 
which was between the bathroom and kitchen, and see what was up there. They did, and everyone stopped laughing. I didn't really want to see what was up there, but then again, I did. My ex told me there was nothing up there but old rags. He tried to persuade me from looking, but I wanted to see for myself. So I climbed up the stairs and looked in the attic. What I saw took my breath away. There was an old black German baby buggy sitting up there. It was full of cobwebs and someone pushed it and I knew what that dragging sound was. It made a distinct sound that could be heard by everyone. I actually felt sick to my stomach. We stayed there for about another month and nothing happened. Then one night, we laid down to go to sleep when I heard this knocking on the wall above us. Three knocks. I asked my ex if we had heard that, and this is what he said. I'm going to tell you I didn't, but I did. Well, it was about two weeks after that when my ex told me we were moving. I didn't know it, but he was looking for another place. No explanations. We were just moving. As we were moving, I asked him why, and all he said was, let's leave this place. I asked him why, and he got really mad and told me we were just moving. Well, we moved, and about six months later I asked him why we moved, and he told me that he looked up to the kitchen window, and there was a man looking down at us. I know there was nobody left in there because I was the last person to leave. He also told me he was experiencing the same things I was, but wouldn't tell me because he was afraid to scare me. Keep in mind, my ex was an atheist. I felt chills go down my body. The next one didn't happen to me, it happened to my husband. Keep in mind that he is a Gulf War vet with over 20 years active duty military, Brooke Army Medical Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. Where it stands now is not where it used to be. You actually have to go on post to see the real hospital. It was abandoned many years ago. It is barricaded off, but I would like to hear more about this building. My husband went for training last year. He's a reservist now. He stayed in a hotel across from the abandoned building. After a few days he was there, he called me and told me he couldn't sleep in this haunted hotel. He stated he woke up several times to find his stuff from his closet strewn across the floor. He also said his closet was extremely cold. He also told me that there were roaches as big as tanks. I laughed most of it off until I went there. He told me that several soldiers complained about things happening to them, but no one believes them. Well, I didn't believe him until he drove me by the old hospital and it looked like an abandoned building, barbed wire and chains with locks. After a few passes by the hospital, he told me I needed to see the hotel. He got me into the hotel pretending I was a soldier I felt more like a prostitute the way the CQ looked at me. I will tell you, this place looks as if you stepped into the 30s. I swear they haven't changed the wallpaper since then. He kept telling me that when he looked out his window, the hospital would have lights on and the windows would be open. Keep in mind, this is an abandoned building. He took me to the room he stayed in and yes, the whole room was cold. I could see the hospital from the window and no lights. When we left, I looked up at the hospital and I saw a room with lights on and a window open. I got the creeps. As we were leaving, he drove closer to it and there was no way anyone could have gotten in there. Firstly, I guess I am what you call a sensitive. I regularly see things, hear things, and feel things that others don't. I'm usually the first one to point out when something doesn't feel right, and I've been like this all my life.
During my first year at university, I stayed at Hillhead Halls, and I had the strangest experiences. For about the first month of being there, it was fine. One day, I was walking about the kitchen, and I felt a huge blast of cold and loud whispering, which really frightened me. Seeing strange things doesn't usually bother me, because it happens quite regularly, but this really bothered me, because it felt so, so bad. I asked my flatmate if she had heard anything, but she said that she hadn't. Just after the Christmas holiday, I came back to the worst time of my life. Firstly, there was a man walking around my flat. He was very tall, wearing all black, including a black hat or hood, and you could not see his face. I saw him outdoors and inside the flat. He frequently had a black dog with him, which often walked by my bedroom door. My flatmate got really scared of being alone in her room, as she felt there was someone watching her from her door. It was about a week after seeing this man that electrical appliances in my room started to go wrong. My electrical alarm clock, for example, would just start to beep much louder than anything had ever done before, and did not stop. When I pulled the plug out, it has no battery backup. My printer would just print out random rubbish, even if it was not switched on, and light bulbs would blow if you looked at them for a long time. The electrical stuff would only happen in my room. Objects would disappear from my room, reappearing elsewhere in the flat. An example of this is that we lost a bread knife out in the kitchen. Bearing in mind that I don't eat bread much, especially not in my bedroom, we found it on top of my wardrobe at the back about three or four months after it got lost. At night was the worst. Me and my flatmate would drag our mattress through to my room and sleep there because we're too frightened to sleep in separate rooms. I would have the most horrendous nightmares, which I never got before and have never got since. At night, there would be constant bangings, tappings, and scrapings, which sounded like they were coming from the space between the walls. I think about the worst thing that I experienced while living there was getting up one morning and walking to the window at the end of the landing and looking out at the trees that are above the river dawn. On the larger branches, there were hanged people, as in dead, with a rope around their neck, swinging in the wind. They weren't dressed in modern clothing. I wanted to run away and stop seeing it, but maybe I was too frightened because my feet wouldn't move and I found it really difficult to breathe. After this, my flatmate found staying in our room, which overlooked the river dawn, unbearable, and moved into the room next to mine. As soon as that room was locked, everything was fine until it came to the end of the year and she moved out. She moved out about a fortnight earlier than me, but I was spending most of my time in the flat above mine. After her moving out, I came downstairs from upstairs to find her door open and light shining through onto the landing carpet. Very bravely, I went to shut the door and switch the lights off, but just as I got there, the door slammed in my face and locked, and I heard the light switch off. I phoned my flatmate to make sure she was home which she was. I then phoned the people from upstairs and asked them to come down, and when they got to my flat, the room wasn't locked again, but was totally empty and freezing cold. It was the summer, but you could see her breath was white. The next day when I got out of the shower, I found that the bathroom door was wide open, despite the fact that I'd locked the door, and there is no way that the lock could open itself. Also, the bathroom door was very creaky, and I hadn't heard a creak. I went to my room and got dressed as quickly as possible, but I couldn't find the key to my room so I could lock up and leave. I'd left the key in the lock on the outside of the door, but it was gone. I found it in the bathroom sink. Finally, one night, I gave my key to one of the people living upstairs to go and get me a sweater for my flat, as I was too frightened to go down. 
this person, who was a complete skeptic, came back upstairs completely pale, sweating cold sweats, shaking, and totally out of breath. I don't know what happened, because this person won't talk about it, and has made us all promise never to bring it up in conversation. These all sound like really weird events, but I don't smoke, drink, or do any kind of drugs, and I didn't then, but I swear they are all true. I don't want to experience anything like that again as long as I live. Thanks for letting me share this with you. My friend and I went to Alabama during our senior year in high school to visit my grandparents. Now, my grandparents lived in the middle of nowhere. Little town. You blink. You miss it. Anyway, there wasn't much to do. So one day we went exploring. Down about a half mile from my grandparents' house, at the end of the road, was a huge pasture. It hadn't been inhabited or cared for for years. There was a large gate with a no trespassing sign. This made us curious to see what was hiding back there, in the middle of nowhere. We crawled under the gate and started walking. There was a gravel path and nothing else but trees, grass, and insects. We kept going for about a mile until we were in a fully wooded area. This is where the strangeness happened. First off, we stumbled across an old graveyard with only about three graves in it. it looked like a family. The tombstones were dated back to the early 1800s. I took photos that I can send at a later date if you'd like. Across from the graves was a waterfall. We decided to sit and take in the sight. While sitting there, we heard horse hooves galloping closely. We turned and saw nothing. A little while later, we heard what sounded like something being swung through the air near our heads. Nothing visible though. It spooked us and we decided then that we should probably head back to the house. On the way back, we heard the horse hooves again, and this time we ran, got back to my grandparents' house, and replayed our story to my grandfather. This is where it gets spooky. He said that a while back, he stumbled across the waterfall too, and decided to sit and fish at the bank. He heard the horse too, and heard the swinging, which he described as a hatchet or something similar. Only he said that he turned and he saw a man on a white horse, carrying a machete, and appeared to be clearing the fields, but it wasn't really there, like he and the horse were transparent. He said that's when he took off running too. The only thing I can think of is that at one time, someone lived on that land, which is why they were buried there. I can tell you one thing, it spooked me then, but now I just realize that people just stayed there where their home was. I haven't had any opportunities to get back to that area, but if I do, I may go visit them. I moved to Indiana in 1986. I befriended a woman who sold real estate and said she knew of this huge house that was for rent in a small town called Lamb, Indiana. It sits directly across the river from Carrollton, Kentucky, and is halfway between Vevey and Madison, Indiana. The house was absolutely fabulous, made of stone, and built circa 1800. It is told that the Native Americans taught a white man how to build the house. It became part of the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. There was a tunnel built from the Ohio River up to the basement wall where they had knocked a hole in the wall for slaves to enter. My story starts in the fall of 1987, when my mother, my dog, and I were on the first floor in the living room, watching television. My little dog ran upstairs and was running around in circles. I could hear little toenails on the wooden planks. I felt a cold chill, like a burst of cold air, and became puzzled by it. There were no doors or windows open in the house. It was cold out, and we had built a fire in the wood stove. I went up to check on my little dog to see what she was doing, 
And there it was. My room had a door that led out to nothing. I assumed there was a balcony at one time, but at this time, there was no evidence of one, so the door stayed shut and locked. When I had gone upstairs, I noticed the air was more frigid, and it seemed windy. I went to my room and the door was standing open, and it looked as though a small child had breathed on the window of the door and wrote Amy's room on the window. I think the most interesting experience in this house also happened to be the most terrifying. One night, I had been sleeping in bed with the door open when I was awakened by what I thought was my dad. I remember the door squeaked open slowly, and I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear it too clearly. All I knew was that it was some sort of talking. That's when I started to open my eyes slowly and saw what appeared to be a nun with an axe on her head, kneeling down and praying in front of my bed. I screamed. My parents rushed into the room and I told them I saw something. My dad did his best to reassure me that everything was okay. And after I explained what had happened to me, I feel like he was just as creeped out as I was, even though he tried not to show it. Well, that even frightened my dad, to the point at which he told me he couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I ended up falling asleep, and my dad stayed up. He told me he went to the bathroom and turned on the light, when all of a sudden, it went out, needing to use the bathroom. He grabbed one of the flashlights we had. When he shined the flashlights towards the mirror to wash his hands, he looked at the mirror for a second, only to notice the old man's face right behind him. He only saw this for a few seconds, but he couldn't forget the man's face. He had three large gashes on the side of his face, like he had been mauled by a tiger. Claw marks. He was a balding man with gray hair only on the side of his face, and he looked about 70s. Of course, when the bathroom light came on, there was nothing there anymore. The basement had some creepy occurrences as well. You would hear a very young voice, often singing softly, not super loud, in fact, very faint, but a voice was there. When he'd get downstairs and into the basement, you wouldn't hear it anymore. But it was always something you heard whenever you were in other parts of the house. About a year or so later, we had some family staying with us for the weekend, and my cousin set up a large tape recorder in the basement to see if there were any noises. My little nieces and three friends bedded down in the living room by the wood stove to stay warm, and we all went to bed. The next morning, one of the little girls thanked my dad for stalking the fire that night because it was getting kind of chilly. My dad hadn't been downstairs all night. My cousin went down to the basement to get the tape recorder, real to real by the way, brought it back upstairs and played it back to us. You could vividly hear a little girl say mommy. My family lived in that house for almost 15 years. This is a wonderfully chilling and rather classic, if that can be said, Scottish Tale ghost experience. My mother, who was attending university in St. Andrews, Scotland, was walking home from a party. It was about 11 o'clock on a chilly November night. It should be noted beforehand that St. Andrews was, centuries ago, the religious capital of Scotland and the ruins of the great cathedral still stand in the middle of the town. Anyhow, she decided to take a shortcut to the dorms. Instead of taking the road, she began to make her way through the soccer pitches. These were surrounded by spinnies of trees. As she crossed the fields, she noticed what appeared to be three policemen at the road at the end of the pitch, where she was heading, though not that close. She could see that they wore heavy cloaks, like the Scottish policemen's coats traditionally worn in the winter. She didn't want to be found by them at that late hour, and went to the nearby trees to hide. To her chagrin, 
they began to move towards the center of the field, though not directly at her. She stayed put. As they came closer, she realized that they were walking on the air, about three feet above the ground. Furthermore, they were not policemen, but monks in clerical robes. Two of them were supporting a third in the middle, who seemed to be wounded. They passed only a few yards away from her, so that she saw them very clearly. Oddly, their feet moved very slowly, but they were moving through the air very quickly. When they came about parallel to her, my mother, mad with fear, ran as fast as she could back to the dorms, clearing a fence that was as high as her, with one leap on the way. A violent wind kicked up against her as she ran, as if trying to blow her back. The next day, she went back to where it happened. At the very spot where the three monks had passed near to her, she found three black cats eating the carcasses of a rabbit that they had just killed. In another note, the mystery as to why the apparitions were floating is easily solved. The ground was leveled in order to make a proper playing field. The monks were simply walking on their own terrain, as it would have been in medieval times, three feet higher than the leveled field. My family has had many paranormal experiences. When my mother was a child, they purchased a house near Martins Ferry, Ohio, that had some strange occurrences there. My uncle was in his room asleep and woke up in the middle of the night to find an old woman in a rocking chair sitting in the corner of his room. He said she told him to get out of her house. My uncle was so frightened, he literally dragged his mattress into my mother's room and refused to ever sleep in his room again. My mother and I also saw the woman and can vouch that she was real. My great-grandmother would also see a small black devil-like creature with glowing red eyes outside her window at night. None of my family's pets lived very long in that house either. Their fish were found dead in their tank one morning. All of them. Here's the thing though. The water was somehow boiling hot. My mother's hamster was found dead in its cage too. And I've been told it looked like something had maybe scared it to death from the expression on its face. Also, every night, my grandmother would dream that the house was on fire, and they couldn't get out. After living in the house for six months, they moved out. The day after they had moved out, the house caught fire and was almost burned to the ground. To this day, my aunt still has ghost experiences. At one of their old houses, they would turn out all the lights, lock the doors, and would come home to find that every light in the house was on. I never felt comfortable being alone in the house upstairs. I would feel like someone was watching me when there was no one else upstairs. And in the house they live in now, they were in bed one night when they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from their living room. They ran into the living room to find nobody there, and all the doors in the house were unlocked when they knew that they had been locked before they went to bed. Also, my aunt was in bed, and someone told her that her baby's daughter's face was covered by her blanket, but no one else was home. I swear this is absolutely the truth. I wanted to share my family's stories with other people, so they can know that maybe they are not alone out there. Hello, my name is Naomi, and I've had several paranormal stories to share. Ever since I was young, I've always been terrified of the paranormal, and I have had terrifying, vivid dreams. As a child, I would frequently awake to see a dark, shadowy figure standing by the doorframe of my bedroom. I would feel a presence behind me when I would walk upstairs at night. At a slightly older age, I dismissed the possibility of ghosts because I figured it was impossible, but later I had a change of heart when I went to this haunted yard. 
I'd heard many stories about a small yard where strange things had occurred. One night, I thought it might be interesting to go take a look at it and see what all the fuss was about. The yard is almost impossible to find, totally surrounded by trees. If you are able to find it, go there in winter. The snow is always perfect, not a single flaw. If it's a windy night, there will be no wind within the yard. The freaky part about it is, is that there is an old building which used to be an insane asylum, now abandoned. It's boarded up, but one night we opened it up, and we heard a faint barking of dogs from within, but there were no dogs anywhere nearby. Next to it, there is a small trailer. No one lives in the trailer, but light and the TV are always on. There is an old swing on the yard. If you watch it for long enough, it will begin to swing slightly. The strangest part is that there are two old Native American tombstones. Every time you go back, they have been re and moved to another location on the yard. I'm not sure if any of this is ghost-related, but it certainly is freaky. An incident happened to me this evening as well. I was walking with some of my friends along the railroad tracks in my town. On the street next to the tracks, a hundred years ago, there was a man who went insane, killed his family, and was hanged in the courtyard. Anyway, tonight, as we were walking, we all of a sudden simultaneously stopped and looked at each other terrified. We all felt a strange presence brushing against our backs. Later, we were sharing stories about screams people frequently hear coming back from the park. We decided to sit out on the deck of my friend's house, who lives right by the park. We were just sitting around, talking, when we hear the scream of a little girl, as if she was being murdered, coming from across the park. We randomly ran inside. Once inside, we began to share ghost stories. One of my friends believes his house is haunted. He always feels things in his room when he is sleeping. With one particular experience, back in winter, he would wake up in the morning with claw marks in his shirts and slight scratches on his back. This happened about six times. Another time, he woke up and all of his blankets were totally flipped upside down, but looked as though they had been untouched. He talked to his grandmother about it because she is able to communicate with the dead and she visited their house and told the spirits to leave. Since then, there have been no strange occurrences. I work in a nursing home and didn't believe in ghosts till I was offered a night shift position. One of the girls said that the home was pretty bad with spirits but I thought because of my age, 19, she was just trying to scare me. I was walking alone after answering a buzzer past the dining room when someone touched my shoulder. I turned around and no one was there. I was convinced it was the other two girls, but they were in the lounge and couldn't have got there without me seeing them. Later, we were sitting talking when the door, which is a fire door and doesn't move, was slamming and opening for about a minute and abruptly stopped. We all got out of our seats, don't know why, and then a black figure appeared at the door and just stared at us for about a minute and walked off. The eldest girl went after it, so we followed and no one was there. We sat down to calm ourselves because we were pretty freaked out by that. When the emergency buzzer started going off simultaneously from one room to 30, but there are patients who can't reach them and others on medication, so we went and turned them off and checked our residence. We went to one lady who was dying of cancer and I turned off the buzzer when my coworker said she was gone. We can only think this was her having a laugh because she was a great lady or she was trying to let us know she was gone. That also wasn't the first time someone passed away before we were aware of it. 
I had a coworker once who could have sworn she was talking to an old woman at the clinic that had been at the nursing home for nearly a decade. This coworker had gone on vacation, and this was her first day back. There was a figure laying in bed in a room alone. She was facing away from my coworker, and she had the door cracked over for a second to see if the woman wanted anything to eat. There was no response, so she figured the lady was just cranky and didn't want to be bothered. A few hours later, she went back to the room, and nobody was there. My coworker asked another why the patient was missing. The other coworker looked puzzled. Did nobody tell you that Miss Noble passed away in her sleep while you were on vacation? My other coworker said, Well, then why was there somebody in the room a few hours ago? She found out that nobody moved into the new room since Miss Noble passed away. They tried moving a patient in there for a couple of days, but we would hear him scream bloody murder for no explicable reason. But again, they took him out right away, and way before my coworker returned to work. My coworker insisted that she saw a figure in that room, and that she wasn't tired or feeling unwell. This might end up kind of being long, since I'm going to try to cover a lot of what I experienced in my life. I will start with the first thing that I remember. I was about four or five years old. I was sitting in my bedroom getting some coloring books. It was summer and the window was open. I heard this noise and at first I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I looked towards the window and the sound faded. It sounded sort of like a lawnmower. Well, I went back to what I was doing and the noise just got louder. I realized the noise wasn't coming from my window, but from the other side of my room, where the closet was. I looked over and saw this black orb hovering over the molding of the closet. It was moving in the swaying motion, and the noise I was hearing came from the black orb. I screamed and curled up into a ball. I continued to scream, until my mom reached my bedroom. She looked terrified and kept asking me what was wrong. Well, my little brain could only assume it was a black bee, which she didn't find amusing. She said she thought someone was trying to kill me because of how I was screaming. From that point on, I read everything I could get my hands on about ghosts. Nothing happened for many years after the first incident. My father was in the military, and we moved from Atlanta to Minot, North Dakota, my sophomore year of high school. I'm not going to get into everything that happened down there, since it was a daily occurrence down there, no matter where in town I was. In brief, let's just say the blacker than black negative things. Everywhere. Luckily, the people that I normally hang out with saw them too so I didn't feel like I was going crazy. They ranged in height from being one foot to over seven feet. There was one we nicknamed Split Toes. Keep in mind, there were more than one of them. I lived in Mano for just under one year, and I'll never step foot there again. On top of the shadows, there were many other things that happened ranging from smells to noises, the absolute feel of being chased, the fear. My sister even saw them. Though it traumatized her so badly, she shut down and now says she didn't. Now I know this sounds crazy, but I know there are other people out there that have experienced these things. I know that what happened down there was not an overactive imagination. We all from time to time will wake up with cuts we couldn't explain, or have them appear out of nowhere, sometimes singular, sometimes looking like a tiny clawed hand that hit us, and rarely, bite marks. We were told by a friend's mother to wear sage and little leather bags for protection. I still wear one, 
even though I'm back in Alaska, after Mano, things slowed down a lot. I had a few more experiences with the shadows. After a while, I had enough, though. I yelled at them and told them if they agreed to leave me alone, I would pretend they didn't exist, and it has been pretty much quiet ever since. The last time I had an experience like that was out in Cooper Landing, Alaska, just a few years ago. I left Mano almost eight years ago. My friend invited me and a few other people to her parents' cabin for the night. We drove out there from Anchorage at around 8 p.m. in the winter. I don't know if you're familiar with Alaska seasons and such, but in the winter, it's hardly ever light out. Maybe a couple hours a day during the time period we went out there. So anyways, we drive out to Cooper Landing in the dark on really icy roads. We finally get out there. And at first sight, this place made me nervous. I was determined to have a good time, so I forgot my initial feeling on the cabin. The night went well. The cabin was set up in a very open layout. There was a wall that went halfway across in the middle of the cabin, with the living room on one side and three sets of bunk beds on the other. Come to find out, it used to be her grandmother's cabin before she died. Well, we all decided to go to sleep. My friend and her boyfriend pulled out the futon in the living room and went to sleep. Me and my boyfriend were lying on the bunk bed where we could look into the side of the cabin where the living room was. We were just talking and then all of a sudden, we started to hear this noise. It started by the living room, but outside and worked its way around the cabin but the noise would continue to come from everywhere it had already been. It was sort of like wailing. It reminded me of what a banshee might sound like. I was really freaking out and asking my boyfriend what the hell that was. He said it was a ghost crying. I looked out to where the living room was and this thing started to appear, starting at the top and kind of whirlwinding down. My boyfriend saw it and leapt to the bunk bed directly across and was freaking out. I started demanding he go and turn the light on. It wouldn't stop until he did. Finally he did and the thing disappeared. My friend woke up and told us things like that always happen out there and we just needed to get used to it. I was really upset she didn't tell me. Neither me or my boyfriend could sleep till it got light outside. Nothing else happened that night, but I have no desire to try my luck again. Since then, I haven't had any encounters with anything that appeared as a shadow. I've seen ghosts that appear like people look, in color, and they don't scare me at all. I'm not sure what the black things are, and I'm not sure I want to know. I do know that as long as I don't think about them, I don't have any problems with them. Oh, I almost forgot. Aklunta is a really creepy place up there. Not the cemetery, but the village, or what's left of it. I only got to spend about 15 minutes out there, but that was more than enough to feel it out. Very bad vibes out there. And as we were leaving, I saw something back in the trees. As soon as I looked at it, it darted behind a tree. It was dark out, so I didn't know what it was, but it didn't look like a person. And when we were driving back to Anchorage, on the outbound side of the highway there was an accident, and this huge bull moose was on the side of the road dead, but none of the vehicles looked like they had hit it. A moose hitting your car would crumple it like a soda can. Well, that's all I have for this morning. Maybe sometime I'll go more in depth about my experience in Mano, but not yet. I don't like talking about it when it's dark outside. It all started when I was about five. There was a thunderstorm, and I hate storms, so I went to my parents' room across the hall. After the storm was over, 
I decided to go back to my room. When I got to the doorway, I saw two figures sitting in two of my chairs. I had a little table and tea set in the middle of my room, and they were just sitting there. One of them was facing me, and it looked like a pitch black shadow. The other had its back to me. I wasn't sure if it was real, so I blinked my eyes very tight multiple times. The one whose back was facing me slowly turned around to look at me. It was white, kind of fuzzy looking, like the way your TV looks when it gets all snowy in the TV set, and had two black holes where the eye should be, and an outline of the nose and mouth. I think the best way to call it is a static man. I got scared and ran and told my father what I saw. He told me that her grandfather tends to watch over us. He passed away years ago. He even said he saw this dark shadow hovering over his bed one night, although it was pretty dark, so we could barely make out anything. I later found out that an old couple originally lived in the house before my parents bought it in the 70s. The original house is small, two bedrooms, and a kitchen a small living room. It was only one story, and when my parents moved in, they said the old man died. They heard voices a few times, but didn't think anything of it. Then, when me and my brothers were born, they built a basement in second story where the bedrooms are. My bedroom and my parents' bedroom are right above the original part of the house. My room used to be the attic until we built the upstairs. I think the ghost from my grandfather and the old man, but I keep seeing the same ghost when I go places. I'm never scared though. Also, we've had things fly across the room, things shatter out of nowhere, hear noises, and I've had experiences where I felt a presence in the room, and then I saw a crease in the couch right next to where I was sitting. I'm not scared though because I just have a feeling they don't intend on hurting me. It actually makes me feel safer at times. Hi, I've enjoyed your website and wish to share one of my experiences. This is all true, and if you have any comments about ghosts or questions, please feel free to email me, as I'd like to know what it might have been. When I was 12 or so, I had a strange experience. I was playing with my friend in the woods near the Quib and Abduct. This is in Wayland, Massachusetts. We had to take our neighbor's police dog on our adventure, looking for the Indian artifacts. On a hill that was gravely, I found what I believed to be an arrowhead. After showing it to my friend, I stuffed it into my pants pocket and moved to a new spot with the dog. He began to whine towards some bushes about 20 feet away. I looked in the direction the dog was looking and saw nothing. Figuring it was a rabbit or squirrel, I let the dog off his leash. He began barking and ran into the bushes. My friend joined me and we called the dog back. He came right away, being well trained. He sat looking from us to the woods and panting. We put his leash back on, and both my friend and I had the feeling of being watched. I reached into my pants to see the arrowhead, but it was gone. I checked the other pockets. Nothing. Then we decided to go home. Both of us creeped out. On our way back, the dog stopped at the tree and looked up. And at least 30 feet up, we saw a piece of bloody fur stuck to the tree. We ran back to the neighbors and returned the dog, not wanting to get laughed at. We didn't tell him about the fur. My friend got her bike and went halfway to meet my house. When I got in the door, the phone rang. It was my friend. She asked if I was okay. I was fine. I told her. Then she'd explain she'd seen someone lurking in the bushes of the only empty house in my neighborhood, and they seemed to be following me. 
I dismissed it and ate dinner. That night, a storm came. The thunder and lightning woke me up. During a flash of light, I saw a tall, thin figure at the foot of my bed. I think it was a man. He wore all black, a long, odd jacket, and had very long arms. They reached his knees. On his head was a stovepipe hat that was too high and had a wide brim, so his face was shadowed. As I looked at him too terrified to scream, he raised his arms and pointed at me with the long finger. Another flash of light, and he was gone. In the morning at school before homeroom, I asked my friend to describe the person she had seen the day before in the bushes. She said he was thin and had a weird hat like Lincoln wore. Of course, I was freaked out. I don't know how much later, maybe a month or more, I was doing homework on my bed and heard scuffling in my closet, thinking it was the cat. I opened the door to scoot him out. The cat was not there, but the clothes were swaying side by side. I closed the door and left my room. The next and last time I saw the ghost was at summer camp. I had been put into a room alone, having had a panic attack over an incident in which I had a dream come true. I dreamt a kid got run over by a van, and a storm came in a cabin was hit by lightning, and kids burnt up. That day, we were teamed up and competing for ribbons. One event was a van pull. A team of kids were pulling a van. A kid fell under, and the van went over him. He was unhurt, but the license plate made a dirty mark on his back. I got scared and then it began raining very hard. Everyone headed to their cabins. It began to lightning, and I lost my mind. I'd confided my dream to my friend that morning, and as she tried to tell the counselor, I was crying and trying to warn the people about the fire I believed to be about to happen. The counselor locked me in her room, alone. A blast of thunder and lightning hit and blew the outside door open. Rain poured in, and in the storm stood my ghost looking in at me. I screamed and slammed the door shut. Luckily, fire never happened. I never saw the ghost again. I often wonder about it, and as scary as it was, it never hurt me. Please note, I know the story sounds far-fetched, but it isn't. This really happened. Hi, Sam here. I've apparently spoke to a ghost when I was two years old. To cut a long story short, I moved to Invicta Road in Charnas, Kent when I was two years old, with my dad. A year or so before we moved in, a lonely pregnant woman lived there and offed herself by hanging. Because of the pregnancy in the back room, no one lived there until my dad and I. I slept in the back bedroom. My dad told me that he would often hear me talking to someone at nights in my room. My dad asked me who I was talking to. I said it was the gray lady who sits at the end of my bed. My dad then met my stepmom and she moved in with us at nights. Sometimes my stepmom and I would sit alone and she'd hear walking around upstairs and things being moved about. It was so bad one night that she went over to her parents house to get them they brought their dog over the dog started growling and barking for no reason my dad moved me out of the back bedroom to another bedroom when i started to get upset and not sleepiness dreams and anxiety are my main feelings i get i can't walk through a graveyard without getting anxiety and i also smell a really musty smell that no one else seems to notice. It's so intoxicating that it makes me feel like I'm suffocating and it makes me feel sick. Sometimes it makes me wonder whether I still have this woman following me. I was recently staying at a youth hostel in Cornwall, England. 
the manager warned me jovially when I arrived that there were three ghosts in the hostel, all linked to different areas in the building. He added with a mischievous grin that one of them had a particular dislike for the new computer that had been installed and seemed to keep switching it off. He chose to tell me this because the reason I was there was to do some work with that very computer. After an evening of unproductive work on the computer that obviously wasn't working properly, I retired to the small private room I had been given. I dropped off to sleep fairly quickly, but woke up after about an hour feeling cold, the reason for which became clear very quickly. The duvet from my bed was lying in a heap on the floor around my feet. I picked it up and covered myself, but then had trouble getting back to sleep as the couple in the next room were being very noisy. Eventually, they quieted down and I started to relax, but before I managed to fall asleep again, the duvet began to slowly slide down the bed as if pulled from the bottom. I let it move about six inches to see what was happening, then got hold and pulled back. Whatever was pulling gave up with relative ease, and I was soon covered again. At this stage, I can remember that rather than being frightened, I felt as if some silly game was going on, and I was almost giggling about the fact that some impish ghost had chosen me for an adversary in its little game. As a result, after a half hour or so, I had no trouble getting back to sleep. It seemed, however, that I hadn't taken things seriously enough and had managed to cause offense. The next time I woke up, it was with a startle, as the duvet began to quickly slide off the bed, again in the same direction towards my feet. This time, I decided that enough was enough and started to feel very afraid. You know what it's like in the dark at night. A simple duvet can seem to offer so much protection and security, and the potential lack of it made me feel very vulnerable. I think I managed to move about an inch before I found myself suddenly unable to move anymore. I couldn't actually feel any force or weight holding me or pressing down on me but I was totally unable to move my arms or any part of my upper body except for my head. In fact, it felt like it was suddenly made from lead. I was then greeted by an old man's laugh. I had literally heard a very slow guttural sounding laugh and it sounded far from pleasant. I fought and fought and eventually managed to get my fingers to move slightly. As soon as I achieved this one small movement, everything was fine. The inability to move evaporated quickly, and I was left back in full control of my body. I stood right side up, surveying the entire room, and what I saw next terrified me. There were a pair of red eyes looking at me by the door for about 30 seconds before fading away. Just then, the door opened, and there was light mist that moved through the door and then evaporated. I screamed I'm not afraid of you and that tonight's rest will be a peaceful night's rest. I pulled the duvet back over myself and surprisingly only felt any kind of fear for a few minutes and was soon relaxing again. Whatever the game was about, it seems that I had won and that my adversary had admitted defeat fairly gracefully. I slept peacefully well for the remaining few hours of the night and woke up perfectly refreshed in the morning. Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I have had frightening experiences with spirits. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house, only eight years old at the time in West Texas. As far back as I can remember, we had strange things going on in that house. First off at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. 
you could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallway to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister, and it didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet, and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all, she woke up and looked over at my bed. Laying at the foot of my bed was a light blue glowing figure of a woman. Her eyes were gone and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed. So she started screaming my name and closed her eyes when she opened them. I was awake, asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night, my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what? I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards, and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by, and when they did, unaware where I was hiding, stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard a younger sister say, what is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused and was about to chase after them. But then, through the leaves, I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later. My younger sister told me that the ghost she saw in my bed and the ghost she saw in the sign both looked exactly like me. It all began around the 1st of June this very year. The incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's home. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer. In the summer of 1998, I didn't know that that those last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, I had spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents, and it felt like I had actually gotten a little closer to them both, but particularly my grandfather. At the end of the summer, I left 
and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother, informing us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing. A month and a half after we had been staying there, I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings. I would feel like touches on my back. My mom and brother both complain about the door handles being rattling and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Diminutive objects would fall from midair, such as paper, hair clips, and coins, and I would hear voices, one of which said wake up very loudly in my ear. I would see mists and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast. So fast, in fact I would hear a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, money to name a few, usually belongings that I would use around the house. I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things humans cannot see, my cat would turn her head really fast and just stare at something, which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I'd been sound asleep for about seven hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing, but I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadowy like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle, in fear that in spite of everything else that he would approach me. I'd never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that maybe nobody would believe me or listen. About a week later I was in the kitchen with my mom, and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed in before he died, because he was too ill. That explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted when I discovered that, but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and my brother, and my mother believed me, because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her, and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her, and I let her do all the talking first, and everything that she told me measured up with my experience, and it only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, it just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little calm. It felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping on the living room sofa that I felt appeased, albeit this has not been my first experience. Ever since the age of five, my family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, 
I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years. Not only by all of the experiences that I've endured, I've been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I'm really good at picking up on things too, which I've found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were several rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom and the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away. So my mom went to go look up the history of the house. And sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck. And they lived in the master bedroom. And the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am to this day too. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing, but I don't know. Maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website, by the way. I'm a current visitor. When I was in high school, my family lived in a rented farmhouse in the country. I was 17 and dating a very nice gentleman who had come to visit me for the evening. My mother worked nights and usually got home around 11 p.m. or so. My boyfriend and I were sitting on the floor in the living room leaned up against the couch watching TV when the kitchen door opened and the light came on. We both heard a thump like my mother had put her purse on the table and then the bathroom door opened and closed. We both thought that was odd because usually my mother would not have turned on the light because my dad is a light sleeper and the light would have woke him up and my mother would have at least said hi to us anyway. My boyfriend noticed that it was getting late and he needed to get home. We had expected snow and he didn't want to be caught in a storm. I got his coat and we walked to the door together and stood on the back porch watching the snowfall. As my mother pulled in, my boyfriend made us both wait on the porch as he searched the house from one end to the other. No one was in there other than my sister upstairs asleep, and my dad, who was sound asleep in the back bedroom. Many other things happened there. One night, me and my boyfriend decided to play the Ouija board to summon the spirit that was residing in the house. I remember it was a blizzard that day, and my entire family except for me were in another state visiting my extended family. We were asking questions about the spirit, at first we asked its name. Nothing happened. Then we asked if we were bothering him. Still nothing. After nearly 20 minutes of continuously trying to get in touch with someone, my boyfriend angrily grabbed the planchet and Ouija board and threw it out of the window. He said he had enough of this make-believe and that he was really starting to get tested. I told him he shouldn't have done that, that he could really upset whatever was living in the house. My boyfriend mockingly says, Sure, why doesn't this stupid spirit just possess me if it even exists? Make some real noise. My boyfriend gets frustrated and ends up sleeping on the couch because he was tired of playing games. Later that night, around 3 a.m., I was awakened in the middle of the night to hear my telephone landline ringing. The only problem was, there was no landline telephone here. We all had our cell phones, and they were on silent. Seconds later, I hear loud pounding on the door to my bedroom, and it slightly opened. I yell out to my boyfriend, but there was no answer. I hear the phone ringing again, but I couldn't locate the sound. Then, everything fell silent. Not a second later, I hear a gargling noise coming from the living room, mixed with prayer. It was coming from my boyfriend's mouth. 
He was violently whispering in his sleep. What really got me though, is I went to see my boyfriend on the couch. There was this very dark cloud floating above him for a few seconds. It disappeared. And then I heard my boyfriend choking. So I ran towards him. He was literally pale in the face, almost as if he stopped breathing. That's when I realized he did seem to stop breathing. I frantically shaked him, yelling at him to wake up. I started getting scared, and I cried. This time, my phone went off, and someone was on the other line. All I heard was what sounded like a low voice saying call, and the phone call disconnected. This was on my cell phone. I then called the paramedics. They arrived. Paramedics were in my house, checking my boyfriend's pulse. That's when he wakes up, delirious, but confused. He asks me what's going on. After talking with the paramedics and my boyfriend, they were convinced that he had a panic attack in his sleep, and they ended up leaving. But he told me something very scary. He said that while he was asleep, he had this odd dream that someone was trying to get him to go to the afterlife with them. There was this hooded figure who said nothing to him. He was just motioning towards the sky. And then all of a sudden, he was in a cemetery and saw himself in a coffin dead. I told him, this all makes sense because you threaten the spirits. This is 100% true. And all I have is my word. But believe me, these events happened. I can't explain the mysterious phone call. I'm sure that my boyfriend challenged the spirits to make some noise because it certainly made some noise. And this is an incident that happened to me in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Washington state area long ago in the 1960s. As a young teenager, I was very impressionable. My parents were never active in my life and I always wanted to feel like I belonged to a group. It didn't matter who gave me the attention, just as long as I got it from somebody. Feeling neglected, I ended up running away from home at the age of 19 so I could join a satanic cult. The cult was pretty serious. We would often meet up at this secluded building in the middle of the woods that was abandoned at night to gather around in circles drawing pentagrams and praying to evil. We did a lot of drugs and even sacrificed animals as part of our ritual. We would decapitate squirrels and place them inside the pentagram. And other times we would cut ourselves and write our names on the walls with our blood. It was definitely not a good environment for me to say the least. But at the time, I was thinking of how much of a bond we all had together the five of us. The building itself actually felt very haunted, but because I was a stone out of my mind, I wasn't sure if those hallucinations or legitimate spirit haunting this old building. I remember one night, we were injecting each other with needles, and we ended up passing out for a few hours. As I started to regain consciousness, Everyone else was completely out, and I swear I saw the presence of an old man in a brown cloak, hood on, and with white eyes that glowed in the darkness of this building. He was there for about 30 seconds, then vanished. He was watching me from the stairs inside the building. We were all in the living room at the time, and there from the living room, you can see the stairs in front of you. The people I was with would sometimes hear voices, evil whispers and laughter so subtle, but quiet enough to hear. I vividly remember another night where we held our bloodied hands together after sacrificing a deer. I could have sworn after three minutes of chanting the devil as our leader, we heard the door from the upstairs of the building open and slam twice. We kept going, and I remember one of us blurted out, if the devil is here, Please show yourself. Nothing happened, and we ended up doing drugs again and passed out. The next time, 
all four of us were awakened to one of the cult members convulsing and choking. I was very alarmed by this, panicked, and told the rest of them that we needed help. All of them angrily told me no, leave him be. I yelled at them to help him, that he needed medical help and he would die. And two of the cult members proceeded to tackle me and pin me down to the ground to prevent me from doing so. They told me that this is what our Lord wanted to happen, that this was natural, and if he loses his life, the devil will want a new companion. What happened next is something that will always haunt me. I watched this guy die in front of my face, and not one single person gave a crap, except me. They kept trying to tell me that it was natural, that this was supposed to happen. The next thing I knew, the three of them were tying me up to keep me from escaping. They told me that I wasn't a worthy member of this cult, and because of my reaction, they couldn't trust me. I told them that I was definitely worthy, that I wouldn't tell a soul, but it was like my words were being ignored. One of the member turns to the other and tells them, We'll keep him here for the entire night and figure out what to do with him in the morning. So, they ended up tying me up and leaving me alone for the rest of the night at this old abandoned building that looked like an asylum. They had left for the night. They ended up drugging me and I passed out until I ended up awakening. As I awoke, I was still reeling from the shock of everything that happened. I actually gagged a couple of times. They didn't even move the body. I was tied up in the hallway, and I was forced to look across at the body that was still there. The man's eyes were bulging open, wide, and lifeless. Now here's where the paranormal part kicks in. After a few minutes of being awake, I look across to where the body was, and I could see a group of hooded figures in a circle around the body, cloaked apparition. I blinked a few times, and they were gone. Was I hallucinating from the drugs? I'm not sure, but it gave me yet another thing to be afraid of. Anyway, not long after that, and I don't even know how this happened, but as I was trying to free myself from the rope that had my hands tied up against the banister of the stairs, I managed to somehow free myself. But that's when I heard voices getting closer to the building. It was the rest of the cult, and they were coming back. At this point, the sun was starting to rise, but it was still dark, so I did my best to flee, and I left out the window in the main room and ended up running through the woods. I just bolted and ran as fast as I could. I had never ran so fast before in my life. It must have been from the adrenaline. Eventually, I was able to pass through the woods until I ended up on the main road when I saw an auto dealership. I ran into the dealership, told the workers to call the cops, that I was abducted, and that there was a group of terrible people who let a man die at the abandoned building a few miles into the woods. They called the cops, and they eventually ran out to the building. The body was still there, and the group was arrested. They ended up going to jail for 15 years. The building itself was torn down not too long after, and I've never actually been back to the spot. I don't know why I would anyway. I ended up having PTSD for years after this incident, terrible trust issues, but after years of therapy, I ended up rehabilitating myself. This happened in the 1960s. I guess the reason why I wanted to write this story was to warn you that you should never be desperate enough to join a group of people who do terrible things. Never openly trust people without evidence that they are worth it. And of course, never join a satanic worshiping cult. I made my mistake and almost paid for it with my life. Nowadays, I have two kids and I tell them this story to remind them that there are bad people out there, but also that there are spirits that can be summoned, and they can be very evil. Stay away from all of that, 
it's not a good lifestyle. What I'm about to tell you happened during the summer of 2015. The incident was at a Mayan jungle, two hours away from Cancun, Mexico. My friend John was moving for work and decided to drive a thousand miles from his home in Mexico City to Cancun. To an adventurous girl like me, it rang in my ears as a fascinating road trip. I offered to go with him as he'd be going through some of Mexico's most economic and breathtaking sights. In Cancun, with its beautiful coastline, covered in powderly white sand and deep turquoise blue waters, was not only worth a thousand mile drive, but would be the perfect destination to complete my vacation before flying back home to California. Cancun is situated in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico's southeast. The peninsula is a region covered in deep rainforest and jungles where the mines once erected their great empire. The first leg of the trip was as expected. Great sights, great food, great places, great music, great people. However, the rain and terrain soon started changing as we started going deeper into the jungle. Roads were less illuminated, towns and villages scarier. We had enjoyed the road so much. The next leg of the trip was going to be non-stop all the way to Cancun. The night hit us as we drove through one of the deepest parts of the jungle. The road started narrowing until it became a two-lane road, with the only light coming from the full moon ahead of us and the dim headlights from the mid-90s hatchback John was driving. He estimated we would be in Cancun in about two hours. It was 2 a.m., and the moonlight could let you appreciate the thick vegetation on each side of the road. John was telling me some more folklore about the region and legends about the Mayans that once lived in the region, when suddenly, the car started slowing down. John would press on the gas, but the car would struggle to go. Shortly, the oil indicator lit up. Something was wrong, but to our relief, we saw lights up ahead, what seemed to be toll booths. We decided we would park by the booths and call roadside assistance. Our relief was short-lived when we realized the toll booths were under construction and they weren't functioning. There was nobody on duty, so we decided to keep going, but about 25 yards past the booths, the car completely stalled. Luckily. The road was well illuminated from the booths on, and the car stalled right next to a light pole. John gets out of the car to see what was going on. It was leaking a lot of oil. He calls roadside assistance to no avail due to bad signal. He decides to try to fix the car. He goes to the trunk, gets some tools and a bottle of oil, and gets to work. After many attempts, the car wouldn't start, so John decides to call roadside assistance and finally gets through. Unfortunately, they tell him it would take three hours to reach us. I told John we were less than two hours from Cancun. Isn't there anything they can do? He put his tools away and gets back in the car and tells me there's nothing we can do but wait to get some sleep and wait for roadside assistance. He then reclines his seat and goes to sleep. I get out of the car instead and start looking at the road, the vegetation, admire nature. A few minutes went by, something caught the corner of my eye. I look back at the booths and I can see the silhouette of a man peeking from one of them. I call John, but he doesn't respond. I look at him and he is fast asleep. I look back at the booths, and the man leap from one booth to the other. I yell at John that there is a man at the booths. He wakes up and tells me not to talk nonsense. At this point, the man leaped from the last booth and stood in the middle of the road, dressed in a khaki long sleeve shirt 
in khaki pants. Pretty normal, but there was something weird about him. His stance was abnormal, arms wide open, but lowered with hands open, and that, when I felt a cold shiver down my spine, when I noticed his arms and fingers were too long for his body. I insist on John, and he decides to get out of the car and sees the man standing back there. He looks at me, then at the man again, and yells at him, hey. The man shook his shoulders, put his arms forward like a sleepwalker would, and started walking towards us slowly. John and I looked at each other in disbelief and asked me what's up with this dude. We turned back to the man, and he was now about 10 yards away. I could really see him now. He was of heavy build, about 6 feet tall, short black hair, light brown skin, but I couldn't see his face. It was like an empty space. As he drew closer, we saw in horror that he had no face, just flat plain skin with no nose, no eyes, no forehead. Nothing. At about five yards, he stopped with his arms still forward like a zombie. He had long arms and bony hands with long fingers. The area was well illuminated that we could see him clearly, that there was no mask, and we were no doubt in front of something paranormal or otherworldly. The faceless man tilted his head side to side, and that's when panic set in. I rushed into the car and told John to get in and let's go. He was in shock and took all my screaming to get him back. He rushes close to the hood of the car and I can see the faceless man walking towards us again. John was getting back in the car when I noticed the oil lamp on the car's hood and yelled at him to put it on. He pops the hood of the car and puts it on. The faceless man had taken two long steps it was now five feet from when John was rushing back in the car. He turned the engine to no avail. I could see the torso of the faceless man through the driver's side rear window. I was totally panicking. Then the car finally started and we took off as fast as the car could. We look ahead at the road and we hear what sounded like a hit on the rear bumper. I screamed at John that he is probably hanging off the bumper. John, short of breath, tells me he doesn't think so, as he would feel the weight on the car, and that I might have to get back to the back seat to check. I was about to, when I looked back, and see the faceless man standing back there in the middle of the road, fading with the distance as we speed away. In a couple very long hours of shock and silence, we reached Cancun city limits. We stopped at the gas station to collect ourselves had no face. John would repeat this over and over for a while. When we were calm and rested enough to keep going, John turns the car engine and the car does not turn on. We look at each other with horror, but then remembered we were safe away from the scene and we smiled slightly in relief. I want to express that we did not see Slenderman. That's an internet creepypasta. The body of the man was like a normal heavy built guy, just long arms with bony hands. He even had hair. This experience changed my view about risks and scary parts of being an adventurer, but I will continue to have adventures in the deserts, forests, and jungles of the world. I just hope I don't ever run into the faceless man again. I was reading through several stories today on your website, and one in particular sparked a memory of an experience I had when I was eight months pregnant with my daughter. I may not have shared this story with you once before, but I don't remember. I remember that night just like it was yesterday. An evening in early 1994. My husband and I were watching TV on the couch when I decided to go to bed. I blew out a candle I had burning on the kitchen table and then headed to the bedroom. 
It wasn't too long after I crawled into bed that it was abruptly taken over by this unseen force sitting on my belly. My daughter began to move very violently and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I looked out my bedroom door and could see this flickering light coming from the living room. I figured my husband fell asleep on the couch and forgot to turn off the halogen floor lamp we had sitting behind it. I began to scream as loud as I could for him, but nothing came out of my mouth. The harder I tried to scream for help, the harder the unseen force seemed to push down on me. I began to pray. I prayed like crazy, asking Jesus to protect me and my unborn child. I kept looking out the bedroom door, seeing that flickering light, and hoping to see my husband come running in, but he never came. The whole incident lasted for what seemed like forever, but when it was over, it was over, just like that. There was no more pain. I could breathe, and my daughter was at peace. That's not the end of the story, though. I got up from the bed and headed to the living room to tell my husband what had happened. No sooner than I left the bedroom, of course, I found him sleeping soundly on the couch. But the halogen light behind it wasn't on. The flickering light I kept seeing throughout the ordeal was the candle on the kitchen table. As I explained in the beginning, I blew this candle out before I went to bed. And I know I did, because I have always been very cautious about burning candles. The candle had somehow rekindled itself and burned all the way down to the wick. Apparently, the glass votive had gotten so hot that it broke and sent flames from the wick onto the table and placemats. The entire top of the table was on fire, placemats and all. I started screaming at my husband to wake up. He jumped off the couch to find me trying to smother the flames out with a kitchen towel. The apartment started to quickly fill up with black smoke. He grabbed the fire extinguisher and put the fire out. After it was all said and done, we talked about what had just happened, trying to make some sense of it all. I was certain the unseen force was trying to kill me and my baby. I thought it was holding me down so that when the fire spread through the apartment, I would die from smoke inhalation, or worse, burn to death. My husband thought that whatever it was, it was trying to warn me. That it was trying to wake me up so that I would discover the fire. But I swear, I was not asleep. At some point, I thought maybe it was all just a bad dream. But then it dawned on me. If it was just a dream, how was I able to see the flickering lights coming from the living room, which turned to be flames? What I do know is, had I not gotten up when I did, it wouldn't have been long before the whole apartment would have been filled with smoke and fire, and we all would have perished. Guardian angel or evil spirit? I guess I will never know. These particular experiences occurred when I was around 8 or 9 years old and it happened to be my first encounter with the paranormal. I grew up in a very religious household and my parents were strict disciplinarians. Unfortunately, I was subjected to a lot of physical abuse at the hand of my stepmother. My biological mother died when I was only 3 months old and my father remarried a little while after. She was an absolute witch to me. And to this day, I don't know why my dad even found her to be remotely compatible. She would call me a filthy animal, because I wasn't praying enough at times. The first experience I had with the paranormal was also toward the end of my dad's relationship with this woman. I can remember a moment I was crying because my dad had been working construction all night and didn't come home until late night. I'll never forget how she spat in my face, told me that 
real ladies don't cry about daddy working late nights. I told her specifically that I really wanted daddy, and she told me if I didn't calm down, she was going to throw me into the pantry closet and lock the door, which was this huge empty space that could fit two adult-sized humans in. Naturally, as an eight-year-old kid, I revolted. She kept her word and threw me in there for an hour. This is where something creepily paranormal happened. After about 20 minutes in, I could hear a faint whispering of a female lady in my ear. I couldn't make it out, but I'll never forget what it sounded like. It was very soothing, and I felt very comforted. I then felt a breath on the back of my neck, and two cold hands touched my shoulder. The pantry closet got a lot cooler all of a sudden, and in my mind, all I was thinking about was the sound I heard from this voice. I ended up curling up on the floor of the pantry and started drifting off to sleep. As my eyes began to feel heavy, I squinted with limited visibility. I turned my head to the opposite side of the dark pantry when I saw a pair of glowing green eyes in the mouth of someone. The crazy thing was, whatever this thing was, it had razor sharp teeth, as if they were fangs. I could only see their eyes, and it almost looked like it was slowly opening its mouth, as if it were going to devour me whole. I closed my eyes completely for a few seconds, opened them up again, and it was gone. I'm not sure what the second presence was, but it didn't seem very friendly at all. As for the female voice and the touching, I truly believe that it was my biological mother comforting me through tough times. Well anyway, I remember I ended up staying in the closet for longer than I was supposed to, and when my dad came home, he had a talk with my stepmother. Thankfully, my dad saw through her lies, and he broke up with her not too long after this incident happened. From that day on, the pantry closet had a reputation for creepy ghostly activity. The door would randomly open slowly and shut at times. If there were items on the shelves such as cans, they would sometimes fall on the ground. My dad told me one of the scariest things happened to him after he got home from work. It was another late night working. My sister, my brother, and my grandmother were all asleep at the time. My grandma had moved in shortly after my dad broke up with my stepmother to help take care of us. Right across from the pantry closet was the kitchen. My dad comes home and he ends up going into the kitchen to decompress for a moment after a hard day's work. Right then, the pantry closet opened slowly. And that's when he saw something. He swears to this day that thing he saw looked 100% real, and he was not hallucinating. Standing in the pantry was a faceless man in a red tuxedo with horns on his head. My dad froze with fear, blinked his eyes twice, and the figure was gone. Later that night, he actually fell asleep and had a dream that he went to hell and saw his ex, former stepmother. The creepy thing is, the faceless man that he saw in the pantry was holding hands with my stepmom. My stepmom had cuts all over her face. I remember he woke up screaming and never saw the figure ever again in the pantry or had a dream about my stepmother either. Another experience. My stepmother, sister, brother, grandma, and I all slept in one room, different beds of course. It was a normal night, and I just fell asleep as usual, hours later. I woke up for no reason and saw a person sitting in my grandmother's bed. I thought it was just my grandma praying since she would always pray, but then I started to realize that my grandma was sleeping, and this person looked a bit younger. I just stared at whatever that thing was and noticed it was looking right back at me. This wasn't my mom because it looked like an entirely different woman. I've seen pictures of my mom and she was a ginger and had beautiful thick long hair. 
This figure I saw was bald-headed and looked very distraught. After she looked at me, she looked back at her hands and covered them with her face. I know for a fact that it was a woman because she had feminine features in her face. You could see it clearly in the body of a woman. Not only was she bald-headed, but her face was burned and disfigured. All I did was stare at her. Then, after all that, she suddenly got up, turned away from me, and disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep again. I woke up the next morning and asked everybody if they were in the room last night. Then I asked my grandma if she had been praying that night. Everybody, including my grandma, said no. That was the first time I ever saw that lady, but from that day on, almost all my relatives that lived in that house have seen the very same woman I have. Only difference, they have been scared. Me, on the other hand, though I was slightly afraid, I had a curiosity about this whole experience. I attended Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas not too long ago. During my senior year, I stayed a few months in a private dorm in the Patty Cobb Girl dormitories. Many people say that various parts of Harding campus are haunted by the ghost of Gertie, a girl who died by falling from a bell tower on campus back in the early 1900s. She has been known to haunt the old music building, the brick pathway that cuts across campus, and the bell tower, which has since been detached and placed on campus as a landmark. One other thing she is said to haunt happens to be the Patty Cobb dormitories. There is debate as to whether or not it's Gertie or a different ghost entirely, but either way, one thing is for certain. Patty Cobb is haunted. I'd heard about this prior to moving into the Patty Cobb dorms, but I was told a different story about how she only haunts the first floor dorms. I was given a dorm on the third floor. It was a private dorm that had no connecting suites to it. I had my own private bathroom and the room was not shared with a roommate. At first I was thrilled with not having to share a bathroom with anyone. Then I started having strange feelings at night. I would find that I would hear noises in the hallway at times. Of course, being a dorm, I passed it off as silly girls wandering the hallways at night. No biggie. But then I started having strange feelings in my room. There were times I would feel as though someone was sitting at the edge of my bed. Sometimes I felt as though someone was standing there staring at me. The doorknob would also jiggle at various points during the night. I normally tried to ignore it, thinking maybe it was an RA doing nightly dorm checks. The university has a strict curfew. But there would be times that it would happen at 3 in the morning, when any sane person would already be out of the hallways and in bed. The few times I opened the door upon hearing it jiggling, there would be nobody in the hallway. The most memorable experience I've ever had was in the middle of the night. I was soundly sleeping when all of a sudden I was awoken by a knock on my door. It scared me so much because it was a very authoritative and loud knock as if someone was trying to break into my room. I looked inside the keyhole and I see this old man standing in a security outfit outside of the door. The man looked oddly out of place. The outfit looked Victorian. I wasn't dressed, so I told him just a minute. After about three minutes, I opened the door, and the security person was gone. I looked down the hallway at the other end, and see a dark shadow floating down the hallway. I never saw that man again. Eventually, I moved out of that room and moved in with a girl a few doors down. While I still could hear the occasional freaky noises in the hallway at morning out, the feeling of something being in the room and the doorknob jiggling seized in my new room. I found out later from an older friend of mine, however, that she had lived in the exact same dorm room that I had scary issues in. A few years earlier, 
She and a friend of hers were sitting around talking. She was sitting at her front desk and felt someone strangle her. She felt a pressure on her neck and even started choking. She turned around to see her friend staring at her with wide eyes. What happened, she asked. I just saw a pair of see-through hands behind you, her friend replied. To this day, she swears up and down that Gertie choked her in her dorm room, the exact dorm room that I had so many freaky encounters in. And people wonder why I get so paranoid being alone in the house at night. Earlier this night, I was rehashing past visits to a cemetery in my hometown in Nugatuck, Connecticut, called Guntown, when I remembered a visit to Iowa when I was 17. So, back in 2000, I went to visit a friend and spent only a few days there. My friend, having been the 13 stairs, I just recently found out its real name, Pleasant Ridge many times told me about it and we decided to make a trip of it there were four of us in total three teens and an adult my friend told me the story is about bodies being buried in the steps about the graves being mostly young children about possible satanist activities and the like before we arrived so i was prepared we left a little after 11:30 p.m arrived there shortly after midnight without any problems finding it. I think there was a gate, but it was open. We parked a few feet from the steps of the car facing them. The moon was out, but it was still fairly dark, so we brought flashlights. We went to check it out only to look around some and take some photographs. It was around winter, so it was cold and windy. We were the only ones there, no other cars in sight at least. We made our way up the stairs and into the cemetery. It was eerie. I kept getting those deep chills up and down my spine that kind of make your body jerk and a definite feeling of being watched. I know my friends complain of the same and wanted to leave minutes after arriving. One claimed to have heard their name being called and being touched, like someone was tugging on their clothing and seeing shadows move around the tombstones. I didn't experience any of that myself, but I was weirded out all the same. We walked around a bit, not too far from the stairs themselves, and took some photos of the graves. After about 30 minutes, and it being well after midnight, the others were ready to leave. This is where the freaky thing happened. To our knowledge, we were the only ones there. There weren't any other cars visible, nor people. After having a somewhat disappointing time, in my opinion, we made our way down the steps and towards the car. We had the flashlight on by then and lighting our way, when my friend saw something black on the ground. We rushed back to the car and turned the headlights on, and right at the bottom of the steps in the parking lot, was a huge pentacle traced out in what looked like black paint. Look, I'm not crazy, and I know it wasn't there before we climbed the steps. The car was parked so the headlights would light up the bottom of the steps so we could see them. There was nothing on the ground beforehand. By then, my friends were screaming and crying and pulling me into the car. I snapped a photo or two, and then we sped off. I do recall the car stalling once before we left. I waited until I got back home to develop the film, only to find that there was nothing at all on the roll. It was a roll of 24, all of which were of the cemetery, and the roll was completely blank. That irked me. The pinnacle thing was crazy. We weren't drunk or high or anything stupid like that, and I know the four of us couldn't have imagined it, and it definitely was not there when we first arrived. I'm not saying Ghost did it either. For all I know, there could have been some kids there already and decided to mess with us. I heard it gets vandalized a lot. 
It's just what we experienced that night. And my friends who are from that area were horrified for a few days about what happened and mentioned some rubbish about going to hell. It's a little hard to believe, and I wouldn't have either if I wasn't there, but I thought it was interesting and felt like sharing. I'd love to go back one day. I'm not sure if this is a haunting or anything. More of a strange happening at a haunted place. Anyway, thanks for listening. I wonder if anyone else ever experienced that. I thought it was strange. I have a sister Janet who's dealt with paranormal experiences over her life. She sent this site to me via email. I in return thought that I would share my feelings and some of my encounters with you. Some of the stories I read from your site were very convincing, while others sounded a bit like a hoax. Although my experiences would sound like the latter to many people, I swear that I believe that all I've seen to be true, although inexplainable. As many of your stories, my experiences also started in childhood. Mine, I believe, may be a result of troubled years, reflecting child abuse and fears of daily trials. Perhaps my apparitions were given a portal because of the fears. I remember as far back as my early adolescence, living in a house that sent a chill in me and fear to go to the upstairs alone. Now, my very human predator used to always stalk me in the long narrow hallway around the wall from the stairway, which accounts for some of the fear. However, this person was not always present in my home. The feeling was always there. I remember at night I slept in an antique frame bed handed down through the family. I would lay very still, and that bed would shake like it had a vibrator attached. I heard sounds and footsteps. Once when I was a teenager, I was alone in the house. I wanted to wear a jacket that was stored in the third floor attic closet. I went up to the enclosed stairway to the top, thinking of nothing but retrieving my jacket. When I stepped onto the floor, an old wind-up antique Victoria record player started playing a very creepy song called Fernando's Hideaway. I've hated that song since I was a baby, and my brothers would play it to frighten me and make me cry. I ran out of my house frightened by the song in about 10 blocks to my best friend's house. When I got there, her mother, known as the Gypsy Lady, was having a seance in her kitchen. The table these people were standing around rose off the floor just about an inch. I bolted from there too. To this point, most of my experiences were sound and physical experiences. I have not seen any apparitions. During my second marriage in my late 20s, my husband and I bought an old log cabin, which was hand-built with logs and stone from land it stood on many years earlier. It was beside the Chilisee Creek on old Indian grounds. This is where I began to see apparitions, both frightening experiences and enlightening experiences. Many things occurred, an unseen force put a large dent in a metal cabinet in the laundry room right before my eyes. My little three-year-old stepdaughter would not stay in her bed. She would crawl under the bed to sleep or hide in a closet. One night, I found her under clothes in a laundry basket in the laundry just outside of her bedroom. The area of the house seemed to be the most affected. It was here that one afternoon while putting clothes into her washer that I felt a cold hand on my shoulder. I was alone in the house at the time. When I looked behind me, I saw a black hooded robed figure. I do not remember a face, nor do I remember this figure being much taller than me at five foot four height. I do remember getting very scared. I looked away, and then it was gone. A small bathroom was also off this room. I recall once while taking a morning shower, hearing animal growling and scratching at the bathroom door. These sounds disappeared when I began reciting the 23rd Palm. 
One night while I was sick with the flu and spending the night on the sofa, I remember awakening to an apparition copycat that looked exactly like my husband in his pajamas in the bedroom doorway, but he was transparent. This also disappeared after a brief encounter. Our life together in this house was rocky, and I thought perhaps I was losing my mind. I didn't do drugs, and only drank socially. Everything that was happening was very real. One final memory I believe I have, which was as a result of my depression which I was falling into, I'd come to a point that I did not want to leave the house. I also knew in my heart that my husband was having an affair. One night after contemplating ending my life, I sought God through deep prayer and called the 700 Club to ask for the prayer line to pray for me. The same night while I lay in bed alone in my dark room, a light started to shine in the corner across from my bed. It grew brighter, and it was in the form of a bright light bulb that floated across the room and hovered at my bedside. I was not frightened and reached up to investigate. I felt a hand from out of the light take my hand, and I heard a mental message saying that everything would be okay. The light then just went away. I was left feeling cleansed, happy, and pure, as if touched by God himself. I wanted to tell the world that life goes on. I couldn't utter swear words and put down my cigarettes. The cleansing phenomenon unfortunately was temporary, and I slid back into my old ways after a few weeks. The divorce occurred, we moved out of the house, and my life went on. The okay part came a few years later, when I became a mother of my own child for the first time. I went to school and became a registered nurse. I fell in love with the man that I am now married to. That was the last apparition I have seen, until my nursing career took me into some old nursing home. I tend to always work the night shift. It fits into my lifestyle. One night, while working in a home in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, I saw a strange occurrence. A helium birthday balloon floated out of the residence room, traveled down the center of a long corridor as if being held in the hand of a child. It bounced along, hitting the ceiling at times and floating down, but in a straight line and moved down that hallway. The balloon took a turn at another residence room and went inside. This resident started screaming to get that out of her room. By the way, it was her birthday. The same nursing home was the place of violence, murder, and unfortunate dread. I have other stories, but this is enough for now. The Willard P. Hall Mansion on Hall Street in St. Joseph, Missouri is haunted. Willard P. Hall was the Lieutenant Governor of Missouri during the last part of the Civil War. When the Governor died, Willard assumed the office of Governor. With the Civil War raging, he moved the State House from Jefferson City to St. Joseph. I don't know why he did that because St. Joseph was pretty well known to favor the South. After the mansion was used as a residence, it became a rectory for priests who served the St. Peter's and Paul Catholic Church parish next door. As parishes were closed in the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, one priest took over the St. Peter and Paul Church and the Immaculate Conception Church, a church immediately west, about three-quarter mile away. The pastor leased out the first floor of the house, at that time, to United Cerebral Palsy and allowed me to live upstairs to oversee the property so it would not be vandalized. Most of the walls throughout the house were solid brick and stone construction, yet sounds of large rats could be heard scrambling within those walls. The light switches in the old servants' quarters upstairs, where I lived, were not up and down switches but to be rotated in a circular manner. 
Those switches were observed rotating on their own, turning the lights on and off. Dark shadows frequently covered doorways, eliminating all light outside those particular rooms. Once, when that happened, a loud scream, like that of a wild cat, lion, or tiger, could be heard, and it was ear-shattering. The room on the southwest corner upstairs that was my bedroom became so cold that ice actually formed thick in the corners of the room and the walls were frosty. Sounds of music, like a very soft harp, was heard on occasion by a number of people. One parish council meeting stopped suddenly when one of the councilwomen, who was wearing a shoulderless summer dress, felt an icy hand placed upon her shoulder and no one was behind her. And finally, many times, when it was very late at night or very early morning, one could hear footsteps throughout the house, followed by a conversation that always turned into an argument, and then it was followed by the soft crying of a woman. The basement of the mansion appears to have been used by either slaves or prisoners, and there is a rumor that there is a cave entrance hidden somewhere in the basement that leads down to the Missouri River, a distance of about a mile and a half. I never found it. When I called the pastor once in the middle of the night and asked him to come over and experience some of the things going on, the icy room, a darkened doorway, and the sound of a screaming large cat, he told me no way. Do you think I'm nuts? I'll come over first thing in the morning. He never showed up and I moved. The place is still standing, but I haven't been back. Hello, I live in Newton, North Carolina, and I'm addicted to this site. My story happened about five years ago. Me and my sister Melissa lived next door to one another at the time. The house that she lived in had been vacant for about 16 years. The previous owner was, according to the neighbors, a very mean old lady who had been sent to live in a nursing home and refused to allow her home to be sold. It stayed that way until her death. As soon as she died, her children put the house up for sale and my sister bought it. At first, it was just little things that happened. Melissa and my nephew, he was three at the time, were sitting in the living room with no TV on, and he asked her who was there because he heard people talking on the stairs. They were alone in the house at the time. The stairs were a hot spot in the house. When she was pregnant with my niece, she fell or was pushed down three times. Her family had went on vacation for the week, so I was left to take care of the animals. Well, three days into their vacation, I went over to feed and water, and I heard a horrible commotion upstairs. It sounded like the house was falling apart, so I freaked out and left and didn't return. When they got home from vacation, I told them what happened, and my brother-in-law went to check, and in their bedroom, which was once the previous owner's and my sister's entire closet, was dumped out in the middle of the bedroom floor. Everything. My sister even remembers a very vivid encounter she once had when she was all alone. She walked upstairs and then walked back downstairs. There was an old rocking chair that she previously purchased and put into the living room after it was discovered that it was an antique. For whatever reason, she couldn't take her eyes off of it, ended up buying it, and it's a really old rocking chair. As she made her way towards the living room, from the distance, she could see a figure that was sitting in the rocking chair. The rocking chair was slowly moving back and forth, continuously without stop. The outline was light enough to make out, and it looked like a shadow, a gray mist, but it was definitely a figure that she could spot. She turned on the light, and it was like it was gone in an instant. Her eyes were not playing tricks on her. She literally saw something, and the rocking chair was still slowly moving back and forth. 
It eventually stopped, and that's when she heard a loud crash coming from upstairs. It completely startled her. She begrudgingly went upstairs to investigate, and as she went into the bathroom, she noticed that the mirror completely broke by itself. No logical explanation, just the mirror broken. Even though she was terrified, she ended up going to sleep anyway after she cleaned up the mess in the bathroom, but she couldn't even get to sleep. Mainly, because her cat Smokey kept staring at the bathroom in the dark. Nothing but moans and groans. It was something completely uncharacteristic for him to do, as he never actually acted out in any way, shape, or form. But this night was particularly creepy for her, and the cat as well. Once, my sister was sleeping in one of the bedrooms, and woke up to an old woman walking across her bedroom floor to the window. She described her, and my mother went to the library to pull old obituaries, and showed the picture to my sister. She immediately broke down in tears, because she was looking at the woman she had seen in her room. She immediately started packing and sold the home. The new owners now have similar things going on. Their daughter was pushed down the stairs, and their son has seen a man in one of the bedrooms on numerous occasions. And then he came home one day to find their cat dead at the foot of the stairs. My mom had about three years of on and off visitations. She would wake up around 11 at night with a start to see different shapes of grayish white fog, which every time she would think it was smoke and her house was on fire. Sometimes the fog was in a blue arc by her dresser. Sometimes the whole room was filled up with this misty fog. Other times it was three big ovals by her TV. And even sometimes, she had a big oval on all three sides of her bed. The one that really scared her was when she woke up to see the fog by the foot of her bed. Then it flew over her with such a force and went through a wall above her headboard. Mom even walked through the misty fog one night because again, she thought her house was on fire and she jumped up to get her robe. I asked her if it was cold when she went through it, and she said that it wasn't, and it didn't smell either. She did see one apparition of a boy of about 18 years old. He was standing next to her bed with his head down. Mom said he was grayish looking, and she did not talk to him, but she felt an awful sadness emanating from him. Shortly after that, we had somebody come and clear the house. The woman who cleared the house said that since mom volunteered at a hospital, she was bringing all sorts of spirits and ghosts back home with her. They sort of attached themselves to her. After that, mom said the house felt very empty. It's been two years since her house has been cleared, and so far, so good. I think we also brought stuff in, because when we were kids, we used to play with the Ouija board in the 1960s. Now I know just how dangerous it is to use one of them, unless you really know what you're doing. But in the 1960s, you really didn't hear anything about the dangers of Ouija boards. It was just plain fun. When the person who cleared mom's home found a ghost of a man under the stairs in the workroom, it kind of explained why my dad and my sister always felt like they were being poked in their backs by an unseen finger, and us kids always had to go into the laundry room to get pop out of a fridge for supper. We would get the pop and run upstairs as fast as we could. All three of us kids did the same thing. We couldn't wait to get out of that room. I really think that spirit hung around since we dug him up in the 60s with the Ouija board. He's gone now though, and hopefully at peace. A few years back, I was in a car outside Worcestershire State Hospital in Worcestershire, Massachusetts. The building was all boarded up, 
and I had a vision. This was the first time this happened to me, and it scared the wits out of me. In reading your website terminology, I think it was a residual haunting. I heard blood-curdling screams and saw a man in a striped nightshirt, like the nightgown-type shirts worn in the 1800s and wearing a derby hat. He had dark hair and a mustache. He was levitating near the ceiling of a hallway. It seemed to happen quickly, but the screaming was heart-wrenching. After we left, I was quite shaken. Sometime after, I discovered a website called Opacity.us. A photographer posts photos of haunted abandoned mental health hospitals and other old abandoned buildings. He has pictures of Worcestershire State Hospital, including the boarded up building. I came across a picture of the hallway that I saw in my vision. What do you make of this? Was it a residual haunting? I've always experienced spirits or ghost type experiences, usually a friendly or mischievous spirit. I've also felt or connected with loved ones. Another odd experience involved myself and my three children. I woke up to one of my children screaming. I got up to check on him and it appeared he had screamed in his sleep. I went back to bed and when I did, I saw this creature that looked like one of the gremlins from the movie of the same name. It ran through the living room where my bed was and through the front door. A few years later, I mentioned this to a friend. My children said that they remember that night and also experienced this. While we talked about the experience, my younger son drew a picture of the exact same thing we all saw. I was floored, as I had no idea that they had all seen this. I originally chalked it up to being half asleep, and perhaps I had imagined it. I just wanted to share this with you. In 1957, my family moved to an old farmhouse in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. I was seven years old at the time, and as I went upstairs to my new bedroom with an armload of things, a terrible wave of fear swept over me when I reached the top of the stairs. From then on, I disliked that small area at the top of the stairs where I met the hallway. Unhappily, there was no way to avoid it. I had to walk through it to get into my bedroom. Other than that, nothing else happened that I know of until 1966. From my bed, I could see it out into the hallway to that small area on top of the stairs that had always frightened me. One night, towards the end of August, I woke up very, very slowly, only to realize that there was a terrible stench in the bedroom. It was like a mix of rotten garlic, human waste, and rotting flesh. Then I noticed the room was icy cold. Remember, it was August usually the hottest time of the year in New Jersey. I was lying on my side, facing the doorway, and when I opened my eyes, I saw that the bedroom door was wide open, and a figure stood in the doorway, very close to the spot that had always spooked me. Since no lights were on, all I could make out was the silhouette of a tall, dark figure that seemed to be wearing some kind of long robe with a hood. What truly petrified me was seeing this creature's eyes. They glowed red and stared straight at me. But before I could scream, somehow the knowledge came to me from somewhere, my guardian angel, that if I acknowledged this creature's existence, I would be haunted for the rest of my life. So I pretended to be asleep, which was not easy. And after a while, I felt the cold room become warm again, the dreadful smell disappear, and the figure fade away. We moved out in 1967, and the house was torn down in 1972. I for one was not the least bit sorry to see it go.
as a child living in our old cotton mill house, raised by my grandmother, great aunt, and her daughter, my cousin. I had many frightening paranormal experiences. I will elaborate on some of them as time goes on, but this story is a recap of many of the things I've experienced living in that house as a young child. I heard the classic footsteps, sounds of papers being crumbled, sounds of books falling when nothing was out of place. Everybody in the family, including myself, heard our names called. Once, I woke up and heard a soft, echoey female voice say deep magic. By way of explanation, deep magic was a facial moisturizer. I once woke up to see a tiny pinpoint of light in my room, which expanded until the entire room was bright as day, and then faded quickly back to darkness. Once I crawled under my grandmother's bed while everybody was outside, something I was not allowed to do, and heard a gruff voice besides my ear say one word, gray. I had that, and still have no idea what that could have meant, but I got the heck out of there from under that bed, and never went back under there again. I had an encounter, a long conversation in the house with a strange unknown elderly woman who called herself Granny Grunt. I saw a little black imp, the shadow of a skeleton, and a handless arm which came up from between the bars of my iron bedspread and saw blood drip from the ceiling. When I was about four, I saw a shadowy figure that at the time, I thought was the Easter Bunny, walk through the living room and disappear into the wall. I now suspect there might have been some sort of gateway in my cousin's room because much of the activity seems to come from or disappear in that direction. One night, I had gone to bed early and had a dream that a being, who look what UFOologists nowadays call an alien gray, was trying to force a full-sized apple down my throat. I awoke, gasping for breath, crying and choking with that feeling still lingering in my throat of something big being forced down it. My grandmother had an old rocking chair with a woven cane bottom, which creaked loudly whenever you would sit down in it or get up. When my great aunt broke her hip and later died of cancer, for two nights in a row, I heard something sit down in that chair, squirm around a little bit, and then get up. I once heard the sound of the chair rocking in the night. Additionally, while my great aunt was in the hospital dying of cancer, I was awakened three nights in a row by something banging on the front door. Of course, nobody was there, but my great aunt died three days later. Later on, when I was in my 20s, still living in that house, I awoke to see a short woman with her hair in a bun and a white apron over an old fashioned dress standing by my bed, who quickly vanished. I had many experiences of being in that half-awake and unable to move state, while hearing voices talking and people moving around in the house. Once, while I was in that state, I felt and heard something leap quickly into the bed beside me and lie there, growling menacingly. It vanished, of course, when I was able to fully wake up. I finally got married when I was 28 and moved away. After my cousin passed away, I inherited the house, and my husband and I moved back into it. Strangely enough, I never heard or saw anything in those days we lived there together. The house was totally quiet and peaceful. My wife and I lived in Ringgold, Georgia, and have lived there for 25 years in the log home that we built ourselves with a lot of help from friends and family. This was about 1983. About three or four years after we moved into our log home, some strange things began to happen. We would be watching TV when all of a sudden, the TV would go off and when we found the problem, it was unplugged from the back of the TV. You have to turn the plug on the power cord to unplug the TV and it was lying on the floor behind the TV. 
after this happened, we started to hear Indian music and some very low volume chanting in the bedroom when my wife and I would be sleeping. I would see the outline of a body on the wall, like a shadow moving, and it looked if it was a stereotypical Native American. There was a moment where I went into the bathroom, in the mirror. I saw the presence of some dark face behind me. At times it would get very chilly in the house, even when it was warm outside, but only in one bedroom. We have a big wall clock hanging on the great room wall, and has three chimes hanging down from it for the doorbells. When you push the doorbell button, the chime plays a short tune. At times, for no reason at all, the chimes would start to move and ring like someone had pushed the doorbell button, but there would be no one there. Our commodes would flush, and there would not be anyone out there to flush them. We have found human bones in Indian pottery, arrowheads, and lead bullets. We do know that a civil war battle was fought on our land, and we checked with a university in Alabama. They told us that this was an area that had a Cherokee Indian village back in the 1700s to 1800s. We reburied the bones in the pottery shards, and the strange happenings have not been as frequent as they were. We still live here, and intend to stay, and the strange happenings have not been a threat or harmed anyone in any way. This is an account of events experienced by a close friend of mine. I've changed the names to protect the identities of the people involved. These events took place in Manchester, England. I met Charlotte some two and a half years ago when we both signed up for a course of ice skating lessons. We got on well from the start and stayed in touch afterwards. Charlotte's father had started to suffer from dementia and her mother was taking care of him at home. Unfortunately, her mother suffered a stroke in November 2008 and was unable to return home. Therefore, it fell on Charlotte to look after her father. Sadly, Charlotte's father died in his sleep in February 2010. This was a big shock as, although 89 years of age, he was very sprightingly and in good health. As you can imagine, Charlotte was devastated. One of Charlotte's sisters came up from down south to stay with her in the days afterwards, and while they were arranging the funeral, they both slept in their father's bed. A couple of days after he died, Charlotte had a very vivid dream. In it, she saw her father as a young man in rolled up shirt sleeves and a tank top. He was running down a hill and hot on his heels was a dog like they were having a race. She said her father looked very happy and full of life. She has never experienced anything like this before and felt it was her father's way of showing her where he was now. I asked her if she recognized the dog. She said her father used to talk about a dog he had when he was young, but she had never seen a picture of it. It was obviously a very profound experience because it eased her grief in that she'd felt he had gone to a better place. It is now March 2010. I saw Charlotte over the weekend, and she told me what else had been happening. Charlotte, her sister and her brother-in-law, had been in their father's house clearing it out and decorating. Charlotte was in one of the bedrooms and came across an organ her father bought her when she was 16. She plays the piano. Anyway, she sat down and started playing it. The moment she did this, the phone started ringing. Bear in mind, the phone was disconnected some weeks ago. Her sister answered it, but there was no one there. While the three of them were upstairs in separate areas, Charlotte's brother-in-law asked who was making a drink. Her sister replied that they were all busy and that he should make his own drink. Her brother-in-law said that was not what he meant and asked who was boiling the kettle. When Charlotte's sister went downstairs, the kettle had just boiled and switched itself off. No one had put it onto a boil. A day or so later, Charlotte began playing the organ 
And once again, as soon as she did, the phone rang, just like before, still disconnected of course. Charlotte said that one night they were sat around talking about their father, and the lights in the room started flickering. This has never happened before. As soon as they stopped talking, the flickering stopped. I told Charlotte that experiences like this are fairly common, and it's her father letting her know that he is still around. The last time I saw her, she was in pieces. After these experiences, although still very upset, she seems very much calmer and accepting. It is wonderful when things like this happen. If only it could be that way for everyone. Hello. I wrote to you a while ago about the house I grew up in, but I had something happen to me back in 2005 that I could never explain. My husband and I were going through the immigration process back in 2005, and while our case was being reviewed by the INS, my husband had to stay in Mexico. This was a very stressful time, and we were facing a lot of uncertainties. So we packed up and moved to his family's house down in Samoa, Misha Showen. At the time, my oldest son was only two years old, and my mom had driven down with us to help with the INS appointments and to help us get settled into our new home. Well, so when we finally arrived to my husband's family home, we got unpacked and settled in to await our verdict. We would hear from the INS six months later, the house is basically two homes together. The building is L-shaped. It has the original house, and then you have to go outside into the courtyard to access the second house. This area had a bathroom and a store, and a supply room for the store, and above this was our apartment. This area had not anyone stay in it for maybe 10 years. This area was like a duplex attached by a door through the living rooms, so we took the left side and closed up the right side. Now, the side we took had an unusual feature. It had a huge bedroom that was divided by a wall and had an open doorway, so it was two bedrooms in one. We slept in one bedroom and my mom slept on the other side. Now, this is a huge home, especially by Mexico standards, but we only shared it with two other people my brother and sister-in-law, because the other family members moved about 10 years before. Nothing about this home seems scary or creepy, but I did learn that between the two houses, two of my husband's toddler sisters were buried. I didn't know this until months later, so a few days after we arrived, we were cleaning and unpacking. My husband was down in the store covering for his brother, and my mom and I were upstairs cleaning the bedroom. She got tired and decided to go out on the balcony and sit. She took my son with her so I could continue cleaning. Well, I decided to sit down on the bed and I was faced towards the window looking out. Well, I could see the door leading to the living room out of the corner of my eye. It was halfway open. While I was sitting there, the door opened up, and someone walked into the little bedroom. I heard the door move across the carpet, and I saw out of the corner of my eye, someone in a white shirt. I figured it was my mom, and thought nothing of it, but then wondered where my son was, and I started to worry why she had left him on the balcony alone. So I called out, and no one answered. I got up and walked across the room and into the little bedroom. I was certain someone would be there, because I had seen someone go in there. Well, I was completely surprised when I walked in there, and no one was in the room. This really startled me. So I walked out into the balcony, and there was my mom and son. I asked if she had went into the room, and mom just looked at me and said no and no one but us and my husband were there that day. Another time, I was walking up our stairs to our apartment, 
and I had a vision flash in front of my face that completely terrified me. I still don't know what it was, or why it happened, but it was at night, and I looked to my right at the wall, and there was this horrible face like a gargoyle, just for a second, and then it was gone. The only place I felt really uncomfortable at was the downstairs store, storage area. I would run past the place. It had a weird feeling to it. Nothing ever happened around there other than that feeling. The other times involved my son. During this time, he developed an imaginary friend. He would call it the baby, or baby sometimes. He would be in the hallway of the kitchen playing and say, oh, come see the babies. Or he would be talking and I asked him who he was talking to and he would say the babies. I didn't think anything of it until my husband told me about his sisters. Then I felt some kind of uncomfortable with it. One day, we were sitting in the living room and he comes in crying and tells me that the babies are hiding under the bed. Well, I didn't want to look under the bed, but I did anyways, and of course, there wasn't anything there, but it still made the hair on the back of my neck rise up. The only other thing was one day, my husband and I were sitting on the couch and my son was playing on the rug, and we were just talking, and my son looks over into the corner and says, look at that man with the cowboy hat on. Well. We didn't see anything, so we just said, oh, is there, and he continues playing with his truck, and we keep talking. Well, about 10 minutes later, my son looks up and says, oh, he's gone. I don't know. We have left six months later, and were able to come back to the US, and have just experienced all these stories that have occurred. It was weird, to say the least. Later, I was talking to my sister-in-law, a different one, who had grown up there, and I told her about her experiences, and she got really defensive and didn't want to talk about it anymore. So who knows? Thanks for letting me share. I had recently moved from our old apartment. We were visited there by an unknown presence. A couple of years ago, I'd won some haunted dolls I had bidded on. One was a doll owned by a murdered teenager. The obituary article about her murder was included with the doll. This is the one that I think may have brought on much of the phenomena. My sister heard knocking on my bedroom door from the inside. We live in the same apartment. I didn't tell her that I had the haunted dolls until she told me that gave more credibility to it that way. I tried to debunk it by saying that I may have knocked on the door while I slept, but she said no. She heard me up, getting ready for work, getting my clothes on out of the drawers. I didn't hear it from the inside though. It happened one more time the next morning, but she asked the spirit to leave, and then it stopped, but other things started to happen. Our music box mysteriously came to life with a full wind, even though it was wound all the way down and wasn't played for over a year. Then again two hours later again at full music without being wound, kept playing for several minutes. Also, our kitchen faucet moved from the right to the left overnight. It is hard to move it by hand. If that weren't enough, we had a plug unplug out of the power strip and neither her or I unplugged it. It isn't easy to unplug. It was kept plugged in for the pump for the inflatable bed, which had a leak in it and had to be pumped up every couple of hours, so we never unplugged it. Our visitor made sure to make itself known. I remember one night I had so much trouble sleeping. I'm an insomniac, so I often wake up many times during the night. I went to fetch myself a snack, so I got up. The living room leads to the kitchen, so I have to walk through there to get to the kitchen. As I'm walking through the living room, I hear a monstrous laughter up, 
a deep voice saying, ha, huh. it creeped me out for a second. Then I brushed it off and proceeded to the kitchen. I'm now sitting down at the kitchen table and can see the living room from where I'm sitting. The only light I had on was the kitchen, but it was dim enough that I was able to see a dark shadow move from one end of the room to the other. It wasn't my sister because she was knocked out from rest, so I'm going back to my bedroom. As I'm heading past the living room, there was a window, and the curtains were moving by themselves. There was no wind or open windows, and no AC unit on. Nothing that could have made the window curtains do this. A second after this, I feel a pain on my arm, and female laughter, once again this time. I check to see if my sister is up, but she is still asleep. I dismiss it, and say it's just me and my imagination. So I finally get tired enough to sleep when I'm laying down and staring at the ceiling. That's when I see it. A face that looks like a witch, much like the witch from the Wizard of Oz. It appears only for a few seconds, but it really made me paranoid. For some reason, I was able to sleep. How I did so, I can't even say, but I did. When I awoke in the morning, I looked back at my arm, and there was a red imprint of a hand there, as if someone tried to twist my arm. I know it sounds crazy, but I wasn't too afraid, even after all that. I investigate places now and then for people, and I'm very much used to activity. My meter readings some nights were very high in some areas, that are usually in the green area on the meter. Many times, I would ask for a sign that it was there, and then it would spike into the red zone. I sort of missed that activity after moving out, but perhaps someday it will return in the new place I moved into. I wanted to share a story with you about something that happened to somebody I knew when I was a young man in Minnesota that always sends chills down my spine. When I was about 12 years old, which would have been 1977. My brother Royce was working in a town named Worthington, Minnesota, about 30 miles from my hometown of Jackson, Minnesota. He worked at a lumber yard called UBC and had a friend that worked at a local grain elevator. The silos for grain elevators in that part of the country rise hundreds of feet into the air and have the capacity to store tons and tons of grain, whether that be corn or soybeans, whatever the silo is being used for at that time. Occasionally, the employees of the elevator climb a ladder on the outside of the silos and get into the silo via an access door at the very top in order to inspect the grain inside, making sure it's not too wet, rotting, or whatever. Inside the access door, there is a catwalk that circles around the entire circumference of the silo. My brother's friend climbed the outside ladder opened the access door, and lowered himself onto the catwalk that circled the inside of the silo. After walking halfway around the silo on the catwalk, my brother's friend, I don't even recall his name any longer, observed what he thought was an excessive amount of moisture on the surface of the corn, which was what the silo was being used for at the time. So, being an industrious young man, he jumped over the catwalk rail and walked out onto the surface of the corn to roughly the middle of the silo to take a closer look. After inspecting the corn, he decided to just continue his journey across the surface of the corn to get back to the catwalk on the other side of the silo. As the catwalk was a few feet higher than the level of the corn, he had to grab onto the catwalk rail and bounce to get his foot up to the catwalk platform and swing his leg over the rail. As he swung his foot over the rail, he heard a noise behind him. Balancing with one leg over the catwalk rail and one leg on the catwalk platform on the outside of the rail, he turned around to see what the noise was. Much to his horror, the corn that he had just walked across was falling straight down, hundreds of feet to the bottom of the silo, which was cement floor. 
It landed with a crash a few seconds later. Instead of walking on solid surface of corn, as he had assumed, he had actually walked across a crust of rotten corn that had formed on top of the silo when corn had previously stored in the silo. The remaining corn had been removed from the silo the previous week. He spent a few months sitting on the catwalk, staring down into the depths of the silo, and then silently got up, went out across the axis door, made his way back down the ladder on the outside of the silo, and took the rest of the day off. Oh, and the creepiest part yet, when he was heading back to where he was going, he actually saw in the distance a farmer of some sort, but it definitely looked like an apparition. As he was getting closer and closer to the man who was standing there, almost as if he was lifelessly stoned out of his mind, he disappeared. His face looked so rugged, disfigured, and it looked like he was emanating pure evil. He later awoke in the evening in his own bed to a man choking him out in his sleep. He woke up immediately and the man was gone. The man, the same guy who he saw, the farmer in the fields. He was described as having the most bulgy red eyes he had ever seen in his life. In the face of evil, something was going on there, and he couldn't quite place his finger on it, but it was definitely demonic of some sort. That farmer was very protective of the cornfields it seemed that he may have raised himself. Although I'm not sure why he even appeared in the first place, in the field, or as a possible sleep paralysis or ghostly encounter at night. Nevertheless, it gave me nightmares for a long time. I've known about this ghost story's website for a long time, probably since the late 90s. I don't visit the site too often, probably three or four times a year, but when I visit it, I enjoy it. Anyway, I wanted to share a couple of stories that kind of dawned on me while reading the site today. While I was reading your site, I remembered some of the experience I had at Paris Island specifically in the rifle range area. Well, when I searched on the internet for Paris Island haunting, I came across this story. This same event in regards to fire which happened to a friend of mine. He was so spooked that he woke me up early for fire watch duty because he couldn't take it. He saw a figure in the mirror in the bathroom. The difference between his story and the story from the link is that he saw the figure in the mirror, but to him, it looked as if he was in the bathroom. The bathrooms were in the large area we called the squad bay. The drill instructor's office was typically there. My friend had me go in the bathroom, but I didn't see anything. I took over his shift and worked mine. I recall hearing sounds like someone was moving in the bathroom. I checked a few times, but I didn't see anything. If I'm being honest, I was hoping that I would, which is why I didn't mind taking a double shift. My second story is an interesting one, because it was an experience we all witnessed. Again, this was in the same barracks where we stayed for the rifle range. We had all entered the barracks after lunch, and we were all standing in front of our foot lockers as our drill instructor, Sergeant Minix, was yelling at us over something. He was standing right at the door that we always used to enter and exit the barracks. We are on the second floor of the three floor unit. Well, while he was yelling, there were three distinct knocks on the door. It was the three knocks that all recruits had to do in order to approach the drill instructor at his office or when a recruit has to enter another squad bay. By knocks, there were not traditional knocks on the door a more like hand slaps against the door. As soon as the third knock was heard, he flung the door open. Now, if someone was standing there, 
they would have had a door to the face. There was no one there, and there was absolutely no possibility that someone could have jumped out of the way or hid. They would have had to run up or down the stairs or jump over the railing and taken a very high and nasty fall and would have been obvious just hearing footsteps looked up and down the stairs and said, must have been a ghost. It was the time of day where all platoons would have returned to their barracks, so it wasn't some recruit falling behind or in drill instructor late. That just doesn't happen. Paris Island is very orderly in everything. Of all the ghost stories I've heard, I've never read or heard one where a room full of people experienced the same thing. I read many of the stories on your site and decided to tell one of my own. This is the scariest and most unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. First, I'll give a little background information. I grew up on a farm in rural South Georgia and spent a great deal of my free time fishing, hunting, and exploring, and always doing this by myself, since there weren't a lot of other kids around and I only had a younger sister. I never really experienced any fear of anything, other than being late for dinner, all the years I was growing up, and I can't recall any paranormal experiences other than the one I'm about to share with you. I had a best friend from school that I started hanging out with after we became old enough to drive and got our trucks, which are required for country boys. For the next two years, we did most of our hunting and fishing and troublemaking together. After we graduated from high school, we even went to the same local college and continued to hang out. My granddaddy owned a farm in the same county that we lived in, and I would go deer hunting on his land sometimes, but I had never taken my friend there with me. Behind my grandparents' house were several barns, then several large fields, then a large pond with a swampy area, then a large pasture that stretched from one side of their property to the other, property line to property line. This wooded area was immediately behind the pasture and also encompassed the entire back side of the property. The woods were also enclosed on the back and on each side with a four-foot-tall fence, since cows were allowed into the pasture and wooded area at times. You will soon see why all this detail is important. On the three sides of the wooded area were large open fields belonging to the neighbors, with each field belonging to a different neighbor. Take note that there are no more trees or woods close by. During the fall of our first year in college, I had scouted these woods and put up two deer stands, one on each side of the property, on the property lines, but also very close to active deer trails and signs. These stands were no more than 100 yards apart, and about 150 yards into the woods from the pasture. I decided one weekend to treat my friend to a little hunting paradise, although I had yet to see anything other than squirrels all season long. We went to the woods about 4pm, with it being dark by 6. I took him to his stand and then proceeded across the woods to mine. Just after the sun went down, I heard my friend whistle loudly, obviously trying to get my attention. I whistled back. He whistled again as though he didn't hear me. Again, I whistled back, even louder this time. There was no response. About five minutes passed and then I heard him whistle again. But he was closer to me than he should have been, but still through the woods somewhere. I found this very strange since we were supposed to sit in our stands until after dark and then meet up in the pasture to walk back out to the house. He whistled again and was even closer and I could tell that he was almost running and he started calling out my name. He sounded panicked and was coming straight toward me, although there is no way he could know where the deer stand was since he had never been there before and I didn't respond to him until he called my name. I climbed down from the tree stand as he approached. And when I got on the ground, he ran up and said, We gotta get out of here. Something big is after me. Instead of joining him in the rush, I stood there looking and listening. Sure enough, in a few seconds, it sounded like a bulldozer was coming through the woods, but without the engine. I could hear trees breaking and large bushes being shaken and trampled. And it was coming right at me with the sound becoming deafening as though it were right on top of us. I started running down the fence headed for the pasture and realized that my friend had run ahead of me and stopped. When he saw me running, he took off running again. We ran as fast as we could through the woods with the sound of massive destruction right on our heels. 
As we broke out into the pasture and got about 50 feet from the edge of the woods, the sound stopped. We continued to run until we were halfway across the pasture and turned to look at each other as we ran, both realizing that either we were no longer being chased or there was just nothing to be torn and crushed in the pasture. We both stopped and turned around, dropping to the ground and shouldering our rifles, aiming to kill whatever was behind us. To our amazement, there was nothing there. The daylight was almost gone, causing the woods to appear as nothing more than a black blob. I told my friend to get up and run for the pond while I guarded the rear. Then he would stop and guard the rear while I ran to him. After meeting up again at the pond, we both walked in silence back to my grandparents' house. We got into our separate trucks and drove to our parents' houses, not mentioning the event until many years later. We still remained close friends then and even today, but we still don't know what happened in the woods that night. I did return to those woods a week later by myself, but in the middle of the day, I walked over the entire wooded area and never even saw one broken branch or bush. I walked in the fields around the wooded area and saw no large or unusual footprints. My friend never returned to those woods with me, even though I returned many times day and night and never again experienced any strange occurrences or sounds. I know there was nothing physical in the woods that night, but whatever it was, I obviously didn't want my friend there, and he got the point loud and clear. My family and I took a trip to Tennessee in the summer of 08. We went all over the place, such as Jackson and Nashville, on our second to last day before we left to go home. My family decided to go to Franklin, because we had picked up a brochure of haunted places in Tennessee, and so he went to humor me, because I was interested in hauntings at the time. This city, not known to most people, is actually the site of the bloodiest battle of the Civil War, even worse than Gettysburg. There are two houses that were the main sites. One of them was the Carnton Plantation, which is the setting to my story. The plantation was creepy enough when we drove up to it, without even knowing the history. When I got out of the car, I looked up at the house and noted how beautiful it was. Then my attention was averted to the balcony on the second floor. There, standing on it, was a man. He was clearly dressed in a Civil War uniform, though I quite can't remember which color and I could clearly see that he had a beard covering his jawline. He stood there with his arms behind him, as if he was gazing out, overlooking troops. Of course, at the time, not knowing any of the history, I thought it was just the tour guide taking a break out on the balcony. I even hoped he was going to be my family's guide. Later, once we are on the tour, I noticed that none of the employees were dressed like 19th century citizens. Of course, then we got the history of the place, and I understood why this place was considered haunted. When the battle itself was both going on, and when it was over, injured soldiers were treated inside of the house. So many, in fact, that there are stains of blood inside of the house that will not come out of the floor. Many soldiers obviously died inside of the house. When we continued our tour upstairs, we entered a room with a door to the balcony. This is where I learned that no one was allowed out on the balcony. This confused me since I'd seen that man out there. When the guide took the group into the room across the hall and began talking, I couldn't pay attention. The closet in the other room kept grabbing my attention because it had a piece of black cloth in it. Finally, I tried to keep myself focused and it was going well until a gentleman in the group got bored and decided to go out into the hall. I watched him leave, thinking that it was very rude and should come back. For some reason, when he left, I noted that the sun was in a position that didn't cast a shadow of the man's head on the hallway wall. Once again, I turned my attention back to the guide, but the man in the hallway began to wander in the hall, and that distracted me. When I turned to watch the man, there was suddenly a very clear and defined silhouette of a man's head and shoulders with a bearded face that traveled across the wall, then just disappeared. It startled me at first, 
Then I got excited because I thought I must have seen a ghost. Then I thought, no, I have to be practical about this because that man is out in the hallway. Once the tour guide was done talking, I went outside into the hallway way. The first thing I noticed was that any shadow from the tourists on the wall wasn't that dark or defined. Then I noticed that the way the sun was facing caused the shadows to be cast in a completely different wall. The silhouette I saw couldn't have been from anyone on the tour. Then I noticed that there was an upstairs where I thought maybe an employee could be working. That theory was completely dismissed when it appeared no one was up there. There wasn't any logical explanations for the silhouette. It wasn't until my family returned home a few days later that I decided to research what I had seen. After discovering that there was a frequent spirit there that was called the General, I made the connection. The details from past eyewitness accounts were identical to mine. He stands out on the porch, has a Civil War uniform on, and has a beard on his face. I was, and still am convinced, that I saw the General on that day. This took place shortly after I turned 16. My dad was working up in Oregon and Washington, but was based out of Rainier. I went up to live with him, I guess, just to do something different. I was used to being around the city type of atmosphere, and it wasn't too long before I grew bored. Not that the Oregon country girls in the area didn't stir my blood. It's just that they mainly wanted to waste their time getting high or drunk, tipping cows, or shooting the passing ships going down the Columbia River, which I don't mind. I just miss the city lights or something. Anywho, I'd been out partying with a friend and drove off the side of a mountain, another story which would take a while to go through, and I thought my dad was probably going to kill me anyway, without benefit of blindfold and a last smoke, so I decided to hitchhike back to Oklahoma. Needless to say, I lacked the understanding of just how far I was from Oklahoma. My newfound compadre decided to go along because he had gotten in recent trouble with his folks and wanted out of town too, so we took off. Somewhere between Portland and the Dells, on I-84, which was only a two-lane at that spot, we were really tired and looking for a place to sleep. By this time, I would found out that this hitchhiking thing wasn't for me, and it really should be called a lot of hiking and not enough hitching, or something similar. And what seemed weird was that out in the middle of nowhere, the fences were really well kept, and I didn't want to get cut up climbing one. No houses, no anything. It was simply just nice fences. Anyway, we found a rather peevish looking fence about three fourths of a mile before a bend in the road. The moon was out and actually lit up the area pretty well. There was about three-fourths of a mile behind us from the last turn in the road, and like I said, about the same in front of us before the next one. We were in a valley or whatever they're called that the road went through, and it was really a beautiful sight. Just as we were fixing the jump the fence, a car came around the bench from in front. Of course it was too far off to see us when it rounded the bend, but we didn't want it to see us climbing the fence when it came abreast of us, like the owners of the land are out cruising in the middle of the night. The sides of the road in that area sloped down at a very sharp right and were gravel, at least on our side of the road, so we didn't have to go far to be below the grade of the road and out of sight of passing motorists. It went down probably 15 feet though, well below the road. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that since. Just as we were sliding down the slope out of sight, I caught sight of something way down the road, just the side of the curve. The lights of the oncoming car caught it, just as it was making the curve. Whatever it was, went down the embankment on the opposite side of the road from us. I asked my friend if he saw it, and he said yes, he saw something. After the car passed, we peeked over the top of the road, 
and right when we started to climb back onto the roadway, because we decided we didn't want to sleep in that area anyway, we saw what appeared to be two guys pushing a motorbike climb up where we saw it go off before. This was still about three-fourths of a mile at least off, down the hill near the curve. We slid back down the slope, out of sight. I really don't know why. Then we kind of just looked at each other. A motorbike? We both looked at the incline behind us. If you pushed a motorbike off the side of the road down this embankment, you'd have a heck of a time stopping it before it went all the way down, and the river was on their side, and even a harder time getting back up. I couldn't imagine trying to get it back up to the road, assuming it didn't go into the river. We both peeked over the top, breathing really quiet and shallow, watching for another couple of minutes, when all of a sudden, it stood up. It wasn't two guys pushing a motorbike. It was something that had been on all fours, and stood up, and it was huge. At least twice as tall as us, and by the way, we weren't midgets. I almost crapped myself. I started looking around, and the fence, by this time, was looking mighty small. Thinking really fast in that fight or flight mode, and the flight was definitely the way I was leaning towards, I realized that, thank god it had been his turn to carry the backpack, which would slow him down, and had the only food we had in it, and on top of that, I thought I could outrun him. Maybe it wouldn't want both of us. I looked at him, saw the panic in his eyes, and knew he was thinking along the same lines. I knew I couldn't run. I also knew that I had the senses when it got directly across from us. I pulled out my little pocket knife. I knew that we're going to die, and all I could think of was, Lord, please let it be quick. I peeked over the top again, and it was almost even with us. I might have whimpered, silently of course, but I also noticed that the wind was blowing in my face from his direction. There might be hope. We ducked back down. And we could hear it almost stop right across from us for a moment or two, then start on up the road again. It was almost the curve up the hill from us from the direction we had originally came from, when another car came around the bend downhill. I thought about jumping out in front of it and yelling for help, but if it didn't stop, then whatever that was would know that we were there. We waited, and it disappeared below the other side of the road like before when the other car came. This time, it didn't come back up. I don't know how long we waited, but we finally climbed back up and continued down the hill and around the curve. We didn't say a word or breath, anything about a whisper, till we cleared that bend in the road and was a mile or two away. When we called the Dallas, we called our parents to come and get us. We'd had enough of the open road in Oregon, I don't know what that was, but I still think about it sometimes. I've had a few other things happen to me in my life, but that really scared me. My boyfriend and I saw the state park on our way from Arkansas to Illinois and thought we should check it out. We had never heard of this place or even seen it before. We parked in the parking area and got out of the car to explore the woods. Naturally, I had to use the restroom, so I went to the bathroom, and once I got to the toilet, I had a terrible feeling of being watched, and I truly felt like someone was in the bathroom with me, but obviously, I was the only one. The feeling of this presence was so unbearing and evil that I ran out of the bathroom the second I finished with my pants down. Once I got out of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I started down the path. Within 30 seconds of walking, and still within 30 feet of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I heard a loud footstep crunching the leaves. In fact, it was multiple footsteps. My boyfriend thought it was a bear or something because of the heftiness of the steps, so he was searching and searching for a bear or anything, but he couldn't find a thing. I didn't mention the bathroom to him, 
but after not too long, I insist we continue. I know there is something terribly evil in that bathroom. For a while, nothing else odd occurred, and we continued on the path which goes down to level ground, with a large lake on one side. But soon after we got to this level ground area, the sun started settling, and that's when things got uneasy again. We both started to hear something large walking in the leaves again. Sean, my boyfriend, really wanted to see what it was, and at this point, I felt like we were really in danger, and that something else, unnatural, was there. So we barely started to move farther into the woods when Sean told me he saw a shadow or something farther in. Then, I was done. I told him we had to go and I cannot be here any longer. So, I ran like hell back to the car, and Sean was close behind me. Once we got to the car, I was at the passenger door, ready for him to unlock it. And of course, he tells me that he hears that thing we've been hearing in the sparsely wooded area, directly in front of the parking lot, which is to the very right near the parking lot, and that he has to see what it is. So, I had him throw me the keys, and I got in the car. He got in within a minute, and I asked him if he saw anything, and he said he just saw that a dark shadow move behind a tree, but nothing else. Needless to say, we booked it off that mountain, and it really seemed like a car was trying to chase us down the mountain, but we may have just been super spooked from the woods experience we just had, but I will note we were driving at about 65 miles an hour, and the speed limit was way less. I forget now it was specifically, but I want to say between 30 and 40 max. Plus, it was a mountain road, and very windy, and frankly, difficult to traverse at 65. Also, during the time I was taking pictures, the whole time we were in the woods, nature shots, that was actually the entire reason we were there in the first place, and the pictures were neat. The day ones didn't have orbs, but the night ones all did, and I thought maybe it was from the lake reflection or something, but I took a picture out of the car window, at the moon, right after we got in the car, and in that photo, there's the moon and like 30 orbs. It's amazing to me. I mean, I've never taken any orb photo ever before, and I took another photo of the moon out my window about 30 minutes after we left the mountain, and only the moon. I did some research to find anything on the area. It seems it was established in an old Indian burial ground, but few findings on much else, and I never found anything on cars chasing you out of this place. Be careful. During the day, the bathroom is really the worst part, and seemingly off the trail, but I just wouldn't go at night. And also, Sean didn't seem to have the feelings as intensely as I did, so if you're the right person, the feeling might not be too overwhelming. I was thinking about my dog last night, as he was put away a few years ago and the immediate remembrance of a very weird experience me and my dog had in my home, in Tallahassee. This home, prior to any construction behind us, was all wooded landscape and ran into Lake Jackson. Within this wooden area were several Indian burial mounds. One day, shortly after I moved there for a new job, I took my dog for a walk, unleashed, back in the woods. I saw those mounds, but really did not know that they were Indian burial mounds. My dog and I both walked over these mounds just being adventurers. When I returned from our walk, my neighbor asked me jokingly if I let my dog run loose back there, and my response was yes. He then stated that I would see a black bird perched somewhere soon in a tree close by, and that this bird would be watching me. I laughingly asked why and he said that if we walked over those mounds, we would have possibly wakened the spirits, and that the bird was their watchful eye on me. Well, of course I thought this man was crazy, but he was actually a very nice and intelligent man as I learned later. 
So only about two days later, I returned home from work and recall thinking about the black bird Betty told me. So I peeked around the left side of the home to look into the wooded area. And lo and behold, there was a blackbird perched on a tree, staring at me. He would not take his eyes off either. Needless to say, that was creepy. So that very night, I was in my office, and my dog was usually laying in the living room by the fireplace. As I was doing my work in the office, my office chair was budged about two to three inches forward, with a force that felt like someone actually pushed the chair. I instinctively reached by, looking over my right side, expecting to see my dog. No dog. Nothing. So I quickly went into the living room, only to see my dog laying down facing the hallway entrance, which is where my office resided, as well as two other bedrooms. And he had his head between his paws, staring and growling at something in the hallway. Talk about getting freaked out. So I grabbed my dog by his collar and tried to lead him down into the hallway, and he resisted every attempt. He was scared, obviously, and he definitely saw or sensed something. I did not see anything at all. As I walked into each room through that hallway, I did not see or sense anything. Then I walked into the bathroom in the master bedroom to find that my candle, which was lit, went out. So that night, I kept all lights on. The following day I came home and looked again for that weird bird. He was not there. So I took my dog outside to do his thing, but then noticed he was limping. Then he fell to his side with pain in the backyard. As I made the observation, I noticed that in his groin area, he had a large tumor-like bulge coming from this area. I immediately took him to the veterinarian, and I recall she had no explanation for it, but prescribed medication to reduce the swelling. Within two weeks or so, the swelling went away. Looking back at that, I really feel that the spirit, or whatever it was, made that happen. As my dog was still young, and very healthy. After that week of weird occurrences, I never had anything further happen. I never told my neighbor what had happened, as I did not want to look silly or have rumors flying around. But for sure, I can tell you that I know in my own gut that what that neighbor told me came to life. Dogs can definitely sense or see these spirits, as we cannot apparently. Between the bird the bump on my chair, my dog growling and acting scared, and the bulge in his groin area, all made sense that something was in that house. Never walked in those woods again. I no longer reside there either. This is a ghost, entity, evil demon spirit, and whatever else was haunting our home I can tell you. I will never forget what happened as long as I breathe air. We moved into this big house when I was 15. It had been empty for about 10 years. It had old, creaky wood floors and a ton of doors. Everywhere you turned in the house, there was a door. Don't ask, I still can't figure it out. It was a doctor's house. In the very back of the house is where he saw his patients. Yes. Some died in the house in his office. Both my grandparents also died there. The very first thought we had activity, about 3 a.m. in the morning, there was someone banging on our front door. My grandfather would get up, and no one would be there. This happened all the time. We'd drop our car keys in the glass bowl right when we walked in, and they would be in a different part of the house. Things were always showing up all over the house. It likes to play tricks all the time. So many things happened, I can hardly recall them. All but this one, I will never forget in my life. I would love to forget it, but it just won't go away. I was 20 years old and just had a baby. I had my daughter in a bassinet beside my bed. 
I fell asleep watching Michael Jordan play basketball in the Olympics. My bed had a tall headboard that sat up against my bedroom window. I also had floor to ceiling curtains, very heavy curtains. The windows were shut, the curtains were shut too. I was sleeping on my back as I fell asleep to the TV. The TV was still on and the baby was fast asleep. All of a sudden, I felt a strong man's hand covering my whole face. He was trying to suffocate me. I was in panic mode. His grip on my face and nose was so tight that I couldn't breathe or scream. I was looking up at the ceiling thinking I'm gonna die, right there, right now. It seemed like an eternity and I was losing my breath. Then, the phone beside my bed rang. It stopped. I jumped so far out of the bed across the room and looked back thinking I was fighting off an intruder and no one was there. I looked out the window. Nothing. I looked in the mirror and I had a bright red handprint on my face. It was evil. It was an evil something. I was praying out loud for whatever it was to get the hell out of my house and leave me alone. I've never been that terrified in my life, never. I looked out the window and it was pitch black. I got the feeling like something was out there laughing at me or mocking me. The baby never woke up. It was her father on the phone. I told him what happened, but he thought it was a dream. I know from the start it was as real as I'm sitting here telling you today. Not long after that, my grandmother and grandfather died in the house on two separate occasions. I was left in this huge house all alone with my two children. They were one and just months old. The house was always freezing no matter how high the heat was on. I would hear talking that I could never make out. Footsteps up and down the hallway, pinching, grabbing. The lights never worked. I changed the bulbs all the time. When I did the laundry where the old doctor's office used to be, I could feel a breath on my neck. I could see shadows of people out of the corner of my eye. It was a living nightmare. The energy was so thick and heavy, even on the brightest day. I was scared to death to be there alone and go home after work alone. I would just sit up with the TV on until I could fall asleep and pray to God that I didn't have to go to pee in the night. I was so scared to get up. The day I moved from that house was the happiest day of my life. I could have stayed there forever in that big house, but I wanted out. I still to this day 19 years later have vivid dreams of what happened. All the things I heard and all the things I saw. I've only told a few people this story. I've seen and felt both good and evil from a very, very young age. My nanny told me I had the gift of seeing and hearing spirits, like I was a light to them. I've had so many experiences I can't count. Most are very bad, but I have a couple that are good. I'm terrified of the afterlife. I pray that God carries me to heaven. If you don't believe, I'm telling you, there are things you can't see, but they can hurt you and make you so depressed you want to die. They can touch you, hurt you, and mock you, and laugh in your face. I know. Here's my story. It will be interesting to see what everyone else thinks of all this. I was at a friend's house listening to music tonight, Saturday, April 12th. He is a drinker, so he was feeling pretty good. He was at the computer with his back to me. I was on the couch directly in front of the TV, which was off. The only light on was right above the computer desk. To my right was the entryway, which was dark, pitch black actually, but I could see the reflection of the room and the TV. He was playing O Death, from Brother Where Art Thou, song itself gave me the creeps, when suddenly, I looked into the TV, 
and saw a solid black figure of a tall man start to step out of the darkness of the entryway and into the living room. I didn't see anything like clothing or facial features, just tall and solid black. My friend at the same time swiveled his desk chair and pointed towards the entryway where he saw the figure. The figure stepped back into the dark as quickly as it appeared, as though it didn't want him to see it. I looked at him and said, did you see that too? To which he replied, see what? He was only being animated during the song, but for sure didn't see anything. I've experienced several things at this house. He has not though, and it upsets him. But what I experienced that evening was the most eerie and frightening thing for sure. I know it wasn't one of his friends or someone goofing off. It isn't easy to walk into his house through the front door and not be heard. The floor is tiled. We walked over and turned on the light, and we both looked. There was no one there. I just went home. I couldn't stay there, and I begged him to come with me, but he wouldn't. A few days later when we talked, I asked him if he had ever had any seances or similar things in the house. He at first said no because it was his grandma's house, and he moved in about a year after she had passed, but then he paused. And then he said, well, remember when we cleaned out the attic? There was a Ouija board up there. Well, no, I didn't remember. And I told him to get his house cleansed. But he was just laughing at me. I've never been back to his house since that night. About two weeks later, he got an unintentional EVP, which is very eerie also. He has a voice-activated recorder and was recording a couple of programs off the computer for a friend at work. He turned off the computer, and the TV isn't hooked up anyways, but when he woke up, there were three recordings instead of two on the recorder. I know he's pretty up on computers, but he didn't make this EVP himself. Actually, it scared him, and he said he wasn't going to listen to it anymore. Even though I'm not sure whether I do in fact believe in ghosts and the supernatural, I must be the ghost stories world's biggest fan and relentless reader, and have been a patron of your site for many, many years, at least a decade now. Like I said, not being totally sure whether I do actually believe in ghosts, I've never had a story of my own contribute to your website. However, over the past months, possibly years, Certain things have happened in our current rented home. Occurrences in this house that made me think twice, maybe even three times about what I actually do and don't believe in. My husband Craig and I have been living in our rented home here in Melbourne, Australia for almost four years now. We rent privately and know very little about the house and its history, apart from the fact that we are private renters and the rent has always been almost ridiculously cheap. The house isn't that old, however. It would only be about 15 or 20 years old. We do know, however, that several of the last tenants that lived here, families with children, by the look of the wall drawings in the study and backyard, moved out fairly quick after moving in, which has always puzzled me, as the house isn't in that bad a shape. The neighborhood is okay, and the rent, like I said, has always been ridiculously cheap. Any questionable incident that has happened in this house has either taken place in the lounge room or the nursery. My daughter is now three months short of turning three. I remember one time when my daughter was tiny. She would have been six months old at the time. We put her to bed in her cot in her room. She's always been a fire alarm screamer. And on this particular day, after screaming for about 10 minutes, she quite suddenly stopped dead. Assuming that she had just fallen asleep, I walked outside into the backyard about 10 minutes later to feed the dog. I looked through her window subtly to make sure that all was calm in her room. When I noticed a very strange thing, my daughter did not look close to sleeping at all. 
She was in fact staring intently at the ceiling. I watched her eyes move from left to right and so forth, as if she was watching something very closely. But there was nothing there. Not thinking all that much of it, I went back inside and continued on with whatever I was doing thinking that she was just boring herself off to sleep. A few weeks later, something very similar happened to this again, except this time, it was in the lounge room. Heidi was sitting with me on the couch. The family dog was also in the room, sitting by my feet. As Heidi all of a sudden starts staring at the ceiling again, with much the same intensity as before in her room. This time, the dog joined in, and was making much the same eye and head movements as Heidi was, as if they were both watching something on the ceiling move from side to side. The dog's hair then stood on the back of its neck, and he started growling, which frightened me, as he is one of the friendliest dogs in the world, and wouldn't hurt a fly. Then, being a bit of a wimp, he got up and snuck into the next room, and didn't come back for about a half an hour. This sort of thing has happened about three or four times since then, but nothing besides this has ever happened either. No apparitions or noises or banging. I've sometimes had the feeling though, that we are not alone here. Nothing like this ever happens when my husband is at home, only when I am alone or with Heidi. A couple of days ago, it happened again. Heidi started off by staring at the ceiling and then her gaze diverted to her toy basket in the corner of the room. She looked at me, smiled, looked back at the toy basket, pointed, and yelled baby. The word baby doesn't necessarily mean baby to Heidi. She calls newborns babies, as well as toddlers up to about her own age. I asked her where Heidi, where is the baby? There, she persisted, their baby. I shrugged and looked away again and hoped to dear God that she would stop pointing and looking at that darn toy basket. She did, thankfully, after only about a minute or so this time. What do you honestly think about this? Fluke? Or something more than just imaginative shot of playfulness? This website has mentioned dark, powerful energies such as imps, and I noticed the creator of this website has seen what could be called imps. Imps are described as devil spirits, who are demons, in small in stature. I've had many experiences throughout my life like the one the web creator had growing up. I don't like talking about them so much, and do my best to keep it dormant, but I did read their story. And I've had an experience with a small black figure that sounds like one of the imps described in that story. Me, my daughter, and my wife all used to sleep in the same bed till our little girl was one and a half years old. Around the time my daughter was that age, I remember staying up till close to 1 or 2 a.m. watching a long movie. When I was finished, I went to the room and turned on the bathroom light to brush my teeth. Our room was well lit from the bathroom. Since around the age of three, I've had dealings with spirits as well. So, when I was about halfway through my brushing, I pretty much knew from that feeling I had that something was happening. I looked in the room where my daughter and wife were sleeping, and called from behind my daughter in a fetal position was a small black figure. It looked human. But it moved, behaved, and felt like it was something else. It looked towards me, got on all fours, and scurried across the bed lightning fast. I kind of jumped back, but it disappeared when it hit the floor. The strange thing was, after I got into bed, my daughter, eyes closed, still asleep, did the exact same thing the figure did before I went to bed. Only my daughter stopped with her still sleeping face right in mine, then laid back down and was normal again. Some other things started happening after that, but I don't know if they're related. 
I hope my story helps you figure out what these things are. My story begins about three years ago. I was 27, and me and my husband were expecting our first child. We had been living with his mother, but since I had become pregnant, we needed a place of our own. My parents owned two houses, one in which they lived in, and the other right behind theirs. My oldest brother and wife and children used to live there but he bought the house right next door to my parents. Always wanted to stay close to our family. We're very close. Now that the house behind my parents was unoccupied, my mother asked me to move in. My husband and I gladly accepted. We would have more room and a place of our own. Well, the very next day we moved in, I was about 41 weeks pregnant and needed to go to the hospital to be induced for labor. We had a healthy baby boy. After our stay in the hospital, we returned to our new home. About four to six weeks after we moved in, I started hearing a noise in the middle of the night coming from the closet in our bedroom. My husband worked a graveyard shift most nights at the time, so I was alone at night with our son a lot. The noise was that of the closet door opening, I had put a long rectangular mirror on the closet door, those that are about one foot wide and four feet long. They had two hooks that went over the top of the door, so as to hang the mirror. So every time you opened it, it would screech very loudly, since the metal hooks rubbed against the door frame. Well, like I said, about four to six weeks after we moved in, I heard this very loud screech at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I woke up and realized it was the closet door opening. It opened about four inches. We had two chinchillas that slept on the floor at the end of the bed, and I just rationalized it to one of them opening the door with their paw. But I know that would have to take some effort, since the metal hooks over the top of the door made it hard to open, and would make the door get stuck. I didn't really get scared, I just looked, then went back to sleep. About two weeks later, again, me asleep, alone, middle of the night, then the screeching sound of the closet door opening. I woke up, and this time, sat up, and looked at the closet door. What just happened? I checked on my baby in his bassinet next to my bed, and he was fast asleep. I looked at the chinchillas, they were awakened too, and looking at the closet door, but had not moved. So again, I felt no fright, and went back to sleep. Again a few weeks later my husband had a day off, so he was home that night, and again, about 2 or 3 am, the screeching noise of this closet door being pushed open from the inside. My husband wakes up, and just stares at the door. Now he saw firsthand what I had told him about. The last time this happened was some weeks after that. Again, I was alone at night. I heard the screeching sound of the door opening, only it sounded like it opened a little bit wider than just four inches this time. I sat up and looked at the door. The chihuahuas were staring at the closet door as well. This time, they stood up. Then the closet door started opening a little bit further still. That set the chihuahuas off. One was barking at the closet door like there was no tomorrow, and the other ran under the bed crying and howling. Their reaction is what scared me the most. My heart was racing. I put my head under the covers. The closet door didn't open further, but it took me forever to get back to sleep. After that night, I was scared of the closet. I told my husband, and he put a lock on the door. I closed it and locked it every night. I didn't open it again. Only one thing happened after that. About a year later, the closet door became increasingly harder to close. It would get stuck, and I would really have to push to close it completely. One Sunday night, about 7.30pm this time. I again was home alone. 
My husband was working, and my son was with my parents in the house in front of ours. I was watching some TV, and I didn't like to leave the closet door open anymore. So I walked over to the closet door to try and close it completely. I was really pushing, and I started banging on the door with my fist to try and close it. It was almost closed. Then, while I was banging with my fist, right on the other side of the door there was a loud bang, as if someone hit it with their fist. It was right on the spot I was hitting it. I could feel the vibration against me. I stepped away from the closet door. I tried to stay calm. I'll try to sit down and watch some TV, I told myself. I sat down, but could not keep my eyes off the closet door. After about 30 seconds, I decided I couldn't stay in the house any longer. I left my parents' house in front of mine and left the TV on. Why did that scare me so much? I was fine when the closet door would open in the middle of the night. Was it because I was so sleep deprived from having an infant son that it was so easy for me to go back to sleep? The fact that I heard the banging on either side of the closet unnerved me so much. Thinking back, I remembered when I was 14 and my brother first moved in the very same house with my then 4 month pregnant sister-in-law and her 4 month year old daughter from a previous marriage. I remember shortly after they moved in, her telling me she thought the house was haunted. I asked why, and she told me that at night, she would see the closet doorknob rattle and turn. Oh, it's just her imagination, I told her. Even at 14, I would rationalize everything. I guess it wasn't her imagination after all. I later asked my niece, now 21, if she ever saw anything. She told me she did, which I later write about. This is something completely different to my experience, and I think it had something to do with her, and not the house. She also used to tell me that the closet door used to open in front of my brother until he confronted it. Then it stopped. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I live about 20 minutes from an old cover bridge in Mableton, Georgia. This is one of the places I've been to in the surrounding area and where I had the most happen. In 2004, we went on a last minute hunt to the bridge. I know you're supposed to be better prepared, but I kept most of my things in the car at all times, just in case. We of course had heard the local legends and wanted to see for ourselves. So we headed down after about midnight. Even then, the traffic on the road was just heavy enough that we were unable to try the chocolate thing with the car. So we parked up the road a ways away at the Comet Trail parking lot. We walked down and took our flashlights with us. On either side of the bridge are orange street lights, so the bridge is lit up all the way through. One in the group brought her cousin and I didn't realize at first that he had been drinking, or he would have stayed behind. He got up in one of the bridge's windows and peed into the creek below. After yelling at him to stop, I realized I could no longer see the lights on either side of the bridge. Our flashlights also stopped working, all of them. After the temperature dropped and it became dark the way it did, I told others it was time to leave. We then saw the streetlights turn on for a second, and then in the distance, at the other end of the bridge, two kids dressed in formal attire, standing and hand-holding. Had to be about 30 seconds, but we saw it. We froze, then started back to the car as we walked out of the bridge. We heard what sounded like little kids laughing, and they actually touched and poked at our backs as we hurried as fast as we could, back up the hill. One of our group reported hearing a voice in his ear telling him to run. I have to say it was unsettling, and though I haven't been back to the bridge yet, it hasn't stopped me from going to other places. I've heard voices and gotten pics, and even had things happen at other sites. This one was one of the best ones. 
because I don't get physically touched by them often. I also believe nothing would have happened if he had not upset the spirits the way he did. I'm very much more careful about who I bring with now. Only one town over from our home stands one of the largest and most ornate railway stations in our state. The owners worked over 20 years bringing it back from neglect in a time gone by, as their second love is antiques. They have decorated it with period pieces throughout, now opened it as an outstanding restaurant. My husband and I often bring friends there to enjoy not only the wonderful food, but for the pleasure of watching them jump as the Amtrak fly by, only feet from the window. There is a very small organ that has been placed on a wall, not far from where we often sit. Several meals ago, our waitress entertained us by telling, some people have commented there is a ghost attached to this instrument. One said she saw a very small, frail old lady standing by it, saying, this isn't right, indicating dismay as to how our organ came to be sitting in an eatery. The waitress went on to say, they never like to work alone when closing up, as there's so many unexplained noises. We enjoyed a meal there today, and as always, our conversation turned into the many of thousands of people now gone that passed through these massive arched doors. Out of nowhere, I smelled a very strong odor of ivory soap. Mind you, we are eating fish, no one is passing by, and the other tables haven't changed their patrons. I say nothing, but a moment later, my husband smells it and says how weird it is. Such an uncommon smell today. It lasted for about three minutes. There was no explaining the smell. As we finish, we wander through the hall looking at various rail-related antiques and move on to the outside. There is an Amtrak train on the track, but it is going slow. Strange as they usually are speeding enough for an onlooker to feel their wind as they pass, heading for Boston. It comes to a complete stop at the station. A man in uniform gets out and looks at the front and then under. Turning to us, he says he thought he saw someone laying on the track. He walks about, making a full inspection. Then he gets in and then starts going. We see the riders in their seats. But as we watch, he stops again, just down the track, and repeats the inspection again. Strange day. This place should be investigated. This is my second entry in story. This takes place in Rusk, Texas in the 70s. This story comes from an acquaintance of mine, who is really more of a good friend of mine of my good friends. Mike and Katie were married and had two children. One was a nine-year-old boy and the other was a five-year-old girl. They moved into a house that had a shotgun-style layout. In other words, you entered into the living room and there was a straight hallway all the way to the back door with all of the rooms off of this one main hallway. Mike and Katie took the first door on the right as their bedroom while giving the children the last door on the left to their bedroom. One night, not long after the move, Mike and his wife were sound asleep when they were awakened by screams of mommy and daddy and turned on the nightstand lamp to find both their children wide awake and terrified. The children claimed to have seen a man with a hat on and a beard peering into their window. Mike immediately got his gun and ran around the back where he found an empty field and no sign of anyone having been there. At first, they were under the impression that this man had a ladder because the back of the house stood on a steep grade down and no one could be peering into one of the back windows without a ladder. But the occurrence repeated itself and finally, Mommy asked the kids to describe exactly what they had seen. Their stories were both told at different sessions and matched completely. What had woken the children was a strange light out the window and someone walking up and down on what sounded like wood boards.
They said this man leaned over and looked down into the window, and he had a shotgun in his hands. The couple moved the children to another room, and Mike did some laborious digging into the history and county files in the house. Through newspapers and files, plus some additional info from some of the older townspeople, Mike learned that this house had once been at another location, and when it was moved, it was turned around so that what had been the front of the house was now the back of the house. He also learned that the man who had died at the house had been arrested and died in prison for shooting his wife and her lover in their bed with a shotgun. I've sent in one other story about my mother's house in Illinois, but I have two more stories to share. I was raised by my grandparents. Their house has its share of odd occurrences, knocking sounds from within the walls, an apparition of my great-grandmother, and eerie feelings down the long hallway to the bedrooms. One night, I was around nine in 1989, I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep. My bed was facing the doorway, and I could see into my grandparents' bedroom across the hall. The hall is only about four feet wide. The only light visible came from a small night light in the outlet at the center of the hall. As I was tossing and turning, trying to fall asleep, I looked out into the hallway and saw a young woman with curly hair, her body glowing faintly, she carried a candle in her cupped hands. She walked slowly and paused for a second and turned to look into my grandparents' room. Being the nervous child I was, I quickly pulled the covers over my head and ignored it, eventually falling asleep. Years passed, and I never saw another apparition. When I was 16, 1996, I was still living there. I grew up in that house. 13 years total, and had moved across the hall, having switched rooms with my grandparents. I decided I would try an experiment. I found a dress similar to the one I saw the apparition wearing, so I decided I would put it on and sort of relive that experience. I had half very curly hair, and it was the same length as the apparitions. I put on the dress, grabbed a short white candle, turned off the hall light, lit the candle, and took the path that I had witnessed the apparition take. I took the same route, made the slow walk, paused at my old bedroom door, looked in, and walked into what was now my bedroom. Was what I saw a ghost, or merely a glimpse into my future? Was I seeing myself on some other intersecting point of time? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Next story. This occurred in 1997, while I was at a Native American ceremony in the woods in Nebraska. We had been out in the woods for about a week, living in our tents and teepees, ceremonies going on throughout that time. I heard the stories of spirits who lived in the trees, and being as curious as I am about the supernatural, I was nervous and excited to see what might be out there. For the first few days, things were normal, and I went about my business working in the cook shack, making large quantities of food for the huge number of people there. One evening, after dinner, I was sitting at a table with the aider, talking about the name he had just given me, Star Woman, for my love of looking at the stars for hours on end, when my right hand suddenly went ice cold. My mother was sitting to my left, and I said, wow, my hand just went freezing cold. There was no wind, and it was July in Nebraska, pretty hot, even after the sun went down. She said, oh, don't worry, that's just the spirit touching you. I can't recall the name for them, so I'll just say spirit. I think it was Wayne Guy, but I'm not sure. Okay, no big deal. Our tent was set up along the perimeter of the tree line, with an outhouse about 50 feet to the right. On several occasions, while walking to the outhouse, I noticed black human forms in the trees. When I'd shine my flashlight on them, they were gone. 
I attributed this to my imagination. A few days later, a friend who had brought along for the trip was sitting in my tent with me, talking about the day. I was on the left side, leaning back on my arms, with my lantern flashlight next to my left hand, about 12 inches away. It was the kind where you could pull up the body of the flashlight to reveal a lantern. We were talking, and we noticed the light shifting in the tent. There were no other lights, aside from a bonfire on the side of the camp at about 300 feet. I looked at my flashlight, and it was standing on its edge. All we could do was sit and watch it. It stood on its edge for about two minutes. Then we decided to leave the tent for a while, because we were a bit freaked out. The flashlight had a rounded head, not a square one. My hand did cause the tent floor to dent in slightly, but my flashlight was nowhere near my hand or the dent I made in the floor. The light was literally standing on one rounded edge. When I mentioned it to my mom the next day, she quipped, they were playing with you, they must like you. I wasn't really scared, just a bit nervous, considering we were out in the wilderness with no lights. I was intrigued more than anything. Considering the nature of the ceremony we were attending, I'm certain the spirits were focused by our activity. I hope to return to that spot in the future. This occurred in Miami, Florida in 1980 when I was 15. I still don't know if this was a paranormal experience, but it was unsettling nevertheless. I was babysitting for the next door neighbors one evening. Their daughter was down for bed, and I was in the family room watching TV. They had a small anchor biter type dog, and it went to the double sliding glass doors that led out into the rear patio and pool area, like it wanted to go to the bathroom. All of the homes in this area had a screened in patio pool enclosure, and when you open the sliding glass door to step out into the patio, Immediately to your left was a screen door that led into the backyard. Unlike most of the homes in my neighborhood though, the backyard was surrounded by a chain link fence. So I go and open the sliding glass door, which was completely covered by trays for privacy, to let the dog out. The dog steps out and I immediately hear the crunching of grass in the yard to my left as though someone is walking in the backyard. Startled, I look to my left, and there is what appears to be a man, adult size, reaching out as if to open the screen door. I immediately slammed the glass sliding door shut, scared out of my wits. I stood frozen in fear in the living room. Silence. After a few minutes, I cautiously peered through the curtain onto the patio. No one there just a dog sniffing around. I let the dog in, and he did not appear agitated at the least. I never thought much about it after that, until years later. If there was someone there, why didn't the dog bark? If it was supernatural, animals are known to get agitated, yet nothing. My imagination? Definitely not. Nothing like that ever occurred again, in subsequent babysitting for that neighbor. When I was young, my grandmother owned a very old rustic country summer home in a small village about three hours away from a large city where I grew up. There was nothing particularly threatening about the outside of the house. To a casual onlooker, it just looked like an old quaint house, much like the majority of the houses in the village. During summer break from school, my parents would send me there since my grandmother always took her vacations there, far away from the busy life in the big city where we all lived. Though I miss my parents a lot and didn't get along well with my grandmother, I still, for the most part, enjoyed the large garden with its old apple trees, a berry orchard, and a large vegetable garden. The inside of the house had a very different feel to it. First of all, it was definitely very old, and somewhat musty, because it went unused for a large portion of the year. 
in one of the bedrooms where the wallpapers was peeling. You could see several layers of different color wallpaper, which makes me think that the house was owned by many people before my grandmother, though she had for many, many years. Though I had a sink, it did not have a toilet or a shower. Instead, there was an outhouse outside and an outside shower for summer use. There was one room in the house, which was added sometime after the original house was built. It was a slightly newer, open space with many windows, painted in a pleasant pastel color. It was located at the very back of the house. For some reason, my grandmother insisted that this particular room is where I would stay. If you were to simply look at it, you would find absolutely nothing threatening about this room. However, for some reason, I was terrified of staying there. My parents always remarked that unlike the other children, I was scared of nothing. I always slept with the lights off, never had any incidents where I was scared to be alone, and never had any childlike fears such as a monster in the closet, etc. So, my parents found it highly unusual that being 8 or 9 years old, I was absolutely terrified of this room. I would beg my grandmother to let me sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, but she always told me that I was being silly and there was absolutely nothing wrong with the room. Yet at night, with the lights off, I couldn't help but hear unusual creaking sounds, knockings, and what sounded like footsteps after my grandmother had gone to bed. Having never been scared of anything, I would pull the blanket almost all the way over myself, except for my eyes, out of which I could see faint black shadows moving along the corners of the room. I tried so hard to convince myself that I was just imagining things, but the extreme uneasy feeling never let up. I felt like something in the room could physically hurt me if it chose to. I told my parents and kept asking my grandmother about the room, but my questions were sidestepped and I was always told that I'm just imagining things. And maybe it's because the room is sort of isolated from the rest of the house and that makes me nervous. And of course, I got the usual explanation of it's just the house settling, etc. Since the house had no hot water, they couldn't blame the water heater. Things would go on like this every summer I was there. On a few occasions when I was allowed to sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, I felt much more at ease and was able to fall asleep much easier. In the other room, the uneasy feeling would keep me awake for hours, which was highly unusual for me since I never had trouble sleeping anywhere else. Yet, though significantly weaker, the effects of that negative energy permeated the entire house. To wash up before bed, we would heat water in the kitchen and put it in a basin. On numerous occasions, when I was washing my face or giving myself a sponge bath, since the only shower was outside, I had very strong feelings of being watched to the point where I would do what I needed to do as fast as possible and would turn to look behind me expecting someone to be there. One particular occasion I remember very clearly. It was broad daylight, and my grandmother went to the local market to buy food while leaving me at the house by myself. I was about to go outside to the garden when I heard a loud female voice clearly calling my name from the living room. Utterly confused since I was supposed to be the only one in the house, I went to investigate. My grandmother was still out, and I confirmed that I was alone. Then I heard the same voice again, calling out to me urgently from another room. I was really freaked out, and almost ran out of the house, but made myself go and see if anyone was there. I saw no one. When my grandmother got back from the market, I told her what happened and she told me many people imagine someone calling their name when they are home by themselves. Even then, 
I thought it was an odd explanation, since I never had an occurrence like that before. And actually, I haven't had an occurrence like that in the nearly 20 years since then. Sadly, since I was still a child, I never found out the history of the house before my grandmother finally sold it after she was too old to maintain it. I don't envy whoever owns it now though. Okay, one of my first experiences with ghosts was when I was about 5 or 6 years old. I was in Texas at my grandmother's house with my brother and cousin. We were sleeping in the living room and I heard kids playing in the background. Then I heard a man call my name. I thought everyone else was up and my grandma was waking me up. I stood up and opened my eyes and there was no one there. It was also silent. I thought it was a dream, but then I heard kids again, and a man's voice started to call my name again. I now knew that this wasn't a dream. I ran to my grandparents' room and told them there was a man calling my name and that there were kids playing. My grandma said I was having a nightmare and to go back to sleep. I got into bed with them and went to sleep. About an hour later, my cousin came into the room, saying that a man wouldn't stop calling his name. My grandma thought it was maybe a coincidence, and told us to go to sleep. Nothing ever happened to my brother. A few weeks later, we got a call from them, telling us that they were moving. My grandpa had gotten up about 1am to let the dog outside. And when he turned around, all of the dog's squeaky toys started squeaking, and there was a woman standing right in front of him, and it wasn't my grandma. They found a house and started moving as quickly as possible. We came down to help them. We lived in Oklahoma at the time, and my grandma told us that there was a family that lived in the house, and the dad and kids all died in the house fire. We never found out who the woman was, though. Thank you for letting me submit my story to you. This is one of the scariest, but I have lots of them. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to feel and see spirits that no one else could. It took me many years to discover what this ability was, and that I wasn't alone. I don't remember my very first ghostly experience very well, but my mother does. She told me the story many times. I was three years old, and we were visiting my grandmother at her home in East Boston. I walked into the back bedroom, my grandmother's room, and then back into the dining room and asked my grandmother about the man in our room. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She turned to my mother and quietly said, she has a gift. She handed me a photo of her and my deceased grandfather and asked me if that was the man. I said yes, but he was skinnier now. My grandfather died of a brain aneurysm, a complication from a bout of meningitis in 1952, 34 years before my birth year. One year later, I was four. We moved into a new home. Directly behind the house was the cemetery. We lived in that house for the next 14 years. There was a very heavy, eerie feeling that surrounded the stairs. Something watched you from the base of the stairs while you were in the living room, or at the top of the stairs. Every so often, there was footsteps and the sounds of someone falling down them. When he went to investigate, Nothing was there. The basement was the worst place. It felt like something like a voice grip was squeezing your chest. I could never go down there. I was apparently the only one that felt it. My sister told me after she moved into her room down there that she never quite felt alone and she'd get this odd headache, then smell something really awful. My dad made sure everything was perfectly safe before she moved everything down. 
There was no explainable reason for her experiences. I've had experiences outside the house as well, in cemeteries, in other people's homes. Recently, I began to investigate haunted places in New England with my friends. Since moving into my current residence in 2005, though, I haven't had any experiences at my home. We lived in a small farmhouse with a huge backyard and beyond the fence, an even larger pasture. I was 11 years old when we lived there, and we, the kids, would always explore the backyard, especially at night, and play hide and seek all of the time. One night, in this big backyard, I was alone and looking out at the pasture, when suddenly, I felt as though I was being watched, and I turned my head to look at the house, when I saw a transparent man looking at me, and then he disappeared a few seconds later. My uncle had died when I was four, so I assumed it was him watching over me, and ventured into the house, and went to sleep. A few minutes went by with no strange happenings, when I went over to a friend's house, and spent the night with her. We had a little bit of a slumber party, and ended up sleeping in the living room, when she woke me up at about 3 a.m. in the morning, apparently scared out of her mind, and told me she had woken up to go to the bathroom that made her hair stand on end, then saw a shadowy tall figure of a man with a pressed suit on, no hands or feet, and some kind of burlap bag over his head with a rope tied twice around his neck. So naturally, I thought she was kidding around, trying to scare me, so I got up and ventured into the direction she was pointing when I felt this strange sensation and boom, like magic, he was there. I ran back and told her that I had too seen it and she ran into her parents' room and got them out of bed and naturally, they told us there were no such things as ghosts and told us to go back to sleep. We lay in the living room a long time just watching this thing pace back and forth and waiting for dawn so we could finally get some sleep. And about five in the morning, the visitor disappeared and we soon fell asleep. Never in a million years, if someone would have told me this would be the beginning of a 19 year old haunting, would I have believed them? But that is exactly what happened. Not just to me, but to my friend also. It seemed that this ghost visited us every night at the same time for almost two years at first, just pacing the halls, then turning things off and on, changing TV channels and radio stations, swinging things in the walls, just little annoying things that at our age would scare the crap out of you. One of the scariest nights I can remember was one night at my house, we were sitting on the bed eating ice cream when we both got that spooky feeling and fell silent and we smelled something burning for a second and then we heard the most guttural scary movie crowl I've ever heard in my life. We threw our bowls and ran into the living room where I felt the need to spoil the beans to my parents. Of course, they told me we were crazy and that our imaginations were great. A few months later, I was still insisting to them that something evil was in the home, and they kept telling me the same thing and began asking me if I needed help like counseling or something, but I kept fighting with them about it. By this point, even my brothers thought I was insane. A few months later, my parents decided to move because I stuck to my story, and they were hoping that if they got me away from my friend, that my imagination would have worked overtime. We moved about 65 miles from that town to another farmhouse that was even older than the last one. The same thing was happening, only instead of pacing back and forth, the figure began to float to my bedside, lean its head to the side, and make noises like it wanted something from me. This was a nightly ordeal for a few months, and then it began to start touching me. I could never see its hands but I could feel the icy cold prickle sensation 
that came with it, working its way up my bed, to my legs, up my body, and even surrounding my head. Most nights, I was too afraid to move and afraid to cry out, so I laid in my bed, silently weeping. This went on for quite some time too. Then it began to lay in the bed beside me and touch me off and on all night as though it was testing me to see if I was scared and trust me, I was terrified. But when 5 a.m. rolled around, proof he would vanish. After a few months of this, in a ton of lost sleep, I finally got the nerve up to throw a pillow at him and whisper yell at him, you know, things like what do you want from me, and he began to put his head to the side, even more, in grunt, as if he was replying what? Remember, the figure always had a pressed on pinstripe suit, and some kind of burlap bag over his head, with a rope that showed to be strung around his neck at least two times. So, I never saw a face or even heard him speak, anything other than the grunts it was doing that night. But shortly after my temper tantrum, it left. Finally, a few nights of peaceful sleep, until I was awakened by heavy footsteps in the foyer, going through the kitchen, which was not like him at all, and then, the burned smell again, and I was so afraid that I would hear the growl again, that I remember thinking, my parents would surely find me dead in the morning from a heart attack. To make a long story shorter, here's a list of things that happened. After that night, I never saw the burlap ghost again, but strange things and sounds and figures would keep me up all night. It was like an open portal in my bedroom. I would wake up scratched up, heavy breathing in my ears, pressure on my chest, Racing black silvery balls across the ceiling, red eyes racing through my room and disappearing, laughter, waking with my arms bruised as if someone had grabbed me, something cold that I always assumed to be a hand, because I felt something like a huge ring hit the bottom of my foot, grabbed me by the ankle, and almost slung me out of bed. A Bible was slung across the room and landed on my bed as I had taken to the habit of filling my room with religious items. In one night, so much activity in my room that my younger brother was awakened and came in only to turn white and started screaming. And to this day, he will not tell me what he saw. So on to the future. I turned 18, still struggling with this haunting, or whatever you call it, and joined the military and it still followed me. Even being stationed in Iceland, it was still up to no good, and my best friend, who was also my roommate, would say things like something is not right, and it was doing all of its little tricks again, like turning things on and off. But she seemed fascinated with it, so I told her the entire story, and she didn't seem to mind. She had just wondered what I had done to have this happen to me. Finally, a few years of peace without one thing happening. I'm now 24 and live with my boyfriend in our three bedroom, two bath house. And nothing. Another year of peace when he tells me one morning that he felt like he was being choked in the middle of the night and he has some bruises on his arm. I say nothing because I don't want him to think I am crazy, but it keeps happening, and then I wake up, look at the clock, and it's 3 a.m. again, and something is breathing heavy in my ear. I got up, and went into our guest bedroom, and nothing, so I fall asleep for what seems like a few hours. But when I wake up, it is only 40 past 3, so I attempt to get up, and I can't move, Something is strangling me and hitting me all over. I struggle to get up, but I can't move. I can't even scream. This went on for about 15 to 20 minutes and proof the struggle is over. This time, the attack is so severe that I consider calling a team of specialists out to see what it is, but I never did. 
Shortly after that, my boyfriend and I split up, and I moved to Oklahoma to be with my family, and nothing has happened since. Once in a while, I get a strange sensation, but I don't think about it twice and just keep doing what I'm doing. It has now been about two years since anything out of the ordinary happened. There are many more things that happened during this trying period of my life, but for me to write it on here would take a year at least. For those of you who read this and think I'm crazy, I can only say that maybe someday my little brother will tell me what he saw. My fiance had just died in our townhouse. This was in 2002. He had offed himself in the head. I went back later because I couldn't go back there for a while after he had died. Anyway, I went back and I kept feeling hand brush across my forehead. One night, I was in bed and was about to fall asleep when something grabbed my foot and was pulling it downward. I freaked out. I was the only one in the house. Then, I had a friend come over because I was afraid to be alone because of these things happening. My friend was downstairs and I was upstairs coming out of the bathroom and a dark floating figure floated right by me. It almost ran into me and would have had I not stepped back. It telepathically told me it was not here for me and that it had gotten what it wanted and also would not look directly at me. I somehow felt like I was being protected by God and the thing was actually afraid of me. I didn't feel scared. Later on in the month, I took a bunch of pictures of the townhouse because I wanted to remember the good times where my fiance had lived and been very happy together at one time. I was planning on moving because the memory of his death was just too much for me, and I always had this creepy feeling there since he had died. After I got the pictures developed, there were 120 photos in all of several different rolls of film of different things, and then the one that I had taken pictures of, the inside of the town hall. Out of all these photos, I had taken three of the exact place where he had died. And only those three photos were what appeared to be flames right in the place where he had passed. It almost looked like the portal to hell. Seriously. To this day, I cannot explain those pictures. They were taken with a very expensive camera. No other photos I had developed before or after that had ever had those flames in them like that. Just the three that were the exact location of his body when he died. My name is Malin, and I've just turned 21. I live in Sweden. In my parents' house, I've experienced some strange things that I really can't explain. My sister and I have always felt that there is a presence, other than us. My parents don't believe in that kind of thing, and have always told us that it's just our imagination. One of the first things I remember is that my father had gotten this stuffed animal that looked like E.T. He got it from his students as a present. I must have been about four years old and had recently seen the movie with my sister. And for some reason, I thought that E.T. was the most scary thing I've ever seen. So I didn't like this doll at all. In our basement, there are a lot of different rooms. In one of them, we had a huge box filled with stuffed animals. Every time I went down there, I took the E.T. doll and put it in the bottom of the box under all the other stuffed animals. But the next time I went down there, the E.T. doll was lying on top of the others again. This happened repeatedly every time I went down there. It didn't matter if I waited two days or two minutes. I of course had my sister my parents about it, but they swore that they had nothing to do with it. Of course it could be so that they lied to me every time I asked them, but I find that hard to believe. Anyway, 
I solved the problem a couple years later by giving the ET doll to one of the guys in my class. I constantly heard, and still hear, cracks and other sounds in their house, footsteps, and sometimes voices. They've always been there, and I guess I got used to it, but it took a few years before the next big thing happened. I was 15, maybe 16, and had moved down to the bedroom downstairs. I didn't like sleeping downstairs, but it was either that or a tiny room upstairs. One day, I was sitting in my bed, writing in my diary, when I heard a knock on my door. I was surprised because I was alone in the house and hadn't heard either the car nor the door open. I said come in, but when no one entered, I got up and opened the door, but there was no one there. I thought it was strange, but went back to my diary. I had hardly any time to pick up my pen before I heard another knock. This happened a couple of times and really scared me, so I locked the door and crawled under the covers. Then I heard scratching outside and froze, just to hear meow, one of my cats. At first I thought it was my cat who had caused the knocking, but I've never met a cat that can actually knock that hard. Another time I was in the bathroom upstairs, I just finished washing my hands and was outside the bathroom when I remembered that I left my watch in the shell in front of the mirror. I turned to go get it and took a step into the room when a bottle of lotion literally flew off the windowsill and landed in front of my feet. The window was closed and there was no wind to speak of outside. If the bottle had fallen off the windowsill, because it was placed unstable, it would have fallen right down in the cat's litter box, but instead, it flew almost 13 feet. I calmly went out of there, closed the door, and got into my room and locked the door. I've also seen a boy in the basement, a teenager. He's not transparent at all. He looks as real as you and me. I've only gotten short glimpses of him. But I know he has brown hair and a green shirt. For some reason, I most often see him around Christmas and other holidays. I wonder why. Even though some of these things scare me, I've never felt threatened. So I guess whomever or whatever is present in my parents' house doesn't want to harm us. I'm one to be afraid of the dark, but there are feelings I get. Feelings that tell me to get out, almost a communication with my location. The basement has been home to incidents experienced by me and my slightly older sister. My experience is weird. I went downstairs to retrieve something for my mom, when just when I was near the stairs, an opaque dark shade of gray temporarily blinded me. Whilst running up the stairs and wiping my eyes, I swore I heard something. My sister heard something too. She was on the downstairs computer once. It had basic features. She swore she heard something whisper something close to her name. My sister sprinted upstairs as well. Finally, my parents' room. I come in on rare occasions like when the light and TV is on, or when my mom or dad are watching a good movie. My room is on the other end of the hall. I need to pass my parents' room. When I pass their room, I see strange things at the end of the bed. I see dark, almost impish figures. Once, I could have sworn I've seen red eyes. Now, for the sound, it is very creepy, yet inconclusive. I have no idea what the sound actually is. Once, when the family and I were in the living room, I heard a broom sweep in the back of the house. Weird part, there was no broom in the back of the house. Plus, just today, on 3-20-2008, I heard something in my room exhale. I know it wasn't me. That had freaked me out. 
the feeling. I think I may actually have been touched too. Once, when I was eight or nine, I was watching a show on Urban Legends. I felt something run something gently down my back. It was around 10 or 11, but it got up anyway, and I went to the living room where I found my mom. I told her what happened, but she just said it was just a curtain. I lived in a home in North Salt Lake City that my children and myself had many experiences over the years that we never could explain other than the supernatural. My husband, myself and two children lived in this house for over 12 years. There is a family that now lives in the house and I do not want them to cause any problems by giving them out the address of the house. I will say the house is located on 5th North. My children attended Jackson Elementary School when they were young and graduated from West High School. My daughter was sleeping and thought she heard her name being called and when she opened her eyes, there was a man with a beard sitting in a rocking chair holding a hat in his lap. My daughter's bed was hung from the ceiling with chains and her bed was four feet from the floor. My daughter said the man turned his head towards her and grinned at her. She also said that her rocking chair was even with her bed and was four feet off the floor. She told me she pulled the covers over her head and when she peeked out over the covers, he was gone. My son told me of a man with a beard and a top hat sat on the end of the bed my son heard his name called, and when he even looked in the direction of the speaker, the man sitting on his bed, the man grinned at him. My son pulled the covers over his head, and when he looked out, the man was gone. I was alone in the house for a few days, and on two different nights, I was awoken to the sound of music, violin, and tinky sounding piano. The lights were on in the kitchen in the front room. As I entered the kitchen from my bedroom, the music stopped and the lights dimmed. And as I entered the front room, the lights dimmed and I found myself standing in the middle of the front room in the dark. I heard footsteps in the stairwell and when I got to the bottom of the stairs, the lights were on upstairs. I started walking up the stairs and with each step, the light got dimmer, and about at the fifth step, it was now dark upstairs. I could write about many other things that happened at this house. We never felt anything evil with our experiences, and it was always our own fear that scared us. I believe the house I grew up in was haunted. My family all makes jokes about how it was just all my imagination. There were several different occurrences throughout my childhood, nothing on a regular basis, but frequent enough for me to believe that something paranormal was going on there. I lived in this house from birth until 18 years old. I am now much older, and I still believe what I saw and felt was real and inexplainable. As a child, I always woke up in the night to get a drink of water or a snack even sometimes. I wasn't overweight, but it was a running joke in my house that I always had to get up to get something to eat at night. On several of these occasions, I would walk out of my bedroom down the short hall and into the living room where we had one of those old TVs that when you turned them off, the colors would dance for a short while and then go out. My parents were early to bed, early to rise, so I know the TV couldn't just shut off. But I would go out, and there would be a human face made from those colors that actually would just swim around when it was shut off. I watched the TV during the day, and it shut off, and always watched to see what the colors did. But they never made the face during the day, only at night after the TV had been off for hours. The second occurrence that freaked me out completely 
was that one night, I was standing at the refrigerator, which was on the same wall as the doorway that led down to a small landing, which is where the back door was, and the stairs to the basement were. I always felt watched downstairs, and couldn't stand going down there at night, even with all the lights on. I could do it fine during the day, but at night, it freaked me out. Anyway, the night I'm speaking of, I turned my head to the doorway. The only illumination was the light from the refrigerator, and there was a fully formed person peering around the corner from the side that would have been coming up the stairs. The horrible thing about it was that at first, I thought it was my stepdad, but then I got a look at his face a little closer, and it was his face, but almost evil looking. I swear it had red eyes, but that could have been a misinterpretation of what I saw. I ran back down to see where all the bedrooms were, and I peeked in my parents' room, and he was still in bed. I've never found an explanation of why it could have been his likeness, but I know it was definitely scary. About two years ago, my boyfriend Luke and I were at our friend's house. He lived about a half an hour away from us in a small beachside suburb called Two Rocks. To get there from our house, you have to travel down a road called Winero Road. It's a very long winding road and has no street lights. Lining the side of the road are white gum trees. These stretch on for a few kilometers. A lot of people have crashed their cars on this road most end up as fatal crashes. There are quite a few crosses, especially in the white gum area. Anyway, it was about one in the morning when we decided to head back home as we were both really tired after a long day. We turned, as usual, onto a narrow road and were chatting to each other about what to do the next day when we reached a high end death toll area. Luke always slowed down near here, because there's so many windy sharp turns that you have to be careful. As we were driving, I looked out of the window, and to my absolute astonishment, there was an old man walking down the road with a bag in his hand. I pointed this out to Luke, but he just thought it was some weirdo who had one too many to drink. About a minute later, Luke slammed on his brakes and we skidded around, doing a 180 degree turn. We had both just seen the same man, carrying the bag run out into the road waving his arms. We sat dead silent watching where he had come from, but nothing was there, just the trees and the butte man. Not far away from where we had stopped, there was a white cross where an old man had flipped his four wheel drive and died instantly. On another occasion near the same spot, I saw a young girl, about 17, wearing blue jeans and standing next to a white gum tree. Luke didn't see her, but I can remember that she looked sad, almost lost. There have been a lot of claims from a lot of different people about the white gums on Winero Road, mainly about figures darting out trying to make their vehicles come off the road or of an old man walking along carrying a bag. We don't travel down that road anymore. They've built up a new road that's more convenient for us. A few other things have happened to me in the past 18 months. I just bought a new kitten not too long ago, and she is always very alert when she's in my bedroom. Usually, she will cuddle up and purr, or go to sleep, but in my bedroom, she can't settle down. A few weeks after we got her, Luke was working a night shift, and I was home alone in bed, because I'm not fond of being on my own in a dark house. I decided that my kitten would stay with me in my room until Luke got home. At about 11pm, I just finished watching a movie on the TV, and grabbed the kitten, and headed to bed to read a book. I was a few pages in when Lottie, my kitten, started trying to hide underneath my arm. 
At first, I thought she was just getting comfortable, but that's when I noticed she was hiding. She then started to walk up onto me, looking up at the ceiling. Her pupils were huge, and her ears were back, and her tail was wagging angrily. I tried to settle her, but she started to follow something along the roof with her eyes. I looked up, but couldn't see anything, so went back to reading. Although I was very uneasy, Lottie kept following this invisible thing for about a half an hour. Then she eventually went to sleep under my blanket. From then on, when I'm alone in my room, I always feel uneasy, like I'm being watched. Okay. This isn't the first supernatural type thing that I think I may have experienced, but it is the only one that I know for sure was real. My best friend moved here to Kentucky when I was in kindergarten from Chicago and moved next door to me when I was about 10. After that, me and her were always together and always spending the night with each other, loved her parents to death. That particular night, she had spent the night with me, and it happened to be her other best friend's B-Day the next day. Well, maybe about 2 o'clock that day, we went over to her house to ask her dad if we could walk down there, as I was just down the road. Her mom was at work, by the way. I waited outside, when the door slammed open, and she was screaming, There's something wrong with my dad. I went in and he just looked like he was sleeping. He had his arms crossed and everything. I'm glad he went peacefully. He was pale, and I touched his arm to wake him up, and he was cold. At that point, I knew he was gone. We ran to my paps, and he came over and called an ambulance. The rest is all just heartache and pain, like that comes with any death. I felt like it was important to tell you all that, because it really is relevant to the rest of the story, or at least, in my opinion, it has some correlation. Okay, now on to the creepiest moments. I was spending the night with that same friend, and I asked where the mouthwash was, and this was probably about three or so months later. She said her dad had some in his dresser, so I went into his room. I stood there as she looked, and suddenly, we heard this rhythmic knocking all down the side of her house. It was really fast and complicated. We freaked out and ran to her room. I think he didn't want her going through his stuff. Well, that's all that happened for a very long time. The last experience, her dog is chained up in their fenced-in yard, and it was in heat, and my male dog got in her yard and no one was home, so I rushed over there. They really didn't need any more puppies, and opened her gate to get my dog that somehow got in there, and I heard his voice again very meanly shout, hey, so I freaked out and ran again. The main thing I'm wondering about is that knocking. It's really odd. I think about it sometimes, but I mean it shouldn't bother me anymore. But it does. If you have any ideas as to what this is, please speak up. I live in a small residential neighborhood in western Kentucky. My family has resided in our home for 37 years. We're the first home to ever be built on this property, as the same with several other homes in the area. Since day one upon moving into the house, we have been plagued with numerous experiences that quite frankly can't be explained. They are loud banging noises that echo from between the halls, strange odors, ranging from the distinct smell of death to a light scent of lilies and roses. Strange shapes of a blackish-gray smoke clinging to the baseboards. Voices that echo through the entire house, 
ranging from the intensity of a deafening shriek to the softest of whispers. Shadow people walk the house day and night. Strange bluish-green bars of light extend from room to room. Balls of light that chase each other around the ceiling. Full-body apparitions, plain as you and I. Things disappearing, sometimes returning in different parts of the home sometimes never reappearing. Cold breaths in your ear, an unmistakable touch that chills you to the bone. Several homes in our neighborhood have also stated similar events. Several of the people that have admitted strange occurrences in their homes have been very religious, God-fearing people, with no reason to lie about their situations. Something is happening here. Upon researching our area, it was discovered that back in the early 1700s, this area was an old Indian burial ground. In the mid-1800s, it was decided to put in a real cemetery. The old graves were destroyed and the remains were disposed of. A new cemetery was started in its place. However, in the 1960s, it was decided to move the cemetery once again due to flooding issues, and a new subdivision was to be put in its place. Being a contractor for our city, my father was offered a reasonable deal on one of the first homes to be put on the land, an offer too good to turn down. Our house was finished on June 14th, 1972. We moved in on June 21st, 1972. It wasn't until recently that my father told his children that he worked for the crew who removed the graveyard. Some of the graves are so damaged by water erosion that they could not be moved, so they were left, and the homes were built on top of them. Even as recently as 10 years ago, less than 5 miles from my home, a family was putting in a swimming pool while excavating the backyard. Several Indian bones were unearthed. The family sold a home and moved. Mysteriously, when several homeowners started asking for copies of our area's records, the records suddenly vanished without a trace. Here are two instances in which I experienced ghostly activity. They're not very long stories, but I think they're very interesting. So here goes. I really don't know if you keep up with your website, but if you do, back in 2004, a couple of buddies and I went to Thompson Creek Trail. We started down the trail. My friend and I were at the front of the group. We had flashlights and we were flashing them at all the really dark areas of the trail. We had passed an old looking house to our right at the beginning of the trail. Shortly after, there was a curve in the trail, and in the bend of the curve, there was a tree. It was really dark at the trunk of the tree, so I was kind of scared, and I shined my light on it. The image that had projected from my flashlight was of a very tall man, and was standing very close to the tree, and a shadow was cast onto the tree trunk. It is a fact that no one was in front of me. My friend had also seen the huge shadow of a man. I had been to a lot of places on her website, and this was the only one where I'd actually seen something, and it scared the living crap out of me. On to my next paranormal experience. For me, I've always believed in the paranormal, though I've never had any experiences of my own until very recently including the one I just told you about. I met a new friend at school, and he told me his house had spirits in it. He and his family had all something happen to them, i.e. seeing figures, hearing voices, unusual odors, and poltergeists. They even hired a priest to bless the house, and also a psychic. I never thought it would have something happen to me, but me and my mates were watching a movie in his room, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, 
I swore to God that I saw a shadowy figure in his mirror, and when I turned my head, it kind of stepped out of view. I thought this was weird, because usually I can tell my eyes were playing tricks on me, but this time it just seemed different. Another experience I had was when I was on the computer alone, and my friend was downstairs. While I was on the computer, I thought I was hearing many voices, like the background noises you hear in a restaurant. I could hear very faintly. Now because of these experiences, I don't like being alone in this house. What I want to do next is to actually try to do ghost hunting in this house. So there you have it, my two experiences. I hope you thought they were interesting, because they scared and terrified me. I just moved back from Long Beach, California, from Vancouver, Washington. A longtime friend named Alan offered me one of his bedrooms, in which I could stay, until I got back on my feet. That night, I felt something sitting on my chest. I remember being too afraid to open my eyes. Whatever it was, it did not move. Then, I opened them and witnessed a flow of whitish looking vapor protruding out of my chest. It went up above the bed towards the ceiling in shape of stretched out rings. It looked similar to smoke from a cigarette. It just hovered over the bed in circles and then began to stretch and exit towards the kitchen, which was next door. I did not dare tell Alan about this experience because he is such a skeptic. I can predict his very words. Ernie, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You must have dreamed it. He says there's no such thing as spirits, or even a god. The very next morning I told Jim, one of the tenants, what I experienced. I just had to get it out of my system. Will someone please hear me out? He had told me that a man named Ron had been staying in that very room and that, when he discovered that he had some type of incurable hepatitis, he hung himself from the refrigerator door in the kitchen. That really didn't make any sense to me, but he explained that Ron had somehow did this by tying his belt around his neck and then somehow sliding on the floor. According to Jim, Ron received a letter from UCLA about a month later, stating that he was to come to UCLA immediately because they now had a treatment for his type of hepatitis. If he'd only waited one more month, Jim told me that he believed Ron had tried to inherit my body when I was sleeping, as in, tried to possess me. This incident, however, never happened again. I do recall one time waking up at 1 a.m. in that house and hearing a repetitious sound coming from the garage. I looked out the window because the garage had a window, but it was dark. The next day Al was in the garage and I asked him what he was doing in the garage at 1 a.m. He said, I wasn't in here. Why do you ask? I told him what I had heard, a repetitious sound from the night before. Then, something made me focus on a small machine that sat on a shelf. I asked Al what it was. He told me that his previous tenant named Ron used to do laboratory work and that the machine was for polishing rocks. There was still rocks in it. It had a handle that turned. When I turned it, I heard the same sound that I had heard in the morning. I told Al, but he said he must have been mistaken. No one was in the garage last night. It was locked at night and only I have a key. I said no more. After my brother had died in his home, my family gave it to me to live in. It was an older mobile home. One day, while on my PC, which faced the same wall that my door was on, in fact, my desk was next to the door. My desk is huge, and a bigger desktop 
than most kitchen tables are. So sitting at my desk, I can see part of the hallway while reading, typing, or whatever on my PC. One day, I just happened to look up at the door, and there came a figure of a man. I could only see his shadow on the emergency door and wall outside my bedroom. He was either bald or had some very short hair. I just sat there and stared for what seemed like several minutes, waiting for him to either come into my room or say something. It finally turned and seemed to go into the bathroom, which was on the other side of the wall, or went in the wall towards the kitchen and living room area. They are both open, with no wall dividing them. I was there alone, except for my dog Chewy, who is very large, over 160 pounds. I got up to check it out, because from what I saw as a shadow, it didn't look like anyone I knew. I walked by the bathroom peering in, and he wasn't there, so I kept going. When I got into the kitchen, I saw Chewy on the couch, looking out the window at the kids who had just gotten off of the school bus and were walking home. He would have barked, even if he had known whoever the shadow was. He never made a sound. There was no one there, not even in my son's bedroom. I checked everywhere. If he had gone outside, I would have heard the door open and close. The only time my brother ever had short hair was when he was in the Marines. The only other person who had no hair or short hair was my father before he had died. The chemo and radiation treatments for cancer had done that, and both were dead for about four years, both dying about four months apart. So far, this has been my only encounter with a shadow person or ghost. I never really knew they could or would show up like this. This past year, my daughter who works in a nursing home was telling me they have seen shadow people there too. They seem to be only showing up in this one hall section. I believe she said it was where the patients who weren't doing so well stayed. One patient even complained about being there in that hall. He said they kept bothering him and wouldn't leave him alone. When they moved him to another hall, he quit complaining. He did eventually die several months later. I did see this happen on Ghost Hunters too, where they saw a man shadow like a figure on a locker. They've mentioned shadow people a few times on there too. Now, I suppose you're wondering if I were scared. For some odd reason, I wasn't at all. I just wish I knew who it was. I know dogs have a sixth sense too, and I still wonder why my dog didn't seem to know he was there. Chewie had never met my brother or my father. Even if he knew them, he would have barked at being excited. Someone came to visit. Hello. I want to submit two amazing experiences that I witnessed that involved children. Many people believe paranormal experiences by children are hard to explain away because they do not know about the supernatural and have no reason to lie or embellish their stories. The first one involved a friend's son who was about four at the time. My hubby had surgery at a very old Catholic hospital which dated back more than a hundred years and he had been placed in a private room with a private bathroom to recover. We were in the part of the hospital that dated back to the 1940s. My friend and her son dropped by to check up on my hobby. He was sleeping off the amnesia and me, my friend and her son, were sitting in chairs next to the bed. I was chatting with my friend and her son was looking across the room into the bathroom and he started smiling and he waved. We thought he was waving at my hubby, and his mom told him that Mr. Rob was sleeping and could not see him wave. What he said next stunned us. He said, Mommy, I'm not waving at him. I'm waving at the lady in the bathroom. The bathroom was empty. She told him no one was in the bathroom, and then he said, Yes, there is, 
and again looked over in the direction of the bathroom and smiled and waved again and said, her name is Karen. We were both creeped out because he really looked like he was seeing someone and considering that we were in an old hospital, there's no telling how many people died there. The second one involved my son. When he was about three and a half years old, he started seeing the babies as he called them. It started one night when I tucked him into bed. As I started to walk out, he began to giggle and wave at the ceiling. I asked him what he was doing, and he said there were babies and he pointed to the ceiling. I asked what they were doing, and he said they waved and smiled at him and made funny faces or played peekaboo with him at night. He didn't seem at all scared. In fact, he enjoyed it. I chalked it up to imaginary friends. However, over the course of time it became more real for him and for me. Many nights, he woke me up because he was laughing so loudly and even talking to the babies. He told me once that he never got scared at night because when he felt scared, the babies came to help him go to sleep. In fact, he never cried at night and never came to my room at night asking to sleep with me. Those of you with children this age know this is amazing. He would sometimes insist that I lie down and watch the babies and he would make me wave and say hello to them. I would indulge him and do it, but again, I really thought they were imaginary. These visits continued for about a year, and finally one night, I wanted to push for more information, so I laid down with him and brought up the subject of the babies, and I asked him how many were there. His answer made me both very happy and sad. He said, there are four, and they said they know you, Mommy. The reason this was so shocking was that what my son did not know, of course, was that I had suffered four miscarriages before we adopted him. I was happy that the babies had come to let us know they were okay and happy, and that they liked their adopted little brother so much, and took care of him by comforting him when he was scared at night. Sad too, because I could not see what they looked like, but I believe one day I will meet them. My son continued to see the babies for about another six months, and then one day, he told me as he was getting into bed that the babies were finished. I asked what he meant, and he explained they were finished because he was a big boy, and he could go to sleep by himself now. He has never even spoken of them again. When I was about 15 years old, my dad became the manager of a pub. I won't say the exact pub, as he does not run it anymore. The pub is located near Sheffield in England, and is on a county road. The pub is converted from a farmhouse and barn. To get to the pub, you come off the country road and follow a small track only about a half a mile until you reach the car park. The first night we stayed there, we all slept in rooms as the pub was also a small hotel, with about six rooms spread over two floors. The first night, I stayed in room number three. When we started to go to bed, the family dog wanted to come into my room, and I laid on the carpet and would not move, even when my dad was shouting at it to leave. The dog did eventually leave to go and sleep in the corridor. But soon after my dad closed his door, I opened mine again to let the dog in. Now, this dog is a Rottweiler with a head as big as a boulder, but the poor thing could not get any closer to me and really did not want to be on its own. I should mention that my parents divorced and at the time, I only saw my dad on the weekends. So the next time I went to stay there, I stayed in room number four. Just to set the scene, if you come out of room number four, 
Thrice an emergency exit with a push bar to open the door, which leads to the fire escape stairs, into the left, leads to a staircase, which leads to my dad's room, in a spare room that was not being used at the time for little more than storage. Eventually around 3 a.m. ish, I turned the TV off but kept the lights on. My dad started leaving the dog in the pub area downstairs and blocked the door leading up to the bedrooms. I think he didn't want the dogs in the bedrooms as he wanted to start letting guests stay in the rooms. I was not comfortable at all in the room. I did not want to turn the lights out and I tried to keep watching TV. Eventually, around 3 a.m. ish, I turned the TV off but kept the lights on. My dad had started leaving the dog in the pub area downstairs and blocked the door leading up to the bedrooms. I think he didn't want the dog in the bedrooms as he wanted to start letting guests stay in the rooms. Anyway, the dog was going crazy, barking non-stop. I was far too scared to go down and see what was up. I then started hearing the emergency exit bar and the door outside my room rattle as if someone was trying to open it but they were not pushing hard enough to open it. Then, I heard footsteps really loudly running down the stairs from my dad's room, and I saw shadows pass under the door of my room. I felt relieved. I thought my dad had come down to go and see what the dog was barking at. The next day, I asked my dad what the dog was barking at last night when he went down, and what he said sent shivers down my spine. He said he had no idea. He had never heard the dog and never went downstairs at all during the night. After some research, I found out that a woman many years ago had slipped down those stairs and fell down them, breaking her neck, and she died instantly. There was one instance when my dad's partner, her son and I came home, and the pub was in darkness, this actually frequently happened as well. The lights would go out all by themselves, and my dad, who previously was an electrical engineer and more than capable of rewiring a house on his own, could not figure out why. Anyway, we come home. I can't remember why the pub was closed, but it was. We just had a quick scan around to check no one had broken in. Don't forget, the pub is in complete darkness, there's no light, and right at the back of the small restaurant area, we could see a man sat at one of the tables, just staring at us. He was just solid black. Other things started to get lighter, the flowers on the table for example, and the chairs, but this figure remained solid. We panicked and ran upstairs and stayed in one of the rooms till the lights came back on. It was not a burglar. The next morning, we check everything, and everything was still in its place, and all the doors locked. The kitchen area of the pub was a big room, which was the old barn, and that was the worst room of the house. You could constantly feel like someone was watching you, and walking past you. Whoever was watching felt angry, as if they were annoyed because you were there. No one wanted to be in this room alone. My dad had a few waitresses and bar staff leave because they felt very uncomfortable working in there. Again, after a bit of research, we found out that the farmer who lived in the farm hung himself in the barn, which is now the kitchen. And to be honest, I don't think he left. Objects would constantly go missing. Spoons would turn up again bent out of shape, and get this, the whole kitchen was cold. Even when we had cookers on, we still had to wear jumpers in there. My stepbrother and a family friend were staying in room number 7, the storage room I mentioned earlier. During the night, one of them, Neil, thought that the other, Jim, had gotten up and was leaning over him as if to check he was okay. And to make it a bit more confusing, Jim had thought that Neil had gotten up during the night and leaned over him. They both said that they were half asleep, 
but through their haze, could see a figure standing above them looking down. A few other things happened, such as a football came rolling down the length of the pub to where me and my stepbrother were sitting. It literally then stepped on the spot, about a foot away from us. No one else was in the house. The back door to the pub was locked at night, but every morning we would find it open, but the lock was still in the locked position. The actual bar that locks into the socket was still sticking out. There is no way it would have opened. The lock was new and undamaged, but this kept happening. This happened about a month before my dad moved out. Anyway, my dad eventually gave the pub up. His partner didn't want to stay there. The dog was never the same. It became a very tame dog, but it did start to get a little better after my dad moved out. Okay, so I've always fancied myself as to be a little in tune with the paranormal. I had an experience this weekend which sort of confirmed this, as my daughter was with me and experience the same thing at the same time, so I know I was not imagining this. A little history first. My grandfather's sister passed away at the age of 93. She still lived in the house that was purchased by their father, my great-grandfather, in 1903. It is on the historical registry in our town, a very old beautiful home which has been in the family since then. She was born and raised in this house, married and lived in this house until the time of her death about a week ago. Her father was killed in a train accident and her mother also lived in the home until she died. After the memorial service, my daughter and I went over to the house to get the food ready for family which was coming over after the funeral. We were alone when we walked into the house and I immediately got a feeling of a presence with us. My hair stood up on my arms, and I really felt like somebody was in the room with us. My daughter looked at me and asked if I felt that. I said that I did, and confirmed it, when we both stopped talking and closed our eyes. You could really feel it. We got really spooked, and I told my daughter that if it was someone with us, it was indeed family and that they would not hurt us. About that time, an overwhelming scent of Lilia perfume permeated the air. It was the weirdest thing. My daughter smelled it, as did I, and we just looked at each other in disbelief. It lasted for about a minute or so, and then dissipated. At this point, I was totally freaked out. I called my aunt in Texas and told her what happened. She told me that was most definitely my great-grandmother, as she wore that type of perfume and was indeed a real lady who had tea on the porch every day at 2. It was about 2 when we entered the house. She also said it would make sense to her that she contacted me as I was the oldest female hire to the family name. I know now that there are things that cannot be explained, but this has really gotten me shaken up. It just makes me wonder what she was wanting to tell me. A side note is that her son has recently mortgaged the family to pay his mother's hospital bills and they could possibly lose the house. Do you think maybe she was trying to contact me for this reason? Guess I will never know. This happened to me while I was living north of Great Barrington, Massachusetts somewhere between 1966 and 1969. We had moved there from the Midwest when my dad changed jobs. We were living in a very old house close to an ancient cemetery. The house was three floors, not including the basement, enormous, and once had a vandral all the way around it. The attic was huge, dark and mysterious, all floored with rough floorboards. It had a tiny window near the chimney and a trap door in the ceiling leading out to the roof. My parents forbade me and my siblings from going up there and never told us why. My bedroom faced south, the front of the house. It was the only occupied room in that upstairs wing. 
At that age, I was between 12 or 14 years old. The old house gave me a galloping case of the creeps. Even on the brightest days, parts of the house could be dim and drafty. Winters are very cold and dark there. At that time, the house was heated with forced hot water that came up from the basement furnace. As the steaming hot water traveled its way all over the house, through copper pipes and baseboard radiators, the noise was phenomenal. There were only four thermostats for the entire house, so at the far end of any hallway, there would be a sharp cracking, banging noise as the cold pipes and surrounding woodwork expanded with the inflow of heat. In the middle of a cold, dark, windy night in January, the sound could wake you out of a sound sleep, heart pounding and hair on end as it echoed all over the dark house and up the staircase. Their church down the street had an ancient clock tower that struck every hour, adding to the strangeness. Sometimes, I would awaken with the start in the middle of the night, feeling as though someone was watching me as I slept. It would be a long time before I could go back to sleep. It was on one of these nights that I had a dream about a little girl, standing at the foot of my bed, watching me as I slept. I say dream, because to this day, I'm not sure if I was awake or asleep, having fallen asleep before this happened. She looked to be only about eight years old, and had long, shoulder-length dark hair that was braided, plaited, and tied with ribbons and a hairstyle I had never seen before. She was wearing what looked to be a pale pink dress, so formal that it looked like some sort of party dress. It was pulled up at each side with large satin bows at her hips, and all kinds of fancy laces, buttons, ribbons, and what looked like little puffy sleeves at the shoulders that went down to her wrists. The skirt stood far out, full on either side of her, and went past her knees. It looked as though she was wearing lacy pantaloons, white stockings, and old-fashioned little shoes, like slippers. She held her hands folded, hopped over the other on her waist. The overall effect would have been very beautiful for a little girl, but what struck me were her eyes. They were large, dark, and looked like she had circles under them. She was so thin, and her face didn't look at all healthy. I could see her cheekbones. She was not smiling. She was very serious and sad. She just stood there, watching me. I was too afraid to say anything. Then she slowly bowed and made a slow, graceful curtsy. It was a beautiful gesture, like something a ballerina would do. She slowly stood erect again, slowly walked to the closed door, turned its knob, and went silently out into the hallway outside my bedroom closing the door behind her. That's all I can remember. Long after this, I was outside the house, almost directly below my bedroom window, where that massive veranda had once been. There were low-growing conferious bushes of some kind. I was exploring around when I tripped and turned my ankle. I sat on the ground where I fell, rubbing my ankle and trying to find the rock I'd tripped over so I could dig it out and get rid of it. The rock was large. As I dug away at it with a stick and kept digging deeper, the rock kept going down and stopped about eight inches under the earth. I dug all around it and realized it was a tombstone about 18 inches long by about 10 inches across and maybe three inches thick. I was able to lift it up and check both sides of it. The surfaces were blank and laying face down under about four inches of soil. I left it alone. My parents said they didn't know anything about the tombstone, so I decided I wouldn't tell them about the little girl in my dream either. It was about this time I decided to try and figure out why they didn't want us up in the attic. 
I went up there when no one was around to try and see what I could find. There was absolutely nothing up there from what I could see by the dimness of the one bare light bulb that switched on with the pole chain just within my reach. I had also brought a flashlight so I could see into all the corners. Nothing was there. I was about to leave when I noticed something sticking up out of the insulation material that had been put there decades ago for the ceiling of the floor below. I dusted the layers of debris off of it and stifling a coughing fit, looked closely at what was in my dirty hand. It had once been a hat box covered in rich yellow silk. The remains of a crushed hat in what I now realized was a Victorian style was still inside. It had been richly covered in the same shade of yellow, almost golden silk flowers. It was designed to fit a little girl. I went farther into the corner and found nothing else. But my foot scraped the heavy dust and uncovered something lying flat on the wooden floorboard. It was a round metal circle, with more round metal rings inside of it increasingly smaller diameter to the very center, which was open. It was an open space, about ten inches across. There must have been more than a dozen of these graduated metal rings, each separately covered in what had once been white cloth and sewn with four long pieces of heavy cloth tape from the outer ring to the smallest ring in a large X. I had no idea what it was. I put both things, the crushed hat and the hat box and the strange ring thing, back where I found them. Sometime after that discovery, my parents were at an antique store in Great Barrington to look at furniture. While they were occupied, I went to a lady who worked there and described to her what I had found in the attic beside the hat. She said the strange ring thing was a set of hoops for a little girl's hoop skirt, and they were common in the mid-1800s. They would have been the era in which the house I was living in was built, I thought. So, something happened to a poor, sick, lonely little girl living in the house back then. No one would tell me about it, and I never learned anything more than what I mentioned here. But she had visited me late one night, in my dream, and evidently didn't want to be forgotten. We moved back to the Midwest in the summer of 1969, and never came back to Massachusetts. It's been 17 years, but it still happens to this day. It happened on a summer night on the back road connecting Mount Clair to West Milford, known to the locals as Alfie Hill. The area had very few houses at the time, and one house stood out, a brand new gorgeous home right at the crest of the dirt road. The man who lived there built it for his wife, and they had a daughter who was, I believe, around eight years old at the time. I remember traveling the road, more of a cow path really, and watching the home being constructed. Once it was finished, it always looked so pristine and happy, but one night, I was coming through this patch, black stretch of land, and saw the mother and daughter in the middle of the road, both in what looked like nightgowns in a mud puddle. I could see them standing there as I approached and the moon seemed to shine on them alone. When I got to them, they disappeared in front of me. I wasn't alone in the car, so I asked did anyone else just see that, and everyone just sat there, too scared to answer. By the light of day, early, early, I was crossing back across the hill and saw six, maybe seven police cruisers and an ambulance Time seemed tape everywhere, and one covered figure in the grass by the house, and several officers crouched by the road, beside where the mud puddle was the night before. Apparently the man had long suffered from depression, and killed his wife and daughter before running to the house and killing himself. The officers said that they speculated he had committed the act the night prior to them being discovered. Still. 
on summer nights, you can see the girl and her mom looking down into the middle of the puddle in their nightgown. My husband Steve, brother and myself, were staying in a condo at Sunrise Village in Killington, Virginia to go skiing. It was in April of this year, and there was a special on the Fox News channel entitled, Does the Devil Really Exist? or something of that nature. It must have really affected me, as I later dreamt that my husband and I were before the devil, and he was going to decide which one of our souls to claim. I was making an argument to spare Steve and take me instead. I remember waking up as someone was grabbing my left calf and tugging on it. I looked around and saw my husband was just coming into the bedroom from the bathroom and he saw my distress as I was waking up and shouting for him to turn on the light as I was waving my hand around me to see if I could detect any cold spots. I enthusiastically read all I can on the paranormal. I vividly recall the hand, fingers and thumb wrapped around my left calf. It was a warm hand, and no without a doubt it wasn't my husband's. He was in the bathroom, or my sleeping brother on the living room couch. I was sleeping, tucked in with the sheets and blankets tucked under the mattress. I think whatever it was, was trying to wake me up from a horrible dream. Perhaps my father who passed away five years ago prior. Don't know. What I do know is that my husband believes it was a dream and he won't accept any other explanation. This infuriates me to no end. I know it was real. Thanks for listening and keep up the good work on your website. It's great. I've got another experience I thought you might find interesting. In October of 2006, I got orders to move from Arleson Air Force Base, Alaska, to Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado. My ex-wife and I decided to drive because we didn't want to get to the next station and not have a car. We spent the weekend with her relatives in Wasilla, then made the drive to Haines Junction and stayed the night. We really didn't sleep well that night. The room was rather uncomfortable. So we left at like 500 and began the trip to Canada. We took the Alcan, Alaska Canada Highway and pushed into the Yukon Territory, stopped and had a rather awful lunch. But my daughter, who was a year old, needed to get out of the car for a while. We pulled into White House around 1800 and decided to stop for the night. We chose the best Western hotel, mostly due to the military giving us a list of which hotels were best for us to stay in, and that was one. As we were checking in, I noticed a rather cold spot by a cartoony statue of a Canadian Mountie. Mind you, this was October and things were getting cooler, but not that cold. I believe we had a room on the sixth floor and let my ex-wife and my daughter get settled while I brought in the things we needed for the night. While I was making the trips to the car and back to the room, I learned that this Best Western was once a saloon and brothel. I'd mentioned the cold spot to my ex-wife and she had stated that once she had made the trip to Alaska in 02. This was two years before our marriage and I did not know her before 03 that she had stayed on the fourth floor and experienced similar cold spots and orbs. Well, we decided to have dinner, then turn in. We had been in the car for over 12 hours and we sorely needed a seat after the awful night before. My ex-wife said she had forgotten something in the car and for me to get it as she was going to give our daughter a bath and put her to bed. I went out from the restaurant in the hotel, and as I was walking in the entrance to the hotel, I kept feeling cold spots in various places. I also felt like someone had brushed up against me, and like a hand on my shoulder. Of course, no one else was around, 
except the front desk clerk. It got stranger as I came back in after getting what it was. I have since forgotten and got on the elevator again. I got this feeling like I was being watched or something was there with me. Now, I was the only one in the elevator, but for some reason, it stopped on the fourth floor. And when the doors opened, an odor of tobacco filled the area. This is a non-smoking hotel, and what can be best described as a wet dog smell filtered through the hallway. When I finally got back to the sixth floor, these cold spots seemed more spread out than before, and I swear I saw some floating orbs in the window overlooking Whitehorse. By this time, it was around 1930 to 2000 at night. Of course, when I looked again, nothing was there. I also heard something that sounded like someone banging pots and pans. Obviously, there was no one there, and you weren't allowed to bring such things into the hotel. I got back to her room and told my ex-wife about it, and she said she had a similar experience in O2 without the pots and pans banging noise. We slept the rest of the night without any further disturbances and decided to head out at 6.30 while I was loading the car. It was still kind of dark outside. I swear, I saw what looked like a prospector from the latter part of the 1890s. Of course, when I looked up, he was gone. When I went back into the lobby near that cartoony Canadian Mountie statue, the cold spot really intensified, and when I got to the area where the elevator was, I saw someone out the window, and I thought nothing of it. But once I got closer to the elevator, I noticed that the person was wearing Victorian-era clothing. He passed by the window and disappeared. Again, I told my ex-wife, and she by now was picking up on animal spirits as she called them, and she was telling me, it was time to get moving, but she noticed the intense cold spot by the statue as well. And like our trip to Rika's Roadhouse in Alaska back in 04, she was quick to get out of the hotel with our daughter and get to the car while I checked out and brought the bags out. Again, I felt something brush against me and something touched my shoulder. However, this time, the hand felt cold and clammy almost. Of course, I turn around and no one is there. Just that cartoony Mountie statue. We get out of there okay without any further strangeness, save for a feeling of sorrow. Then of course, I found out it was a saloon and broth from the Alaskan Canadian gold rush of 1898, which could explain several things but it was the first time I actually feared spirits and ghosts. And that was because of my daughter, who was a year old at the time. Again, my ex-wife and I would talk about this till our divorce. It was probably the first time I've ever felt animal spirits. This is a personal experience that happened to me two years ago in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm in the Navy and had just got off the swing shift on base, leaving at approximately 11.45 p.m. from the base. The base I was at is on an old plantation's land, but I never thought anything of it. The part where I worked at was on the water of the nearby river, and the road back passed along the river for about a half mile before turning inland. Fog had a tendency to build up on the river in the fall and winter months, and the fog had rolled across the road on this particular night. As I was driving along the road coming back from work, I saw a man running on the side of the road. This was nothing special on a military base. People run all the time to keep up physical condition, but this was almost at midnight, which I found strange, and he was wearing nothing reflective at all seemingly wearing all dark clothing. As my car came up on him, he immediately darted out in front of the car at a speed I'd never seen before. I slammed on the brakes, 
but it was too late. I expected to hear and feel a massive thud as I hit this poor fellow, but as the car passed through him, he vanished without a trace. I got out of the car, brights on, searching with my flashlight for a person anywhere around my car, but I was the only one as far as I could see on this road. It scared the living daylights out of me, to the point in which I started searching inside of the car to ensure I did not have a hitchhiker with me now. After getting into the car, I drove as fast as I could, with interior lights on in the car, to the nearest well-lit area, locked the doors, left the lights on, and called my father to relate the incident. After some 20 minutes of consoling me, I finally got my wits about me to drive home. However, it did not end here. From this night on, something was different about my apartment. There was a presence in that place that I haven't felt the months before the incident. I began to review sitting in the living room alone altogether because of feeling like someone was watching me. Out of the corner of my eye, I would see the bathroom light on, clear as day, but when I looked over, it would be off again. It would feel like someone would sit down next to me on the couch, but I was the only one in the apartment. Finally, one week and my father came out to visit. Growing up with numerous ghostly and at sometimes demonic experiences, most of which he never talks about, he has become highly sensitive to the paranormal. The first day he arrived, he was the key I left him to get in while I was at work. When I got home, having said nothing of my experiences in the apartment to him, the first thing he asked me was if I ever got the feeling someone was in the kitchen area, peeking over the half wall at the television. I froze in my tracks at this. Over the course of his week-long visit, he said he also thought he saw the bathroom light turning itself on and off and felt someone else sit down on the couch next to him, as well as seeing a shadow of a man mainly around the kitchen area who would periodically lean over the half wall like he was looking at what was on the television. But he said he never saw or felt anything or anyone in the bedroom. I now had a reason for my seemingly unfounded paranoia of being in the living room alone. I continued living with this feeling from the night of the incident, driving home through the following few months until I received orders to leave Charleston and have not felt the presence of the running man since then. When I was little, about five or six, we lived in a big house which was originally two cottages, later joined together. Although myself and my sister were young at the time and had no personal experiences, my parents told us stories about what happened there when we moved house some years later. As well as the familiar cold spots, creaks and groans, some other stuff went on too. One day, my mom was in the downstairs bathroom when she heard a man's cough coming from outside the door. Thinking it was my dad going into the study room, which was opposite the bathroom, she thought nothing of it. When she came out of the bathroom, however, the study was empty and no one was outside. She went back to the kitchen and found my dad where she'd left him, sitting at the table. She asked him if he had come out the bathroom and coughed. He hadn't moved the whole time. Another time, my mom, my dad, and one of their friends were sitting at the kitchen table. When they all heard a massive crash come directly from upstairs where my bedroom was, my mom described it as the sound of a wardrobe falling over or a full-grown male adult being thrown to the floor. They rushed upstairs to find me fast asleep and nothing out of place in my room. We even had the fireplace in my room checked. In case a stone had fallen down the chimney, nothing was found and there was no explanation. 
everyone in the house was accounted for. One night my parents were in bed when they heard the sound of a woman gently humming and singing. The sound came from the end of the corridor and continued downstairs, then eventually stopped. Again, this could not be explained. Myself and my sister were asleep, and even if we did get up, we certainly would have walked down the corridor singing. My second story is based in my grandmother's house, a manor house which is around 200 years old. My grandmother has a story which even to this day she swears was true. She was walking upstairs when in front of her she saw a pair of women's shoes on the step above. She looked up to see a skirt, blouse, and before she could see the woman's face, she vanished. My dad's family all grew up in the house, and my uncle mentioned that from his bedroom, he used to hear the sound of gravel crunching outside, like someone walking towards the house. On several occasions, he even recounts seeing two big black dogs sitting by his bed. Although I like the house, I always get that feeling of being watched whenever I go over. If I'm sat in the kitchen, I always want to look into the parlor, which is next in the kitchen, with the door always open so you can see in, and I always feel like someone's sitting in there. Even to this day, I refuse to go upstairs by myself, as well as seeing a key moving in a locked door from the inside when no one was in there. Myself and my sister had a weird experience. We were sat outside. The garden is kind of placed on a hill, very sloped, that you could reach by climbing some steps. From where we were sitting, we could just see into my grandmother's bedroom. She had gone out shopping and had left her two dogs on her bed. We were just watching them, talking, when suddenly, one of the dogs started barking at the corner of the room at something we couldn't see. She, the dog, then jumped onto the bed and started barking directly at us. Then, at the exact same time, we both saw a white mist, sort of in the form of a hand, move gently over the dog's head. He then stopped barking. My sister and I both looked at each other in surprise. We'd both seen it, but could not understand it. It was daylight, but not sunny, quite cloudyless. There was no reflections on the glass or anything like that, because there was nothing to reflect, no trees or anything behind us, and we quite clearly seen the mist from the inside of the window. While serving at RAF, Middle and Hall, with Yusaf, 1993-1994, I lived with a roommate from Santa Rosa named Greg. Santa Rosa is located in New Mexico. We both originally lived in the dorms on base, but got special permission from our first sergeants to move off base together. This was due to the fact that we did not drink alcohol, and drunken parties were a constant among our roommates and in the dorms, in general, 24 hours daily as airmen worked three shifts. We were both practical-minded Air Force aircraft mechanics with serious responsibilities and not given to flights of fancy and had no previous interest or experience in the paranormal or occult. I simultaneously dated an Englishman I would later marry named Bill. The cottage only had a coal fireplace for heating, Greg did all he could to keep the coal stoked, but the house never warmed, and coal always died out quickly, despite large piles of coal Greg stoked well often. The phone rang at various hours day and night, with a loud, hissing static. There was a faint, but unmistakable sound of someone whispering loudly through the static, but the words were always unintelligible. Calls to the operator to discover where the calls came from were answered that we had not received any phone calls at all during these events as far as the phone company was concerned. 
The call simply came from nowhere. Reich worked a night shift. I worked days. Every night, I heard heavy footsteps come up the stairs to the bedroom landing, four square feet, and back downstairs after varying lengths of pause. When I was home at night, these heavy footsteps occasionally went into Greg's room. When he was at home, he heard the steps enter my room a few times. 500-year-old stairs creaked very loudly beneath thin carpet when no known humans were using them. The human footsteps could be heard anywhere in the cottage. These phantom footsteps were much, much louder and projected a foreboding emotion to the roommate at home when they occurred. The rocking chair in the living room near the fireplace rocked off of its own accord on a regular basis. Once, Greg and I were simultaneously TDY or assigned temporary duty to separate bases for a few months. We locked the cottage down tight as a drum. A friend agreed to check the place from time to time, but as all doors and windows remained locked, he never went inside. I returned before Craig did. Every object in the kitchen that could be moved, such as culturey, dishes, pots and pans, bread bins, knickknacks, whatever, were taken by someone and all dumped in the middle of the living room floor. Nothing was missing. It was simply transported to the middle of the living room and unceremoniously dumped there. At other times I was TDY and Greg experienced occurrences more often and more intensely for him when I was gone. However, his worst experience happened unbeknownst to me while I was deep inside the cottage. One night, as Greg went out to his car to go on duty, he saw what are sometimes called a shadow figure, but in much more detail. Greg was not bothered by the unmistakable occurrences in the cottage until he met this thing. It was blacker than black, the outline of a large adult male, about six and a half feet tall, be his estimation. No facial or other features, except glowing eyes that looked at Greg in such an evil way. Greg said he was scared to death. He claimed without hearing a sound that this thing was unmistakably evil and had ill intentions to say the least. Greg got in his car, a true British yellow mini, and sped away as soon as he could. There is a broken down shed directly behind the house in the backyard. Both Craig and I looked into it from time to time, but refused to enter until one day we agreed to go in together. We both experienced an unexplainable strong sense of being watched from up close, though no one else was on the property. The sensation, we both agreed at the time, was an evil one. We both thought we heard heavy breathing, but neither one of us wanted to jump to the conclusion and appeared to the other one to be easily duped by what we couldn't explain. There's a storage area on the side of the house that cannot be accessed from inside the house. Only by the door outside the storage area, attached to the side of the cottage. Craig and I both hardly dared to look inside after our first time inspecting the property. There were no electrical lights in the room. There was junk and building materials scattered around, as if someone dumped everything from the ceiling and materials changed positions from time to time. Occasionally, the taps, faucets in the bathrooms upstairs, turned on and off on its own accord, yet both hot and cold tap levers were always in the off position. Every unexplained occurrence was of an extremely strongly sensed nature. It always got our attention, except for the static phone calls and the chair rocking itself. Most activity took place when there was only one roommate in the cottage. Neither Greg nor I had ever experienced anything paranormal before. At least, he had not anything to this degree. 
Of the photos taken inside and outside the cottage, there is nothing remarkable. No orbs, light streaks, vortices, apparitions, etc. The Englishman I was dating and later married was a complete skeptic, but strongly disliked being in this cottage. He would only state, something is wrong with this house, something is strange about it. For his degree of skepticism, that was quite a statement in itself. When a man with a young teenage girl moved into the other side of this duplex cottage, Greg and I decided to warn her, without giving anything specific away about the occurrences, so we weren't planting suggestions in her mind, knowing teenagers are very impressionable. We simply welcomed her, made chit chat, then told her when she was alone, if she was ever uncomfortable or frightened, telling us she was in her bedroom alone, when she audibly heard a voice call out for her. She had no history of hallucinations, swore she did not mistake it for a conversation she heard through the walls, which would not have occurred for that night Greg was on duty, at the base, and that the voice was male, not matching Greg or myself. Shortly after this, I moved in with my fiancé in a nearby town, largely to get away from the occurrences, and soon lost touch with Greg entirely. The paranormal occurrences in the cottage were constant, in one form or another, and experienced intensely. It carried a heavy pull of fear or, at times, dread or terror everywhere in that cottage that never ever left. Never anything that could be called benign or benevolent. In the summer of 1996, I bought a large home in a nice, older neighborhood. My fiancé lived with her parents at the time she was still in college, and I was living with my parents since I'd just gotten out of the army. We were really looking forward to getting married and having our own, private place. The first night in the house felt very strange to me, but I chalked it up to being a newlywed in a new home. As time went by, the strange feelings did not abate, as they thought it would. I felt more and more apprehensive, especially when I was in the house alone. The house made very strange noises when I was there by myself, that it didn't make while Sandy was home with me. Also, I asked Sandy if she heard any strange noises when she was there alone, and she said she didn't. I tried to ignore the noises in apprehension, but it was getting harder and harder from the upstairs. There were just the two of us in the house, and the bedrooms upstairs were only used for storage. The footsteps seemed to pace back and forth in the upstairs hallway. Sandy claimed she never heard any of the sounds and was calling me paranoid and crazy. At first, the footsteps were confined to the upstairs but eventually, they came downstairs and into our bedroom. Whatever was making the footstep noise would come up to my side of our bed and stand there for several minutes before walking straight out of our room. I heard other strange noises in the house, like the sound of an animal growling and scratching noises in the walls. Someone or something knocked on our front door one morning at 3 a.m so loud that I thought the door was going to come off the hinges. Of course, Sandy never heard anything and accused me of trying to scare her. I began to see small, black humanoid figures darting in and out of the corner of my vision. They would shoot behind furniture or duck into some rooms when I tried to lay my eyes directly on them. I saw them during the night and day and began to see them more often and often. I would often get this odd feeling that someone was behind me, and if I quickly turned around, I could see one or more of those things run away. One day, when I turned around to try and see the little black things, I saw a large black thing at the other end of the hallway. It was about six feet tall, 
and though I could not make out any features, I could tell that it was a human shape under a cloak, and it did not run away. It just stood there for several seconds to let me get a good look at it, and then it slowly disappeared. I saw that apparition several more times over the next few months, always standing some distance away and just looking at me. I was really getting scared, and it came to the point that I did not want to go home at night. The experiences were taking a huge toll on our marriage. Sandy would blame me for scaring her with reports of things that were not happening in her mind, just to cause trouble in our marriage. She would not begin to convince that I was truly scared and that something was really happening, even if she did not experience it. We stayed married for a total of 30 months before she moved out of the house and filed for a divorce. But here is where the story gets even stranger. The day she moved out of the house, the frequency and intensity of the experiences began to diminish. That night, the footsteps did not come downstairs like they always had in the past. I saw the large black apparition only one time after she moved out, and that time it was translucent as opposed to being completely opaque as it had been before. It also did not stick around as before. Once I saw it, it vanished. Four months after she was gone, all the activity ceased. The house was quiet and still, and I no longer felt that apprehension I wrote about earlier. I've since remarried, and we live in the same house with our children. I thought that the experiences might return once I brought my new wife into the home, but they didn't. If they had, I would have sold the place. It had to be something associated with Sandy. Maybe she was into the occult or something. I spent plenty of nights with her in her parents' home when they were away, before we were married, and never experienced anything like what happened in the house. Perhaps it was the combination of her and the house that was the problem, but I hope not. If it were, then that means the same thing could happen again, and I don't want my family subjected to that. I'm writing to tell you my story. I was reading Dave's story, and it's so close to the experience that I had that it actually gave me chills. My first paranormal experience happened to me when I was four years old. All the experts say that things that happen to someone before the age of five is very hard to remember. The funny thing is, is that I can remember my experience like it was yesterday. My mother, sister, who's three years younger than me, and myself. I remember being asleep in my bed and waking up very suddenly. I looked at the doorway and I saw this full-bodied figure. The only thing is that it was completely white. I'm not talking like white, like a white wall. I'm talking white like energy. This figure to me was a child. The reason I believe this is actually because of its height. I mean, it did not have a face or anything like that. It walked towards me and got on my bed. I remember pulling the blanket up over my head because I was so scared, but I actually felt it on the bed. At that point, I ran screaming and crying into my mom's room. Her boyfriend got up and walked me back to bed to show me there was nothing to be scared of. When we got there, it was gone. Now let's fast forward to the age of 17. By this time in my life, my mom had gotten married, not the same guy from when I was four, and they had bought a house. It was a tri-level, with a full finished basement and a sub-basement. From day one, something felt very odd in the house, almost like a very heavy, unwelcome feeling. The sub-basement was probably the strangest. When you would walk in there, you could see spray paint all over the walls. I know that's not strange, 
but when he stood in the center of the room, you could see that the spray paint was actually covering up what looked like writing on the walls, and it was also on the floor, so that was kind of creepy. We had two dogs that both refused to go into my room and constantly would either stare at the wall and bark or would stand at the stairs and bark up to the second floor or down the stairs to the basement. The longer I lived in the house, the more I began to feel almost alone. It was like I was becoming isolated mentally from everything in my room. It would constantly feel as though I was being watched. I would hear loud bangs and things sounding like they were hitting the floor, but nothing would be around. All the motion sensor lights from the outside of the house would turn on all at once for no reason. I mean, I actually began to think I was going crazy. Finally, I broke down and told my stepdad everything that had been going on. He looked at me very seriously. I remember thinking, oh crap, he thinks I'm nuts. He began to tell me about how one night, after I'd gotten home from work, he worked second shift and didn't get home till around 1 a.m. We were sitting on the computer playing a game. At the time, our computer was in the front room and you could see right up to the stairs and onto the landing where the bedrooms were. He said he saw a man walk out of my room. The man he saw was a taller man in a pair of jeans and a flannel shirt. At first, he thought it was me because he only saw the man out of the corner of his eye. But then he asked how I was doing and looked up and realized the man wasn't me. The man turned and walked back into my room. My stepdad ran up the stairs and opened my door and I was the only one in there and I was asleep in a pair of boxers. After my stepdad told me this, I was convinced something was going on. One weekend, while my parents were out of town, I invited two of my friends over so we could try to catch stuff on film. Of course, we got absolutely nothing, that is, until we tried to go to sleep. We had all decided to sleep in the basement because there was more room there. We turned off the lights and started to go to sleep. My one friend, Chris, was already asleep and myself and Dave were talking. All of a sudden, the light to the sub-basement turned on and we could see what looked like a shadow under the door. You could actually hear what sounded like the work boots walking up the wooden stairs. We woke up Chris and we all stood at the door. We really thought someone had broken into the house. We opened up the door, prepared to beat the crap out of someone, and there was no one there. We walked downstairs and looked around. We checked the windows and everything. The windows were shut and looked like no one was there. There are a lot of things that happened, but it would be like writing a novel to tell them all. I just thought it was kind of creepy how similar my story is to Dave's. This experience happened when I was in my late 20s, back around late 1994 or early 95. I was laying in bed asleep. I felt something touch my face and I woke up. I was face to face with a smiling old man. He crawled backwards out of my bed and stood there smiling at me. He looked like he was Caucasian descent, in his 80s at least. He had a glowing light all around him. He looked like he was at peace while staring at me. I have no idea who this was. Furthermore, I don't know why I wasn't afraid of him. He definitely looked scary to me, and I had roommates at the time. I don't know why I didn't go running down the hallway to get someone. I just stayed in bed and stared at him. Again, I wasn't afraid at all. It was almost peaceful. 
he faded away, and I looked at the clock in front of me. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. I stayed up a little while, and then went back to sleep. How do you talk about something like this? I didn't tell any of my roommates when it happened. I was fearful because I thought I would be outed as a crazy person. I did call my best friend, and thankfully she seemed to believe me. I gave her my rocking chair, and she wanted to make sure the spear was not standing next to it. So yes, I think she believed me. I've thought about it a lot over the years, trying to figure out who this could have been. I told my grandmother, she's Catholic and thinks it was an angel. I've never met my father, and I have no pictures of him, so I don't know what he looked like. But perhaps, maybe this could have been my father? My mother is Spanish and French, and supposedly, my father was of Caucasian descent like the spirit of the old man. So again, maybe it was the father or grandfather that I never met. Who knows? Since then, I've now had a husband and children. I mentioned it once to my husband. He looked at me like I was crazy, and I'm not allowed to talk about it again. Anyway, thank you for reading my story. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it's the best I can do to tell you guys. These are two experiences that happened to me about five years ago. Here is the first story. My house is six years old and has never been lived in by anyone else. This started about two months ago. I am laying in my bed alone with the door to the hall and the door to the bathroom open. I swear I see the door open a little bit and then go back to where it was. I then see black figures with little or no shape appear in the doorway, then whoosh, they are gone. I also saw what looked like people I knew, who will stick their heads in the door and then turn and leave. Last night I was asleep when I felt something nudge me two times. I woke up to see this black form standing beside me. It stood there for about two seconds then vanished out the door. The most interesting aspect of this all is that these figures have no legs. They are just a black oval shape with no faces or arms, just a black form. Last night was the first time it really scared me. I felt like it was the Grim Reaper asking me to follow it. Now on to my next experience, which was even spookier I might add. I was working in a gym at a hotel in Moodsburn near Glasgow. One night, I was getting ready to leave for the night. The route I had to take was down a dark corridor to the main door. This was a walk I had made many times before and had never any problems. But this night, as I was going along, I felt like I was being watched. As I got to the end of the corridor, I turned to close the door when I saw what looked like a white shape running towards me. Needless to say, I closed and locked the door very quickly and sprinted to the bus stop outside the hotel. The next night, I was working again and decided to see what could have caused it. I went through every possibility I could have think of, from car headlights to interior lights but nothing recreated what I had seen. About two days later, I was looking through the old accident book when I found an entry from three years before. A man was running on the treadmill and died of a heart attack whilst using it. What was interesting was, it was the same date and time of when I saw this incident myself of the running man. This happened to a friend and I back in the mid-1960s, when we were 12 or 13 years of age each, 
and we were camping with our church group, and while we had some free time, Alan and me, me as in Mark, decided to do exploring on our own, so we set off towards the perimeter of the park, where we found a fence that we could easily squeeze through, surrounding the park property, and bordering some large open cow pasture land was a grove of trees right smack in the middle of it. We set off across the pasture land towards the grove of trees, and much to our delight, for it was a hot day, we found a meandering stream in the grove of trees that was about six feet deep and about six feet wide, and it wandered all throughout the grove. But to our dismay, Alan and I realized that we were wearing blue jean pants and a t-shirt, and had not brought along our swimsuits, since we were not planning on going swimming until later, when the springs in the park was less crowded, so we had nothing to wear to go swimming at that time. But, Alan convinced me that there was nobody around to see us, and we could go swimming like they used to do in the old days, by going swimming in the nude, or skinny dipping, and nobody could tell we had nothing on. Once we were in the water, and not wanting to be labeled a coward or chicken by my friend, I quickly got undressed, and we dove into the cool water. We swam around in the water for about 15 minutes, when we were startled to see a young boy, about our age, dressed in some dusty old fashioned looking overalls, and barefoot, staring at Alan and me from the bushes, and even though he probably saw we were both skinny dipping, by our clothes hanging from the bushes, neither Alan or me felt embarrassed about it. After all, all of us were boys, and Alan got bold, but staying in the water, Alan said hi to him. The boy came out of the bushes, but didn't get near the banks, and he just stared at Alan and me for a solid 20 seconds. All we could think to do was ask him if he wanted to go swimming with us, but at this point, I don't think we realized it was a ghost at the moment. We just always thought it was a kid that always hung around this area, and just wanted to play because we were playing around. But then, it was like he had simply vanished again. Helen and I did not wear glasses, and our vision was perfect, and we were looking straight at the boy as we climbed out of the stream, and like I said, the boy just disappeared before our very eyes, just kinda blinked out of sight, and Alan and I quickly got into our jeans and looked around for him, but he was nowhere to be found in the bushes. And if he wanted to play with us, why did he disappear? And if he had left the grove of trees, which he didn't, we would have seen him in the open pasture land. And afterwards, we talked about our experience between us, but Alan and I didn't tell anyone of this, knowing that no one would ever believe us. Alan and I both wondered if the boy might have fallen into the stream from the crumbling banks and drowned in that stream many years ago. And, as the kids our age wouldn't be caught dead wearing old fashioned looking overalls, when all the kids we knew were wearing the latest looking fashions, was it even remotely possible that perhaps Alan and me saw a ghost that day? One who was lonely and just wanted to play. I worked at a place called Dowling as a janitor for a year. My shift was overnight, and for three months, I worked that shift alone. I never saw a purple orb, but I did spend a lot of time outside. What I can tell you is that after the creepiness of being in a big building all alone wears off, there are still sounds and such that can't be explained by me. Every week, if not every night, Doors would open and close by themselves, me and the others would go chasing these noises, thinking there was someone in the building, but of course, there was no one there, or I wouldn't be writing to you, and the security company wouldn't call to see an external alarm went off, so there couldn't have been anyone there. Sometimes we'd be in the library, and we'd hear one of the counselor's doors open and close. The library was the same room 
but divided by office walls from the council area. Sometimes the classroom doors would as well. At times, I'd be in the gym and would chase the sound of footsteps. The place does make a lot of building noises. It's difficult to report on anything I heard in the auditorium, the creepiest place in the school. Because the roof and heating systems would collaborate with the big empty space to make many mysterious noises that could be too easy to explain away. Plus, the auditorium was creepy because it was always dark until I would clean it, and there were so many access areas, such as backstage or the lighting area above the stage and the several doors that would really just make me paranoid. Having said all that, I did sometimes get transfixed on the idea that an emaciated naked woman was watching me. I only got that feeling in or around that particular room. It makes no sense to me, but I did avoid it. The band room was also a little creepy. I would sometimes take my lunch there so I could listen to the radio, and the doors within would make noises like they were opening and shutting. There was one definitive time that I also couldn't explain. I went into the library and locked the door behind me because I was hearing so many noises around that door that night. Then I climbed over the wall to the counselor's area and unlocked that door so I could rush through it when I heard the noise. Sure enough, the library door tried to open because I heard the deadbolt hit the door frame. So I ran to the hall and listened for footsteps, but there were none. I ran to look down both north and south halls along the library. There was nobody, and there was nowhere to hide. I didn't think someone could have gotten away like that, not in that manner anyway, without making enough noise for me to hear it. A similar thing happened one night, when all three of the overnight janitors were in there. We heard the noises in the counselor's area, so I climbed the wall while the other guys went to the doors, but nobody was there. I want to assure you of two things, even though these aren't really the most impressive tales. First, I don't really believe in ghosts. I'm open enough to the idea, I guess, but anytime I heard a noise, I would go looking for somebody because I assumed it was an intruder. There were times we had intruders, and times people who had rights to the building were found. However, there were so many times that we were sure there were noises, and so little chance for whoever was making them to escape, and we still found nothing, that I thought you might be interested to hear the story of Dowling from someone who was there for a long time. The building stopped creeping me out by itself about a week after I was working there alone. I heard voices and chased them, but the air unit, the building setting, and other normal noises stopped giving me the jitters by the time they became normal for me. I don't really believe in ghosts, but I saw the purple orb listed on the website after a night of chasing these noises, so I decided to write this to you, albeit two years after the fact. Last thing I want to say. There are two creepy stories about the place from a source that I'm not sure I trust, but I'll tell you anyway. One time, this guy saw people in robes walking into the woods west of the building. Another time, a girl was taken advantage of in the auditorium. A funny, unbelievable, but true story from the overnight shift. Ninjas attacked the school one night and put one of the soccer goals in the atrium. The kids did this for their overnight prank. They seriously climbed onto the roof of the school with two of the school's regulation sized soccer goals and dumped them into the atrium. I chased off a bunch of kids when they were trying to get on the roof a third time. They were all dressed like ninjas. My name is Carly. And I used to live in a hundred year old house on the eastern shore in Maryland. This house was on a street with about 10 other houses, all closely related in shape and size, except my friends. 
She's my best friend, and the man who had built all the houses in our street lived in hers. They have never had any bad experiences in theirs, up until now. My friend's older sister came back for Thanksgiving, and she woke up in the middle of the night and saw a form of a giant man. The man closely resembled Andre the Giant, even though she thought it was her boyfriend. When she looked next to her, he was sleeping. She really didn't think too much more about it until the next day, where the rest of the family shared that they had been hearing and seeing things too. My house was only a few years younger than hers. My parents bought it at an auction because the whole thing had to be gutted and renewed. As my dad was working on it, he was putting in new windows one day and saw a man. He was crouched down with his face right up against the wall, looking at the window he had just put in. The man saw my dad get up and disappeared. I've had my own experiences too. Like, we used to hear someone running up and down the halls at night. My room was right at the end, and my bed looked out the door. When the person got to the end, you could hear them turn around and run back. That wasn't too bad though. I also remember going into my room and saw a crowd of people. They were all dark figures with the outline of a trench coat that were so long you couldn't see their feet. They slowly faded away and I didn't go back in the room for weeks. I would stay in the other guest bedroom. I had a great aunt and she was a psychic. I loved her. We had the strongest bond you could ever have with anyone. She died of cancer, and it was terribly hard on me. I ended up with some things of hers, like her tarot cards, but most importantly, her angel cards. I had just gotten these, and I was up in my room playing with them when I pulled up one card that had a picture of a lady on it. This lady looked exactly like my aunt, and she was surrounded by animals. My aunt had a basement full of bunnies, birds, fish, she had five cats, and five dogs. The message on the card said, a message from your loved one. I'm fine, very happy now. Don't worry about me, and don't forget about me, but don't let me overtake your life. Then it said goodbye and I love you on it too. After I read that, I teared up and ran downstairs. I showed my mom and she couldn't even believe it. I couldn't believe it either, so I got scared and told my mom to take the cards out of my room, just in case. My mom put it on her dresser. They were there for about a week or two and then they disappeared. My mom never moved them, and neither did anybody else. No one had touched them, and they had just vanished. I'm for sure that was her final message to me. Maybe not forever, but just so I wouldn't worry. It was her proper goodbye. The week before Thanksgiving, my son and I were emptying out a house that was to be torn down and this new one brought in. We were standing by my pickup truck, which we were loading, and he happened to look at a bright light in the sky and said, hey, look at that, is it a plane? I looked up, and there were no flashing lights, just looked like a wide set of headlights, no other colored lights. I thought at first it was a plane, but no sound for as low as it seemed. It came over slow and headed east, and I thought it would disappear like over the trees like the planes that come over do, but instead it went up and did so very quickly until it was a speck that disappeared. I still wonder what it was. Was it a paranormal entity, like an orb or some sort, or maybe something different, like even a UFO? It's hard to say. but. Back in 1990, my husband and I were talking outside and happened to look at the edge of our 40 acres. There, just above the trees, 
was a long cigar-shaped object that covered the entire line of the 40-acre parcel. It had flashing lights and looked like windows were along the side of it. It was reported in the newspaper as a lot of people saw it that same night and made no sound at all. My son passed away in August 2008 and I've had my grandson say that he sees him in my bathroom. I find that strange. Last week he came to me and his mother and said that there was a man in my bathroom and he needed to put his clothes on. When I found my son, he was naked. My grandson didn't see him that way, the way he passed away. He has told me many times that there are ghosts in my house. We have heard doors open and close, and sometimes the floors creaking. Like last fall, I'd gone in my bathroom to turn off the lights, the kids left on. I called out to him, thinking that maybe someone was still in the bathroom. Finally, I said loudly and impatiently, who is in here? I heard a voice distinctly said I am, very quietly and clear. I didn't recognize the voice and thought one of the kids were playing a joke on me. But no one was near the bathroom, which is just off my master bedroom. It didn't scare me. There are other strange things that happen in my house. We hear little kids outside talking. Most of the time, it is indirect and you can't make out what they say. And other times, something comes in clear. We just think the land is haunted. For a while now, my sister has lived in a house a few blocks away from my parents' house. I live with my parents. I would go over there to babysit my nephew when my sister had plans. Some nights I would sleep over there. Her house always had a creepy feeling to it, a thick feeling to the air. My sister had just had knee surgery and wasn't able to take care of her son so I was spending the weekend over there. The first couple of nights were fine. I didn't mind at all. But the last night I stayed there, I was in the living room watching TV when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a shadow. Before I say any more, I better tell you the layout of my sister's house. When you walk in, you go to the left and down a hallway. The open doorway to the left leads to the kitchen. The kitchen has another entry as well. The first door on the left is my sister's bedroom. The only door on the right is the bathroom. And the door at the other end of the hallway belongs to my eldest sister. When she's there, that is. On the other side of the kitchen is a set of French glass doors and let out into a game room. An add-on to the house. The doors are always kept closed and locked at night. The only people in the house that night were myself, my sister, the one on the mat, and her son. So anyway, I saw a shadow. At first I thought maybe it was my sister getting up to ask me to get her something. But the shadow simply vanished before I could get a closer look at it. I shrugged it off as me being tired. I lay down to go to sleep. I woke up a couple minutes later. It was around 5 in the morning. I didn't know what had woken me. I was sweating badly and I felt like someone was sitting on my chest. I was propped up enough to see the French doors which were across the room from the sofa. What I saw that night is engraved into my brain. There was an old woman outside the doors. She had her hands pressed against two of the glass panels and her face against another. Her mouth was open in a scream. I was scared beyond belief because I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I couldn't do nothing but lay there. And then the door began rattling. The woman was shaking it. A shadow came out of the kitchen and the woman vanished. The shadow vanished after that, and I could breathe again. I don't know what the shadow was, but it did make the woman go away. I like to think it was my guardian angel. Who knows? 
That's my story. Anyway, and yeah, it is true. My mother was born in Austria-Hungary in 1908. When her parents immigrated to the US, they left their three children behind in the care of their grandparents. It was five years until her parents were able to return and bring the children to the US. In that five years, my mother became very close to her grandfather and went everywhere with him. She arrived in the US as a 13 year old, grew up, and married my father. They were a young farm couple living in rural Ohio. One night, my mother awoke to see her grandfather standing at the foot of her bed. He was smiling at her, but did not speak. She relayed that she pulled the covers over her head and then looked again, and he was still there. She then tried to wake my father, but when he awoke, her grandfather disappeared. She had the overwhelming feeling that her grandfather had died. This happened in the mid-1920s, and at that time, international long distance was only a thing for wealthy folks. Her only contact with her grandparents was via mail, which would take a couple of weeks to arrive. Sure enough, two weeks later, she received a letter from her grandmother verifying that her grandfather had passed away on the same day and approximately the same time that he appeared in her bedroom. My father attested to the entire happening. This was always our family ghost story that no one ever had a reason to doubt. My parents live on a farm in Sugar Grove. My stepdad grew up here with his family as a child. On Christmas Eve in 1964, his dad went into town to pick up the grandma for the holiday. With him, he took a younger daughter and his younger son. On the way home, there was a terrible accident and everybody died except the daughter. Over the years, the farmhouse was used as rental property until my mom met her husband. They have lived here now for six years and have had many experiences with the spirits of this home. I too have had some of the same. There are many, many voices that we hear. Marbles rolling down the hallway upstairs, foot noises walking up and down the stairway, clouds of light and dark smoke throughout the entire house, doors open and close, things come up missing, then are returned within days. If you are alone in the house and stand by the sink, you will soon hear a voice that asks you to go away. It will repeat until you walk away from the sink. Standing outside, if you look up into the window upstairs, sometimes you will see a vision of a woman standing in the window. This is believed to be Grandma. I have an 11 year old daughter that has walked into the downstairs bathroom and ran out stating there is a man standing at the bathroom sink. He will only turn his head and look at you, and then turn back to the mirror. He hasn't spoken yet. When my parents first came here, they slept upstairs. They had to move to the downstairs room of the winter, because no matter what room you are in up there, it is ice cold. We have used electric heat sources to try to generate heat, but it doesn't work. There are also apparitions of faces, white in color, etched into the door of the master bedroom. These appear darker at times and lighter at other times. They appear to be stuck in the wood of the door. It's believed by everyone here that the spirits and happenings of this house are all those family members that were killed in the crash. After all, they all did reside here, and I think they still do. My mother passed away a little over four years ago. Since then, we have seen her, usually in dreams, and my father has actually seen her many times in her home. 
My mother had been sick with a congestive heart failure that took a turn for the worst for about two years. My dad cared for her day and night. Finally, the last trip to the hospital was supposed to be a routine trip to remove excess fluid. On the way to the hospital, my mother made a prophetic statement to him that she would not be coming home again. When she was given the diagnosis that no further help was available to her and she would be sent home with hospice, she refused and decided to die in the hospital instead of at home because my father had to continue to live there and she did not want him to find it hard to stay at their home. Nine days of excruciating pain from a failing liver and kidneys and unable to get her breath, she succumbed to death only after the last of our immediate family visited her on that day. It was as if she had waited until she had seen her husband, children, grandchildren, and son-in-laws before she was ready to go. Ten minutes after the last visitor, she breathed her last. Oddly enough, the grandfather clock at my parents' home stopped in the exact time of her death. My father has refused to rewind it. After 60 years of marriage, my father has been so lost. For the first year, she appeared to him frequently with a smile on her face and one time told him, I love you deeply and just want to make sure you are okay. She still appears to him, just not as frequently as the first year. Recently, my sister and father had found a picture she had painted and had a frame to give me for my birthday. My dad saw my mother the morning they gave me the gift and said she was holding a shopping bag with a wooden frame sticking out from it with a huge smile on her face. He said they communicated without talking and he knew she was happy and proud I was getting the picture. I've seen my mother in dreams but only one stands out as a possible contact with her. In my dream, I was looking through the picture window of my parents' home and saw her sitting in her chair with my father standing over her, talking and smiling as if he was catching up on recent events. I went inside the house and she looked at me and smiled. I remember how peaceful she looked and so healthy. I remember saying, Mama, how can this be? I saw you in the casket at the funeral home. She just smiled at me and said, Well, sometimes these things just happened. I replied, Well, I don't care how it happened. I'm glad to have you back. I've missed you. With that, I woke up. One other time. After an extremely frustrating day, I was walking in a corridor and thought I'd heard her call my name. She said, Susie. I actually said out loud, Mama, she was not even there. My sister says she has dreamed of her, but never actually have seen her. My son slept in my mom's bed about six months after her passing and said sometimes in the night, he felt her sit down on the side of the bed. He knew it was her because he could smell her perfume. My nephew recalled a dream he had the first Thanksgiving holiday after her passing. He said that in his dream, he walked out of his upstairs bedroom and she was in the hallway. He said, let's go get some turkey granny. He said she replied, no Mark, you know I can't go downstairs with you this year, but you know I am here. My family feels that she is around us all the time. I know she is with my father the most because he is terminally ill and misses her so terribly. I feel comforted knowing she is waiting for his time to cross over. My mother is a current janitor working at Rockford College and one of the buildings she is assigned to cleans happens to be the Burpee building. There, she and some of the other ladies that work with her have lunch in that specific building 
every work night. A while back, she told us that during her lunch break, she saw what was a female figure walk past the room they were in. She said she wore a blue dress and had blonde hair. The room has a mirror that faced the only door of the small area. She said, and I quote, I glanced at the mirror, a habit of doing when you're in that room a lot, and saw this thin, transparent figure walk past the door. I thought it was one of the other girls that was walking by, but it wasn't until I realized that no one that night was wearing a blue dress or had dyed their hair blonde. I walked out to see if I was a trespasser, but saw no one in the hall. I called security and asked them if they allowed any blonde, blue-dressed girl on the property. They denied doing so, confirming my suspicions that it was possibly a ghost. This is just one of the stories that she has told us during the last two years of her encounters with the burpy ghosts. This just happened to me just recently, on February 8th, 2008, when I took a ghost tour of the Tuang Cemetery in Brisbane, Australia. First of all, I would like to keep this to myself anonymous. Secondly, what I saw is true, for I did some research to see if anyone else experienced what I saw that night, and, as it turns out, a few people over the years saw it too. It was cold and partly windy that night when I turned up at the ghost of the Tuang Boneyard, Brisbane's oldest and biggest graveyard. There's a lot of strange stories connected to this boneyard, like a vampire. There's only two boneyards in the world that got Fair Dinkham vampires, Highgate in London, and Tuang in Brisbane. The Bleeding Grave and Walking Statue. Yes, a wandering statue. Anyway, the tour barely began as our hostess was introducing herself when I saw something standing amongst the trees. It was solid and black. It was standing there watching us. I saw it, but I thought I was seeing things. Excitement that might have sparked off my imagination. But as I walked past the spot, there was nothing there to resemble that figure. But yet it was real, as you and I wasn't until a few feet ahead, I heard a weird clang sound right next to me, as if someone was banging in a pot or whatever. I thought it was the signpost rattling, but there was no signpost anywhere. Now that was freaking weird. I thought, as I hurried on, looking behind me, most of the night I felt we were being followed by something, as I was Till and Charlie best place to be on a ghost tour at the end of the line. Things started to get a bit stranger, like the cold wind I felt touching me if there was no wind blowing. The same thing happened again two nights later, when I felt something touching my neck in my own home, or seeing things at the corner of my eyes. When I turn around, there will be nothing there. I thought I was ready for the madhouse at one point. I know that I saw something, so I researched it, and as it turned out, others saw that same black figure at the same spot where I saw him or her, whatever the heck it was, and heard the same clanging sound I heard, so I didn't imagine it at all. I hope I didn't. That's my story. I've got other great spine-chilling tales, which I'll put up ASAP. But this was the first experience I had in years, except for the ghost of my dog who came back for a few nights to bark goodbye to us. My name is Tina, I'm 33, and I have a story I would like to share with you and your readers. I've been experiencing strange things for many years now, but I've only been sharing them for just a few people who don't believe always have the need to find something wrong with the ones who do. My mom was one of those people. She would roll her eyes and say I was crazy or I had been drinking. The day she became a believer 
was one of the most beautiful moments we've ever shared. This is our story. My mom had surgery in her foot and was using a walker to get around. I was at her house helping her with her laundry and such, and had laid my son down in the bedroom down the hall for his nap. Mom was kicked back in the recliner and decided she would also take a nap. All my chores were done for the time. Everybody in the house was sleeping, so I went out to get into the pool. I turned on the baby monitor at the room where my son was sleeping and brought the other piece outside with me. My mom lives out in the country. No neighbors close enough for monitor to pick up any other signals from a phone or another baby monitor. It was so quiet in my mom's house, I could hear the tick-tock ticking of the clock in the room where the monitor was. All of a sudden, I heard a woman's voice so clear and loud. It sounded like she was speaking into the monitor. It sounded like peep, as in P-E-E-P. -E -E I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it was just gibberish. That's what I heard at this point. I start to run to the door to see if my mom is still in the chair in the living room. I got to the door, snatched it open, and there was my mom, still reclined back in the chair with a really strange look on her face. I guess I had a strange look on my face too, because she said, what? What's the matter? Who's here? Who are you talking to? I just looked at her and couldn't say anything. She asked again who I was talking to. And I said, nobody. Why? She said that she heard a woman talking. She thought she was dreaming. She opened her eyes, and the woman was still talking, so she knew she wasn't dreaming. Having to always have an explanation for things, she then assumed I was on the phone, but looked around and saw the phone and my cell phone were on the kitchen counter. That was when I came in the door, and she knew it wasn't me. I said, heard that too? Yes, she said, with a very strange look on her face. So I went down to the hall to the room where my son was still sleeping and looked around. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing out of place. I came back down the hall and told my mom he was fine, still sleeping, hadn't moved an inch. She was a little freaked out. But she started asking me questions about my great-grandmother, who often visits me in the places that I go. I never met my great-grandmother in person, but I've had many run-ins with her spirit. My mom didn't want to believe that grandma visits her too, but after that day, she started to believe, not only in ghosts and spirits, but in me too. Thanks, Grandma Daisy. This is a true murder story that happened around the early 1900s in the Woods and Maureen Circle, Mapleville, Rhode Island. This story is a more true and detailed story of the one before that my great-grandmother told me about. Catherine was a mill owner's daughter. She was a very pretty tall blonde. She was engaged to a local farmer, Robert. Catherine, though, had one problem. A man, who some say had mental issues, was stalking Catherine. His name was David. David would send Catherine letters of how much he loved her, and how they could have babies together. These letters disturbed Catherine. He would watch her through the window and follow her wherever she went. One day, Catherine confronted him and told him never to talk to her again. David thought this was like a game, so he proceeded to send disturbing letters and watch her at all times. As a few days went by, he gave up. With this, he had a plan. If he couldn't love her, no one else could. So one day, while Catherine was going to the woods to get water for her family, David followed. First, he stopped at Catherine's fiancé's farm. Robert was working on the farm as usual, and David came in from behind and stabbed him in the back with a pitchfork. Then he went off to find Catherine. 
Catherine was sitting next to a pond under a hemlock tree. David pulled out his knife and stabbed her through the neck. She screamed in pain as David ripped open her body. As she died, David messed with her dying body. Afterwards, he took her organs out, cut off her breasts, and nailed her heart to a tree, covered in blood. David went home and took a nap. He was supposedly awoken by the sound of dripping. He looked around his room, and it was covered in blood. In the middle of the room, Catherine stood there cursing at him. David had gone insane. He wrote his last letter to the police, telling them what he did, where her body was, and all that happened. He drowned himself the next day in a river. His body sprawled out on a rock, broken. Catherine and Robert were buried in a now abandoned cemetery, and David's body was thrown into a pit. During a biopsy, they found a heart in David's stomach. Some people think he swallowed her heart, while others think Catherine put it there. Still, rumors persist that late at night in the cemetery, you could see the couple holding hands as if nothing ever happened. I believe I had a true experience with a shadow person. This is my story. It was maybe 11ish at night. My boyfriend and myself were watching a movie. The lights were dim in the house. The house is more than a hundred years old. From where I was seated, I could see the dining area, which was dark, and the kitchen doorway, which had a dimmed overhead light on, and the light was spilling into the dining room. I noticed a distinct shadow movement in the light from the kitchen, like someone or something walked past the light. I turned my head fully towards the doorway now, and saw a solid black elongated ovalish shape towards the top of the doorway, and it quickly slipped into the kitchen. My immediate reaction was not of fear, but sort of like, huh, okay, what the heck was that? I wasn't alarmed. I continued watching the movie thinking of explanations for what I just saw. Now let me tell you, there are three dogs in the home as well as the two of us. My boyfriend's two dogs were asleep on the floor by our feet, and my dog was by my side on the couch. He's small. He was acting a bit odd, nervous now. Perhaps he sensed it in me. 30 minutes later, he got down and headed towards the kitchen. He had just got his head in the door and promptly stopped. I couldn't see his head and shoulders, just his back end. I saw his neck raise like he was looking up, and then it happened. It took my breath and gave me chills. He started wagging his tail, slow at first, like he was unsure, and then the momentum slowly gained. He never got to a full-on happy to see you wag. Then he abruptly stopped and came back to my side. He would not enter the kitchen. And in case you think maybe he was looking out a window, no, the window was too high up to see anything. My name is Guy, and I would like to share my experience at Lambertville High School. I've been there numerous times. I live about 25 minutes away in Pennsylvania. My friends and I are ghost hunters, and Lambertville is a favorite spot of ours. The first time I visited the school was about two years ago, in 2005 and 2006, and I've been curious about it ever since then. I've had many comments about history of this amazing site. I've been through some of the school. Not all of it though, because the building is in poor shape. The first time we went, we didn't encounter anything out of the ordinary. Back then, we had no equipment except our eyes and ears and flashlights. We really didn't venture inside until the second trip, but that was during the day 
and also uneventful. The third trip back to the school was a shocker that still gives me chills to this day. We went on a summer night, around midnight, or maybe a little later than that, and not a smart thing to do, but we didn't know any better. We parked the car out in front of the steps, leading up to the school. We were to go in shifts up and into the school, to go and to stay in the car, to watch for cops. We were there for five minutes before two of my friends came sprinting to the car screaming, drive, drive. Me and my friend who stayed in the car were wondering what was literally scaring them to insanity. What they told us was pretty crazy at first. They said that while they were walking up the steps to the school, they heard the sounds of little children, little girls, giggling and laughing. At first, I didn't believe it and wanted to go back to experience this for myself. I'm the kind of person that has to see to believe, but it's the hope of that proof that draws me back to the school. Anyway, that incident was about two years ago, and between my friends, it has been just a story with no proof. No proof. Until now. Last week, May 2008, me and my friends met up again, thanks to school being finished, and decided to go back. We went that night around 10 to 10.30 and stayed there for a good hour and ventured inside. Though we heard no laughing, I'm still a believer. I believe my friend's story and everyone else's stories of little children laughing because I caught it on tape. I recently purchased some equipment to help capture paranormal activity. And the most valuable tool I had that night was my recorder. It's amazingly lucky that I caught anything at all, because I only recorded audio for about 7 minutes of our hour-long investigation. And all but about a minute of the audio has voices on it that were not ours. I also caught the voice of maybe a teacher or student saying, Does he seem okay? In a 2 minute long conversation with what I believe is a female and a male that answers a question that I ask. I've showed this tape to my family and friends, and they all hear talking as well, and the laughter seems to freak everyone out. I wanted to make sure that what I was hearing was, well, what I was hearing. When I heard the laughing on the tape, I thought, my god, they weren't joking or trying to scare us. They really did hear something that night, something that I would like to share with your website, if that is alright with you. I just want to know that there is something other than this life. And that is what draws me to the paranormal. Thank you for your time, and thank you for reading this. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to ask. I would love to share these clips with you guys and your viewers. This is in reference to your listing for the Hearthstone Inn, Colorado Springs, Colorado. This place has much more than a little girl. As a housekeeper there in 1999, I was able to experience almost all of the hauntings. In the south building, third floor, the little girl would appear regularly, as well as the man in brown in the main bedroom, also in the southwest corner of the floor. He was harmless and would usually disappear as soon as spotted. On the third floor, I've never felt alone, would often hear the little girl in running and laughing. Two of the four bedrooms on the first floor share a bedroom. I learned to prop the door open while cleaning or I would be locked in. The first time I was locked in, I rattled the door and was screaming for the other housekeeper. I was nearly hysterical when she let me out after about five minutes. Also in the south building, first floor, there was a bedroom at the end of the hall that used to be under the stairway. The back stairway of this building, when it was a hotel, led outside. Many of our guests reported having the dreams of the woman in this room. I would feel her, but never see her. I would have trouble with the lights an unwelcoming presence. On one occasion, the owner, 
David Oxhandler spent the night in the room on having a very vivid dream of this woman and dismissing it as a dream. He was too shaken to go back to sleep. When he stepped outside to have a cigarette, he turned around, feeling he was not alone, and actually saw her, dressed as just in the dream, floating where the stairs would have been. Rumors she was the victim of a lover's quarrel and was shot on the back stairs. The last one I knew of, was in the north building, second floor. One room next to the stairs facing east was never pleasant to be in. The light was very temperamental, flickering and choosing when to be on or off. I would feel a presence on the floor, but really tried to ignore it until one day. I was standing near the stairs with several heavy bundles of laundry to take downstairs. When I felt a pressure on the right side small of my back, just a little shove, and I nearly went headfirst down the stairs, and not of my own volition. Last I hear the Oxlanders were doing haunted history tours of their hotel. Shortly after, it has been sold to another local organization. Very much worth adding some info to your site, and thanks for the space. My wife and I had several experiences in our apartment over the last three years we have lived here. It began with hearing noises and creaks in the building early on and slowly evolved to seeing shadows in the middle of the night in our bedroom. We both have had experiences where we thought to have seen a little boy in blue pajamas looking at things in our bedroom. Three major events have occurred, which I'll describe in detail. Event 1 summer of 2006 my brother was staying over because he is a minor and our mother was going out of town we had woken up late to eat breakfast and were playing a game of cards as we are brothers and there is a significant age gap we sometimes argue i was being a little bit of a jerk picking on a card selection he had made when our kitchen trash can started to rock back and forth we were the only people present in the apartment and we were about 10 yards from the trash can. I investigated the trash can further to find that it was nearly empty and there was nothing that could have moved. So we went to the park. Event 2, winter of 2007. My wife and I were growing fascinated with the television show, Ghost Hunters. We had spent an entire day watching episodes from the second season DVD being cocky and joking with my wife over her growing discomfort with the mood the show was setting. I began joking about talking on the ghost of the apartment, saying such things as, if anyone is here, come here and get me, or you can't touch me, you're just a ghost, I don't believe in you. Later that night, at 4 a.m., I woke up quite distressed and felt that the apartment was shaking from a significant earthquake. I was sure that it was the big one and rushed to jump out of bed and pull my wife to safety in a doorway. She was in a state of shock as I lifted her out of bed and was scared of an earthquake also. When we finally got to the doorway and calmed down, I explained to her that I thought there was an earthquake but couldn't feel it anymore. She couldn't either. I began to grow very nauseous and leaned on her for support. I told her I wasn't feeling right and I blacked out. As I was blacked out, I heard sounds of people talking very quickly. At first I thought it was my wife, and I tried to tell her to slow down. I felt the sensation of running very quickly while I was hearing the rapid dialogue. I was growing angry, when suddenly I awoke lying on the floor with my wife over me. She told me she thought I was having a seizure or something, because all of my muscles had lightened and I was screaming and moaning in a sense of fear. She said that I had also grown pale. All throughout that night, I felt the bed continue to shake. Event 3, soon after Event 2. I was angered by experience I had felt earlier in Event 2, where I had awoken to what I thought to be an earthquake and experienced what I thought to be a form of being possessed. I researched how to hold a seance to converse with spirits present within the room and invited friends over 
to help with the conversation. I didn't describe the experience I had felt earlier so that it would not affect my friend's experiences that night. In the middle of the seance, one of my friends began to grow woozy and sway forward when he suddenly stopped it. He said that he couldn't go on and felt like someone was talking quickly to him and he had felt the sensation of running, identical to my experience earlier. I shared with him my experience and we decided not to continue. Also, this night, my friend's car got a flat tire while parked in my apartment and only needed to be refilled with air as there was no puncture to cause the flat, as if someone deflated it. Also, another friend was called by his girlfriend within minutes of us ending the seance because she felt something had happened and was worried. He had only told her he was going to see me and not anything about what we were doing that night. The friend with the flat also received a phone call from his aunt about an hour after, whom he speaks with rarely, because she had similar concerns as my friend's girlfriend. How's that for women's intuition? Ever since that last event, nothing else has occurred. This is a personal experience that to this day has left me shaken. There is something wrong with this apartment complex. My experience centered on the apartment we were in, but from other residents, I heard other tales that made me really not want to live there. And as soon as I could get out, my husband and I certainly did. Pontreal Apartments located in South Lyon. There is a huge tree right directly in front of it. Apparitions have been seen in the little hallway between bathroom and bedroom. The panel in the hallway leading up to the crawl space had moved on its own. Personal experience was actually in the bathtub and the only one home when it happened. I'm all of five foot and that ceiling is a good eight feet. There was no way for me to get up there. We figured that the only way to move that panel was to be up in the crawl space. Each crawl space is self-contained. EVPs have gotten into the apartment of a young woman with an accent saying, can't stay too long, and sleep, both still have. If you leave the apartment door open while taking a shower, you get this feeling that you are being watched. Then look out, you see the retreating figure of what looks to be a young woman. I'd had this happen, and thought I'd left my apartment door open, and it was a neighbor, and upon investigation, found my door deadbolt was locked. Numerous pictures of orbs and odd shadows have been captured in this apartment. All still have. Late at night, you can also hear someone walking past the apartment, and when you go to look, there is no one on the walkway. And considering where the apartment is, there is no way for someone to get down it quick enough without hearing the sounds of running feet have had an experience of having the front door hit several times while I was to people, and no one was there. Stories were also told to me of the laundry room in the same building is also a place of odd occurrences, feelings of being watched and hearing a young woman's voice have felt the being watched part, but considering that the old furnace system is right there in the laundry room, I dismissed it. A lot of my family and husband's family refused to spend the night there just cause the place gave them the creeps. And this was prior to some of these events happening. I've tried to find out if there have been any deaths or murders or anything on that ground and I came up with nothing. All I know is that the place was just, there was something wrong with it and I wish I had never moved into it. The EVPs were caught when that building had few residents. I still have them, just have others listen to them from time to time to prove I wasn't crazy with what I heard. The pictures are numerous, and some still make the hair on my arm stand up because of the experiences with them. One night in October 2008, my friends Scott, Denny, and Steve and I decided we wanted to go ghost hunting. Scott was the only one who had experience with anything, and he had seen things and had things happen to him and other people in his past groups. 
we started off by going to Peace Church Cemetery and where the murderer Billy Cook is buried. We were equipped with a video camera, me, a digital camera, a digital voice recorder, a heavy duty flashlight, Scott, and two smaller flashlights with the other two people. We walked around for a little bit as Scott instructed us to let our senses take hold of us and guide us as they please. If we got an impulse to do something, do it. We all had weird feelings, but eventually realized we weren't going to find anything here. We left, deciding to go somewhere that Scott had experienced before, the Waco Cemetery. Once we got there, we said our opening prayer and made our way out into the cemetery. Eventually, we split into two groups, me and Steve in one, Scott and Denny in the other. Steve told me to get a couple of specific things on video. He thought he had seen something he said was best described as a specter, with a head that shaped into a point in a cloaked black body. We walked around for a bit longer, and he told me he had seen it again. We walked towards the area he saw it and didn't see anything. We met back up with Denny and Scott on the other side of the cemetery, and Scott started talking about the things that had happened to him here. He had been asking questions and talking in general, trying to pick up some EVP. He started talking about what he called the prankster that had slapped him in the face and possibly put scratches down his friend's back. We made our way back to the center of the cemetery where there were no graves, just a patch of grass. We stood around, and Steve told the other two about the specter he had seen, and where he had seen it. Around that time, Scott said lights out. He took a couple of pictures, and the rest was silent. Then, we turned our lights back on for a few seconds, before Scott repeated his order of lights out. This part gets a little blurry. I can't remember if it was before or after we turned the lights back on. But Scott is a big guy, wide and tall. He fell backwards onto Steve, who would have fallen on me had I not moved in time. He had fallen hard. He laid there and just looked confused, and his face was red. His glasses have flown off of impact of the fall. He asked where his glasses were. Then he asked, did I fall? We tried to explain what happened from each of our perspectives quickly, as we were pretty freaked out, since this was our first experience. He had asked a couple more times as the rest of us came to the conclusion that he felt too hard to have just fallen from a loss of balance. I, for one, think he was pushed by some force. Anyway, we got him up to his feet, he looked around and said, we're leaving. Scott was shaken, and that was all we needed to hear. As we walked back to our cars to say a closing prayer, Scott started coughing, which progressed into dry heaving. We had eight hardies before we went to the first place, so we knew that he had something to throw up. We stopped to wait for him, and after he felt better, we proceeded to walk to a space between the cars to say the prayer. Scott began, Our Father which art in heaven. It was interrupted by more dry heaving. Steve said, Scott, are you okay? He nodded and said, I'll be thy, and cut off to some dry heave some more. This time, it was so bad that he lost his glasses and was down on his knees coughing up something that wasn't there. He looked up, straight at me, and gave the most evil glare I've ever seen. I immediately recoiled in fear, with tears forming in my eyes. I asked Scott, Scott, are you there? He got over this fit eventually, as Steve said. How by thy what? Finish the prayer, Scott. You have to finish it. Scott straightened up a little, and hoarsely started to finish. Hallowed be thy name. Again, the same occurrence had just happened, and he just kept coughing and dry heaving. 
At this point, Scott has regained his composure enough to finish and says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we each followed with a thankful amen, he said, Now let's get the heck out of here. I was ahead of him in parking, so I started the car and drove out of the cemetery as fast as possible. We stopped into a church parking lot up the road. Scott got out of his car, and we started talking about what just happened. He claimed to have no recollection of falling or anything after that. That's the story of what happened in southwest Missouri on a late October night. May you form your own conclusions, and I hope you enjoy. I've felt the presence of ghosts at some places I've been or lived at. I've never had experience of seeing a ghost, but I can walk into a place and tell if there's a ghost there. I know if it's a male, female, or child. I've seen dark shadows, but not all have been black. Some are gray, like the color of a rat. One night, a very good friend of mine came over and we started watching a movie and eating pizza. I saw the dark outline of a male child peeking around the corner of the kitchen. I told my friend Don, who was very religious, and at first she didn't believe me. I kept seeing the outline of a head and shoulders peeking around the corner. Then, about five minutes or so later, we started hearing a scratching noise. I told Don that's the ghost. She said it was just a mouse. Then. I heard a loaf of bread fall on the floor. The bread is kept on the counter far back next to the microwave. I got up to investigate. The bread was lying on the floor, but had no holes in it from a mouse. I put the bread back and went back into the living room. Dawn got up to get a glass of soda, and when she went into the kitchen, she yelled. She said the loaf of bread moved across the counter and dropped on the floor at her feet. She started praying. Every time she stopped praying, you could hear scratching noises. She kept praying, and the scratching continued. Then it got quiet. We finished the movie, and as we were talking, we noticed the lid on the pizza box, which was propped up, started to slip down. Instead of just falling down, it closed. This was very slowly. Dawn said she had enough and went home. She took the pizza and box home with her. She called me later that night and said that the ghost followed her home because her bread was constantly sliding off the counter and she actually saw the pizza lid open when it was closed in the box. She said she threw the bread and pizza box off her balcony and prayed really hard. She didn't have any more problems, and our bread stayed on our counters after that. I was at the age of 12 to 13 when my grandmother bought me a rocking chair out of what she said was a yard sale. She claimed that they were very glad to get rid of it, and she never thought to ask why. She brought it home and sat it in my room with my dolls on it. It was an antique, swells leery about anyone sitting in it. I never experienced any weird activities in it, but my brother at the age of nine years was sitting in the living room where he could see it and claimed to have seen it rock three times. It scared him to the point where he just ran outside to my grandmother, crying and screaming. I was confused, and my grandmother told me to keep it closed and keep my door shut. Later, my aunt said she went into my room to get something, and she also seen it move. I was getting mad, thinking that there was something wrong with my chair, and hid it in my closet. The last person that had seen it move was my little cousin, due to us moving to another location. She agreed to keep it in her room, where she did not stay at the time, but went in and out of there when needed. She was doing her hair in a dresser mirror. When she got a glimpse of the rocker moving, then, to 
her surprise and fright, a little girl appeared. She said she was very beautiful in an older clothing. She screamed and ran from the room. It took her some time to calm down to tell what happened, and there I was, ready to get rid of it also. The one thing I did find out about the chair before giving it away was that it hated men. Due to my family's curiosity, my great uncle was determined to see it and experience it sliding away from him across the room. He was nevertheless very scared and left quickly. I'm glad I gave it away and didn't think twice, but never had it do anything in front of me. I didn't experience this myself. It happened to my mother a couple months ago, and she told me about it after it happened. What happened was, a couple months ago, my mom was prepping for a party in our kitchen at about 9.30pm. Me and my brother who were about 11 at the time, we were both at the house at the time. I was upstairs, and he was in the living room. My mom told me that she was washing dishes, and that she looked up at the window in front of her, and she saw someone walk by the hallway behind her. She immediately thought that it was me, because of how tall the person was. She called out my name, and told me to do something for her. After a couple of minutes, she came to look for my brother to ask where I had went. He looked at her like she was crazy and told her that I hadn't come downstairs for about an hour. She called me down noticeably scared because she thought someone was in the house, but we couldn't find anyone. This happened more than once to my mother, but more noticeable. She was washing clothes and had to walk through the kitchen and saw someone poke their head out from behind the counter. She of course thought that it was either me or my brother, but when she checked, she found no one. She called me immediately and told me what had happened, and now we believe that a ghost is in the house, but it doesn't show itself regularly. Two other things that have happened since then. One happened a couple months after that. Me and my brother had a friend over, and he had gone to the bathroom on the second story of the house. No one was up there at the time, but when he came down, he said that he had seen two red eyes down the hall near my parents' bedroom. He immediately ran downstairs, and we told him about my mother's experiences. The other things that happen more frequently now is that our dog starts to growl at something in the hallway. She sleeps in our parents' room, and sometimes she will get up and walk around the room, and then... She will stop in the doorway and growl at something in the hallway. But when we turn on the light, there will be nothing there. It has been a couple of months since anything worth reporting has happened. But we believe that it is a friendly ghost and nothing harmful will come of it. Even though I'm terrified of this kind of stuff, Reading stories and watching things on TV about it is very interesting to me. I have a story to share. It's still very fresh to me, even though it's happened many years ago that it has taken place. My husband and kids laugh at me when I tell them my story just because of some of the things that went on. They find it more humorously amusing than seriously true. This story took place when I was about five or six years old in a house we lived at in Oregon, Ohio. I really don't even know where to begin. The house was a two-story home that wasn't huge, but sure wasn't small. I had two brothers, and they shared a bedroom with me, having my own bedroom right next to theirs. In their closet was this blue plastic hanging shoe rack that was left when we moved in. It was completely empty, except for a few bouncy balls and a metal jack in some of the pockets. Every day we would check these pockets because whenever we would empty them, there was always more the next day. I never thought anything weird about that. It was cool finding things in there. My room had a door that led to the closet. I never heard anything scary in my room. But one night, 
My grandparents spend the night. They came from Florida and were visiting us before moving on to other relatives. In the middle of the night, everyone ran into the room because my grandpa woke up screaming. He said the cat had crawled onto the mesh part of the box spring and scared him. Everyone went back to bed and nothing was thought of it. Months went by and summer was here. My brothers and I used to all lay in the hallway upstairs outside our rooms in front of a box fan my dad would put up because it was so hot. Sometime in the middle of the night, my younger brother Mike woke up, I guess to sleep in my room, and began screaming. He said my older brother's Jake's face was on the wall scaring him. Jake had been laying in the hallway the entire time with me and Mike. Still, everyone shrugged it off like the other things that happened and figured he was sleepwalking. I've heard things throughout the night on and off after the last incident, but the last and scariest part of the house that happened to me, and I'm not sure how much time in between this happened, is one night when I was sleeping with my cat. It was sometime in the middle of the night, and for some reason I woke up. My cat also woke up. My cat was tucked under my arm at my side, and all of a sudden, it opened its eyes wide and hissed with its hair standing up on its back. Then it darted out of my room. I didn't understand why the cat acted like this, and seconds later, at the end of my bed was this figure. It was definitely human, but was all white and misty. It had no features or limbs. The only feature I remember is seeing an O like shaped mouth. It was just standing there, but then looked like it was moving slowly closer. I kicked my feet at it, and nothing happened. I just kicked right through it. I was scared to death and ran into my parents' room and slept there the rest of the night. I thought I heard sounds coming from the drawers in my dad's dresser the rest of the night, but never heard anything or seen anything since. My husband, like I said, finds his humors. So last year, he bought some ball and jacks and placed them on my pillow and laughed. I would love to find out if anyone living in that house after or before me ever had any experiences like that. I always wondered why that thing would want to scare us like that. My grandfather was a member of Washington Country Golf Club in Washington County, Pennsylvania. The golf club sits on top of a hill and used to be a very old farmhouse that dates back to the 1800s. He told me stories of him along with a group of friends who spent the night at the clubhouse. Members were allowed to stay there if they wished. It was said the old farmer who lived in the house lost all of his money and the farm went under. After this all happened, the farmer then decided to end it all. My grandfather said that during the late hours of night, you can hear footsteps walking back and forth upstairs. They went upstairs, and no one was to be found. Even in the ballroom, the lights would be seen turning off and on by themselves, as doors were being opened and closed as well. I myself have been in the clubhouse, which is very old, with wooden stairs and floors. I have even seen the bar going across the staircase where it said the farmer had done the deed. I've heard this story from other members of the club. Whether this is true for sure or not, I don't know exactly. Another story I've heard takes place in Peters Township in Washington County. I've been told by an old football coach whose family lived in the town all their life dating back to the 1700s, I believe. He tells the story of an old haunted railroad tunnel close to Hidden Valley Road in the area. It's said that many years ago, when the railroad was a busy place, a man was hooking up two boxcars. The boxcars then rolled together, hitting the man in between the two hookups. The man was cut in half from the two boxcars, and many people say 
they've walked the tunnel holding hands across the tunnel very late in the night. They said they have seen a man walking at the other end of the tunnel with an old oil lamp in his hand, swinging back and forth. They even say the train can be heard off in the distance, but no train even came. The story has been known as Boxcar Willie. I've heard the story from many different people in the past. I've seen the tunnel myself one night with two of my friends. We held hands going across the front of the tunnel. We all then saw a very small light at the end of the tunnel. Never went to check it out, but something was there. We all saw this light. It may have been something off in the distance, but I believe it was Boxcar Willie. We all felt something very weird that night. That's why I get the feeling something was out there. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Hit the like, comment, and share the video. Make sure I see your name at the bottom in the comment section. Um, I'm done though. Love you guys. See you in the next video.